gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Uh, just a moment, please. Hey, boss, uh, Mr. Tom Wilcox wants an appointment. How about one o'clock? Archie, no appointments today. I intend to pot some dendrobium offsets. One o'clock will be fine, Mr. Wilcox. You see the Tom Wilcox who was acquitted yesterday of the murder of that singer, Keith Hansen? Uh, Mr. Wilcox, are you the Tom Wilcox who... Oh, you are. I see. What does he want with me? Uh, Mr. Wilcox, why do you seek Mr. Wolf's services? I see. Well, our fee is $1,000 with a retainer of 500 okay? Oh, yes, Mr. Wolf will see you. Uh, what's that? Hey, what was that? Hey, hey, Mr. Wilcox. Archie, uh, stop shouting, hey. He whispered someone was at the window. Then I heard a shot and he dropped the phone. Boss, I'm afraid we've just lost a client. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This episode, as one Nero Wolf refers to, is a slight case of perjury. It all started with the phone call from Tom Wilcox and the ensuing shot, which I was sure had brought our newfound income to an early end. Anyway, there was the shot and... Hello? Mr. Wilcox? Hello? Well, boss, I've certainly waited long enough for him to come back to the phone. We may have just lost a nice bankroll. Nonsense, Archie. Other clients will rescue us. Now for a cold bottle of beer, Archie. We're almost out of beer. I'd better get over there and see what happened to Mr. Wilcox. The beer first. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Oh, Wilcox, you all right? Well, was that a shot? It was, huh? I'm glad it missed. Tell him to come right over here. Yeah, you dug the slug out of the wall. Well, come right over. Boss, the police never found the gun that killed Keith Hansen. No gun was found. Wilcox said he thinks he was shot out with a thirty-two. He dug the bullet out of the wall. The murderer of Hanson must now be after Wilcox. If Wilcox is telling the truth. He was acquitted. The society gal, Mrs. Patricia Park, established his alibi, said she was with Wilcox at the time the murder was supposed to have occurred. I read the papers, Archie. Where's last night's paper? Wow, boss, look at her picture. Ooh, she's a honey. Archie, will you get me some beer? Well, if you move your arm six and a quarter inches, you can't possibly miss it. Mr. Wolf, this is Tom Wilcox, our new client. How do you do? Uh -huh. Archie, the red leather chair for Mr. Wilcox. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I, I'd like your aid in finding the murderer of Keith Hansen. Indeed. Why do you suppose you were shot at this morning? I gave a statement to the press last night, which was printed this morning, saying that I was going to seek out the killer of Keith Hansen. The killer obviously wants me stopped. Uh, here's the bullet, a thirty-two, i I'd say. Why did you go to Keith Hansen's apartment on the day of his death? I went there to tell him to stay away from my sister. We had a fight. The manager came and stopped us. I told Hansen I'd kill him if he didn't lay off. The manager heard this. Then I went home. What time was that? About 8.30. The police claimed I returned to Hansen's apartment and shot him. I couldn't prove I was at home all night. It was going rough for me until Patricia Park testified she was with me at the time when the crime was said to have been committed. Why didn't you tell the police in the first place that this Patricia Park was with you? Well, that's the whole trouble. She wasn't. What? Her claim that she spent the hours from nine till midnight with me was a lie. In fact, I'd never met the woman in my life. Have you contacted this Patricia since your release, Mr. Wilcox? Yes, but she refuses to see me. Archie, uh, phone Mrs. Patricia Park and tell her that she must see you at once for her own good. Time is of the essence. And what else can you tell me, Mrs. Park? Mr. Goodwin, I haven't anything more to say than I've already said. All I want is a simple answer as to why you lied about being with Tom Wilcox. Well, Tom Wilcox is a very fine man, but he isn't telling you the truth. Did you commit the murder? 
and succeed in establishing your own alibi by swearing you and Tom Wilcox were together ten miles from the scene of the crime? I did not. Do you own a gun? Don has one around. Who's Don? Don's my husband. Oh, is he here? I doubt it. He's never here. Spends most of his time at the bookies, throwing away every cent he can get his hands on. I've had to cut his allowance to practically nothing. Doesn't he work? No. He studied medicine but gave it up. He was an illustrator for years, but gave that up when his eyes were burned in a plane crash. Mm -hmm. Where's the gun? It's in the desk. It used to be in here. What caliber? I don't know. Where were you at 10 o'clock this morning? Why, I think I was with the cook. Someone fired a shot at Tom Wilcox this morning through the window. No. Oh, no. Archie, please don't continue with this investigation, please. How well did you know Keith Hansen? Not very well, but enough to realize he was no good. Mr. Goodwin, if you'll drop this case, I'll give you $1,000 cash. Not interested. But I am interested in learning why you lied, why Tom was shot at this morning, and why you should try to bribe me. You must stop for your own sake. How will it benefit me to step out of it? The killer tried to stop Tom Wilcox. You might be next, and he may not miss this time. Go on. Why have you been protecting Wilcox? I believe Tom Wilcox was innocent. Now, I didn't want him to be sentenced to die, so... So I lied at the trial. He told us today he'd never seen you before. That's true. But he looked so innocent, so so clean and good and decent. That's not very believable. If you don't think Wilcox killed Hanson, who do you think did it? Please believe me, Archie. I don't know. I don't, I tell you. Hi, sis. Hey, what's the matter? Are we intruding? Oh, hello, Marge. Brad, come in. This is Mr. Goodwin. My sister and brother-in-law, Marge and Brad King. How do you do? Hello. What gives and who's Mr. Goodwin? A private detective, Marge. I've just explained to Mr. Goodwin that I wasn't with Tom Wilcox at the time of Keith Hansen's murder. Pat, why did you tell him that? Mr. Goodwin, I hope you will not use this knowledge against Pat. Did you all know Keith Hansen? Yes. And my husband and Keith went to school together. Keith, Don, and I were on the same polo team. Where were you at the time of the Hansen murder, Mr. King? He and Don were attending a horse show at Madison Square Garden. Marge and I didn't want to go. We stayed here. Where were you at 10 this morning, Mr. King? Why, uh... I had an appointment with my dentist, Dr. Flagg, Rockefeller Center. And you, Mrs. King? I was shopping. Ilsa's salon. A salon dresses. Why all this questioning? Marge, someone tried to kill Tom Wilcox this morning. What? May I use the phone, Mrs. Park? Yes, of course. First door to your left. Suppose you try to find the gun. Marge, that gun is missing from the desk. I haven't seen it. Do you know the caliber, Mr. King? Uh, 32, I think. It must be in the house. For your sake, I hope you find it. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. You should have reported long ago. She must be very pretty. Pat Park admits she lied. She claims now she was with her sister, Marge King. Marge and her husband, Brad, have alibis, and all have alibis for this morning. I'll check them before I return. Where were they the night of the Hanson murder? Well, Brad and Don Park, that's Pat's husband, were at the Madison Square Garden horse show. Pat and Marge were together here at the house. Impossible to verify the Madison Square alibi at this date. Check all the rest and come home for lunch. It's Oysters Rockefeller. Has Inspector Kramer arrived yet? He has, and left the police records on the Hanson murder. He has taken the bullet Wilcox brought to be checked at ballistics. Good. Pat had a thirty-two caliber gun in the desk in the library. It's now missing. Indeed. And boss, Pat just offered me $1,000 to quit the case. When I refused, she said if I didn't lay off, something might happen to me. Oh, dear me. That would be most upsetting, eh? <laughs> After lunch, I want you to visit the late Keith Hansen's apartment. Bye. Before you join the others, Mr. Goodwin, I want to talk to you. All right. Close the door, Marge. Pat didn't mean anything when she offered you money, Archie. And she wasn't threatening you, honest. I'm convinced. Why the pressure? Uh, well, why don't you sit down? Here, by me. Okay. What's on your mind, huh? Archie, I can add another thousand to what Pat offered. Wouldn't that be enough, Archie? I can give it to you right now. Brad will write a check. Does Brad want me to stop, too? He said you couldn't be persuaded. Every one of you seems to have had a reason for killing Hanson. None of you apparently liked him. Now, be a good little girl, Marge, and stop trying to act like a Delilah. If you're innocent, you have nothing to worry about. You're stuffy. I hope you do get hurt. Thanks a million. Now let's join the others. 
Well, Pat, did you find the gun? I can't find it anywhere. Oh, Mr. Goodwin, this is Don Park, my husband. How do you do? How are you? Have you seen the gun, Mr. Park? Not for ages. You're a detective, eh? Yeah. May I ask where you were this morning about ten? Why? Well, frankly, I was at my bookies. Where's that? I can't tell you. But I'll call him and you can check it. Were you and Brad together at all times during the horse show the night of Keith Hansen's murder? No. Brad wanted away a couple of times, and I saw some people I knew. You know how it is. We'd meet at intervals. Archie, you're wasting your time. None of us is guilty. I made a fool of myself, that's all. Tom Wilcox was such a decent man that I hated to see him have to pay for taking Keith Hansen's rotten life. If a man's guilty, why should you butt in? You never use your head. Pat is one person who thinks of others before herself. Marge, forget it. Now you've got private detectives snooping around. What are you after, Goodwin? Who are you working for? Why don't you let my wife alone? The case is closed, isn't it? Maybe. Don, this just makes it more interesting to Mr. Goodwin. As a matter of fact, I think you all know more than you're telling. I still think Tom Wilcox killed him. And there's only one reason why Pat should protect him. Don, that's enough. Nice, happy family. Suffering all the torments of a guilty conscience, is that it? What are you trying to do, Mr. Goodwin? Get your nose poked? Not exactly. If not, you'd better leave. Okay, Mr. King, I'll run along. Mr. Wolf will be anxiously waiting to hear about this. So long. Pet box, cook, ready for the alibi for 10 o'clock this morning, then. Uh, what about the other alibis? Well, Brad's dentist said that he didn't get to Brad until about 10.30. His appointments had run over. He wasn't sure if Brad was there at 10 or not. The nurse was out at that time. Marge's alibi is no good. And that mob at Elsa's, the saleswomen wouldn't have known their own mothers. Don's alibi checks, if we can take the word of the bookie. Don and Pat, then, are the only ones who have alibis that checked, huh? That's right. Are these the reports Inspector Kramer brought? Mm-hmm. Keith Hansen's body showed obvious signs of battery... Lips were swollen and lacerated, clothes disarranged. Knuckles of the right hand were skinned, nose fractured. Major contusion over the right eye. The eyes were closed. Thirty-two caliber bullet was embedded in the left chest wall. Wow, what a battle. I am of the opinion that Hanson was battered by two different people. I think someone arrived after Will Colts was thrown out by the manager, and this someone gave Hanson another beating. Really, boss? Come, let's have dinner. Then you must get over to Hanson's apartment. Boss? Yes, Archie. What have you found at Hanson's place? Well, the desk yielded one thing of interest. Keith's address book. And Marge's name is in there. Apparently, he'd known her before she was married, when she was Marge Van Cott. I see. A married name, King, was added in a different colored ink. Pat's phone number's there, and of course, Don's and Brad's office numbers. There are few bills, but no letters, no clues. Sure. Boss, I've combed the place, and there's not... Hey, wait a minute, I'll call you back. Who's there? Archie, you know I just like the banging of doors. Sign of their breathing. Archie, what happened to you? Target for tonight, Archie Goodwin. Your forehead's bleeding. You better have Fritz fix it. Well, my head can wait. Some guy certainly surprised me at Hanson's. Creased me on the forehead. Good thing I snapped off the lights. He emptied his gun at me. He scuffled and he got away. And then I dug his slug out of a chair. I think it's a thirty-two. But look at this, boss. A little round piece of glass. Found it on the floor. Hmm. Very small, very smooth, and concave or convex in shape. Half an inch diameter. Watch crystal? Don't think so. The edges are too smoothly ground. I'll examine it under a magnifying glass. I'll get it, boss. Oh, hi, Tom. Come in. Mr. Wilcox, boss. Archie, hey, what's happened to you? Somebody tried to scalp me. Good evening, Mr. Wilcox. The red leather chair, Tom. Archie, please finish your report. Did you notice anything else of importance at Hanson's apartment? Is that where this happened? Yeah. Well, there were dozens of gals' photos scattered around. Photos, eh? But no letters, Archie? Not a one. There must be some letters, Archie. Love letters. 
Wherever we have girls' photos and telephone numbers, I assure you they're bound to be love letters. That is what we must find. And then we'd have a motive. Yeah, but where do I look, huh? Go to Hanson's dressing room at the Club Diablo. I have just phoned the place. A female singer is substituting for Hanson. But she won't arrive until supper hour. Mr. Wilcox, accompany Mr. Goodwin, if you please. Keep your eyes open. I need the boy. Then you do love me, boss? Come on, Tom. Let's look at this Club Diablo. Well, I fixed it up with the stage doorman. Here, this is Hanson's dressing room. What a layout. The dressing room's fancier than most of the Met stars get. Uh, Hanson fixed it up himself. A bar, refrigerator, hot plate, television set. He could live here. Some of this stuff could be the new girl singers. I don't think so. Well, let's get to work, Tom. Take the drawers and his dressing table first. What are we looking for, Archie? Mr. Wolf says the motive. He means letters. There's nothing here. Nothing in the desk. New singer must have cleaned it out for her things. Nothing in the books. Don't pass up that refrigerator. Nope. Empty. Hey, there is something here. Back of the ice cube trays. Come here. Well, Mr. Wolf said there had to be letters, and so there are letters. Lots of them. Hey, here's one from Marge. And another. And look here. Really confidential letters from a dozen society gals. There's something else in the back. A bank book. What do you know? A singer like Keith didn't make this much. No, that kind of money didn't come from crooning. This guy Keith was really shaking these babes down. Archie. Someone's coming, listen. Quick, behind the door and grab him. Douse the lights. Oh, run, Mark, run. Hold it, Mom. Well, it's you two. Oh, you dirty rat. Hitting a woman. Tom, what are you and Archie doing here? Well, the letters. Oh, Archie, you found them. Archie, please, give me those uh, letters. Uh-uh, uh-uh, don't touch. I'll just put them safely away in my pocket. Besides, you didn't write all of these. Give them to me. At least give me my letters. I'll tell you what. You go on home and stay there, and we'll leave it up to Mr. Wolf. Tom, take him outside. I want to use this phone. Come along, ladies. Let us oblige Mr. Goodwin. I'll meet you at the stage door, Archie. Right. Hey, the lights. Who's there? Put the phone up, Goodwin. Who are you? Uh, Archie, what happened? Are you hurt? Here, let me help you. Uh, I'm all right. I guess. Ooh. My head. Did you see anybody? No, no, I didn't. I shouldn't have left you. Turn out the lights before I saw him. He whispered. Got away with all the evidence. Where are the girls? I sent them home in a cab. Well, let's get over to Mr. Wolf. This is tough luck. But if I'm not mistaken, his next move will be to have a little get-together with all concerned. Come on. Archie, the door, I guess, are arriving. Excuse me, Tom. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Uh, good one. Good evening, Inspector. Well, Mr. Wolf, got the killer. You said you'd hand him over to me this evening. In time, Inspector. You know Tom Wilcox, of course. Mr. Wilcox. Evening, Inspector. What about the ballistics report, Inspector? The bullet was shot from the same gun that killed Hanson. And that gun, I am certain, came from the home of Pat and Don Parks. Marge and Brad King also had access to it. I have one more bullet here, Inspector. One fired at Mr. Goodwin. I'm sure it was also shot from the same gun. However, it isn't important now. It isn't important? It almost cost me my life. You can make it into a charm if you wish. Inspector Kramer, before our other guests arrive, I must tell you that Mrs. Park lied on the witness stand. She was not with Tom Wilcox at the time Keith Hanson was murdered. In fact, they were absolute strangers. What? Sit down, Inspector. Four other guests are due to arrive any moment. Well, who are the other guests? 
Patricia and Don Park, Marge and Brad King, one or all is involved in the Hanson murder. Archie, do any of these people wear spectacles? No, nope, none of them. You know why this person killed Hanson, Mr. Wolf? First of all, Hanson was a blackmailer. The girl Marge was the current victim. The letters Hanson held with a threat. I'll explain later. Well, then Pat must have thought that Marge killed Hanson to get the letters, and she lied on the stand to save Tom's life because she believed Tom was innocent. Where is this Marge King? I'll have her picked up. Sit down, Inspector. Archie, I believe our guests are arriving now. Come in, come in. How are you? Uh, Good evening. Archie, cheers. Inspector Kramer, Patricia and Don Park. Marge and Brad King, and this is Tom Wilcox. We met at the Club Diablo this afternoon. All right, Mr. Wolf, which one is it? Patience, Inspector. One of these five people is the murderer of Keith Hansen, a killer. What is this nonsense? Please sit down. Mr. Wolf speaking. Go ahead, boss. Any one of you had sufficient motive to have committed the Hansen murder. Not one of you has established a bona fide alibi. You who are actually innocent must tell the truth. Or you shall all suffer as accessories after the fact. Mr. Wolf, you're wasting your time. Marge, several years ago, you were secretly married to Keith Hansen. It lasted but one week. You gave Keith the money to get a divorce from you at Mexico. He didn't, which made you a bigger miss when you married Brad. Keith was all set to blackmail you. He knew your husband Brad was wealthy. Marge, is this true? Yes, Oh, please, Brad, I thought he got the divorce. If I'd known that, I would have killed Hanson myself. Maybe you did kill him. One moment, Inspector. Patricia, you lied on the stand to protect Tom Wilcox here because you believe your sister Marge was guilty of Hanson's murder. Why did you believe her, her guilty? Were you at the scene of the crime? Marge, it's time to tell the truth and clear all this up. You won't be satisfied until you're in jail. Will you shut up? Quiet, please. Go ahead, Marge. All right. Keith Hansen was shot from the bedroom while I stood talking to him in the living room. You went there to buy back your letters? Yes, Pat drove me to his apartment. There was no place to park, so she said she'd drive around the block until I came out. That's why she's never been sure whether I killed him or not. That's right. Because I feel I might have shot him if I'd been in your place. Because of what Hansen did. What was it he did? Keith Hansen demanded $10,000 in exchange for the letters. Pat loaned me the money... So Brad wouldn't know. What? Is that true, Pat? You loaned her 10000 I got to Keith's apartment about 9.30. He looked awful. He obviously had been in a fight. The room was mussed up and his nose was bleeding. Yes, go on. He went to the bedroom to get the letters and came back saying they were gone. I didn't believe him. Keith said he knew who had taken them and he'd have them back by morning. He grabbed the money from me and put it in his pocket. He was just about to tell me who took the letters when there was a shot from the bedroom door. Keith Hanson fell to the floor, but I didn't see anyone. I I wanted to get my money from his coat pocket, Pat's money, but I I couldn't touch him. His staring wide open eyes were horrifying. I ran and I ran. Poor baby, why didn't you tell me? I think you're lying, young lady. You took the gun from your sister's desk, and when Keith Hanson didn't produce the letters, you deliberately shot him. You didn't even offer him any money. You kept it yourself. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, Pat, don't believe him. Inspector Kramer, she's innocent. I know who did it. No, Brad, stop. Oh, Brad, what are you saying? All right, all right, break it up. Yeah, so do I know, Brad. That's why you left the horse show. I thought you were guilty all along. All right, Inspector. Now you know. I don't get this, boss. Inspector, ladies and gentlemen, please. First, which of you had some medical training? Medical training? Well, Keith Hansen and I both went to medical school. Why? That is most enlightening, Mr. Park. Marge and I were nurses' aides during the war. Then perhaps you can interpret this medical phraseology for me. These few lines from this little medical book. Archie, hand it to Don Pop. Will you read it, please? At the top of page 75. It uh, says the form of pernicious anemia commonly found in the human is... No, uh, Don... Hold your hand over your right eye and read on. What? Uh, also common to the many lower... Now, uh, cover the left eye and read with the other. What is this? Go ahead. Well, uh, many, many lower animals and... Uh, and uh, this, this light isn't so good. Step close to me. 
Hmm. Yes, thank you. Mr. Park, here is the contact lens for your right eye. I'm sure you've been tremendously handicapped without it all day. Inspector Don Park is your murderer. Don't move, Park. Keep away, I warn you. Drop that gun, Park. Now, I got his gun. There you are, Inspector. He's all yours now. Okay, come on. Okay, good one. But I'll get out of this. You trapped yourself, Don, by your contact lens. It dropped from your eye during the scuffle with Archie in the Hanson apartment this afternoon. And the gun Archie just took from you is undoubtedly the murder weapon. And the gun that fired the bullets at Wilcox and Archie today. Hey, Tom, are you all right? There's blood on the side of your head. Uh, just graze my scalp. You and I must have hard heads. Well, that's that. Thanks so much, Inspector, for dropping in. Come again, won't you? This is a rough day's work, boss. Send me an RG, please. Right. Hey, what was that business about the medical training? Marge said the body of Keith had staring, wide-open eyes, preventing her from touching the body. But the police found the eyelids closed. How did they get closed? Well, he must have bothered Don, too, and he closed them. His medical training. Right. A layman would never touch the eyes of the dead. Marge couldn't, not even to get back the $10,000. Here's your beer. Why did Don do all this, boss? Obviously, he learned of Hanson's blackmail scheme and was trying to force him to agree to split Marge's $10,000. Don was quite startled a minute ago to learn that Pat, his own wife, put up the money. However, when they heard Marge arriving, Don stepped into the bedroom, found Marge's letters in there, and must have hidden in the closet. And then as Keith Hanson was about to speak Don's name, Don shot him and took Marge's money. Of course, he planned to carry on a blackmailing of Marge himself, thinking the money would come from Brad. Yeah. And you are warming that beer with your hot little hands. Pour it, please. There you are. You've had a rough day, beaten twice, and lost to interesting women. <laughs> Tonight, you may open your bedroom window. <laughs> Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Gladys Williams was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Mary Lansing, Gene Bates, Paul Marion, Barney Phillips, Ken Peters, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Lost Heir. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Transcribe. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Hello? Is this Mr. Wolf? If it's for me, I'm not here. Hello? What if it's a case? If it is, tell him no. I will not. Hello, hello? Confound you, Archie, do as I say. Uh uh-uh. uh. Hello? Hello, is this Mr. Wolf's resident? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh, I am in very much trouble. Could I see you, please, immediately? Well, now, yes. What kind of trouble, miss? Give me that phone, Archie. No. Hello? Uh, sorry, I had to turn the radio down too loud, you know. Oh, uh, may I see you right away? Well, I, uh... Oh, I give you $1,000 as a retainer fee. Yes, 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 indeed. I'll take the case. Come right over. The address is 601 West 35th Street. I cannot, Mr. Wolf. I just cannot come there. Well, where do you live? Hello? Boss, that was a shot. Hello? Hello? (laughs) 
ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> usually refer to this story as the case of room 304. The girl on the phone had a decided foreign accent. I wasn't quite able to decide what nationality she was, but it sounded like French. Anyway, there was what sounded like a shot, and then dead silence for a second or two. Hello? 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 Well, Archie, another woman? Bah! Mr. Wolf, I heard a shot, and then the line clicked off. Trouble. Women always trouble. I said I heard a shot on the phone. Indeed. I'm going over to her hotel and see what goes on. By all means, Mr. Wolf. Yeah. Huh? Now that I've been insulted to the tone of being called a radio... I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf, but we needed the money, and this was $1,000. If you'll excuse me, I have to attend to my orchids, Mr. Wolf. What about the girl, the shot? Hmm, fascinating, isn't it? You figure it out. Okay. I've got to get over there. Room 304, Paul Hotel. So long, boss. Good luck, Mr. Wolf. Please phone me from time to time. <laughs> 301, 302, 304. Ah, what do you know? The door's open. Oh, hello. Sir, who are you? Archie Goodwin, now it's your turn. I'm Jay Bream, pilot for Jan Airlines. You seen... Yeah, I guess you have. This girl's been shot. Oh, that's all? Yeah, dead. Real dead. What do you know about this? I don't know anything. Say, who are you? Looks like you're in a spot, pal. You better start digging, haven't you? I got here a few seconds before you did. I, I knocked on the door... The door was partially open, so I pushed it wide. And... Go on. Well, there was no answer. I, I couldn't see anyone, so I came in, and well, there she was. You know her? Well, yes. Why do you think I came here? That's what I'm trying to find out. Look, what right have you got asking me all these questions? What's it to you? Did you ever hear of Nero Wolf? Of course, who hasn't? Like I said before, I'm Archie Goodwin, Wolf's assistant. Now, would you rather talk, or should I call the police? I've told you all I know. Who is she? Helen Rennie. French? I don't know. European, anyway. Why'd you come here tonight? I have a dinner date with her. You mean you did have? Yeah. Let's turn her over. There. Hmm. Had an automatic in her hand. Yeah. I never saw it before. Hey, hey, I I wouldn't use the phone. Fingerprint. It's okay. I'll use this handkerchief. Who are you calling? My boss. Archie, boss. Archie, I thought you were near a wolf. You sound very much like him. Please, boss, be serious. Oh, but I am. I'm here at the girl's apartment, the one who called me. She's dead. Beautiful? Yes, was very beautiful. She would be. Hmm. How did it happen? Shot. Neat round hole in her right temple. She's married and looks like she shot herself. When I turned her over, I saw a wedding ring on her finger and a thirty-two automatic still in her hand. Are you alone? No, a fellow named Jay Bream, a pilot. He was here when I arrived. No one heard the shot? Apparently not. No one showed up yet. Very interesting. Uh, what do you do now, Mr. Wolf? Should I call Inspector Kramer? No, say nothing to anyone. Get over here at once. And bring Mr. Breen, the pilot, with you. Goodbye. <laughs> That's all you know about it, Mr. Breen? That's right, Mr. Wolf. Just like I told Mr. Goodwin here. The whole thing sounds... Hey, I just thought of something. Pray tell, Archie. It can't be suicide. Oh, and why not? How can a dead woman hang up a phone? (laughs) You finally arrived at that, Archie. Amazing. Of course she couldn't. She was murdered. Murdered? Yes, Mr. Bream. But I, I thought she committed suicide. Please, Mr. Bream, it'll be better if you don't think. Where are you staying? 
321 West 19th, apartment 5. And your job? I've 10 days vacation. Started yesterday. One thing, Mr. Bream, I suggest you don't leave town. Furthermore, talk is not advisable. I strongly recommend that you adopt precautions. Yes, sir. Show Mr. Bream to the door, Archie. Yes, sir. Right this way. Good night, Mr. Wolf. Good night. I didn't want to tell you in front of Mr. Bream, but I found this in her purse when I sent him for a sheet to cover the body. Hmm. Thousand dollar check. Made out to Mr. Nero Wolf. Well, boss? I think it's time we phoned Inspector Kramer. Should I? Who else, Archie? Who else? My apologies. I forgot how heavy that phone really is. Archie. Oh. Um, do you want me to talk to the inspector? I'll do the talking. Should I hold the phone for you? You can get me some beer. Inspector Kramer. One moment. Here you are. Is Nero Wolf, Inspector? I think you had better go over to the Paul Hotel. Yeah, why? I believe you'll find a dead woman there. A dead woman? What is this, a gag, Wolf? I'm afraid not, Inspector. Well, how did you know about it? Have you been over there? Telepathy, Inspector. Mental to... Wolf, I'm too busy today to listen to nonsense. Telepathy, don't give me that kind of stuff. If I find a body, I'll lock you and Goodwin up. You watch your blood pressure, Inspector. Never mind about my blood pressure. One thing, Inspector. Yeah? Would you hold off the press for the present? Why? What are you holding back, Wolf? Will you stop your idiotic jabbing to what I ask? Okay. By the way, Wolf, I suppose you know the girl's room number. Naturally, Inspector. It is room 304. So hurry. Oh. <laughs> Dear Inspector Cream, he's so fond of me. Archie. Yes, sir? I suggest you call the bank in the morning and find the person who is handling Miss Rene's account. Try to bring all her canceled checks over here. And what if they won't hand them over? Then Kramer will get an order issued to do so. Simple? Coming. Well, where's Wolf? Where do you think he'd be? In his big chair. Good evening, Inspector. Hmm. I expected you before this, Inspector. What kept you so long? If I told you I had a flat tire, would you believe me? <laughs> now start giving, Wolf. What did you know about the dead girl? Inspector Kramer, do sit down. Relax. Nervous tension is such a deadly thing. Now listen here, Wolf. Would you like some beer? Most soothing, you know. Come on, what's the dope on this case? Fill the inspector in on the details, Archie. I was here talking to the girl over the phone. There was a shot, and then I went over to her hotel and found her the same as you did, dead on the floor. And the phone was placed back on the hook. Come on, Wolf. There's more to this than that. Let's have it. Really, Inspector? Who was she? You don't know? I mean, what do you know about her? Now get this straight, Wolf. I... Please, Wolf. What's this all about? A girl's been shot. Her name is Helen Rennie. What's the dope? Did you have a ballistics report made on the gun? Well, not in this short time, but I will. How did you make out your report? Suicide, naturally. Archie was talking to the girl on the phone at the time she was shot. So she chooses to kill herself talking to your assistant. Why, you big, flat-footed... Inspector, precisely how can a dead girl hang up a phone? Why, she, uh... You see, Inspector, quite impossible. And now I suggest you make out your report, murder. Murder? Wolf, tell me, why is it you're always mixed up in these cases? That, Inspector, would be as difficult to answer as it would be to convince Archie of the danger of the female of the species. Oh, what's the use? No one ever answers my questions. I give up. Oh, Inspector, I do hope you will bring the girls' cancer checks tomorrow if they don't turn them over to us. What? The inspector is just going, Archie. Please see him to the door. I'm not helpless. Good night, inspector. Good night. Please, boss, can't we have just a little air in here? You've been out all the morning, isn't that enough? Well, get me an oxygen tank to use in here. Did you contact the bank regarding the girl's account? I did. 
I finally talked to the head of the accounting department. He told me about her personal agent here, Mr. Renfrew. He was handling all her financial affairs. Went to see Renfrew. What did he have to say? Very little. But he seemed very upset when he learned of her death. I didn't tell him how she died. He said Helen Rene was here buying technical equipment for her government in Europe. Technical equipment? What kind? Laboratory stuff. Did she make any definite purchases? From the Arrow Company here in town, a Mr. Paul Morio is the head man of this Arrow Company. Mr. Renfrew, her agent, gave us quite a bit of an argument about coming over here today. Said it was very irregular to show bank statements. But he finally gave in. I didn't need the inspector's help. What time do we have the honor? He said he'd be here at noon. Noon? You know I'd be busy at that time. Well, I didn't think you'd let... Archie, you never do. Your lunch will keep just this once, Mr. Wolf. Not this once, nor any other time, Archie. You know I have lunch precisely at noon. Not after, not before. Understand? Yeah. I surmise you have the address of the Arrow Lab Supply Company. Yes, sir. You want me to go have a talk with Mr. Morio who runs the place? Sometimes, Archie. Your conclusions are fantastic. I'm leaving. One thing more. And? After you return from your visit with Mr. Mario, would you be so kind as to entertain Mr. Renfrew until after my lunch? And don't stand there with the door open. Sorry, boss. I'll go out through the coal chute. Do forgive me. Arrow Supply Company. Well... Oh, uh, Mr. Morio in? Yeah, I'm Morio. My name's Archie, Archie Goodwin. What can I do for you, Goodwin? I'm Nero Wolf's assistant. You've heard of Nero Wolf? I don't get around much. Tell me about him. How should I answer that? Any way you like. Nero Wolf's a detective. Did you ever hear of a Miss Rene? Stop shadow boxing, Mr. Goodwin. What's on your mind? I understand you sold Miss Rene some laboratory equipment. Is it a jail term? Now listen, Mr. Goodwin, I have a nice, respectable business here, so what do you want? Spill it. When'd you last see Miss Rene? Two days ago. Talked to her since? Once on the phone. What time was that? Yesterday morning. You called her from your office here? No, from my hotel room. Now, look, let's quit playing cat and mouse. Why all the questions? Miss Rene is dead. Dead? Who did it? Now, wait a minute. You don't think I had anything to do with it? What makes you think anyone did it? It'd be the only reason cops would get into it. You know, Mario, I'm beginning to wonder just how long you've been in the lab supply business. You know what a retort is? And don't tell me it's a snappy comeback. Now, what's the matter, Goodwin? What's eating you? Look, Morio, I came here to find out something about Helen Rennie. Just what sort of equipment did you sell her? It was heavy stuff, heavy chemical work. Where is it? We don't have samples, just pictures. Yeah, we ship it direct. Oh, so the purchaser never sees what he's buying. That's right. Could I see what she purchased? I'm afraid not, Goodwin. Besides, what difference would it make? Did Miss Rennie see what she bought? No, I already explained that. Now, I'm busy, Goodwin, so if you don't mind... Okay, I'll run along. Good afternoon, Mr. Morio. I'm sure we'll meet again soon. Uh, uh. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Yes, Archie? Just left the Arrow Lab Supply Company, and as far as I'm concerned, something's rotten in Denmark. Indeed. This guy, Morio, who runs the company, doesn't sound like a legitimate lab supply man. I think he's running some kind of a racket. What makes you believe that, Archie? Just not the type to be in a legit business. Things just don't jive. And she didn't see what she bought. You believe, then, that he would have reason to want Miss Rennie out of the way? Yeah. Guy made me see red. I wanted to take a poke at him. Archie, you're an idiotic hothead. He said it was all heavy lab stuff she bought, and it was too late for me to see it. Forget it now. Get over here as soon as you can. Immediately? Immediately. Have you forgotten you have an appointment with Mr. Renfro at noon? Goodbye. Coming, coming. Hello, Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Renfrew. Well, well, who's this? My goodness, come in. Yes, uh, come in, my dear. Thank you. Mr. Goodwin, I brought my secretary along. I hope you don't mind. Mind? Why, Mr. Renfrew, how could anyone object Mr. to... Mr. Goodwin, uh, Miss Bennett. Oh, Miss Bennett? First name? Jean. Do you always use this approach, Mr. Goodwin? Only at noontime, and my name's Archie. Well, this is a happy surprise. Please sit down, Jean. Allow me. Thank you. Well. Wasn't it Mr. Renfrew you wanted to see? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Wolf will be down shortly, Mr. Renfrew. Please be seated. Thank you. Is something wrong, Mr. Goodwin? Not a 
thing, Miss Bennett, not from where I sit. I don't believe a word he says, miss. His judgment concerning women is not to be trusted. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. You're so kind. Mr. Wolf, Miss Bennett. How do you do? Mr. Wolf? Uh, Mr. Renfro, I presume. Yes. Now we can uh, get down to business at hand, Mr. Renfro. Yes, yes, by all means. I don't understand why we couldn't have discussed this on the phone, Mr. Wolf. The whole thing is highly irregular. Of course, I know you're trying to do your duty, but... Uh... I prefer not to discuss the dead girl's business affairs on the phone, Mr. Renfro. You should appreciate that. Yes, yes, I, I see. Now, uh, <clears throat> what is it you wish to know? How long have you known Helen Rene? Mm, about a month. When's the last time you talked to her? Yesterday. What time? Why, about 2.30. I called her from my room. She was here on government business. You uh, brought the cancel checks? Mm. Uh, here you are, Mr. Wolf. Hmm. Quite sizable amounts, Mr. Renfro. Very interesting indeed. Yes? Yeah? You see, Miss Renee made some very large purchases, Mr. Wolf, and of course they were all quite legitimate. Hmm. Would you mind if I kept these checks overnight? Well, uh, I... Thank uh... you, Mr. Renfro. By the way, was Miss Rennie right or left-handed? Why, uh, left-handed, Mr. Wolf? Why? Just inquisitive. Now, if you would excuse me, Miss Bennett, Mr. Renfro, I have a very urgent appointment. Well, if I can be of any more service, don't hesitate to call on me, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, sir. Oh, dear. Poor Miss Renee. I hope the person who did this dreadful thing is dealt with properly. Indeed. I, uh, I must run along now. Yes, this way. Must you go too, Miss Bennett? <laughs> Good day, Mr. Wolf. I must, and Good day. See you soon, Miss Bennett. Well, boss, what do you think? Isn't she a beauty? I'm sure I'm not a fair judge, Archie. Do you happen to know where the Mario Warehouse is? Why, yes. It's at the other end of town near the river at... Oh, no, not again. Nine o'clock tonight. Okay, okay. I suppose you want me to take a gander at what's in the warehouse, break in like a burglar? Archie, if your mind were free of women, I do believe you could reach phenomenal heights in this your chosen profession. around here with a bunch of old tubes and glassware. I hope Wolf knows what he's doing. I don't. All right. Stand where you are and reach. What's it? Flip the lights on, Joe. That's better. Now, sing up and tell me what you're doing here. I beg your pardon. I'm a little deaf. I couldn't hear you. I said, what are you doing here? Oh, Ellen. I was supposed to meet her here. Makes sense, will you? You think I can? Uh, what's the matter, Mac? Visit this. Yeah, and this bird refuses to talk. Well, then knock it out of uh, You two talk it over. Don't bother telling me how it comes out. Hey, wait a minute, you. You ain't leaving. All right, you win. This night is just full of surprises. Ain't it? Let's see what you're talk. Hey, who do you think you're shoving around? Just full of questions, ain't you? You know, someday you're going to end up by getting into trouble. It's illegal to push people around. I guess you better understand. <laughs> hey, are you kidding? Get the point? Now, get up. Now, talk. Why, you... You're yeah, still in a play, huh? Uh... He's out like a light, Mac. What are you going to do with him? You won't do any more snooping around here. You know something, Mac? You've got an awful disposition. I'm actually scared of you. You're that mean. Yeah. Now, dump him outside. Hey, boss... It's me, Archie, remember? Archie, these interruptions are detestable. Can't you see I'm busy? Is that you, Archie? I've been busy too, boss. Look at my face. I had an accident. From your appearance, I'd say that someone else had been busier. All right, Mr. Goodwin, as long as you insist upon interrupting my meditation, start at the beginning. Mr. Wolf, I arrived at the warehouse. I went inside. I saw a lot of packing cases and a bunch of old glassware, worn-out junk. Two men jumped me. I came to lying in the alley. I staggered to a cab and made it home. End of story. Archie, your repertoire of words is most astonishing. 
And your description of Morio's warehouse is without doubt most enlightening. I thought you'd like it. And now, Archie, I suggest you get Fritz to give you a piece of beefsteak for that eye of yours. And after that? I've arranged a gathering for five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Then I shall repair to my bed to suffer in silence. You should be more careful on these nefarious expeditions. You might get hurt sometime. Yes, I've been a careless fellow, Mr. Wolf. Good night. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Pleasant dreams. Mr. Wolf, I'm glad you called me early. I was just about to leave town for a couple of days. Uh, what is this conference about? Not at this time, sir, if you please. I'm glad you could come along, Miss Bennett. Well, I'll be happy to assist in any way I can, Mr. Goodwin. Archie. Right. Well, good evening, Mr. Morio. I knew we'd meet again. It's no fault of mine, Goodwin. Please come in. Come in, Mr. Morio. You don't want to keep the rest of the guests waiting. What do you want with me? What do I want? Nothing. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Morio. Sit down, sir. Take the red leather chair. For special guests, Mr. Morio. Yeah. Now, gentlemen, you're probably wondering why I asked you here. Naturally, you know it has to do with the death of Helen Rene. Yeah, well, we... Mr. Morio, I understand you and Miss Rene had some business transactions that involved quite a sum. That she purchased laboratory equipment. That's right. Archie told me that your warehouse contained nothing but second-hand junk. It was a shame, Mr. Mario, that this shipment was delayed by a shipping shortage. Otherwise, you might have gotten away with it. Is this why you called me over here? It is immaterial to the case at hand. Actually, I'm only interested in Helen Rennie's murder. Hey, wait a minute. You don't think I did it? Didn't you? No. Mr. Wolf, I admit everything you said about the equipment. But I've had no part in any murder. I see. Mr. Breen, you are a pilot of a war flyer. If you had shot the girl and wanted it to look like suicide, in which hand would you put the gun? Why, uh, her right hand. Indeed. Where did you first meet Miss Rene? Boarding the plane at uh, Orley Field, Europe. Mm-hmm. Mr. Renfrew. Now look here, Wolf, this has gone too far. I won't be put through any third degree. If you'll excuse me, I, I have to get to the dip. Sit down, Renfro. Well, I, I... Mr. Renfro, I'm astonished that anyone would be as amateurish as they were in this case. I don't understand. Could it be that you killed Miss Rene and attempted to make it look like suicide because she was about to tell me that through forgeries, her bank account was $50,000 short? Well, what reason would I have to kill her? You told me yourself you phoned Miss Rene from your hotel the day she died. Yet there was no outgoing calls charged to your account. Oh, this is nonsense. Ridiculous. She suddenly became suspicious of you. And you are probably the only person here who knew that she was left-handed. Well, what does that have to do with it? She was shot through the right temple, Mr. Renfrew, while talking on the telephone. With a gun in her left hand, wouldn't it be awkward for her to twist her arm around her face and shoot herself? In your excitement, you forgot you had shot her in the right temple. And what else do you know, Mr. Wolf? That you once worked in Europe where you met Miss Rene, arranged to represent her in this country. Only you would know how much she had in the account here. I've heard enough of this nonsense. Yesterday, you made a statement. Quote, I hope whoever did this dreadful thing is dealt with properly. Only the police and Archie and I knew Miss Rene had not died naturally. How did you know that? Unless you are the murderer. Don't make a move, any of you. I was forced to eliminate her. She accidentally learned about the shortage and she became most unreasonable about it. Phoned you about it. Oh, dear me. So utterly weary of these melodramatics. Put up that gun. I've spent 15 years sweating, trying to get enough money to live the way that I want. And now I have it, and neither you nor anybody is going to take it away from me. I'll kill anyone who tries to follow me out of this house. All right, Mr. Wolf, stand back. Mr. Renfrew, don't, please. I will take that gun from you and... Oh, Mr. Renfrew. What the... Well, Inspector, you certainly arrived at the proper time, even if you are late. What do you mean, late? I've been standing out there listening to Renfrew for five minutes. Boy, that's too close. Glad he missed you, Inspector. Well, good night, Mr. Wolf. You're not so fast, Mr. Morio. 
I suggest you hold Mr. Mario here for swindling Miss Rennie and her government. And uh, Archie. Yes, sir? Do you know how to care for a person who has fainted? I certainly do. Then look behind you. Your pretty Miss Bennett has collapsed. I'll get it. Hello? Is this Miss Jean Bennett? Yes. Sergeant Goodwin there? Well, well, yes. Just a minute. It's for you, Archie. For me? Mm -hmm. No one knows I'm here. Hello? I thought I'd find you there, Archie. How'd you know I was here? I figured that by the skill you expressed on reviving a patient from a deep faint. Archie, on the way home, I want you to stop by the delicatessen and uh, pick up the following things. Ham, beer, cheese, olives. My boss. How do you know you were here? Pure deduction. That's why he's called the world's greatest detective. Really? Come here. Yes. Archie, you shouldn't do... Archie. Archie, you listening to me? Oh, well, guess you didn't hear a word of it. (laughs) Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Virgil Reimer was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Lucille Alex, Val Brown, Bill Johnstone, Hal Gerard, Betty Lou Gerson, Vic Rodman, and Ed Bailey. This is Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Just listen to the stars on this Sunday's big show. Jimmy Durante, Ethel Berman, Milton Berle, and Gordon McRae. Plus, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. Your MC on the big show, of course, is the glamorous Tallulah. And you're invited. And on Theater Guild on the Air this Sunday, you'll hear the comedy The Man in Possession, starring Rex Harrison and Lily Palmer. Don't forget, hear Ethel Merman on the big show Sunday on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Who? Who is this? Who wants to speak to Mr. Wolf? Nobody. Nobody? I said that. Hang up. It's late and it's too cold. And even if it weren't, I would not consider for one moment moving from this room. Please, Mr. Wolf, I can't hear a thing this old gentleman's saying. Does it matter? You heard what I said? No. Now, what did you say? You were late because she was killed. Who was killed? I can't hear you. What is it about, Archie? He says he was due here an hour ago, but she was killed. Who was killed? What does he want? Uh, Do you want us to solve the crime? I say, do you want us to find out who killed her? Oh. He says he knows who did it, but he has an important message for you. Well, then come right over. We'll be waiting, Mr. Jenkins. Archie, why do you insist on taking every silly little case? Because, boss, we need to recover from March 15th. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This case I like to refer to as the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Perhaps a better title would be Wolf Goes a-Hunting. 
For in a way, this was one of those unusual instances in which my boss, of his own free will and without any coercion, actually decided to leave the house and go to the scene of the crime. It started when the strange old gentleman who phoned us finally arrived. Well, there's our client, Mr. Wolf. Evening. It's me. Who's me? Oh, I, I just phoned you. I, I'm Jenkins. I got a dispatch for Nero Wolf. Oh, you're Jenkins. Well, come in, come in. Uh, Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Jenkins. Says he has a dispatch for you. Yep. Yeah. Are you Wolf? I am. Where is the dispatch from? Don't know. You, you don't know? How come? Oh, I know, but I'm supposed to say I don't. See? That's my job. What is? Just to say I don't know. What about the matter? Yeah, who was killed? Oh, my goodness. It was a terrible thing. We were just crossing the turnpike, and this fella come at us out of nowhere. The killer? Yeah. Must have been drunk, I guess. Well, how did it happen? Did he shoot her, stab her? Oh, no, no. He ran into her with his car. And she was only nine years old. Your granddaughter? No, no, it was Bessie. But the police got him. I, I have to appear, I guess. Probably get 90 days, he will. For murder? Murder. Was somebody murdered? I must have missed something. Look, we're talking about Bessie, and what do you want us to do about it? Nothing. Bessie's my old horse. Oh, no. Uh, but say, who was it that was murdered? Nobody yet. Good night, Mr. Jenkins. I thought you said it was important. It might be. At least that's the way I was told. What might be? Uh, this here letter I was bringing to you. This is dispatch. Well, got to get along now. Uh, goodbye. Well, get him. What a pixie. What is in the envelope? Mr. Wolf, look. Five $100 bills. And the note says, Mr. Wolf, your services are desperately needed. Come up this weekend as my guest. Signed, E. Malott. Edwin Malott, the wealthy manufacturer. Hmm. Well, looks as though you're going out this weekend. Well, our GP, my respects to Mr. Malott, and I hope you enjoy the weekend. Good night. <laughs> Something certainly phony about this. There's no party going on here tonight. Yes? What is it? Is this the Malotte place? It is. What do you want? My name's Goodwin. I'm a guest of Mr. Malotte's. A guest? Yes, he invited me down for the weekend. Weekend? Oh. Well, you better step in, please, Mr. Goodwin. Quite a bolt you've got on that door. Yes, isn't it? Just sit down there, please. I'll get Mr. Malotte. He's in the library. Oh, here he is. This is Mr. Goodwin, sir. Says he's come down for the weekend. Mr. Goodwin? Good evening. You've come for the weekend, you say? Well, yes. Wasn't that the idea, Mr. Malotte? Well, I, uh, I don't understand, Mr. Goodwin. Didn't you send me this note asking me to come here? Note? I did not. Oh, well. Well, this is my personal note stationery. But I don't recall sending this. I didn't even type it. And I'm in the habit of signing my name with a pen, not with a typewriter. E. Malott. You're certainly Edward Malott. Yes. Services are desperately needed. What does this mean? What services? Who are you, Mr. Goodwin? Are you serious? I'm a private investigator. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. Oh, indeed. Nero Wolfe, eh? I know of him, yes, indeed. And you really don't know anything about this note? I do not. Are you having a weekend party here? <laughs> I most certainly am not. Then who sent this? And there were five $100 bills as a retainer. I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, uh, Dorothy. Yes? Would you step in here, please? Uh, Miss Davis is my private secretary. Uh, she may know something about this. Yes, Mr. Malott. What is this? I... Uh, Dorothy. Oh. Dorothy, this is Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mr. Goodwin? Well, I... How do you do, Miss Davis? Uh, yes, yes, well. Uh, Mr. Goodwin is assistant to Nero Wolf. You don't say. Nero Wolf, the detective? Well, I've heard a great deal about him. And about you, too, Mr. Goodwin. Well, now I'm mighty glad to hear you say that, Miss Davis. Uh, Mr. Goodwin has Edward, a note here. Is anything wrong, Edward? I heard voices. Oh, do we have company? Nothing is wrong, Eva. I was calling Dorothy, that's all. Oh, oh this is Mr. Goodwin, Eva. My wife, Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mrs. Malad? Mr. Goodwin, I... Oh, yes, how, how do you do? Uh, now, as I was about to say, Dorothy, yes. Mr. Goodwin... What's going on? Mr. Goodwin, uh, this is my son, Larry. Good evening. What's wrong? Uh, Mr. Goodwin has been invited here for the weekend. He has an invitation supposedly written by me. At least uh, it's on my stationery. Look at this, Dorothy. Know anything about this note? No. No. I certainly didn't write it. But it's my personal note paper and my signature is typewritten. I'd uh, never do that. Well, somebody sent it. Who's Jenkins? Jenkins? 
Never heard of him. A little dried up old man. He delivered it to us. Yeah, maybe it didn't even come from this house. I'm positive that it didn't. Never heard of Jenkins. You have a typewriter here, of course. Yes. I'd like to see it. Uh, certainly, Mr. Goodwin, in the library. How far have you come, Mr. Goodwin? From New York, Manhattan. Oh, and it's such a dreadful night, too. Yes, yes, and it is rather late. Late? It's only 7.30. Why not stay here for the night? Plenty of room? Uh, yes, Mr. Goodwin, plenty of room. Well, I, I don't really think that's necessary. I, uh... On the other hand, it would be a tough drive back to the city in this storm. I'll accept your hospitality, Mr. Mallott. Very good. Oh, where uh, Jeffrey's... Show Mr. Goodwin to the uh, east wing and uh, take care of his car. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Goodwin. You, you, you mean you're all going to retire now? I haven't even had my dinner. We retire very early here. But Jeffreys will prepare anything you want. Good night. <laughs> Speaking. Archie, boss. Well, I'm here at Malat's place, but there ain't no party. What happened? Are you in the right house? I'm afraid I am. They've all gone to bed. Weird bunch. His wife, who looks very sickly and I think wants to say something to me alone, and Larry the son and Malat's secretary, Dorothy Davis. She has me bothered a bit. How unusual. Especially if she's pretty. A beauty. But she seems to know all about me. Hmm. You better come home, Archie. I can see you're in no condition to handle this case properly. Give them the money back. Oh, I forgot to tell you. They don't want me here. Malat didn't send the note. No one here knows anything about it, so we can keep the dough. Interesting indeed. The circumstances would indicate that you should stay there and wait for it to happen. For what to happen? For whatever it is the fates have conspired to have happen there while your shiny little ego is in the midst of it. Bye. Who is it? It's Archie Goodwin, Mrs. Mallott. Come in. Come in, please. I saw you give me the eye when I was about to leave. I've been waiting till I felt sure they were all asleep. Now, what's up? I wrote you that note. I sent for you. How do I know that? Old man Jenkins is a scissor and knife sharpener who happens along every month or so. They wouldn't know him. I put five $100 bills in the envelope. Okay, why? My life is in danger. I've been threatened. I received three notes through the mail. They were all postmarked in New York City. Could I see them? Here they are. All typewritten. Hmm. The first one reads, there is no love for you in Great Gables. The second, why stay on in the face of death? And the third, the time is shorter than you think. Do you think this is a, well, an inside job, Mrs. Muller? Well, at first I didn't. But lately I've come to think it is. What caused you to think that? For some time I've been having severe spells. I thought it was indigestion. But then it occurred to me that I always broke out in cold perspiration. I was left horribly weakened, terribly thirsty. Thirsty? You fear you're being poisoned? Yes. And since the thought came to me, I've been living in fear. Fear of every bite of food or drink. It's so shattered my nerves that I have to take these yellow sleeping capsules to even close my eyes. Well, here's your husband and his secretary and your son, Larry. Larry is my stepson. Which one do you suspect? The secretary, Dorothy, or my husband, or both. What's the motive? Oh, well, they're in love. She's been here over two years, and they've spent most of their time together. The idea never occurred to me till last week. And when I watched them, it, it was quite obvious. Anybody else know about these three notes? Oh, no. Then I'll keep them for a while. Good night, Mrs. Mallott, and don't worry. What are you doing, Mr. Goodwin, snooping around in Father's library? Well, Larry, I was just trying to find out if this Remington was the machine you used to type those notes. What? What notes? The notes you sent your stepmother. Why... I don't know anything about any notes. Then why were you so startled? I'm not startled. I just... Well, uh, why would I threaten her? Well, so you do know about them. I didn't mention the contents of the notes. I just happened to see them on the table in her sitting room. You don't care too much about your stepmother, do you? Oh, she's all right. You don't care too much about Dorothy either, do you? I certainly don't. Why not? Well, I don't like her tactics making a fool out of my father. If anybody here sent those notes, she did. You think Dorothy would have a motive? I certainly do. Of course, you wouldn't have a motive, would you? No. Well, I'm inclined to think you would. 
Well, just what motive would I have? You don't seem to like any woman who's too close to your father. Maybe because you'd resent anyone sharing in the estate if your father died. If I were you, Mr. Goodwin, I'd leave. Tonight. And the sooner the better. Good night. Oh, Argy. Arg- oh, confounded boy. Yes, Argy? You have the wrong number. This is Sherlock Holmes speaking. Why don't you go to bed like the others? You don't have to push it. It'll happen. Eva Malotte thinks she's being slowly poisoned. Suspects her husband and his secretary. He could be right. What are the symptoms she suffers? Gastric disturbances, weakness, thirst. Indeed. What about the son? Have any ideas? He doesn't like his stepmother and is decidedly against his father's secretary, Dorothy. He knew all about the notes Mrs. Mallott had received. Saw them on her dressing table. He believes Dorothy's the culprit. Then I should say that Dorothy should be the next on your list. You can say that again. Be careful, Archie. Use your head this time. Incidentally, Larry advised me to leave the place tonight. Bit of a threat it was, too. What shall I do, Mr. Anthony? Do nothing. The trouble will come to you. Bye. Oh. Hello there, Mr. Mallard. I thought you turned in for the night. It's quite obvious you thought so, Mr. Goodwin. What are you doing in the library? Why, just looking for something to read. You'll find the books all around the walls, not on my desk. Well, I was looking for a particular kind of book. I'm very much interested in poisons. Poisons? Yeah, a hobby of mine. You happen to have any books on toxicology? I do not. And what's that book on the fourth shelf right beside you? Why, I... I uh... Oh, oh toxicology... Where did that come from? Never saw it before. Hmm... Uh, perhaps it was in that uh, assorted collection I bought a couple of weeks ago. I uh, hadn't noticed it. Larry probably put them on the shelf. Mr. Mallard, how long have you known Dorothy, your secretary? Uh, a little over two years. Did it ever occur to you that she might be well infatuated in love with you? What? Well, of all the... Now, see here. I don't know what you're up to, and I don't know how you got hold of my stationery to write that fake note. It isn't a but fake I... note, Mallard. I'm only trying to find out what's back of it. Mr. Goodwin, there is nothing going on here that requires the services of a detective, and Dorothy is not in love with me. I didn't say she was. I asked you if you thought she might be. Well, since this conversation seems to concern me, I suppose I am at liberty to come in. Oh, you're still up too, Miss Davis. Did you hear what this man said, Dorothy? Yes, I did, Mr. Mallott. And I'd like to have a few words alone with Mr. Goodwin, if you don't mind. Mr. Goodwin, would you mind coming with me for a few minutes? No, not at all. And... Well, it's rather late, Mr. Mallott. Don't you think you should retire? It's a heavy day tomorrow. Well, uh, uh, yes. Yes, I suppose I should. And please, don't let this upset you. Mr. Goodwin has been misinformed. I'll straighten him out. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. The bar is right across the hall. I'll fix you a nice, soothing drink. That'll be nice. Well, now, what would you like, Mr. Goodwin? In the way of drinks? Oh, well, some seven-up. Really? <laughs> Just sit down over there. Okay, what do you want to talk about? Well, where did you get the idea that I was in love with Mr. Millat? First, suppose you tell me if you are in love with him. Yes, I am. But until a few minutes ago, he wasn't even aware of it. I worship him and his work. I never wanted him to know because he's married. It would have caused trouble and I'd have had to leave here. But now he knows it's true. Well, now that he knows, what will happen? Well, I'm going to leave tonight. Now. I see. And since I don't own a car, Mr. Goodwin, I'm going to ask you to do me a very great favor. Will you run me into New York? I want to leave without a word. If I wait till morning, I'll have to explain to Mr. Mallard and... Well, that would be most embarrassing, Archie. Oh, now it's Archie. You, you don't really mind, do you? No, no, I guess I don't. I should, maybe, but, uh... Don't you like your drink? What'd you put in this drink? What do you mean? What'd you dope it with? <laughs> Archie, why would I do that? Might be several reasons. There's nothing in that drink. No? Then suppose you drink it. Why? <laughs> Give it to me. I'll throw it out. If you want another drink, fix it yourself. I'll have my things ready in five minutes. Are you going to take me? Sure. Certainly I'm going to take you. But are you sure you have to go tonight? I must go tonight. Now. Wish I knew why. Mr. Wolf's always so right. What? 
Just talking to myself. Dorothy! Larry! Jeffrey! Come upstairs! What's happened? Call Dr. Hauser. Something terrible has happened to Eva. <laughs> Well, Dr. Hauser? Oh, poor Mrs. Malott. No, there's nothing to be done now. It's all over. Eva. Eva. You'd better lie down, Mr. Malott. I'll phone and take care of everything. I'll be here if you need me. I uh, have to make out the certificate. Yes, come along, Mr. Malott. Just a minute. You too, Larry. I don't want to make this any more unpleasant for you, but, Doctor, just what are you going to put on the certificate as the cause of death? Acute gastritis. Is that what you've been treating her for? Well, she's had several attacks lately. I'd warned her to be cautious of her diet. And that was wise advice, too. Did you know about these attacks, Mr. Malott? Yes, I did. And you, Dorothy? Yes, I knew. And you knew also, Larry? Uh, no, I, I knew she hadn't been feeling well. How long had Mrs. Malott been suffering from insomnia? Oh, a year at least. I prescribed Nemitol. In yellow capsules? Of course. I wrote a prescription ever so often calling for 12 capsules. You all knew about that, of course. I thought so. And would this be the prescription, this little box of capsules here on... Well. What's the matter, Mr. Goodwin? That box was open on this nightstand when we stepped into this room. All right, let's have the box, Mr. Malad. Thank you. Why'd you pick it up? Because I... I didn't want the stigma of suicide on Eva's name, nor mine. Suicide? Yes. Eva had this prescription filled yesterday morning. The dose is one at bedtime. Twelve capsules. She took one last night. I glanced at the open box when I came into the room, and there were only eight capsules left. I... I knew instantly what had happened. She'd taken an overdose. Doctor, do you think three capsules would be sufficient to cause her death? I doubt it very much. So do I. Mrs. Malott didn't die from an overdose of sleeping capsules. She was poisoned. Poisoned? Are you crazy? By whom? By you. Or Dorothy. Or Larry. No. I didn't do it. I didn't write those notes. What notes? Mrs. Malott had received three notes threatening her life if she didn't leave this house. Each of you had a motive, so I'm sending this body to the coroner for an immediate autopsy. I won't permit it. The police will see to it. You have no choice. Yes, Archie. What now? Do you know who did it? How do you know anything's happened? Let us call it extrasensory perception. Well, Mrs. Malott was right. She's dead. Her doctor knew nothing about the spell she was having as being caused by anything but indigestion. How about an autopsy? It's all in the works. Looks like a metallic poison, all the symptoms. Oh? Did you search the house carefully for such a poison? I did. Now I'll check the drugstores in the morning. Somebody in that house will purchase some poison. Let me know when the autopsy report is in. Right. Let's see now. We have Mr. Malott, Dorothy Davis, and Larry the son. He's Mr. Malott's son, but not the child of Eva Malott, remember? Yes. Is it true that Dorothy is in love with Malott? Yeah. Dorothy admitted it to me, but claimed Malott wasn't aware of it until tonight. And earlier this evening, Dorothy tried her best to get me out of the house, insisted that I drive her into town. She tried to give me a drink, which I think might have contained knockout drops. You don't say. Archie, I should have Fritz drive me up to the Malott place at once. Archie, are you there? No, boss, I just fainted. <laughs> And that, Mr. Wolf, is most of the story up to now. Very interesting. Yes, indeed. But it isn't true. I did not put anything in Mr. Goodwin's drink. Then did you ask him to take you into town? Yes. And I might have been found in a ditch. Oh, it's ridiculous. Why did you try to get Mr. Goodwin to take you to town? Because I felt it would be too embarrassing to remain until morning. Maybe you'd already given Mother the big dose of poison and wanted Goodwin out before it was discovered. Well, you Wait a minute. That... Now, Mr. Miller. You claim that you knew nothing about Dorothy being in love with you? Should we believe that? You can believe it or not. Dorothy had a motive to get rid of Mrs. Malott. It seems that Mr. Malott had one, too. And so did Larry. What? You admitted to me that you didn't like your stepmother. And that you disliked Dorothy even more. I didn't say that. You said Dorothy was making a fool of your father. You resented the possibility of any woman sharing in the estate. You knew about the sleeping capsules, and you could have put poison in some of them. You could have written those threat notes. And by getting rid of your stepmother and placing the blame on Dorothy, you'll be getting rid of them both. But I didn't. I did not write those notes. You were the only one who knew about them. I was not the only one. I saw Dorothy coming out of Mother's room. It was this afternoon. 
Mother was out taking his son back. Dorothy did it. She's the one. I think you're the one. No, no, Dorothy wrote those notes. That's a lie. No, she probably slipped into Mother's room and wrote those notes on Mother's portable. What? Hey, just a minute. Archie, come here. I never heard of sex lies. I didn't do it. You can't send me to jail. I'll kill you first. Larry, drop that gun. Don't come near me, any of you. You're such a fool, Larry. Give me that gun. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Come on. There. Now, you better quiet down, kid. Or Inspector Kramer will take care of you when he arrives. Well, Mr. Wolf, what goes on here? Where's Goodwin? I sent him upstairs, Inspector Kramer, upstairs to Mrs. Malotte's room to check on something. Now, here he is. Yeah? What have you been doing, Goodwin? This, Inspector, is the piece de resistance. This is what Mr. Wolf has been waiting for. This little black box contains a typewriter, a portable noiseless Remington. Mrs. Malotte's typewriter. What? I didn't even know she had a typewriter. Larry knew she had one. And this is undoubtedly the very typewriter the threat notes were written on. All three of them. You were right, boss. Oh, I knew she had a typewriter, but I didn't write those notes. Oh, shut up. Archie, how do you know the notes were written on this typewriter? I've compared the type and the ribbon. They're both the same. These notes were written on this Remington. It was Dorothy. Larry, I don't believe a word you've been saying. Dorothy couldn't possibly be guilty of such a thing. If anyone is guilty, you yourself certainly have all the earmarks. Everybody's against me, even my own father. But I'm innocent, I tell you. Let me get it. I think I know who it is. Hello. Yeah, just a second. You better take it, boss. Wolf. Oh, yes, go ahead. Let's have it. Yes. He's here, but he won't mind. Yes? I see. Uh-huh. You just finished. Oh. Good. Right. Bye. Was it the coroner? The coroner. Reporting that poison was found in the sleeping capsules. And the body. Did they find poison? They did. You were right again, boss. I'm going up to Mrs. Minot's room for a while. I want you to come along with me. Find anything yet, Archie? No, mostly bills and invitations to bridge parties and so on. Ah. You find something, boss? Yes and no. This pocketbook detective story. What about it? I was just flipping through the pages and I find this corner turned down. Well, well. What is it? Look and read. Why stay on in the face of death? Interesting. The very words used in one of the notes. Give me the book. Of course, uh, this doesn't prove a thing either. But it does confirm what I was... Oh, oh. What now? This cinches it. Get them all up here, Archie. Tell Kramer to bring them all to the bedroom. Well, Mr. Wolf, what now? As you all know, Mrs. Millot was poisoned by someone who had an opportunity to put it in the sleeping capsule. Someone in this household. Yeah, but which one? The kid? I never bought any poison in my life. Be quiet, will you? No, Inspector, it wasn't Larry. And I suppose you think I put the rest of that rat poison in your drink, Mr. Goodwin. No, Dorothy, it wasn't you. But how did you know it was rat poison? I didn't. I just guessed. I can think, too. Then if it wasn't Dorothy or Larry, you you must mean me. No, Mr. Lunt. No, wait a minute. It had to be somebody. Yes. This is going to be painful for you, Mr. Malott. Well, you you mean that Mrs. Malott did commit suicide? It was more than suicide. It was suicide with an attempt to have both you and Dorothy convicted of murder. She planted things? She did. I can't believe it. Show him the pocketbook, mystery. Here's the proof. Some of the threat notes were lifted bodily from this novel. Look on the back cover. Isn't that Mrs. Malott's handwriting? Yes, and this is the other note. The one to you, Mr. Wolfe. Composed in pencil before she typed it out on her machine. Then, Wolf, the note you received was the same typing as the threat notes. See for yourself, Inspector. Then why the Dickens didn't Archie compare them right away? Just one of those things, Inspector. There are times when even a good detective is a bit on the, uh, shall we say, dull side. Don't you find it often true, Inspector? Hmm? <laughs> Nice of you to go all the way out there, boss. I was a bit stuck. Quite all right, Archie. Yeah, there's something that still bothers me. So? How can such a sweet, motherly type as Mrs. Malott cook up such gruesome ideas? She was a very sick woman, mentally as well as physically. 
She probably felt she was going to die. And her warped mind seized on the opportunity to make sure that this Dorothy didn't get her man after she was dead. And speaking of Dorothy, she's a mighty pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Some beer, please, Archie. If you were so certain that Dorothy wasn't guilty, what was the idea of spending so much time questioning her? Huh? Why, I, I, I... Never mind. The raised eyebrow department answered the question. Well, there are certain rules a good detective always follows. Some are in the book, others aren't. You mean there's nothing in the book which says a good detective shouldn't spend a few minutes with an attractive brunette, even though she is a murder suspect? The author of that book can be none other than the incomparable Archie Goodwin. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Irene Winston, Ted Von Eltz, Jerry Hausner, Vic Rodman, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the shot in the dark. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music in the air tomorrow evening, music and fun, brought to you by Dennis Day, Judy Canova, and Grand Old Opry. Charming and boyish Dennis gets himself tangled in another bewildering situation, while Judy Canova gets together with her comedy pals for some mountain-style goings-on. And Saturday also means a killer cycle trip to Nashville for Grand Old Opry. Friday's fun includes Sam Spade and, of course, the magnificent Montague on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Horace Crail. Crail, uh, does Mr. Crail know Mr. Wolf? Oh, I see. What is it, Archie? A guy named Horace Crail. His secretary says he wants to talk to you. What about? I don't know. Us? Uh, Mr. Wolf's rather busy right now, but I'll give him a message if you wish. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait a second. Mr. Wolf. What? Black on red and red on black. Archie, this is solitaire. So? Solitaire is a game that is played by one single person alone. If I wish to put a red card on a red card or a black card on a black card... You're cheating. Of course I am cheating. What is the message Mr. Horace Crail, secretary, asks you to convey? Just that he wants to see you. In a rather tragic sense, I suppose he does. Why tragic? In that he wants to see me. He is blind. Tell him to come here at his own convenience. Okay. Uh, what does Mr. Crail want to see Mr. Wolf about? A murder? A murder that may still be prevented. Archie. Uh, just a second. What? I have run the cards out perfectly. Is it his own murder Mr. Crail wants us to prevent? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Once in a long while, Mr. Wolf and I talk about this affair. When we do, we call it the case of the lost heir. But I don't think the title's quite adequate. For me, it ought to be called the case of the gone goose. And I was the goose. Well, Archie, do you see any red on red or black on black? Nope. So? So what? 
You irritate me, Archie. Okay, you won your little game of solitaire perfectly, as you say. Now, who is Horace Crail? A prominent industrialist. If you read the papers, you would know. Horace Crail. Crail? Oh, yeah, the Crail Company. Exactly. How did you know he was blind, if he is? The papers have carried the story. The headlines read, Blind Father Welcomes Lost Daughter. Oh, yeah, I remember. A few days ago, there was a picture, too. <laughs> I thought you'd remember the girl, at least. Well, if it's the one I remember, I remember. Archie. Oh, well, it probably isn't true. By the way, let me tell you what I found out about the facts of life. The door, Archie. Mr. Crail is here to see Mr. Wolf. Oh, yes, come in. This is Mr. Crail. I'm his secretary, Hugh Gaines. Uh, there's a step here, Mr. Crail. Of course. Uh, who is this man? I'm Archie Goodwin, Mr. Wolf's assistant. Mr. Wolf's waiting for you. Where is Mr. Wolf, Mr. Goodman? I led the way. The blind man and his secretary followed. Mr. Horace Crail was tall, thin, white haired. His face was heavily lined, but the lines were not those of care or worry. He wore very dark glasses through which he might not have been able to see even if he had had his sight. Hugh Gaines, the secretary, was in his late 20s, surprisingly young and surprisingly handsome for the kind of a job he had. I led them into Mr. Wolf's office, made the introductions, and sat them down. Well, Mr. Crail, what can I do for you? As you see, Mr. Wolf, I'm blind. Need I say you have my deepest sympathy? I don't give a hoot for your sympathy, Mr. Wolf. Oh, uh, thank you, of course. I mentioned my condition merely because it affects the position in which I find myself. Go on. Uh, you. Yes, Mr. Crail? Tell Mr. Wolf about my daughter. Oh, incidentally, Mr. Wolf, I asked my secretary to do this because in this way you will get a first-hand account. Now, let's see. A few days ago, Tuesday to be exact, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, a young woman walked into the house and said she wanted to see her father. I spoke to her myself. She said her name was Magda Crail. I asked her certain questions. Why, Mr. Gaines? He asked her questions because he thought, and I, I thought, that my daughter died 13 years ago. Oh, either the girl who came back to me is my daughter, or she is an imposter, and she belongs in jail. Is there any doubt in your mind about it? Of course. That's why I'm here. On the telephone, you said something about preventing murder. Well, I, uh, I have a stepson named Anthony George, to whom I intended to leave my money, not because I liked him, <laughs> Simply because I had nobody else to leave it to. Except your daughter. Except my daughter. If she is my daughter. We were talking about murder. I was talking about my daughter and my stepson. Ah, same thing, I think. Maybe, possibly. I don't know. Mr. Crail. Yes? I am not a wealthy man, but I am certainly able to make ends meet. Yeah? What do you mean? Explain, Archie. I think Mr. Wolf means that if you don't want to be frank with him, he'd rather not waste his time. Mr. Wolf, I apologize if I've seemed to spar with you. Fooey. See, a blind man can only judge by what he hears and smells and feels. So? No, I must be a little more cautious than I would have to be uh, otherwise. I'm sorry, Mr. Crail. Patience is not one of my virtues. Now, about your daughter or your non-daughter. What's her name? Magda. She calls herself Magda Crail, which was, was my daughter's name. What makes you think she isn't your daughter? Well, ten million dollars, partly. Uh, once again, Mr. Crail? My estate may be worth more than that, but uh, surely not less. You? Surely not less, Mr. Crail. Rather more, I should say. Yes, ten million might have some appeal to an ambitious girl, eh, Archie? Sure, but I'm not a girl, and I'm not ambitious. Nobody could accuse you of either four. Mr. Crail, we are getting nowhere. Either you tell your story from the beginning or take it somewhere else. Archie, I'd like some beer. When I went out for the beer, the kitchen was a mess, and incidentally, I saw what was being prepared for lunch. When I got back to the office, Mr. Crail and his boy were gone. One beer for Mr. Wolf. What happened? What took you so long, Archie? I had a sandwich. And spoiled your lunch. You know what you're having for lunch? Of course. I planned it. Baby octopus. Delicious. I'll take your word for it. What happened to the blind tycoon? Get your book, will you, Archie? I want to give you a few notes. Well, just a second. Okay. Item? Item. You needn't repeat everything after me. Yes, master. 
Item, Horace Crayer was born blind. Item, his wife and their six-year-old daughter, Magda, disappeared in their private plane 13 years ago. Magda returned last Tuesday. Item, no matter what he says to the contrary, Horace Crayer is afraid he's going to be killed. I think Mr. Crayer is right. Memo. From Archie Goodwin to Nero Wolf. Time, 4.32 p.m. The notes you dictated on the Crail case are on your blotter. Three pages of them. You are with your orchids. I am on my way to the Crail domicile to meet the other characters in this turgid drama. As per instructions, I will bring them here if possible. Love, Archie. Yes, sir? My name is Goodwin. Archie Goodwin, I believe I'm expected. This way, please, sir. Don't tell me you're near old wolf. Not by a couple of hundred pounds. I'm Archie Goodwin, his assistant. Well, I'm Magda Crail. Nobody's assistant. That awful Hugh Gaines creature said near old wolf wants to talk to me. He does. Well, where is he? Waiting for you. No hurry, though. No hurry at all. Just, uh, just play and don't worry about a thing. Black hair, green eyes... Skin like a magnolia petal. Beautiful, beautiful. While she finished what she was playing, I watched her. Beautiful. Well? Beautiful. Mr. Goodwin. Archie. Oh, we could get along together, Archie, if that's the way you are. It's the way I am. I can't seem to do anything about it. Where's Anthony? Anthony? Oh, Anthony George. But I thought both my repulsive half-brother and I were supposed to meet Nero Wolf. I'm here in case anybody wants to know. Over there in the shadows, listening with all his ears. That's Anthony George. Shall we go and talk to Nero Wolf, Anthony? Goodwin? You look like a normal sort of person. Well, that's open to question, but go on. If you had to choose between $10 million and killing a woman by due process of law, which would you choose? I'll think about it between now and July 1994. Now, shall we go talk to Nero Wolf? Miss Crayer. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Why did you wait until now, until last Tuesday, to let your father know that you were living? Does it make any difference? I think so. Thirteen years ago, I was six. What she means is that she was six when she died. But I didn't die, Anthony Sweet. Obviously. But Magda Crail did. With my mother. His mother. Anthony says he doesn't remember me as a child. But I remember him, the brat. What about me? Well, when I was about four or five, you were eight or nine, I suppose, do you remember dressing up in one of Daddy's tailcoats, a sword, and Mother's hat with a plume? Suppose I did. You're still not my sister. Don't worry, Anthony. When poor father dies, I'll support you. Archie. Sir? I made a mistake. A mistake? You? I thought I wanted to talk to these young people. I don't. Take them away. Take the young lady to a nightclub. On my salary? As part of our investigation, it will be charged to Mr. Horace Crail. It was no hardship at all. In fact, it was a pleasure. We dropped Anthony George off at the Crail place, and Magda and I went on. And on. You're a wonderful dancer, Archie. You can't make enemies that way, honey. Archie, why did Mr. Wolf want you to take me out? To find out whether you really are Crail's daughter. How did he expect you to find out? I don't know. Do you think he knew? He probably had some idea, but I don't know what it could have been. Honestly? Honestly. Archie... Do you think I'm telling the truth? No. But wait a minute, baby. I I don't think you're lying, either. I just don't think. Give me my handbag, Archie. Thanks. I've got something here that might interest both you and Mr. Wolf. Here. Those are snapshots that were taken of me before I was six. Ah. Yeah, cute. Now look at me. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, can't you see those pictures are of me? 
kids that young all look the same to me. But uh, suppose they are pictures of you. What of it? Well, just this. I found them in one of Mr. Creel's old photograph albums. My father, I mean. Oh, here's something. The one lying on my tummy on the white bearskin rug. All babies get their pictures taken that way. Here, give it to me. Wait a second. What's this mark under your shoulder blade? It's a little birthmark. Like a strawberry. It's clear. Uh, look, honey. Why are you so interested in babies, Archie? Because I always thought I should have been a mother. Now, look, have you still got that mark on your back? Of course. At least I suppose so. They don't go away, do they? Uh, Where are you going? I'll be right back. You're a wolf speaking. Archie Godwin. I'm with Magda Crail. No doubt. What? No doubt, I said. But never mind. What do you want? I want to ask a question. Go on. You don't think Magda's Horace Crail's daughter, do you? I don't think anything. You're stealing your lines from me. Never. All right, then, no. I don't think the girl is Crail's daughter. That's just what I hoped you'd say. Why, Archie? Because for once, you're wrong. She's pretty, isn't she? Yes, she is. Also, she's got a birthmark. You have seen it? No, but nobody's going to be fool enough to claim a birthmark. It isn't there. It's too easy to prove. Good night, Archie. But you deserted me, Archie. Well, you know Hugh Gaines, don't you? Hello, Gaines. Hello, Goodwin. Making hay while the moon shines? You know, if you work that into a routine, it could be pretty dull. You don't like me, do you? Do I have to? No. No, not in the least. Well, that's good. Mr. Wolf and I feel it's wrong to like any of our clients, especially in nightclub. Really? Why? Because they might sit down at your table while you're making a telephone call. Uh, I'm sorry. Never I... mind. Finish your drink. Once again, I'm sorry. Forget it. Mr. Crail seems to think that uh, Magna's trying to rook him. Apparently. What do you think? Boys, I'm here too, you know. Why? What do you think, Mr. Gaines? Well, to me, it's a matter of no importance one way or the other. As for Mr. Crail, what he wants is absolute proof. And, of course, there's no such thing as proof that is absolute. Do you want me to add it up for you? Yeah, that's exactly what I want you to do for me. Add it up. Thirteen years ago, Mrs. Crail and her small daughter, Magda, boarded a chartered plane in St. Louis to fly across the Ozarks to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. They took off, and that's the last that ever was heard of them, or the pilot, or the plane. Okay, add some more. Mr. Crail had the whole area searched for months. The search itself cost almost $50,000. And the plane was not found. They finally decided that it must have fallen into the Mississippi where it would sink to the bottom and uh, stay forever. Now, wait a minute. Magda. Yes, Archie? Don't you remember anything about this trip? Nothing. Not a single thing. The last I remember is Mother putting me to bed in a strange city in a hotel. And that's all. Okay, what's the next thing you remember? Archie, dear. Yeah? Didn't my father go over this whole business with Mr. Wolf? I suppose he did. Then do we have to do it again? There must be some reason why he wanted me to take you to a nightclub. Because I might say something I haven't already said a hundred times. Maybe. What's the next thing you remember after your mother put you to bed in a strange city? Archie, I have a confession to make. This I believe. Go ahead. Ten million dollars is a lot of money. So I've been told. I don't really remember a single solitary thing before I was six years old and going to school in Rogers, Arkansas. Not Anthony George wearing tails and a sword? It was one of the pictures in the album. Not your mother putting you to bed in a hotel in St. Louis? Ten million dollars, Archie. So you're not Magda Crail? Well, of course I'm Magda Crail. Oh, I may have tried to make the story sound a little more convincing than I should have. But I'm Magda Crail just the same. How could I be anybody else? And so far, I can't see why you shouldn't be anybody else. Miss Crail will now bring up the matter of the diary. Won't you, Miss Crail? The diary? Oh, you don't know. Then Mr. Wolf has told you nothing at all about this case, has he? He probably told me all I needed to know. What about a diary? Well, you see, Mr. Goodwin, Miss Crail's memory begins at about the happy age of seven. A black-haired, green-eyed, pigtail brat named Maggie Lomax. Only child of Walt and Mabel Lomax of Rogers, Arkansas. Am I correct, Miss Lomax? Uh, Miss Crail, I mean. He's a sarcastic character, isn't he, Archie? That he is, that he is. What about this diary? To cut a long sob story short, Walt and Mabel Lomax died in an automobile accident a few weeks ago, leaving uh, only Maggie. Take it from there, Maggie. There was no money. I looked through the house to find anything I could sell, and I came across a hidden box. The diary was in the box. 
along with some clothes that might fit a six-year-old girl. The clothes look like what the girl was last seen wearing. How do you know? <laughs> well, there's a photograph of one of Mr. Crail's albums taken in St. Louis the day before the flight. But for uh, ten million, those clothes could be reproduced. Stitch for stitch. Archie, dear. Take him out in the alley, it would be a pleasure. <laughs> oh, now, wait a second, Archie. With one arm tied behind you, I think you could probably beat me into a pulp. Is it all right if we uh, don't prove it? We were talking about the diary, Archie. Okay, what about it? Archie, I don't even claim the handwriting is mine. What's handwriting when you're six years old? Still, the first page is one of those things that has name, name of parents, home address, and like that. Color of hair, eyes, you know. Sure, I had one myself. Certainly. Every child had one. One or a dozen. Maybe they still do. You fill in the first page and then you never write another word. Honey. They were cheap. I doubt if they cost a quarter, and there was a place that said, my first date, favorite pastime." Look, baby. Oh, he calls me baby, Mr. Gaines. Yes, I noticed that. I think he'd believe your story no matter what you told him. Get lost, will you, Mr. Gaines? What's that? Get lost, drop dead, turn blue. Well, I can take a hint. Good night, Archie, and Miss Lomax. Prissy, isn't he? Prissy is the word. He doesn't seem to believe your story. He believes what he's told to believe. It's his job. Sure. You believe me, don't you, Archie? Honey, you're beautiful, just the way you are. Now, let's talk about the diary. I hate you. I hate you, too. Shall we dance? The diary. Oh, dear. Where is it? Do you call this romance? No, I call it working overtime. Where is it? Here, in my handbag. Here. Push over. We look at it together. I'm not... Crowding you, am I? What's a little crowding? Cozy, isn't it? Now, look at the cover first. My Diary, 1934. I suppose somebody gave it to me for my sixth birthday. Let's just not suppose anything, shall we? All right, Archie. Page one. Name, Magda Crail. Date of birth, October 11th, 1928. But you'll read it. Or can you read? Anything you can write, honey. Uh, date of birth and so on. Father Horace Crail, Mother Mabel Crail... Hair black, eyes green, my favorite pastime, playing with Dolph. Playing has a Y in it. You know what I think, Archie? You wouldn't call that writing, would you? Not real writing. It's more like printing. I think my mother guided my hand when I wrote that. Yeah, that's the way it looks, all right. Well. Dance now? Dance now. While we danced, while I held that disturbing girl in my arms, I tried to believe the case was just as simple as it seemed. Somehow she'd survived a plane crash, a head injury, and then a normal life with a couple who naturally wouldn't tell her that she wasn't really theirs. I tried to believe it. I was trying hard when... Archie, don't look. There's Anthony George. Oh, yeah, alone in the corner. You've had a lot of experience, Archie. Do you think he's a killer? A what? Do you think he'd commit murder? I don't think anything about him, but why should he? For ten million dollars? I see what you mean. Are you worried? Not with you around, Archie. Not with you around. It was like that, maybe even more like that, until the waiter told me I was wanted on the telephone. I asked her to keep the table warm, that I'd be right back. Hello? 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 This is Archie Goodwin. Archie? Oh, hello, Mr. Wolf. I have been talking to Mr. Crail. Wonderful. A little less humor, perhaps. Okay, what about Mr. Crail? He showed me some pictures of his daughter. Baby pictures? Unfortunately. Some of the pictures were missing from the album. Those are the ones I've been looking at. Archie, I'm interested in that birthmark. So am I. Do you think you could persuade the young lady to have a picture taken of her back undraped? Wait a minute. Just one moment, please. Well... Clear picture in a bright light. How would you like her posed, Mr. Wolf? I am not amused, Archie. Okay, I'm sorry. All I want is a clear, sharp, focused picture of that birthmark. And I expect you to get it for me. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Hello again. And? No. Talk. More talk? Lots more. What now? That birthmark. So I've got a birthmark. What about it? I wish I had one that was worth ten million. So do I. 
This one is worth nothing to me. Since my father doesn't believe I'm his daughter, he's blind. That kind of identification doesn't mean anything to him. You're forgetting the people he trusts. Hugh Gaines, for instance. If the birthmark is there, couldn't he look at it, compare it with those awful baby pictures and say, yes, here is your daughter? I've got news for you, Archie. He has looked at it. He says it looks the same as the one in the baby pictures. Has he told your father that? Yes. But he also told him he thought I was a fake. That somehow I found out that the six-year-old daughter of a millionaire had died in a plane crash 13 years ago. And I found out she had a strawberry birthmark on her back. And I had one, too. So I decided to say that I was Magda Crail. That's absurd. Of course it is. You can see how it's going to work out, can't you, Archie? Frankly, no. How? My father went to Mr. Wolf simply to have him prove that I am his daughter. Whatever Hugh Gaines says. The only thing I'm afraid of, though... What are you afraid of, baby? I'm afraid my darling half-brother might kill him before he has a chance to change his will. Isn't that a somewhat mercenary view to take of the matter? Maybe it is, Archie. And maybe I'd feel differently about it if my father had found me instead of waiting for me to find him. He tried, didn't he? I wonder. Let's get back to that birthmark. Are you allergic to floodlights? I know a photographer who has a studio. Confound it, Archie. How did you know it was going to be me? Because nobody else would dare to call me this late. What do you want? I got the pictures. They're drying now. If you come home, bring them with you. They may be important tomorrow. Have you heard that Horace Crail was murdered? No. How? Who? Where? Tomorrow we'll talk about it, Archie. Good night. At 4 p.m. the next day, there was quite a lot of confusion in Nero Wolf's office. At his direction, I'd set up a picture screen at one end of the room, and on his desk at the other end, a rather strangely constructed projector. At 4.30, the guests arrived. Magda, Anthony, George, Hugh Gaines, and of course, Inspector Kramer, ready to make an arrest if he could figure out whom to arrest. Hello, Inspector. Hi, Goodwin. Magda, Anthony, Hello, George, Hello. you. Yeah, Mr. what's Goodwin. this all about? Uh, what's going on, Archie? You got me, Inspector. I think Mr. Wolf wants to show slides of his trip to Yellowstone Park. But here he is. Ask him. Oh, say, Wolf, you want to know what I think? Not in the least, Inspector. Sit down somewhere, won't you? Mm. Archie, will you turn out the lights? Thank you. Now, this is a picture of Magda Crail lying on her stomach at the age of six months. I changed the focus so, and we have a close-up of a birthmark. A smooth discoloration that looks as if it might have been painted on. Now, look, Wolf. You said if I came here, you'd give me the guy who killed Horace Crail, and you show me a picture of a baby's back. Inspector, if you open your mouth again, I may not keep my promise. Go ahead. While we look at this enlargement of a birthmark on baby's back, let us remember that the late Mr. Horace Crail was blind and never saw it. So what? What's he getting at, Goodwin? Inspector, if I knew, I'd tell you. Listen. Mr. Crail had a trusted secretary, Hugh Gaines. I'm here. Of course. Mr. Gaines had a brilliant idea. He knew the tragedy of Mrs. Crail and her daughter, and he decided to bring Crail's daughter back to life. What makes you think so, Mr. Wolf? You had access to the photograph album, and only you. Oddly enough, Mr. Crail didn't even know his daughter had a birthmark until you told him. That may be true, but what of it? It's unimportant. Now I want to show you another picture. Archie, explain this picture, will you? A rating from left to right, this is a picture of Miss Crail's back. Very pretty, too. As you can see, there is what appears to be a small birthmark, somewhat under the left shoulder blade. I changed focus... And as it becomes larger... That's not a birthmark. That's tattooing. You can see it. Tattooing, of course. And Mr. Gaines had a brilliant idea how to make use of a tattooed birthmark and Miss Magna to help him out. Blind as he was, Horace Crail saw through it. That's why Hugh Gaines had to kill him. No, you don't, Gaines. <laughs> 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 Mr. Wolfie, all right? Of course I'm all right. Well, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Gaines is your man. The 
Another bottle of beer, please, Archie. It's right there in front of you. You know, I was thinking, a girl can get herself tattooed, can't she? Is that a crime? What does it prove? Archie, Archie, have I ever told you I love you? (laughs) I'm going to bed. Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadden production produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Martha Shaw, Vic Rodman, Peter Leeds, Gray Stafford, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you the case in room 304. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah brings you another hour-and-a-half broadcast of The Big Show, starring Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Joan Davis, Fran Warren, and many more. And this Sunday's Theater Guild on the Air production is the Broadway comedy The First Year. Starring in this Theater Guild presentation are Richard Widmark and Catherine Grayson. Remember, Tallulah Bankhead stars in her wonderful big show Sunday on NBC. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for... Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Oh. But Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. It has the odor of Christmas night. Or, uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything... What I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridle path. Signed, Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. We'll take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. An anonymous note. A rendezvous in the park at night. Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was writing. At least it's got a good start. 
The question is, what's the ending? Well, this is the park, and the clock says ten. There's the bench at the end of the bridle path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep, nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Oh, I'm sorry. The Sandman came and I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. But aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? <laughs> yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. I like you a lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. Just happened, I guess. What's your name? Janie. I mean, uh, what's your other name? I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Janie? I got two homes. I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I like you and I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie, flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then if we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right and go two blocks. <sighs> that's home. That's where the ice cream fire is. Now, stop that, Janie. Tell me how to get to your home. Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Only they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At 10 o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Well, let me see uh -huh. that. Well, how do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother. Hmm. You're nice. I like your voice. What's your name? Dan. A sucker if there ever was one. <laughs> This is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Glenn Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. Let's hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. Uh, put it down on the couch, Holiday. Mm, that's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, feels kind of good, too. 
Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holiday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? She's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I'm on a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? Oh, I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holiday, keep it. Just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You'll just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. You'll understand soon, Mr. Holiday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're right, our Holiday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. Janie. I broke the nail. I broke the nail. Oh, that's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't mean to. I wanted my bed to poop. No, don't cry, honey. That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. No, Janie. My daddy went away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? Mm. It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleepy? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now, you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? No, I'm sorry. No doll. Daddy Bear? No teddy bear. You might be awful lonesome. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? Tell me a fairy story. All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears. The papa bear, the mama bear, and, and the... And the baby bear. I know that story. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Once upon a time, there's a little girl named Red Riding Hood. And, and the wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed. And it grew up into a mighty tall vine. And, and he, he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. Oh, that's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. You stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. Well, what's this? A little girl. Oh, thanks, Holiday. Uh, what's your name, young lady? Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it doesn't. It isn't? <laughs> uh, Holiday. Great little kid. Her dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> All children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop. A policeman, honey. Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. The writing business slow these days, Holiday? How do you mean? Oh, I thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh. Oh, yes. Just helping out a friend. I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? That depends, uh... Are your children anything like you? No, Holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad to accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, Holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Whew. Your hand is shaking. 
Oh, Never mind, Jamie. It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Hmm. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off. You'll wake the kid. You Dan Holliday? Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old. Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Can I use the phone down the hall? I'm sorry about this. But get inside then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Oh, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. He comes with me, Holiday. Let's keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you... Think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. <laughs> Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holliday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? Mr. Holliday... I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holliday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? The man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a... Friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man, did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? Harley, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. You must have seen him. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can't a man get some sleep? With your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant. Mind telling me what this is all about? I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant? I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Kling, you have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you could remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I dropped here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. 
Lieutenant. You'd never believe me. Now, where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holiday. You. They're gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's Mr. mother... Mr. Holiday, there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark. What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here. But I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. Mr. Holliday... He carries a gun. You stay here. We'll get her. We'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. I'll be waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. Brown's Motel. This is one time you'd better be right, Holiday. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He, he said he didn't want to be disturbed. It's a matter of life and death. Get him to the phone. Uh, who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Now, quick, Holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just slip around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? 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 What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark. Oh. That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is? Of course I do, Daddy. And tell me quickly, that man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Well, come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. <laughs> I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holliday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Janie. Mommy. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mommies. Holliday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holliday. Thanks. Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then, who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Kling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Kling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. 
If neither of these two ladies had the child, who did? A man named Sam Parker, who turned out to be Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her a child, a holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no. Not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer that door, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? No. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up his gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. Mr. Holiday, how can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holiday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Mommy. Yes? He fixed it so I can keep my true mommy, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. And would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holiday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Jamie, and this is my daddy. Why, Mr. Holiday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh, boy. I'll bet this is going to be good. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Hey, look, boss, look at this. An ad in the Star Times, out of town newspaper. Yeah. Box 13, adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. <laughs> well, this looks like the right answer, Tony. Yeah. I think I'll write a letter to Box 13. The letter was postmarked from a city in Nevada. It came airmail, special delivery to Box 13 and me. It sounded like a great chance to grab a change of scenery and maybe a little fun. <laughs> fun? Brother, how wrong could I be? <laughs> Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Triple Cross. Just run an advertisement in the Star Times, one that reads, Adventure Wanted, will go any place, do anything, and see what you get. A lot of them can be interesting, like the one I listened to Susie read. 
The one that came airmail, special delivery from Nevada. And closed is enough money to buy you a plane ticket to Los Maros. You want adventure? All right. Come to Los Maros. Register at the Paradise Hotel. Wait in your room until you're contacted. And that's all it says, Susie? That's all, Mr. Holliday. There's not even a signature, even. It's what's called an ominous letter. What kind of a letter, Susie? Ominous. Uh, you know, that means it's not signed by anybody. The word you mean is anonymous. Oh. But you could be right after all. Well, Susie, lock up the office and look for me when you see me with a new plot and a nice tan. <laughs> new plot and a nice tan, I said. Hmm. I got the plot, but the tan almost turned into a beautiful white pallor, the kind that goes well with lilies. The plane trip was smooth. The trip from airport to the Paradise Hotel was nice and easy. And the hotel itself? Well, it was the only one I could remember that looked like the ads in the travel folders. Oddly enough, there was a room reserved for me in my name. Okay, somebody checked and found out who I was. I explored the suite, thinking maybe I'd get a lead on what this was all about. But it was just a fancy set of rooms, all newly decorated. I sat down, and then about a half hour later... Come in. Message for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Who gave this to you? A man, sir. What kind of a man? What do he look like? Oh, just a man, sir. Oh, I see. A head, two eyes, nose, two ears, and a mouth. That his description? <laughs> yes, sir. That's exactly what he looked like. Good. But I'll know him when I see him. <laughs> oh, did he ask for an answer? Uh, no, sir. He just told me to bring the envelope to you. Will that be all, sir? Huh? Oh, yes, yes. Thanks. Well, two $100 bills and a message that said, buy a red carnation in a flower shop and put it in your lapel. After dinner, go to the casino roulette table, buy $200 in chips and put them on number 18. If you win, walk away, wait 10 minutes and put half the winnings on number 22. After you play, wait in the casino. So with a carnation in my lapel, I bought $200 in chips and walked to the roulette table. There weren't many players. It was a little too early for the big crowd. So I waited a minute and watched the play. Took a look at the croupier, but I might as well have been in Timbuktu. He didn't give me a tumble. Okay, the best way to see what was going to happen was to see. I shoved the whole 200 on number 18. One or two of the other players placed bets, and then... No more bets, please. No more bets. Number 18, red and even. Your chip, sir. The croupier shoved the winnings across to me. I I watched his face. If he had any expression, it was on the soles of his shoes. Well, maybe $7,000 win was coming around here. I left the table, sat down, and did a little problem in arithmetic, which figured out to be $126,000. That's what I'd have if number 22 came up. And brother, it looked from where I sat as though it would. The ten minutes went by, and I walked back to the table. Waited until the wheel stopped. Number 16, red and even. Place your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Slowly, I shoved 3,500 in chips to number 22. This time, the others around the wheel did look. 3,500 to 35 to 1. And the wheel began to slow up. No more bets, ladies and gentlemen. No more bets, please. That croupier was as cold as the floor of a mausoleum. Somebody dropped a pin and I heard it hit the floor. The white ball clicked, clicked, clicked its way until... Number 22, black and even. Your chip, sir. I cashed in the chips, and there I sat, with $126,000 tucked away in my inside coat pocket. Somebody had that wheel fixed for a killing. I began to wish I was back in my office. I didn't like it. A crooked play. Why? Who? 
I made up my mind to go to the owner of the place and wash my hands of the whole thing when... Oh, there you are, Mr. Holliday. I've been looking for you. I have a message for you. Yeah? Well, it's verbal this time, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what is it? You're to go into the bar and wait. Is that all? Yes, sir. The same man gave you this message? Yes, sir. Did he still have a head, two eyes, a nose, and two ears? <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. All right, here you are, kid. Oh, thank you. You know, if this keeps up much longer, you'll be able to retire my tips alone. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Will that be all? Oh, uh, how much did this character give you to forget what he looked like? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. And a smart boy like you should have taken a good look the second time. Huh? Especially since I asked about him after the first message. Oh, he was big, dark, a little mustache, and he had a little white scar over his right eye. Will you take five dollars for that information? That's all right, Mr. Holliday. No charge for that service. Mm, good boy. I'll see you later. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. I walked toward the bar wondering what was coming next. I didn't like that fortune burning the cloth in my pocket. The bar was like my suite. Fancy, rich, and expensive. I climbed up on one of the stools, and the bartender came over and... Yes, sir, may I serve you, sir? Got any ginger ale? Yes, sir. What with, sir? Oh, by itself. Just a glass of ginger ale. Just a ginger ale? Oh. You see, I like the bubbles. <laughs> Champagne has bubbles, too. Ah, uh, but they're still around the next day. Just a ginger ale. Yes, sir. Of course. Excuse me. Is someone sitting here? Hmm? Oh, no, no. I don't think so. Thank you. Here you are, sir. Ginger ale. Thanks. The usual, please. Okay. Yes, sir. May I? You got a light? Of course. Thank you. Don't mention it. Here you are. Thanks. Why do you drink ginger ale? Oh, I like it. Why do you drink martinis? Same reason, I guess. <laughs> it's a brilliant conversation, isn't it? Well, I've heard better. You're not very friendly, are you? A uh, boy scout is always friendly. And does good turns. So I hear. Do you want to be helped across the street? <laughs> All right. I'll shut up. I took a good look at her. There was something scared looking about her. She was nervous. Well, so was I because the minutes were passing and I still had that money. And I wanted to get rid of it. But I wondered about the girl, whether she had any part in this. I watched her out of the corner of my eye. She picked up her bag, reached for a lipstick, and then... Oh, oh, clumsy. So it's true what they say about women's handbags. You get the stuff on the bar, I'll pick up the kitchen sink off the floor. I'm, I'm so sorry... Did the powder spill on you? No, it's all right. Yeah. Here you are. The, the mirror didn't break, did it? Nope. You're still good for seven years more. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. I told you I was a good boy, Scott. You have a nice smile. Want a toothpaste commercial to go with it? No, don't be nasty. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just as nervous as you are. I... Let's talk about something else. She chattered away. And it really is I listened with half an ear. Either. Once in a while, through in a yes or a no... And the clouds began to gather. The mirror at the back of the bar went back and forth. The people got bigger and shrank to midgets. Somebody drove a plane through my head. It buzzed around and made a bad landing on my brain. And... Just lie there. Take it easy. Sure, I... Hey. Hey, I'm in my room. Of course. We brought you here. We? I'm the hotel physician, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what happened? Just a fainting spell. Nothing serious. Fainting spell? What are you talking about? They're fainting spells. Your wife told me you get them. My... What told you what? No, no, no. Just lie back. Whose wife said what? Your wife. She's got to have a prescription filled. Now, listen, Doc, I... Hand me my coat, will you? Uh, it's better if you lie here. It's better if you hand me my coat. Give it to me. Oh, very well. There you are. What's the matter? Was my wife in this room? Of course. She came up with me. Uh-huh. Doc, what would you do with $126,000? A hundred? <laughs> That's an odd question. What would you do with it? I don't know. Because I haven't got it anymore. Now, back.
back to Triple Cross, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So there I was, 126,000 in the red. If it was meant to be taken from me, then somebody was working it the hard way. Sure, the girl slipped something in my ginger ale when I picked up the stuff that fell out of her handbag. She took the money. All right, I wanted no more of it. I was going to head for the nearest exit, running, not walking, when... Come in. You Holiday? Yeah. Do I know you? Call me Tony. I'm the guy who wrote the box 13. Oh. All right, goodbye, Tony. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. We're playing 20 questions. Let's skip the other 18, Tony. I got a big one left. Where's the dough? You tell me. Give it to me. Well, I didn't like him. I didn't like the gun he was playing with either. And I didn't like the little white scar over his right eye or the little black mustache. I was willing right then and there to cross him off my friendship list. But I told him what happened. It's a great story. Ain't heard one like it since I read fairy tales. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. You got no regard for your health, Holiday. Look, Tony. I'm leaving this place You'll now. You'll be too heavy to carry out if you take one more step. That's better. Now, what kind of a frame is this? Once more, you tell me. I played a crooked wheel downstairs. I don't like that. You got adventure, didn't you? I don't want anything that's crooked. Now, look who's talking. Who was the girl? Believe it or not, I never saw her before. What did she look like? I don't know. Yeah. Ever try to take a good look at anyone in that bar downstairs? It's too dark to even see a lighted match. You're smart, Holiday. The game with the girl is neat. Awful neat. You get the dough, play doggo. Act like the girl slipped your mickey. Later she turns up with the dough and you two split. Now talk sense, Tony. I didn't know why I came to Los Morris in the first place. I didn't know how I was going to get that money. How would I have time to dream up that frame with a girl? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Halliday, maybe you're telling it straight. Okay. Now can I go? No, no. You get that money back first, then you can go. I don't think I'll stay for the ninth inning, Tony. The game has not started yet, but you get that dough. How? That's your problem, but get it. Look, Tony, I'm backing out of this. You know I can go to the sheriff. Oh, no, you won't. Because there'll be a tail on you from now on up. One move like you're going to the law. Understand? Okay. Okay, I get it. And there'll be somebody in this room to see that you don't use the phone. You'll be covered like a pool table, Holiday. What if I can't find the girl? What if I can't get the money back? The boss will be awful mad. And? There are worse places than Los Moros to spend a lifetime. If you live. Ever have one of those dreams in which you try to run away from something and can't? Well, this one, with my eyes wide open, was really something. Tony and I went downstairs. Two other characters detached themselves from chairs when Tony nodded at them. Brother, I was covered. It looked hopeless. With Tony not far behind, I asked the doctor if he'd ever seen the girl who said she was my wife. Well, there was no dice there. Then I remembered something. I told Tony I was going back into the bar. Bar? What for? Now, look, Tony. Let me do it my way. I'm the one that's on the spot, so let me play it the way I want. Okay. I'll watch, and don't try for a quick steal, because the boys outside know who to look for. Go ahead. Thanks. What would I do without you, Tony? I don't know, because you're not going to be without me. Remember, I'll be watching. Yes, sir. May I serve you? Well, feeling better, sir? Well, much. Where were you when, uh, when I fainted? At the other end of the bar, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, So you were. It wasn't our ginger ale, sir. (laughs) No, it wasn't. I just have a loose head, and when I shake it, it comes off. (laughs) May I serve you something, sir? Yes. An answer to a question. Well, what's that, sir? Who is the girl who sat down next to me? I don't know, sir. Oh, yes, you do. I beg your pardon, sir. But the sir business, you knew that girl. Why do you say that? Because when she sat down, she asked for the usual, and you brought her a martini. And you said okay when she asked you. What does that prove? The martini proves you knew who she was. The okay means she wasn't a guest of the hotel. No bartender as polite as you are would say okay to a lady guest. That makes sense? Why do you want to know who she is? Does that make any difference? Yeah, because I wouldn't want to see her in trouble. I'll try to keep her out of it. 
I won't tell you. Ever see a picture of Alexander Hamilton? Hmm? What are you talking about? Well, here's one. And funny enough, it's on a $10 bill. In fact, his picture's on all five of these bills. Yeah. Her name's Kathy Lee. I think she has a place at the Las Palmas Courts. Thanks. Put these pictures in frames, will you? I found the Las Palmas Courts. And, of course, Tony behind me all the way. The name list in front said Kathy Lee lived in number eight. I looked around before I turned in the walk. Yeah, Tony was closer to me than varnish on a tabletop. I found number eight and stopped for a second. Looked for a phone line, but there wasn't any. I knocked at the door. No answer. I tried it again. Then I heard Tony whisper from the shadows. Try the door, Holiday. I did. It was unlocked. Tony coached from the sidelines. Go on in. I went in and closed the door behind me. It was dark. I decided to risk a call. Kathy? Kathy? Kathy Lee? She wasn't there. I fumbled my way to what felt like a dresser and a lamp. Turned it on and... What I saw made me turn that light off fast. What's the matter? She's dead. Uh, what are you talking about? You heard me, she's dead. You sure? Well, go in and look. You go back in and look for that dope. Go on. Now look, Tony, I don't know any more of this. That poor kid's dead. Murdered. I want you to call the sheriff. No, you don't. I said you go back in there and look for that dope. You look for it. Leave my fingerprints all over the place. Now you go back in there and hunt. Don't be a sap. Whoever killed her took the money. Don't you see that? Maybe. But we'll play this angle all the way. Now stop talking and get in there. I hated to turn on that light, but I had to. I didn't look at her. I looked through the room. Then I found something. A plane ticket to San Francisco. Leaving that night. And a boat ticket for South America. They were in an envelope, but the information beyond the envelope said there would be two reservations. I put it back where I found it because I didn't want Tony to find it on me. And there was something else. A locket with a man's picture in it. I took it off its chain and shoved it in my pocket, and I left. Well, Helen Lee? It's not there. I told you it wouldn't be. Stand still. Back toward me. <laughs> a frisk, Tony? You don't trust me, do you? Shut up. No, I told you. Who killed her? Find that out, and you'll know where the money went. Come on. <laughs> What's so funny? Helen Lee... Right now, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Tony was right. People at the casino saw me win that money, and somebody must have seen the girl with me. Then I got the Mickey. The money was taken. The girl killed. Who did it? Mm-hmm. Me, Dan Holliday. Because the girl clipped me for the money. Well, this was a beautiful frame. Any art gallery in the country would be proud to hang it. But I knew something Tony didn't. The plane and boat tickets. Two seats. One for Kathy and her murder. Somebody who left her tickets in her bungalow to make it look as though she was in on the $100,000 job by herself. Sure. Now her killer was taking a plane. In one hour. And a boat to South America. I could have told Tony, but I wanted to wrap it up myself. Besides, I wanted to get the whole thing to the law. On the way back to the hotel, I figured something out for myself. But I'd have to see the boss of the casino, and I thought I knew how to do that without Tony tagging along. The casino was full. I stopped. Tony stopped. What's the idea? What now? I've got to think. Up to your room. No. You want to get hurt? Sure. Go ahead. Shoot me. Now. In front of all these people. You know, Tony, you, you wouldn't get ten feet. Smart, ain't you? Okay, what's now? I'm going to play blackjack. What? Want to watch? I sat at the blackjack table. 
I had as much interest in the game as Aunt Mamie back in Iowa, who never saw a deck of cards in her life. But I had an idea, and I played it for all it was worth. Look, uh, dealer, yes? I didn't like that last deal. I beg your pardon, sir. I said I didn't like that last deal. Well, we'll return your money, sir. Never mind the money. Who runs this place? Hey, what is that guy trying to pull on over there with it worked. In three seconds, I was surrounded by muscle boys, and Tony was hotter than a New York sidewalk in August. But he couldn't touch me. A minute later, I sat across the table from the owner of the casino. I told him what happened, and when I finished, he stared at me and said, You're trying to tell me somebody let you win that money on my wheel? I am? You're crazy. The wheel's straight. But you know I won that money. Sure I do. Any time a hundred grand slides across, I know it. But... Uh... But this time, it was fixed. The croupier was tipped I was to win. Wait a minute. Marty, send Frankie up here right away. Huh? Oh. Okay, forget it. What's the matter? Frankie, the croupier. Went off duty just after you won. It's not back yet. And he won't come back. Now, somebody planned to take the house this evening for that money. Somebody who couldn't risk getting it himself. So I'm the logical one. No one knows me here. I'd look like just another player. Later, Mr. Fixit plans to pick up the money and beat it. Who? Someone besides yourself who could get to the croupier and bribe him to fix the wheel. Got any ideas? Yeah. One. My partner. Well, that's it, then. It's got to be. But the girl, she doped you. That was a hard way to get the money from you. Listen, I've got an idea, but I'm a little cramped for room. Some of your partner's boys, particularly a guy named Tony, are glued to me. Get some of your boys to shake them off and I'll bring that money back to you. How do you know where it is? I know. Okay, Holiday. Remember, fast play and I'll find you if it takes the rest of my life. It's a deal. Now, uh, how about the boys? They won't follow you. Marty, a guy will leave my office. Some mugs are telling him. Stop him. Got it? Good. All right, Holiday. You're on first base. Go ahead. I was sure he'd be at the airport, and I wasn't wrong. He was sitting in the shadows on the outside. I walked over to him, and he looked up. Holiday, I thought you would be... Thought I'd be framed, huh, Frankie? What are you doing here? I've got a message from Kathy Lee. Kathy? She's... You ought to know you killed her. Ah, <laughs> you're crazy. Not only that, you've got $126,000 in that bag. $126,000 that looked like easy money. Shut up. That money doesn't mean a thing. It's the girl who counts, the girl who was willing to do what you told her to do. The girl you triple-crossed and killed after you double-crossed your boss who bribed you to fix the wheel. It's too bad you're so smart, Holiday. <laughs> It's too bad you led with that right, Frankie. Somebody call the police to uh, come and clean this up. The croupier was... Oh, please hurry, Mr. Holliday. I, I want to hear the ending. All right, Susie, all right. What do you want to know? Well, how did you guess that Kathy Lee was the croupier's girl? Well, her locket had his picture in it. Oh, they should have given you the money as a reward. No, thanks, Susie. They can have it. But there's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Holliday. And that's? You didn't get a tan at all. You're just as pale as when you left. Oh, $126,000. A murder and a tan, too, she wants. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his new picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production supervision is by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production.
Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's a tinseled wilderness of steel and of stone, and the foliage of darkness is thick and unyielding. You make circles and pretend you're not lost. You make circles and walk and try to break through. Then you get the message. It can't be done. Because it's a cage, a big cage. The animal cries you heard were your own. It's Broadway, my beat. At 10 o'clock of a bright December morning, Broadway's music shops open their loudspeakers. And Broadway wears a scrubbed face, a new haircut, and a flashy smile arranged to look appealing and innocent. Because Broadway is on its way to con Santa Claus. Then you get a look at yourself in a mirror decked with holly. And you know you're doing the same thing. So you drop a coin in the pot. Thank you, Danny. It feels good inside. And then at 46th Street, you see Patrolman Meshikoff ad-libbing his way through a crowd. But he's got a tight hand on a little guy with gentle and tired blue eyes. All right, townspeople, all right. The party's over. So make way for me and Santa Claus, huh, townspeople? Me too, Patrolman Meshikoff. Oh, Danny, I didn't notice you in the round of my appointed duties. And your duties? This little guy here, you see him? I see him. Hello. Hello. This little guy, he's crazy, Danny. Lost his marbles, like Meshuggah. You know what I mean? I'm not crazy. I'm only doing what I have to do. You have to do this? You have to give away $10 bills in the middle of Broadway? This is not only a hindrance to the flow of traffic, it smacks also of holes in the head. You tell me about it, mister. I'll tell you, Danny, even if it breaks my heart. This sweet little character is a potential client for Bellevue. He tells me he's got 50 grand to give away. Let him tell me, huh, Meshikoff? Would you like a hot cup of coffee, mister? It's pretty cold out here. I like it. Thank you. How about the automat, okay? Oh, very nice. Let's go. <laughs> he's a very nice man, that patrolman Meshikoff. He has a kind heart. I tried to give him $10, but he wouldn't take it. Will you take it for him? All right. We'll, we'll put it in the policeman's fund. After you, mister. Thank you. Here, I got a couple of nickels. You want coffee or, or chocolate? Chocolate would be nice. Uh, you think I'm crazy, too? You look like a man who worked hard for all that money. Why are you giving it away? Uh, here's your chocolate. Oh, thank you. Uh, I give it away because it's my duty to share it with those who need it. Those people in the street, maybe they're just greedy. Oh, here's a place. We can stand at this counter. Sugar? Uh, thank you. Uh, some people buy yachts with money. I buy little boats in people's hearts. Maybe they'll still be sailing when I'm no longer here to wave them on their way. Uh, you'll be here a long time, Mr... Uh, Henry Baker. No, I won't be here for long because I'm going to be murdered. What? My brother George. He'll murder me because he wants my $50,000. And I want to give it away before he kills me. Uh, what's your name? Well, Danny Clover. Look, I don't quite... Uh, you're a policeman, aren't you? Yes, uh, uh, Then you'll protect me until I give all that money away. Uh, you'll do that, won't you, Mr. Clover? Yeah. Y yeah, I'll do that. Oh, you're very kind. The kindness is in your face, Mr. Clover. Well, look, Mr. Baker, you you've done enough for today. Why don't you go home and rest? If there's any trouble, call me right away. Just give your name and they'll put you through to me. I may call you at any time? Any time. All right. Now I'll go home. Thank you for the chocolate, Mr. Clover. It was very kind. <laughs> Uh, Mr. George Baker wants to see you. Oh, well, show him in. Okay, Danny. I don't have Mr. Baker. Thank you. Lieutenant Clover? Yes. What can I do for you? Sit down. Thank you. I just learned you had a little talk with my brother. So? So this. I've come to ask you not to have him put away. You, th you think he should be put away? Well, he's mad. Oh, I won't quibble with you. I just know that. Mr. Baker, I talked to your brother a long time. 
I think you can be proud of him. Proud? <laughs> Hardly that. Making a fortune and giving it to drifters. Well, that's his own affair, I suppose. But it's the other thing. Which is? His insane delusion that I want to murder him. Yet you don't want him committed to an institution. Why? Well, I'm sorry for him. He means no harm. I try to help him. How? Well, I arranged that he be taken care of by a doctor. Oh, well, I'm glad you did. What doctor? An expensive one, Dr. Michael Sinclair. Dr. Michael Sinclair. I see. Oh, pardon me. Yeah, sure. Danny Clover speaking. He tried it again, Danny. He tried to kill me again. He did, Henry? When was this? Just now, just this instant. He shot at me, but he didn't get me. Oh, I'm glad to hear it, Henry. Uh, you'll have to do something, Danny. Promise me you'll do something. I promise. Where are you? Uh, 2150 East 20th Street. I'll be right down. Your brother, Mr. Baker. Well, what did he want? You'll have to excuse me. i got to get down there. He says there's been another attempt on his life. A gentle knock does it, Mac. Shall we try again? If you've got time to play, you've got nothing important to do here. Point yourself north, kid. Yeah. Now we stop rubbing noses, huh? Now we discuss our problem. You think so? I say we play some more. Copper. Huh? Blush to my shoes when I say it. I'm from the police. Oh, so I can't bang on you, huh? i got to throw my hands back against the wall and drop my jaw and say, golly. i got to do that because you're from the police. Do it. It'll make me feel important. Where are you from? From here, landlord. I had cards printed once that said Ben Croft, landlord. They got sticky on a hot day and melted, but I ain't changed. You want a crummy room? I want to see Henry Baker. Uh -huh. I got a theory. You want to hear? I'll tell you. A cop puts in eight hours a day with the city ordinances and a gun and phony muscle. That gives him 16 hours left to be a grabber. That's why you want to see Baker, grabber. You, an off-duty cop. Look, I'm working. I'm between card punching time. So when I say a question, you say an answer. What's your interest in Henry Baker? I like him. Answer. Like why? Because sometimes I talk to him, then I can stand to look in the mirror. Answer. Try this. Why didn't you want to let me in? Because people come here, try to get the little guy's dough from him. Because he's got a crazy idea someone's going to walk in and kill him. Because... Maybe he isn't kidding. Let's go. In here. Kill me. Who? Who was it? George, my brother. I saw him. He shot at me from the alley. Uh-huh. The shot came through the window, but there's no one out here now. He was waiting for me there outside in the alley. Then he took a shot at me. I see. You're sure it was your brother? Well, I know my brother, don't I? Sure you do. Hey, what's this sticking out from under the bed? Uh, you mean my suitcase? No. Uh, yeah. Yeah, your suitcase. Uh, Open it, Mr. Clover. Sure. Holy... Almost $50,000, Mr. Clover. Have a $10 bill. Go ahead. Take some. You're my friend and I want to have some. I didn't tell Henry Baker that what I'd seen sticking out from under his bed was a gun that had just been fired. I didn't tell him that the window glass had fallen into the alley outside. And I didn't tell him that all that meant he had fired the shot himself from inside his room and through the window. He didn't even know his brother couldn't possibly have been there. I couldn't let him know I saw through his child's game of attempted murder. But I could take the gun away with me, and I could call on his doctor, because a doctor is where you go when someone important to you is sick. Yes, what is it? I'd like to see Dr. Sinclair. Is he in? I'm Dr. Sinclair. Won't you come in? Dr. Michael Sinclair was the least medical-looking girl I ever saw. She wore a dress of some metallic cloth that shimmered in the afternoon light. And in her eyes was a kind of grave, mocking smile. And her mouth... Her mouth... The way you look at me, I wouldn't diagnose as neurotic. Not in the least. I'm sorry, it's only that... Uh... That what? I don't know. You're the doctor. It's that I'm a woman doctor, and women doctors are rare, wasn't that it? Rare? Yeah, that's it. And women have the vote, and give their seats to nice old gentlemen in subways, get their PhDs in psychology at Hunter College in the Bronx. You feel better now? I'm a policeman, doctor, Danny Clover. I want to talk to you about a patient of yours, Henry Baker. What about him? He tells me his brother is trying to kill him. Yes, that's what he told me. When did he first come to you? About two weeks ago. His brother sent him to me. 
What's your interest in Mr. Baker? Has he committed a crime? No. It's only that he's a friend. I want to help, if I can. Yes, he does have a lot of money, doesn't he, Mr. Clover? And he gives it away. It's good you're a woman. Don't be angry. I find greed universal. I have it myself. I just diagnosed you incorrectly, that's all. Or did I? You keep records of everything Baker tells you? Of everything everyone tells me. I record it on tape. New world, new methods. I find it more revealing and more accurate than taking notes. May I hear Baker's recording? Mr. Clover, what he says to me is in the nature of a confessional. I see no need to trespass on Mr. Baker's privacy. That's a law, isn't it? Is it? I'd like to hear the recording, please. I guess there's no harm done. I'll get it since you're a friend. So here it is. You'll find, Mr. Clover, that Henry's case is the usual one of sibling rivalry. More intense, perhaps. More outward going. More bizarre. How, how do you play this thing? <laughs> like this. Why should he keep imagining his brother's trying to kill him? That's my problem, Mr. Clover, and I... Shh, that's me. Everything. Just as it comes to you. It began when I sold my truck farm and took all the money and savings and started to give it away. I said to him, George, why do you want to kill me? You want my money. That's why you want to kill me. It's all like that, Mr. Clover. A recurring aberration. You think it's only that, eh? There couldn't be any truth in it. Oh, I strongly doubt it. How often do you treat him? Every day. Uh, as a matter of fact, he should have been here an hour ago. What? I called his rooming house. He wasn't there. I called his brother. Not there. Do you have any idea where he might be? Yeah. Yeah, Doctor, I do. I remember your face. Uh, here you are, sir. Will you help Henry, me? Henry, come here. Oh, hello, Mr. Clover. Oh, you're angry at me for giving away money again, aren't you? No, no, I, I'm not angry, Henry. Uh, shall we have another cup of chocolate? Oh, that would be nice. All right, Henry. Oh, but I, I, I can't. I, I just remembered I have an appointment with Dr. Sinclair. Uh, would you like to come along? All right, Henry. Oh, she's very pretty. Oh, Mr. Clover. Huh? What's the matter? Mr. Clover. Mr. Oh. His body slumped to the pavement and his face stared up at me. It was a face from which everything had fled. Terror, the waiting, the protest against pain, the slender knife between his ribs, the blood that nudged from the corner of his lips was the shape of his dying. Suddenly the crowd was aware that death had touched him. The confusion welled out from near the dead man. Eddie then broke itself into the fragments of people shopping for a happy Christmas. And with them, inside the sudden spasms of shock and motion, and lost, was a person who had just killed a friend of mine. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Did you know it was Buster Keaton playing Sing It Again's Phantom Voice these last few weeks? Well, now there's a new Phantom riding the airwaves on Sing It Again. For identifying him tonight, some CBS listener can win fifty thousand dollars in cash prizes, radio's largest jackpot. Phone calls go out from coast to coast. Be ready when Sing It Again comes your way over most of these same CBS stations later tonight. You've got to listen close on Broadway. That's the only way you can tell if the sudden sound you just heard was laughter or anguish. Not that it makes a lot of difference. Broadway reacts to clowns and dead men in pretty nearly the same way. And the dead man you saw lying in the blood of his death on a holiday pavement, you tell your family about. How the policeman pushed you back, but you saw anyhow. But you didn't tell how somebody came and swirled a mop over the sidewalk. Because somehow you knew that was his final recognition. 
the requiem for a man who had just died. But I saw it. I had to stay till the end. Until Henry Baker was shrouded and carried away. Until Henry Baker was made a matter of official concern. Then I left. I had to go to a place. Yeah, Oh, it's you, the police fella. Yeah, Croft, me. Then come on in out of the snow and cold and the dismal elements. See, I'm doing the right thing by you. Stick around, I got a bowing and scraping act that'll tug your heartstring to pieces. Henry Baker is dead. Did you hear what I said, Croft? I... I heard him say it once more. Baker, dead. See, it don't pay, it don't pay at all. Good little guy with a good idea, be nice, the world couldn't stomach him. Breaks you up, huh? Yeah, I, I don't show it good, do I? Because I don't know the words how to talk about it. To a high school graduate like you, I ain't being crushed enough. How did he die? The world slipped a knife in his back, a real one. I don't want to repeat myself this time, Croft. Who would want to kill him? I don't know you for a lifetime, Croft, so I'd say you might. Yeah, you'd have to say that. That's so you can smile when you draw your pay. You're being a keen police fella. Yeah, this keen. How come you got a hat and muffler on? The temperature's fine in here. I've been out. Smell my breath, you'll see. Around Broadway and 46? Uh-uh, nowhere near that. Stick around, Croft. I'm going down to Baker's room. A matter of $50,000 in keen, a suitcase. Keen police fella. Where's the light switch? Oh. Better? Under the bed. No suitcase. Maybe he found another hiding place. Oh, not in the closet. Maybe in the bureau. Hey, who turned out the light? Ooh. Somewhere I heard it, caught hold of it, and wouldn't let it go. Christmas bells banging an offbeat rhythm to a dream I never had before. I was in the middle of a room which was in the middle of a room which was in the middle of a room, and far away, far, far away was a little man with a blood-red ten-dollar bill tucked in his coat lapel. Then he did a clever thing. He, he did a backflip. When he stood up, it wasn't him at all. Her name was... It didn't make any difference... She was dressed in metallic cloth, and her mouth... Her mouth said I'd better get up. So I did. I looked for Ben Croft, and he wasn't there. So the thing for me to do was to get back to the office. So I did. There's a Dr. Michael Sinclair to see you, Danny. Oh, huh? well, show her in, Tartaglia. Okay. Uh, you can go in, da- uh, miss. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everything. Surprised to see me, Mr. Clover. Should I be? Yes. I'm a very busy doctor, and I know you're a busy, busy man, so I'll come right to the point. I want Henry Baker's money, all that was left of it. Oh? You're his widow? Henry never told me. Neither did you. Nothing quite so cheap as that, Mr. Clover. Henry promised me his money. Every visit to my office, he promised me. He said that when he died, he wanted me to have whatever money was left because I was good and kind and helped sick people. Henry said all that on a tape recording? No. No, that was our own secret. When a man says things like that to a girl, a girl doctor, Mr. Clover, she wouldn't record it as if it were a symptom of a wandering mind. Now, would she? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't want to keep you from your appointed rounds, Doctor. So many people must be crying out for you. You're saying I don't get the money? I'm saying we haven't got it. I'm saying a girl with a bright, shining mind like yours can make her own way in the world without robbing the dead. I'm saying... Quite enough. And all of it insulting. Ain't it the truth? Thank you, Doctor. Happy neurosis, Doctor. I was glad when she went. Anyhow, she ruined the decor of my office. I made a note to splatter the place with wax roses, then have her in again. 
which constituted the mixed-up daydream for the day. Right now, there was a man I had to see, George Baker, loving brother and sole living heir of a murdered man. I wondered how he reacted to the news. At his home, I found out. I have nothing to say to you, Mr. Clover. You don't understand about policemen, do you, Mr. Baker? When they intrude upon grief, they're intruders. I started to talk about your not understanding policemen. We got a right to make a nuisance of ourselves, Mr. Baker. The public demands it. What do you want to know? You thought your brother was mad, didn't you? I told you that. Of course Henry was mad. He gave away money. Money? What money? Money that was in a suitcase under his bed. Do you have the suitcase? Me? You have it. Uh Uh-uh. I don't have it. Then find it. It's mine. I'm his only living relative. Take it easy. Take what easy? I want that money. It's mine. See what I mean, Mr. Baker? What? See what I mean? You want that money so badly, maybe you'd kill for it. Get out of here! You can't say that to the law without nudging me with your elbow and smiling. You know that, Mr. Baker. I'll post a suitable reward. Does that interest you, Mr. Clover? A reward? Wait a minute. I know men like you, Mr. Clover. You're greedy. You're holding out for a price. So I'll give it to you. I'll give you 20%. Baker? 25%. So help me, Baker. I'll... No, no, no. No, don't hit me. No, I wouldn't do that. I'll just throw you away. Ah! Dog! Pig! Filth! Scum! <laughs> Back patrol Meshikov picked up Kraft. They're in your office. Hey, Danny, Danny, what's the matter? Oh, Danny, I picked up Kraft here at the Eagle Tavern. He was spending money like a drunken sailor. Yeah, get out of here, Meshikov. Okay, Danny. You ran away, Kraft. Tell me, bitter, bitter men like you, you always run away? Sometimes. Things leave a bad taste in your mouth sometimes, like you. You do that to me. Now you know. You slugged me, beat me up. That makes you feel good, huh? It would have, but I didn't have the pleasure. Maybe I can arrange it sometime. Just you and me. A pleasure. First, tell me about the dough. The dough that flowed like wine. It was given to me, given to me by a little guy who had a healthier brain than all of us. That includes you and me. Baker gave you the money? How much? A hundred bucks. Ten crispy saw bucks. That makes a hundred bucks. That made you a big man on Second Avenue. Now you haven't got it right, Mr. Clover. Baker gave me the dough. He made me promise to toast his way to heaven when he died. This I was doing when your bull walked in and stuck it up. You could have followed Baker up to Broadway. You could have stood in the crowd and slipped a knife into him. Then you could have taken his dough and hidden it. Ah, you want to know something, Clover? I'll... Bear my soul to you. None of that what you said could I do. It's a weakness with me how I'm in love with good people. Yeah. Yeah. Baker sometime had callers in his room. Yeah? The callers. Who were they? You. Me. His brother. His brother. His doctor. His... His what? His doctor, a perfume doctor with the body of a girl and the legs of a girl. Like how often? Like practically every day. It was a thing a man could look forward to. Her with a little black case and a smile. It's a... Hey, policeman, where are you going? I ain't finished with my confession. Oh... Mr. Clover, what an ex... The recordings of my patients. Mm. Here's Henry Baker's. Mind if I listen to it on the recorder here? Maybe Henry said something on this tape I didn't hear before. You heard all that was important. Not everything, Doctor. Like how it was you who visited him and not vice versa like you told me. Practicing psychologists do that now? They visit the patient? Oh. <laughs> I lied, didn't I? Uh-huh. Oh, Closet full of test tubes and bottles. Very medical for an unmedical doctor. Are you always nosy like this? Call it an occupational disease. What do you think happened to Henry's money? As a psychologist, your guess might be better than a cop's. Don't go in there. Hmm. Pretty bedroom. Planning a trip, doctor? No. That's good. Because this suitcase, it's kind of shabby for a career girl like you. Leave it alone, Mr. Clover. And the initials, H.B., What do they stand for, Doctor? Michael Sinclair in code? I have bad habits, Doctor. I open other people's mail and suitcases marked with the initials of Henry Baker. Hmm. All these $10 bills. They could have made Henry so many friends. He gave it to me. He gave it to me because I cured his fixation. They cure it with murder now? Let's go, Doctor. 
Grab a hat or something and let's go. That must be a patient, Mr. Clover. May I answer it? Yeah. I'll wait in your laboratory. Tell your patient you're busy. And doctor. Yes? Remember, nothing fancy. Just tell him to go away. I'm sorry, but Don't be sorry about anything. Just you can't me. come in here. Can't I? Can't I not? <laughs> I'm in all right. Now give me my brother's money. I don't have it. Give it to me. Give it to me or I'll beat you up just as I did that policeman. He wanted that money for himself like you do. Give it to me. <laughs> it's in there. In that room, my laboratory. Good, good. Very good. I sold my truck farm and took all the money and saved it. What's that? start to give it away. I said to him, George, why do you want to kill me? It's Henry. He He's alive. Money. But I killed him. I killed him. I'll kill him again. I'll kill him over and over again. I'll kill him. Baker, Baker. I'll kill you, Henry. I'll kill you, Henry. Makes me feel good to give it away to people. I'll kill you, Baker. I'll kill you. I need friends. That way, when you leave this world, you'll be remembered. What more could be a man ask? You see their faces when I give it to them. Don't look like that, Danny. Happy. You had to kill him. There was nothing else you could do. Yeah. Okay, Doctor. Get your hat. And so it was over. Done. A little man had given away pieces of his heart in kindness until it was shattered finally by violence. And his murderer, his brother... Two bullets had fixed the mask of greed on his face. Michael Sinclair? She had the money all the time. She cried when we took it away from her. But it didn't do her any good. Not a bit of good. Broadway is sleeping now, and the furious avenue of the night is still. It stretches out in front of you, without beginning, without end. Only the sleepwalkers are there, the handful whose lust for a dream or reality is never through, the seekers, the sodden, the huggers close of nothing. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Jerry Hausner, Rolf Sedan, Byron Kane, Lou Merrill, and Joan Banks. A week to go, and Christmas and its problems of shopping and presents grow serious in the minds of most of us. For the lighter approach to Christmas, may we suggest you spend Sunday evening with Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Red Skelton, Charlie McCarthy and Bergen, with Eve Arden and all the other famous CBS Sunday night entertainers. Now stay tuned for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you'll find Broadway is my beat every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. On Christmas Eve, Broadway's natives dance their Christmas dance to the music of carols flowing out of tinseled loudspeakers. The kids mash their noses against plate glass, lick it, and watch the mechanical clown, the mechanized tour army, the tin man dancing a jig on a tin box. Their eyes are dark with desire and hunger. 
They make a wish on a neon star. That's how it is on Christmas Eve on Broadway. My Beat. On the morning of the day before Christmas, creatures are stirring at police headquarters. There's the patter of tired feet and the sound of manly giggles as little gifts are hidden in desk drawers or poured into Dixie cups or slipped under the police blotter. And in my office, there's a kid I knew, name of Marty Wednick. Danny, I don't like to disturb you at this unmentionable hour. Ten o'clock in the morning, unmentionable? You kidding? Sleep has not yet fled from my starry eyes. What makes me bounce from my pillow at an hour which is for the squares is a problem. What's your problem, Marty? Am I or am I not the child president of your branch of the Police Athletic League? You are? So I promised my constituency of fellow former delinquents a Sandy Claus for Christmas. That's the problem. When are you going to give with a Sandy Claus? <laughs> Don't laugh, Danny. A former delinquent shouldn't be disillusioned. It could make him a neurotic. So I repeat, on behalf of my constituents, where is Sandy Claus? <laughs> oh, he'll be here in a minute, Marty. Sergeant Tartaglia... Oh, here he is. Come on in, Sergeant. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what This fun. guy's a sergeant? Huh? Hey, Tartaglia, this is uh, Marty Wednick. He wants Santa Claus. Oh, he's coming, Danny. He's coming. Come on in, Sandy. Everybody, make way, everybody, oh, for Santa Claus. Oh, ha, ha, ha. And what's your alias little, uh, uh, name, little boy? Ho, ho, ha. Hey. This guy's a Santa Claus. Who's the kid? The punk, Danny. Who is he? Marty Wednick, that's who I am. So you're Santa Claus, huh? <laughs> Audition me something. What? Why, you crummy Take little... Take your hands off me, Santa Claus. Is this the Christmas spirit? I'll give it to you in the mouth, fresh kid. You and how many rain? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, you two. Marty, this is Nick Norman. Nick Norman, the ex-con? How do you like this monster? For 15 years, I've been playing Sandy Claus at Sing Sing with no complaints, mind you. The first day I am a free civilian playing me old part, the squirt gives me the hook. I resign from Sandy Claus. I didn't get treatment like this even from the guards. Well, take it easy, Nick. Marty didn't mean it, did you, Marty? How was I to know that Sandy Claus here was the world-famous light-fingered safecracker? Ex-light-fingered, world-famous safecracker, you. Well, does he meet with your approval, Marty? Well, the costume is sloppy, the beard's moth-eaten, but... Yeah, he'll do. Don't do me no favors, punk. You want to know something, Nick? What something? I like you. I think you are the best Sandy Claus it has ever been my privilege to present to my constituents of the PAL. This is from the heart, Nick. Oh, that's better. You gotta show respect for Sandy Claus. What time's your party? Eight o'clock tonight. You'll be there? I'll be there. Well, so long, Danny. Sergeant. <laughs> Sandy Claus. See you at the party. Merry Christmas. That's a good kid. Appreciates the finer things. Feels good to be out, huh, Nick? Fifteen years is a long night without sleep, Danny. Yeah, feels good. And thanks for the job of Sandy Claus. I would miss it after all these years. The deal we made, that feels good too, huh? The... Oh, yeah, yeah, the deal, sure, Danny. I'll keep my promise to you. That's good. You won't forget what happened 15 years ago on Christmas Eve. How can I forget? It was like today. I was all dressed up like Sandy Claus. I had a few idle hours, and right in front of me, there just happened to be an idle safe. So I cracked it. So, so I got caught. Uh-huh. Now, what are you going to do now, between now and 8 o'clock, the time the party starts? Walk the thoroughfares and wish everybody joyous tidings and pat kids on the head. And, and leave it... their mother's purses alone. Oh, Danny, how can you talk to Sandy Claus that way? I promised you oh, that... I'm sure you did. Hey, Tataglia. Uh, yeah, Danny. Tag along with Santa Claus. Fresh air will do you both good. Oh, gee, thanks, Danny, thanks. You know, the fresh air will do us both good. Yeah, but hold his hand, Tataglia, so he won't get lost. We don't want him to get lost, do we? Oh, no, Danny. No, because what's Christmas without Santa Claus? Have fun, boys. So everybody was happy, and that was good, because it was the season for it. Sergeant Tartaglia was happy because I had not only given him permission to leave the room, I told him to go out and take a walk with Santa Claus. And everyone knows that Santa Claus is always happy, even if once upon a time he had to spread his glad tidings around Sing Sing. I considered it a while, and then I decided to inhale the bloom of Christmas as it filtered through police headquarters. And it made me feel happy, too. It lasted for two inhales. The sign on the door says Lieutenant Danny Clover. I don't believe in signs. What's your name? Uh uh. What's yours? I came prepared for a question like that. Here's my card. Oh, thanks. Simon Larrabee. Real estate and rentals. 
You're renting something, Mr. Larrabee? Ah, that would give you the upper hand. Two questions to my one. And you haven't answered it yet. Danny Clover, like the sign says. That's my name. You're quite right. I am running something. Go ahead. Rent away. I like to watch. I'm doing it now. Just looking at you. I'm renting that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. Well, if it makes you happy... Wait a minute. That's our clubhouse. That's where the kids are having our Christmas party. Are you? <laughs> What's the... <laughs> what else can it be? Where's the rent? Rent for what? Rent for that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. You mean it hasn't been paid? How much is it? It's sixty-two fifty a month. Oh, that includes utilities. I'll pay it. The club's treasurer will reimburse me. You don't understand, Mr. Clover. When I rent something, I get a year's rent in advance. That comes to $750. And I want it before there's any party there. Are you kidding? Why are those kids going to get money like that? Oh, well, I'll give you until 8 o'clock to get the money, and I'll just sit right here until then. All right. Grab yourself a police gazette. Never touch the stuff. Suit yourself. Oh, excuse me, Simon. Danny Clover speaking. Danny! Yeah, what is it? I can hardly hear you, Curcio. Yeah, yeah, well, no wonder. Listen what I gotta talk through. Listen, Danny. Hey, you see what I mean? Why the sirens? What's the trouble? Sergeant Tartaglia is up a tree. What? Sergeant Tartaglia is in a tree on the Avenue 8 playground, Danny. He flipped his lid. He's telling anyone that'll listen that there ain't no Santa Claus. Hey, you better come on down, Danny. When I got down to the Avenue A playground, it was having the Christmas party of its life. A 30-foot tree complete with tinsel, candy canes, colored popcorn balls, firemen, and a scared sergeant policeman, forlorn and lost, pinned to its top branch. The fire department finally convinced Tartaglia that a ladder was a safe invention for getting down out of tall trees. At the bottom rung, he almost believed it. When his feet touched the ground, they gave him a blanket because he was suffering from shock. He was about to tell the newsreel boys his ordeal when I faced him. Oh, Danny, Danny, I, I was about to tell the newsreel boys my ordeal. Well, oh, just tell me first, Attaglia, because I hardly ever get to the movies. I, I, I'll be with you in just a minute, sir. Oh, Danny, it was awful. It was something awful. I only ask this because there's so much about you I don't know, Tartaglia. Why do you climb trees? Oh, I don't, Danny. The height scares me. When I was a child, a tree threw me on the ground. Still, you climb this tree. Why? Well, because I'm a policeman. That makes sense. But how? Well, sure it does, Danny. The kids see me. I am a policeman. They need to put a star on top of their Christmas tree. They ask me because I am a policeman and can do such things. I couldn't let the department down, Danny. So, so you leave Nick Norman alone all by himself because you don't want to let the department down. Oh, I knew you would say that. But I trusted Nick because he is Santa Claus. He told me I could trust him. Sure you can, Tartaglia. But what happened to Santa Claus? He's not around. That's right. There ain't no Santa Claus, like I've been saying. They told me you were saying that. What happened to him, Tartaglia? Well, Danny, whilst I was up in the tree pinning the star, below me I saw a big black bulletproof sedan. What kind? A big black bulletproof sedan. Now I know. Then what happened? Well, this big black bulletproof sedan stopped by Nick, our Santa Claus. Two men got out, talked him for a minute. Then took them one by each arm, deposited them in the car, closed the door, and away they sped careening on two wheels. I yelled to them to stop, Danny. Eh, but I guess they didn't hear me on account of the hustle and bustle. Our Santa Claus, Tartaglia. Where is he? Where'd he go? Well, if I was Santa Claus, I know where I'd go. Not that it matters, but where? Well, to my mother. On Christmas Eve, she deserves something like that. I'm sure she does. Well, we have you now, Sergeant Tartaglia. Oh, make good in the newsreels, Tartaglia. This may be your big chance. <laughs> Yeah? Are you Mrs. Norman? Hi. I'm Danny Clover. Yeah? May I come in, Mrs. Norman? Hi. I want to talk to you. About what? About Nick, about your son. Come in. Thanks. In here, in the parlor. Sit down. Thank you. No, not on that seat, that one. What do you want to talk about, about Nick? Do you know where he is? Well, you don't tell me no more. One day when he was nine years old, Nick said to me, he said, Ma, don't ask me where I've been no more, cause I'll lie to you. That's what he said. Then you don't know where he is. Don't make me go through that again, Sonny. 
Say, who are you to ask me questions? I told you I was... Yeah, yeah, you did. You said you was Danny Clover. That don't mean nothing to me. Oh, you must be the guy come about, uh... Aha, uh-huh, I am. That's why I came. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, you tell me what you come here for. For, you know, just as you said... Oh, this I like. This lets me play cagey like in the old days. What are you talking about? You know your son, Nick. You got to squirm more than that, kiddo. What about Nick? We want him to be our Santa Claus. Bingo. That's good. Oh, it must be a good feeling, a young man like you. Big, strong, looking for Santa Claus. Me? I just sat here in my rocking chair. Mrs. Norman. Thinking about the times we had, me and Big Ed, my husband. The time... I have to go now, Mrs. Norman. Where is your son? Oh, you made me go through it again. One day, when he was nine years old, Nick said to Uh, me... Yeah, oh, thanks, Mrs. Norman. Ma, don't ask me where I've been. Hi, Danny. Uh, did you find Santa Claus? No, uh-uh, Tartaglia. What are you doing about it? Uh, me? Nothing. That's good. Anyone to see me? Uh, yeah, in your office. Uh, hey, Danny, Danny, well, what are you angry at me for, huh, Danny? Hey, Danny, what's this I hear about Santa Claus taking a powder? Uh, you'll get your Santa Claus, Marty. You still here, Simon Larrabee? Yes, 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 I'm waiting, just as I told you, I'm waiting for my 750 rent. Can you imagine this kind of Danny? On Christmas Eve, he wants his rent. This is a Christmas, no Santa Claus, no party. What am I going to tell my constituents? It'll work out, Marty. We'll get the money someplace. By 8 o'clock, Mr. Oh, Corbett. shut up, Simon. But Danny, no Santa Claus. Hold it. Hold it, everybody. I got the solution. Communications. This is Sergeant Tartagli in Danny Clover's office. An all-points bulletin. Pick-up man. Description as follows. Height, 5 feet 11. Weight, 235. When last seen, was wearing a red suit, a red hat with bells and black boots. Identifying marks as a long, snow-white beard. What's his name? Santa Claus! You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. $51,000 in cash and wonderful prizes. Danny Seymour might play Santa Claus to you tonight, and he might fill up your stockings with that 51 grand if you can identify the phantom voice. Listen in just a little later tonight to Sing It Again. Broadway brings you Christmas in a lot of ways. You get dribbled around by the opposing teams of last-minute shoppers. You ride backwards on up escalators so you can be in a good position for the down escalators. You get mauled and shoved and picked over, and finally you get gift-wrapped and sent on your way. My way was out to lunch and back to police headquarters, holding my Christmas stocking in my hand. I had two things, no rent and no Santa Claus. Two nothings which made for an empty holiday. Sergeant Tataglia wasn't enjoying himself either, and he expressed himself with sentiment. Ah, humbug. What did you say, Tartaglia? Bah, humbug, Danny. Uh, that's a Christmas expression I picked up to be used when you wished it was the 4th of July instead. Yeah, me too. Uh, you uh, seen the afternoon papers, Danny? Yeah, take a look at it. Uh, you look at it for me. What does it say? Well, first it has got a picture on the front page of a tree. In the tree is me. Mm-hmm. Then it says under it, it says, Officer Gino Tartaglia... Yeah, hey, Danny, they spelled it right. Now, Officer Tartaglia spent the afternoon cavorting in a tree to the delight and applause of all the little... Well, it runs on like that. Oh, forget it. It wasn't your fault. Then that's what I tried to tell Mrs. Tartaglia. Doesn't she believe you? Danny, she called me on the phone. I said, hello? She said, signal Tarzan. Then she started laughing, hysterical. I can't get her to talk. Every time I pick up my phone, all I hear is Mrs. Tartaglia laughing. <sighs> I got my problems, too. Yeah, this is probably the first time in the history of Santa Claus that he's ever heisted from his appointed rounds. Maybe. 
Hey, did you get in touch with Nick's mother again, like I told you? Oh, Danny, she ain't nowhere to be found. The old day must have skipped, and the 200 Santa Clauses that the boys investigated, not one of these is Nick Norman under the beard. Oh, I'll get it, Danny. Thanks. Sergeant Tartag... Huh? Yeah, he's here. It's for you, Danny. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. Danny, this is Maxie. You know, Maxine Riddell. Yeah, how are you, Maxie? I'm in lingerie, Danny. Come on down. What? In the lingerie department at Fletcher's department store. Working. I got news for you. News about Nick Norman. You interested, Danny? Yeah, yeah, I am. Hold on to everything, Maxie. I'll be right down. <laughs> Take this black nightgown over to that girl over there. She'll gift wrap it up. Hi, Danny. How am I doing? Great, Maxie. Only great. How long have you been working here? Only for the Christmas season, Danny. But the way I've been operating, I think maybe they'll keep me on. No no questions about your background? You mean about me being a shoplifter? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's the reason I got the job. The way I was lifting things, I told them it'd be cheaper for them if they put me on the sales force. So they did. So for 22 bucks a week, I'm an honest mouse. Anyway, it's steady. Keep it that way, huh, Maxie? Anything you say, Danny. Well, now that we've had our tea, I guess you want to know about Nick. Yeah. Breaks my heart to be a stoolie. You know how it is, Danny. Me with my former alliances. But it's different now. Yeah, different. I want it to be different for Tussie, too. You remember how it was between me and Tussie? How was it? It was gorgeous. That's why I'm being a pigeon, Danny. If Nick made up his mind to be a kosher citizen, he should stick to it. Not fall back into the arms of a mob like a doll who says mama. Which mob, Maxie? Tussie Cons. Such a name for a gorilla. Tussie. How do you figure a name like that? I don't know him. Where do I find him? Tussie just got back from Chicago. He bought the Domino Club. I happened to be passing there on my lunch hour, and I saw Nick in a Santa Claus suit drinking grape juice with Tussie. Oh, excuse me, Danny, a customer. Yes, madam. Something for yourself. Thanks, Maxie. For what? We have some gorgeous outside girdles, madam, for everyday wear. They're right over here. The Domino Club in the West 50s is a bright and shiny joint plastered with black glass. It stands close to the ground between two peeling brownstones. When you walk into it, you have the feeling you're walking into the mouth of a beetle. Its walls are lined with black mirrors, and its ceiling is draped with folds of scarlet silk. And at six o'clock of a Christmas Eve, the boys, complete with Christmas-wrapped girls, are beginning to gather. You ask a busboy in white tie and tails, where's Tussie Carnes? And he lifts an eyebrow to a guy standing near the bandstand. A guy grinning like an alley cat, while a girl pins a sprig of mistletoe to his lapel. You wait till she kisses Tussie. Then Tussie kisses her. But his eyes are open and flicking around the joint, so he sees you and pushes the girl away. Beat it, Blitzen. I got company. Merry Christmas, stranger. You want something from Tussie Boy? Same to you. And I want Nick Norman. Oh, that's a big desire on a holiday. Why you want Nick? Uh, tell Tussie Boy. Maybe I gotta explain. I'm Danny Clover, a cop. I want him. Don't everybody? Come with me, Sonny. Santa's right down at the end of this hallway. Merry Christmas, Melvin. Ain't it, though, Tussie? Merry Christmas, George. Likewise, I'm sure. I brought you a present, boys. Goody. Likewise. Where's Nick Norman? This fella here, he says to Tussie boy, he wants Nick Norman, our Santa Claus. Uh-oh. What big eyes you have, mister. And you know something else that's plain precious, boys? No. Do tell us, Tussie. The fella says he is a cop. Isn't that cute, huh? I could die. Yeah. So show the fella Santa Claus, huh, fellas? Merry Christmas, Danny Clover. Oh, Tussie boy said that, didn't he? Stay away from me. But first we want to wish you on a star, like... Are you too crazy? Stay away from me. I think that was not enough stars. I'll give him another package. You know that Tussie is good to us. He gave us the best Christmas present two fellas could ever have. Uh, don't be greedy, Melvin. Leave some for me. Oh, look at that. It's all gone. Ho, 
Come on, Danny, open your eyes. What? Yeah, open your eyes, Danny. It's getting late. Ain't you heard? Christmas is coming. Hey, it's you, Nick Norman. Oh, Danny, call me Sandy Claus. That's the nicest alias I got. Now, look, Nick, I'm going to... Oh, here, I'll help you up, Danny. Yeah, sit on the edge of the sofa there. Yeah. Sandy Claus, Danny. Santa Claus, huh? Sure. So help me, Nick, where I'm going to put you, you'll spend the next 94 Christmases in solitary. Take it easy, Danny. Come on, let's get out of here. I'll be late for that kid's party. Come on. Look, you mean let's get out of here just like that? I don't have to beat my way out of here? What for? What's all this about, Nick? Uh, Santa Claus... You're adult today, Danny. What's the matter with you? But you were kidnapped. Kidnapped? Me? Who would want to do a thing like that to jolly old me? A man in a tree said two guys pushed you into a car. He only had a bird's eye view, but he said kidnapped. You, oh, you mean Melvin and George. <laughs> I mean Melvin and George. <laughs> two pals from Chicago, Danny. They heard I was out and wanted I should be Sandy Claus to a private party they was given. That's all. Harmless guys, pals, buddies. We enjoy each other. Yeah, they enjoyed me, too. Uh, before they left town for this party, they said to tell you... Oh, wait a minute, I wrote it down. Uh, it says, uh, Dear Danny Clover, Sorry we made a mistake and beat up your head. May the bells ring a joyous Noel for you. Signed, XX. That's Melvin and George, A yes. mistake, huh? Sure. They knew some mob or other might try to get me as Santa Claus. They figured you was a mob, so they protected me from you, like like you was fibbing about being a cop. After they walloped you unconscious, they went through your pockets and saw you was really a cop. So they wrote this note. The running ink you see here on the note, Danny, that, that's tears. You'll forgive them, won't you, Danny? Yeah. How about your mother? Well, that was your error, Danny. You didn't tell Mom you was from the police, so she taught just like Melvin and George. You gave me the double talk. Man. Yeah, that's my mom. A grand old dame. You know you know what I told her once when I was nine years yeah, old? Yeah, yeah, no, I, my sleigh's outside. I'll give you a ride back to my office. That means the whole thing was an error in identification and motive, as they say, huh, Danny? That's right. Isn't that right, Santa? Sure. I'll tell it to you again if you want. You no, know, never it's mind. The... What happened to Simon Larrabee? Oh, he went out for a feast of spud nuts and coffee. Hey, you don't look very happy, Tartaglia. Uh-uh. No, Danny. I ain't happy. Unhappy. Very. What's the matter? We've got Santa Claus? Come on, smile. It's going to be a fine Christmas. I can't, Danny. I just can't. It's Mrs. Tartaglia. Hmm? Yeah, now she ain't laughing anymore. The neighbors are laughing and Mrs. Tartaglia is crying. Why? Well, the later editions in the paper said that, that Sandy Claus was heisted. And it was because I was in a tree. Yeah, the papers say I, single-handed, messed up Christmas. Bad as that, huh? Mm. Well, I'll tell you, Tartaglia... Hey, what about my Christmas party? Oh! oh, oh well, not oh, yet, Sandy. Oh. Wait till you get to the party. Say, the press was saying that you were snatched, Sandy. What gives? It said that mobsters grabbed you. No, nah, it was just a little misunderstanding. Uh, that's right, Marty. Nick was grabbed by mobsters. Huh? Yeah, well, then how'd you get away? Sergeant Tartaglia. Yeah? Uh-huh. Sergeant Tartaglia. The kind of policeman who tracks down criminals to the lair. I am, Danny? The kind that single-handed rescued Santa Claus from the jaws of disaster. This guy did that? Yep. I'm just about to call the press boys and tell them about it. Oh, Danny. I mean it, Tartaglia. Don't be so modest. I'm going to do just that. Danny. Put Marty in a cab, Tartaglia. I'll send Santa down the squad car in a little while. Yeah, sure. Well, come on, little tyke. Uh, I mean, uh, Marty. Okay. Merry Christmas, Danny. Whatever you tell the press guys, Danny, I'll swear to it. Sure. Sure you will. Yeah, that's a fine Christmas you're giving everybody, Danny. How about yourself? Oh, I'll have fun at the party. I always do. Oh. Where, where, where is it? Where's my money? Oh, look, Mr. Larrabee, it's Christmas. Of course it's Christmas. That's why I want my rent, so I can have a Merry Christmas. Hey, Danny, who is this guy that needs rent to have a Merry Christmas? This is Simon Larrabee. He wants a year's rent in advance for that warehouse where the kids are having their party. Or else, no party. Yes, that's who I am. Oh, like that, 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 huh? that, 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 So that's how you are, huh, Simon? Stop breathing in my face, Santa Claus. All them kids wanting to have a party, and a Simon like you wants to louse it up. I'll put him down, Nick. Yes, I ain't doing nothing, Danny. Just holding Simon up so I can breathe in his face. Oh, please, I want please. you to think about something, Simon. Think about all those kids yes, that are looking forward to that Christmas party, which ain't going to happen on account of you. Think about it. All right, it. I'm, th I'm thinking, yes. Maybe 
Maybe you could think better with a pen in your hand, Simon. Yes, a pen that will write out a receipt for a year's rent in advance, huh, Simon? And of course, of course, of course. Oh, Christmas spirit and all that. Yes, I'll get my receipt book. Uh. Ah. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I haven't felt so good in years. Ah, yes, here you are, Mr. Glover. A receipt for a year's rent in advance. And tell the darlings, Merry Christmas with us. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Ain't he a nice fella, Danny? Come on, nice fella. I'll take you to a party. Merry Christmas, Danny. It's a merry, merry, merry Christmas, Danny. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Broadway is almost like any other place in the world. The bells ring out, the horns blow... There's laughter. The Mazdas on the Translux spell out slowly, word by word. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. And you read it. You believe it. Because on Christmas Eve, you believe a miracle. Then a whirl of confetti is in your eyes, and you're pushed along with the crowd, and you never see the next news bulletin. You don't try to look back. It's Broadway. The merriest... Shiniest, lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Gil Stratton, Jr., Howard McNear, Hal March, Bert Holland, Shep Menken, Estelle Dodge, and Peggy Weber. On Christmas afternoon, Jack Benny will be heard as guest star in a full one-hour version of the comedy The Man Who Came to Dinner. Charles Boyer, Gregory Peck, Rosalind Russell, Dorothy McGuire, Henry Fonda, John Garfield, and Gene Kelly will be starring alongside Jack in this special holiday hour. Then an hour later, Jack will be back with his own Sunday night gang for 30 more minutes of holiday hilarity. In fact, the best idea really is stay tuned to CBS all day Christmas Day. Now stay tuned for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you'll find Broadway is my beat every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's December and the winter has caught hold, Broadway comes up with a miracle. Silver trees grow out of the sidewalks. Men with beards and red velvet suits suddenly appear from out of the Bowery and dedicate themselves to being jolly. And reindeer roam the tundra of the spectaculars. It's a time of Crosby records, noses against department store windows, and wishing you'd kept up the Christmas club payments. Everybody's happy. Even the finance company sends you season's greetings. The atmosphere hadn't touched the alley, littered and dark, except for a stark cone from a flashlight held by a policeman. Up here, Danny. 
Shot twice in the back. Still breathing. Come on. Come on, Doc. Take a look, Doc. Let's put him on the stretcher. I don't think this one's got much time. Give me a hand here. Yeah. Easy. We'll have him in the hospital in five minutes. Know who he is, Muggerman? Yeah. His wallet says Ben Justin. And here it is. The ideas of what happened? I think he knows who shot him, Danny. He was saying he'll get even. Any names? Uh-uh, no. Easy with him now. Just slide the stretcher in here. We'll ride with him. Let's go, Muggerman. Yeah. Okay, Joe, let's get this ambulance on the road. Kill him. Kill him with my back. Who are you going to kill, Ben? Watch it, Danny. Flat him out. Now, here, hold the bottle up like this. Yeah. Is it all right if I talk to him? You better hurry. Who shot you, Ben? Can you hear me, Ben? Ben. Wait a second. Hey, Joe, you can take it easy. Take your time. He's dead, Danny. Then the slow ride through swarming avenues, the slow tolling of the ambulance bell, because the rhythm of death is slow. Through the windows of the moving car, the procession of fleeting faces, of melting forms scurrying from the bitter touch of an unknown wind. Then suddenly, at a stop, because death in the city must wait its turn, the face peering in, avid for a furtive glimpse of pain, seeing only the shroud-covered man, turning away in regret. The ambulance moves again, and within it, silence, because there are no more questions that can be asked of the dead. At headquarters, the setting up of a file on Ben Justin. The word, murdered, neatly typed in triplicate. Then the fragments of his life drifting in to be pieced together, to be entered under the correct heading, on the correct line. Ben Justin lived in an apartment on West 86th. He was married to a woman named Evelyn. Go there. Ask her the question the dying man wouldn't answer. Ben didn't tell you? He was bleeding to death and he wouldn't tell you who killed him? No, Miss Justin. I like him for that. For a lot of other reasons, but this one's the best. And you will want to help us find his murderer. No, uh-uh, that's your job. That's what you get paid for. They shot him down in an alley. Sorry, they... but that's how I feel about things. You get what you work for in this world. No one can do it for you. You want Ben's killer? Find him. That way he'll belong to you, just you. If you know something, Mrs. Justin, we can hold you. Now, wherever did you get an idea like that? How would I know who killed Ben? It's his secret. He's taking it to his grave with him. Maybe I didn't tell you. Ben's last words were that he would kill him with his bare hands. Ben can't do that now, can he? But you can do something, Mrs. Justin. You can tell me about Ben. You can tell me who wanted him dead. Tell you about Ben? That could take my lifetime. But I'll brief it down for you. Ben did good by me. Dressed me in fancy clothes, showy. Showed me off to his friends. Didn't mind if one made a play for me. Grinned it off. Grinned about it when we got home. Cuffed me a little, and we go to sleep laughing. That's about Ben. Doesn't help us much. Then try this. Ben used to work for the Imperial Insurance Company, an investigator. Go ask them about Ben. I bet those insurance people knew more about him than even his wife knew. It's their business. Imperial Insurance? On Lower Broadway. You can excuse yourself now, Mr. Clover. I want to go over my wardrobe, pick out a black dress for Ben's funeral. Silk... Yeah, Silk. He liked me in it. Uh, yeah, it's very intriguing what you tell me, Mr. Clover. Look, why don't we go downstairs and chat about it over a cup of coffee? Hmm? Now, Mr. Cogan. Oh. You don't understand, kid. I haven't had my breakfast. How can I do my best for Imperial Insurance without something hot in my stomach? We're trying to find out who killed the man. For this, I have to miss my breakfast? I tell you, you don't understand. My wife sleeps in the morning. She doesn't ben make Justin me... Ben Justin used to work for you. I want you to give me what you know about him. Now. Because it won't wait. Ew. On an empty stomach? All right. All right. Yeah, he worked for us. One of our hottest cases... You're a goalie kissed us goodbye. You don't know anything about him after that. You're just... Uh... Look, kid, did I say that? I know a lot about Ben. Let me open my mouth a little, huh? It's open. 
A year ago, we put Ben on the Colton murder case. Remember it? Who doesn't? Mrs. Colton found murdered, shot to death in her house on Long Island. That one cost us, uh, the company, hundred grand. The police were handling it. Why did you put a private investigator on it? Oh, don't let it bother you. Justin flopped, too. He said he couldn't find a thing to prove that Mrs. Colton's nephew and his wife committed the mayhem. Remember Johnny and Dottie Reed? The lovable kids that all of us thought were the murderers? The state? Us? Till they were acquitted? No evidence. Not even from our own boy, Ben. And after that, Ben quit. How did you know? Oh, I told you, yeah. He turned in a memo that we should pay the kids the hundred grand insurance the aunt left the boy. Shook hands all around, resigned. Then right away we find out he was making merry with the Reed kids all over town in their home. How do you know that? It was a password in our office how Ben and his wife were always in the company of the kids. Why? The kids were acquitted? They have the right to make their own friends? For a hundred grand, we keep trying. <sighs> do I get coffee now? Yeah. Here's a dime. Let it be on me. Hello. What can I do for you? My name's Danny Clover from the police. Yeah. Is your name Reed? Yeah, that's right. I wanted... You uh... got to look in your eyes. You want to talk to me, don't you? Come on in. In here. I know that look, Mr. Clover. The police and I have been chummy before. Is your wife here? Vacuuming the rugs in the dining room. Daddy! Hey, Daddy! Yeah, what do you want, Johnny? Turn off the lewit and come in here. We got a caller. I hope you don't mind the way Dottie looks. <laughs> Holiday cleaning. What'd you say? Oh. Uh, this is Danny Clover, Dottie. He's from the police. I'll be honest with you, Mr. Clover. I'm busy. Well, just a few questions about Ben Justin. <laughs> Guess I'm right, Dottie, huh? Soon as I saw this morning's paper, I told you a policeman would be twirling his hat at the door. Then you talk to him, Johnny. I've got to get my work done. I'm afraid you'll have to hold it off for about five minutes, Miss Reed. Do you have a warrant? I don't need one. All I want... Uh, Dottie gets all mixed up. Ever since the cops scared her to death last year, well, she just could be lost, and the only person around, a cop, and she wouldn't ask him which way was home. Johnny isn't kidding. Cops. How well did you two know Ben Justin? We're not going to his funeral. Not even flowers, Mr. Clover. Funny. I heard you were pretty good friends. Two weeks ago, Johnny and I took turns yawning in his face. He still wouldn't go home. Then he used to drop in here often. Mm, maybe a couple times a month. <laughs> when I shook his hand after we were acquitted, he took that to mean buddy. He couldn't get through his head out of shaking anybody's hand. Ben then. Justin tried to send you to the chair. I don't understand. Neither did we. You inherited a lot of money when your aunt was killed, didn't you, Mr. Reed? You people can't leave us alone, can you? Hey, you shouldn't have asked that, Mr. Clover. Dottie's going to be upset all day. It's going to be like this for the rest of our lives. Dottie. No matter what we do, where we go, it's going to be the same way. Get him out of here, Johnny. Get him out of here. You heard him, Mr. Clover. You better get out. Dottie's busy. <laughs> If I turn on the radiator, Danny, it's cold in here. Huh? How can you stand it? There. Danny, you've been over and over the transcript of a year old trial maybe a hundred times. You want something juicy to read? Here, try this pulp. It's good, huh? Tells me the thrilling things detectives have happened to them. For two bits, it thrills even me. The things that go on. Mrs. Colton was killed with Johnny Reed's gun. Our ballistics man proved it. Brought it in evidence. Exhibit A. But no fingerprints. No fingerprints. And if you read the transcript another hundred times, there still won't be any. What are you trying to build, It Danny? bothers me. You mind, Muggervin? Danny, listen to me. The kid had a right to the gun. Messenger boy for a brokerage house. Briefcases full of stocks and bonds. Sometimes even money. A boy needs a gun in a career like that. They present him with it, courtesy of the house. And it killed his aunt. Endowed two kids with $100,000. The gun could have been stolen from him, just like he said. His wife put her arms around him. He felt different somehow to her without the gun. That was the first they knew it was missing, just like they said in court. Yeah. I don't understand what you're after, Danny. The kids were acquitted. I know. They said they spent the day picnicking on the Jersey Palisades. Nobody could prove different. Nobody could prove they were at the murder house that day. They were acquitted. I told you I know, Muggerman. Then what's with you? You think you found a free and easy way to solve Ben Justin's murder? I... 
Take it back, Danny. I, I, I didn't mean to say that. Well, I'm so chummy with the Reed kids. You mean Justin and his wife? You care about anyone else? Justin was a top insurance investigator. He couldn't find a thing to prove that the kids were anywhere else but eating ham and cheese sandwiches on the Palisades. That cinched it. When an insurance company... Danny, you gotta go. You just gotta. Here, I brought your overcoat. I'll help you into it. It's not too much, Tartaglia. Where am I going? To the residence of one Mrs. Evelyn Justin. She just phoned in, Danny. She was crying, then screaming. In between said cries and screams was sandwiched that someone was trying to kill her. I made her go slow so I could take her down in shorthand. Here, Danny, her very words. Yeah, get your coat, Muggerman. It's a cold ride. Down this hall, Muggerman. Come on. Right behind you. Wish I'd taken that call. Sounds real quiet in there. Locked, huh, Danny? Lean on the bell, Muggerman. Yeah. Danny! Danny, something happened. Take it in. <laughs> Mrs. Justin! Watch it, Danny. The place is a furnace. Mrs. Justin! Oh, Danny, you can't come in there. Don't be crazy. Yeah. I don't understand. What happened? We ring the bell, we blow the place up. You were listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There should be plenty of action on CBS Hopalong Cassidy show tomorrow night. Hoppy will be invading the land of the Gunhawks. And though this may not sound full of action at first, he'll finally play dead to capture a band of vicious marauders. Hopalong Cassidy, starring Bill Boyd, comes your way every Saturday evening on most of these same CBS stations. Join him in the land of Gunhawks tomorrow night. On the eve of the holiday, Broadway opens wide its loudspeakers, takes last year's tinsel off a back shelf, considers its tarnish, shrugs and hangs it in a doorway, in a shop window. Just above the summer resort sports shirt sprinkled with artificial snow and decked with dust-covered holly. It makes glints in the winter's sun, sways gently in the winter's wind, and it makes you all warm inside, doesn't it, kid? The warm-eyed women walking by, hugging the warm fur close to them, makes you merry, and the music floating out of the metallic throats. Good, huh, kid? But turn it up. That way you won't hear the dissonance of death. That way it won't intrude that explosion uptown. Anyone killed? No one knows yet, but when they do, it'll be given to you. Hot off the presses, shining from the Translux, gift-wrapped with red ribbons. But before that happens, they've got to clear away the charred litter, hold the crowds back, assure the lady her kid wasn't in there. You don't know where he is. And then finally a man comes up to you. It's all clear now, Danny. We can go in. They find anything? Uh-huh. They said in the kitchen. They said to watch ourselves. The walls are still smoldering. Okay, let's go, Michael. Yeah. He said in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Watch it, Danny. Doorway don't look any Come on. Not much left, is it, Danny? You were here before. Not much left, huh? Broken. Up in smoke. Hey. Yeah. Mrs. Justin? Yep. Explosion must have done it, huh, Danny? The way she... The way... She was beaten up first. Slugged. See? Here. Hmm. Here? Yeah. They made sure, huh, Danny? If we hadn't rung the doorbell, maybe they... Call it in, Muggerman. To homicide. I come bearing gifts from the boys in technical to you. You thank them for me, Gino. Goes without saying. Christmas is coming, Danny. Courtesy is the motto of the season. A fellow has Goes to... Goes without saying. What have you got? Gift number one. You are confirmed in your deduction that Mrs. Justin was slugged, left unconscious to... To, uh... Well, you were there, Danny. I don't have to spell it out for you. No, Gino. For this pearl, my thanks. This, a poet once Tartaglia. said... Yeah, Danny. Gift number two. 
The doorbell was rigged to a booby trap of a type commonly used in the last... Hmm, last. What am I saying? Ring the doorbell and boom! Blast! Poof! It was that professional. To the contrary, wise is Mr. Gordon from Technical. He says it was a clumsy imitation. Gordon didn't like it, huh? He sniffed his nose at it. However, in the matter of an inferno machine, what matters clumsy, huh, Danny? Anything else? Nothing else. Except an itching in my brain. Huh? Yeah. I am making out my Christmas list, and it itches me. Want to give Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detector from Philadelphia, for Christmas. Ah, the joy he has brought me. I should return it with a likewise. You... you got a suggestion, Danny? Yeah, only a question, Gino. How did you know it was Mrs. Justin you talked to on the phone? Well, she told me, Danny. Several times she told me. Well, what reason would I have to disbelieve what a lady tells me? You're trying to make out I'm a gulliver, Danny? You know... Pardon me, Gina. Likewise, I'm sure. When they tell you their name, see if you... Danny Clover speaking. Now, this is Swifty Crenshaw of the 34th Street Post Office, Mr. Clover. They referred me to you. Why? Oh, because I'm holding some undelivered mail for Mrs. Evelyn Justin. Bet you'd love to get your hands on it. Yeah, I would. Fine. Just ask for Swifty Crenshaw. Everybody knows me. Bye now. Who was it, Danny? A Swifty Crenshaw in the post office. Swift... Cren? See? See how you two can be a gulliver, Danny? You Mr. Crenshaw? Uh, you bet. My name's Clover. I spoke to you on the phone a little while ago. You bet. Just wait here. Hey. Here you are. The mail addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. Uh-huh. Uh, there's not much there. Circulars, a few Christmas cards from people who heed our message to mail early. One there that's sealed and the center tried to mail a third class. Postage due on that one, but I guess we can forget it, huh? Uh, I can save you trouble turning over that postcard. It's for a free grease job with 15 gallons of gas. Uh, that other is for a book overdue at the library. You've been having yourself a time, haven't you, Mr. Crenshaw? Hey, you bet. What's in this envelope? How do I know? Hey, it's no use holding an envelope like that up to the light. It's Manila. It's postmarked yesterday. Addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. The old box 626, 34th Street Station, New York, New York. Return address. The same. She addressed it to herself? Uh, what's in it? You bet, Mr. Crenshaw. Now. Okay, okay. Tell him to hurry. Mr. Jasper will speak to you. Good. Mr. Jasper on the phone. What about it, Jasper? You say you have a carbon copy of a subscription form for today's Lady Magazine? Where did you get it? In an envelope. Come on, your girl said you were looking it up, Jasper. The form is used by your company. Signed with the initials D.F. Who is D.F.? Donald Fraser. He would have gotten 400 points if he'd handed the subscription in. But why didn't he? Where does Donald Fraser live? 19 West 16th. He's a pretty good... Yeah. Thanks. You better come along, Muggerman. Right. You ring the bell this time, Danny. No, oh, I'll ring it. I read someplace if you crash in an airplane, the first thing to do is to go up in another one. Now, nah, you ring the bell, Danny. Thanks. What do you want? Are you Donald Fraser? So, what do you want? We're from the police. <laughs> Didn't you hear, Donald? We're from the police. Let's go inside. <sighs> Sit down, Donald. You want a cigarette, Donald? I don't smoke. You drink? No, I can't stand the taste. He's got refined taste, Danny. You signed this magazine subscription form, didn't you? Or didn't you? I don't know. You know. You know, don't you? I signed it. All right. You took a magazine subscription on November 2nd, 1949. That's the date on this form. It's also the date Mrs. Colton was shot to death. So... What's that got to do with anything? It's got this to do with it. It's a magazine subscription for Mrs. Colton. You took the subscription. Who signed it? I'll tell you. 
You're not kidding. Let him alone, Margaret. I, uh, I came by Mrs. Colton's that morning selling subscriptions. Mrs. Colton said to come back later. She wanted time to make up her mind. When you came back, Johnny Reed was there with his wife. I said, leave him alone. Yeah, that's right. They were there that day. The girl yelled up to her aunt that I'd come back. Mrs. Colton said to take the subscription. The girl signed for her. That does it, Danny. Not quite. Donald, then, uh, then Ben Justin got to you, didn't he? He was investigating the murder and tracked down a lead that a magazine salesman was on the Colton block that day. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, the very next day. Before I had a chance to turn the form in to Mr. Jasper. I, I, I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. For a thousand dollars, the trouble I'm in. I didn't mean to do anything. He talked me into it. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Let's go inside, Mrs. Reed. Remember how busy I was yesterday? I'm busier today. That's too bad. I want to talk to you, and I want to talk to your husband. All right, come in. I've got an idea Johnny's going to throw you right out, and I want to watch. Johnny! Johnny! Yeah? Look who's here, Johnny. Huh? Oh. Hi, Mr. Clover. Can I get you something? I just broke out a quart of beer. No, thanks. I want to talk to you alone. Ah, sure, sure, my pleasure. Uh, go make us some coffee, Daddy. I told him you were going to throw him out, Johnny. You're making a liar out of me. Just get the coffee, Daddy. Then you'll throw him out? If he annoys me. All right, Johnny. Now, what's a good word, Mr. Clover? What have you been doing with yourself lately, Johnny? Oh, this and that. I got enough money. I'm lucky with the horses. The money gets used up and replenished. I envy you. Yeah, got a system. That's fine. I'm glad to hear of it. Is this what you come all the way out here to talk to me about? You impressed me the last time I talked to you. <laughs> you kidding? No, I'm not. Say, uh, you think Dottie needs any help with the coffee? Yeah, probably. She's all thumbs. But she doesn't like you, Mr. Clover. Uh, maybe if I help her with the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you do that? Help her with the coffee. Uh, mine's with cream, Mr. Clover. Two sugars. What do you want? I just came in to tell you to get your hat and coat. That sounds familiar. That's right. You're under arrest. <laughs> hey, you're doing all right, Mr. Clover. You're under arrest for murder. Let me tell you why it sounds familiar, Mr. Clover. Because it's happened before. What happened before? A year ago, when Johnny and I were arrested for the murder of his aunt, the police separated Johnny and me. Then one cop came to me and said Johnny confessed. That way I was supposed to break down. They did the same thing to Johnny. <laughs> oh, as a policeman, you're a real nothing, Mr. Clover. A real nothing. <laughs> hey, let me laugh with you, huh? Oh, say, you remember what they tried on us before, Johnny, trying to make us confess? Well, your friend Clover just tried it again. <laughs> oh, Clover, Clover. All right, you had your fun. Don't you think you ought to go home now? I haven't had my coffee yet. Daddy makes such lousy coffee. It really isn't worth it. You know, I don't understand you. Throw him out, Johnny. That's what I mean. I came here to give you something for Christmas. Maybe I'm a little early. Maybe I should come back. If you're giving, we're receiving. What do you got? This. The magazine subscription form that your wife signed last year in your aunt's house. Where'd you get it? From Mrs. Justin's post office box at 34th Street Station. You got it figured, huh, Mr. Clover? Sure. It's proof that the two of you were at Ms. Colton's the day she was murdered. The piece of evidence the DA didn't have at your trial. Johnny, they can't try us again, can they? You, uh, planning to reopen the trial with new evidence, Danny? It won't be necessary. Justin bought this subscription form from the salesman. He was blackmailing you with it. Then a little while ago, he got afraid of you two, passed it on to his wife. That's where she had it, huh? That's where she mailed it for safekeeping after you killed her husband. You thought you destroyed it when your wife called headquarters and had me set off that booby trap. And now you've got it. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Danny. How much you want? How much were you paying Justin before you killed him? Don't bargain. How much? All of it. Everything you got. I want you to sign a confession, you and your wife. Let me sit down and think about it. Serve the coffee, Daddy. You gonna stir it with that gun? No. I'm gonna kill you with the gun. 
You want one slug or two? Johnny! Hey, hey, hey. Ah! Oh, oh. This will put you out of your misery, Johnny. You can have half of it, Mr. Clover. All of it. You can have anything you want. I've got what I want. Let's get your coat, Mrs. Reed. In the midnight cold, Broadway echoes with sounds you hear only in darkness. The fleeting whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. People pass and touch you. You look down, there are fingers of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Anthony Barrett, Sam Edwards, Virginia Gregg, Michael Ann Barrett, Sidney Miller, and Jack Crucian. Now, here's Larry Thor. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's program concludes the present series of Broadway's My Beat. We thank you for listening and hope to return to the air in the near future when Danny Clover will bring you more adventures along the Great White Way. Next week at this time, most of these same CBS stations will bring you a new program featuring Edward R. Murrow, Columbia's famed news reporter. This new program will be called Report to the Nation. And during its 60 minutes, Mr. Murrow will bring you not only important war and political news, but also summaries of all that's bright and new in the world of music, the theater, sports, and the other colorful, varied fields of American life. You'll hear recordings of great speeches and great events in the week preceding each Friday night broadcast. Report to the Nation will report the news for CBS listeners in this unprecedented series of broadcasts. Be listening for Report to the Nation next Friday evening on CBS. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, the Star's Address, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The day without color is only six hours old, and the restlessness begins to eat at Broadway. The waiting, the longing for the nighttime begins to gnaw like hunger, like thirst. Because Broadway's night is a banquet loaded with delicacies. The scarlet wine of neon, the forbidden fruit of a trumpet scream, the lukewarm stew offered on a tin plate through an alley doorway. But Broadway's day, that's the drab time, kid, the empty time. The time of leaning against sun-warmed stone and waiting. And you wait with the rest of Broadway because it'll come. Something will come. And it does. You know that because Broadway nudges you with an elbow, winks, says, Follow me, kid. The day has turned bright. And it's not far away where the day is bright. On 39th Street, just off 7th Avenue in the Garment Center. The crowd is already there ahead of you, toothpicking its last bite of lunch, digesting the spectacle of a man sprawled on the pavement. 
The dress rack he'd been pushing lay beneath him. There was a scissors in his back. His blood sketched a new pattern on the bright, flowered silk prints. And the man, heavy in the shoulders, pushing his face into the crowd so you can be close to it. So he can fill you in on it. About here fast, Danny. I was shown the way. Who is he, Mugovan? His wallet says he's Thomas Hart. Social Security card, YMCA membership, it all says he was Thomas Hart. These people know him. They call him by name. He don't answer for 20 minutes now, I'd say. Any of them see it happen? No, I asked around. They were all busy with shop talk, with wife and kid talk, with union talk. First thing they noticed was Sinclair Stylecraft's new sample spring line was spilled in the gutter. They kept the cabs and trucks from running over the dresses. Sinclair what? Sinclair Stylecraft. See? On a dress label. Huh? A dress manufacturing place up the street. He worked there. They all told me that. And I didn't even ask. Uh, keep him back, Mugovan. They're waiting for us to act something out. Just keep him back. After a while, one of the onlookers glanced at his watch and hurried away. Lunch hour was over, and he'd be the big man around the water cooler this afternoon. Something big just happened to him. He'd seen a man with a scissors in his back. And a girl looked up from the pavement, smiled across the crowd to a boy in a sports shirt, and walked away slowly. And a woman in a youthful hat took her place. In a few minutes, it was all over. Two men threw a blanket over the face of Thomas Hart and carried him away. Then, work to do. Thomas Hart worked for Sinclair Stylecraft. Ladies and Mrs. Dresses, down the street. Go there. Four flights up on a freight elevator. Nod to the gray-haired man holding the wheel in a comic book and get no answer. And through the rows of sewing machines where a hundred women spend eight hours a day with a dress pattern and a bobbin. Then finally ushered into the office of the man of destiny for the fourth floor, Mr. Justin Sinclair. Sit down, Mr. Clover, Danny Clover, police. About what happened downstairs? That's right. Uh, you want a cigar? Tell me about Thomas Hart. Sure, I'll tell you. You don't mind that I'm smoking, do you? Oh, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. What's that supposed to tell me? Look, I've been in business for a long time. A man gets hard driving for a dollar. Takes a time like this to make me know what kind of a man I've gotten to be. I'm not asking you to weep for the boy, Mr. Sinclair. I wish I could weep. That's just what I mean. I've forgotten how. Tommy was a bright youngster. So what if he was pushing dress racks around? I did it once. Tommy was interested. Tommy asked questions about the business. I'm sad, Mr. Cloven. Don't laugh at me. I'm more than sad. I'm horrified. Mr. Sinclair. Oh, come in. Come in, Stella. Miss Croft, Mr. Clover. Mr. Clover is from the police. Yes, they told me in the shop a policeman was here. That's why I... I'm glad you did. He wants to know all about Tommy. What do you want to know, Mr. Clover? Well, as much as you can tell me. Mostly why somebody murdered him. Tommy was an errand boy and pushed dress racks. I'm sorry he's dead, but frankly, he annoyed me. How? (laughs) Oh, Mr. Clover, come now. Look at Miss Croft, will you? Just look at her now. I'm looking. Does it annoy you, Miss Croft? Not yet. If you came into my office and stared at me sitting at my drawing board, then if you grinned, then if you winked... You really couldn't blame Tommy, Miss Croft. Natural, normal. Don't you do it, Mr. Sinclair. (laughs) Quite a girl, huh? Quite a young lady. What else about Tommy? Not a thing. Me either. All right. Where does he live? I can tell you that. Follow me out. I'll get the address for you from our personnel man. Yes, you'll find Sinclair Stylecraft cooperative, Mr. Clover, anything, anything at all. Next time, knock soft, mister. You want something from Jonesy, the keeper of the garbage pails, the collector of rent, she'll knock soft. They told me Thomas Hart lived here. Show me his room. Tommy? Tommy's dead. It's been the topic of the day for the tenants how Tommy's dead. He don't need nobody in his room. Now he's dead. Can't use him. Look closely, Jonesy. This is how a policeman looks who wants something. Huh? I don't care what your sickness is. Next time, knock soft. Come on. You knew Tommy? No, sure I knew him. He never wrapped his leavings in the newspaper, not even a a greasy brown paper bag. What else do you need to know about a man? Sometimes you'd open your door and peep at his collars. Sure I peep. 
You don't peep when you get the chance? Back off, Jones. Who'd you see? Who? Uh, well, once it was a guy with a dirty white apron and a sack of beer cans. Uh, up these stairs, he went whistling. Uh, give me a minute, I'll tell you what he was whistling. Uh, no one else? Sure, sure, someone else. With silk stockings and high-strapped shoes. But living as I live in a basement apartment, it got away from me before I could see the face. That never took a moment's happiness away from me, not seeing her face. What do I do? Yeah. Tommy's room. Phew. Crummy tenant, wasn't it? Crumbs bring exterminators. Exterminators cost the management money. Take your hands off Tommy's suitcase. Something in this shirt pocket. What? Nose tissues? Tommy was always with nose tissues. I forgot to tell you. Money. Twenties, tens. Five hundred dollars. All's in there is a wash basin. Hmm. Yeah, that calendar you're looking at, I got piled downstairs. You can take your choice. Don't rob a dead man's dream. There's an address scribbled under the picture. Directions. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Out of the way. Uh, that's a dress, all right. You think, uh, hmm? Knock soft, Jonesy. You want something, knock soft. Yes? The nameplate on the door says this is the residence of Justin and Elizabeth Sinclair. Is that right? No, I'm Mrs. Sinclair. What is it you want? Well, my name's Danny Clover. I'm from the... The police. You're from the police. Well, come in, please. My husband phoned and said a policeman might be around. Oh, my. Girls, girls, we're raided. <laughs> oh, I was just fooling. <laughs> no, Mr. Clover didn't come here to break up our canasta game, did you, Mr. Clover? We're only playing for a 20th. This is Mrs. Westfall, Mrs. Meston, and Miss Natalie. Now, Miss Natalie does our hair after the game. She wins our... Can we talk someplace, Mrs. Sinclair? Well, of course we can. Deal me out, girls. In here. We'll close the door so we won't be disturbed. Now. Now tell me all about it. All right. I came from Tommy Hart's room a little while ago. He had some directions penciled on a calendar. The directions brought me here. Well, but I don't understand. Tommy's dead. Maybe Tommy scribbled those directions before he was murdered, huh? Oh, of course. Surely. Then Tommy must have been here on some occasion or another. Well, of course he was. What was the occasion? Dinner. You'd think I'd get someone in to cook dinner, wouldn't you? But I didn't. I never do. No, I still cook, Mr. Clover, like I did before all this happened. All this, you know, the French provincial furniture and the set of books and sending my son to private school. And... When was the last oh. time Tommy was here? Did my husband tell you? Why, it was last night. Just last night, Tommy was sitting in that chair you're sitting in now, with that girl draped over him, lighting his cigars and waiting on him hand and foot. What girl did that? Well, the girl Tommy brought with him to dinner. That bleach blonde from the shipping department. In my house, imagine. Why my husband tolerates What it. was the girl's name? Ginny. Ginny Morrow, I think. And she works for your husband? I told you she did, in the shipping department. Oh, check her or something, I don't know. He invited Tommy over because well, Tommy's bright and maybe someday he could learn the business. But why the girl? I don't know. What else can you tell me about Tommy? He ate everything that was put on the plate in front of him. What else? What else? Mr. Clover, I'm a married woman. I've got a son taller than me and... She took me by the hand to prove it. Back to the canasta table. The son was doing fine, wasn't he, girls? Wasn't he? And her life with Mr. Sinclair was all a girl could ask for, wasn't it, girls? What right had a policeman to come nosing around spoiling everything? The card game, the hairdos, making the canapes grow cold, letting the ginger ale turn flat just because someone stuck a pair of scissors in her husband's errand boy. So I explained the rights of the dead. And the girls cried, scooped up the cards, shuffled, re-dealt, and I got up. At Sinclair Stylecraft, ladies and Mrs. Dresses, a woman finished a seam, took the rimless glasses off her nose, rubbed her eyes, told me Jenny Morrow, shipping, was on the loading platform having a smoke. 
You can keep looking at me, mister. The view is for free. Teeth, courtesy Dr. West Miracle Tough Toothbrush. Hair, courtesy Peroxide 10%. Eyes, cheeks, figure, courtesy Careful Planning. You're Jenny Morrow? For you, Jenny. Mom called me a Jenny. Found the name in a book someone threw in the trash can. Dramatic, ain't it? Some questions I want to ask you, Jenny. Questions about... You're the... a policeman, ain't you? Yeah. Tell me about Tommy Hart. Mine hostess of last night blabbed to you, huh? Okay. How long did you know Tommy? Long enough to slap him a couple of times, slap his mouth. Then he says he'll make up to me. He'll take me to the boss's house for dinner. Big deal. You didn't enjoy it. Here I am practically spilling my life's blood on you, and I don't even know your name. Oh, Danny Clover. <laughs> it suits you. <laughs> no. No, I didn't enjoy the supper, Danny. I got the feeling... Uh, I'm crazy. I'm making it up out of my own head. What feeling, Jenny? You ever had it? The feeling that you've been taken someplace just so as you could insult people with your presence. Just by being in a place you don't belong, it's an insult. Just by being what you are. But Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair invited you, Jenny. Tommy twisted an arm. That's how come I'm invited. Big deal. Tommy did that to you and he's your steady boyfriend? Oh, steady. What steady? That Daisy go pin on Stella the designer. Me. I was the last name on the list. Stella Croft? Stella, the designer of designs. Where is she? By the Pantages Theater on 42nd Street, in the third row on the aisle. An arrangement we got with the management, so Stella can steal the latest Paris creations from the Parisian actors. <laughs> oh, Stella has a life. Maybe it'll come to me someday. I'll work on it. It was a five-minute walk to 42nd Street in the Pantages Theater. On the stage, a man in a plaid dinner jacket was having a little trouble hoisting a girl to his shoulders. But when he did, they were fine together, circling faultlessly to the music. By the time I got down front, the man was holding his partner over his head, spinning, smiling, and turning red. Stella Croft is there, all right, pad and pencil poised, staring at the act. The dancers bowed. Everybody applauded. Everybody was happy. Not Stella. Stella with a scissor stuck in her side. Lifeless Stella. Dead Stella. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Every Sunday evening, CBS brings you two of its top comedy stars, Jack Benny and Eve Arden. It makes no difference where you live, whom you know, what your job is. Everyone immediately feels at home with Eve Arden's romantic Harris school teacher and with Jack's careful spending, perennially youthful portrait of himself. CBS cordially invites you to join them this Sunday again when Eve Arden plays our Miss Brooks on most of these same stations and Jack Benny and his gang are heard on them all. Now the second act of Elliot Lewis's production of Broadway's My Beat. Of an evening in springtime, Broadway stands on a street corner, sips its penny plain, and counts its blessings. The Yanks, the Giants, the Bums, only a ten-cent subway ride's distance, and usually worth it. There's bottled orange juice from sun-kissed California to be tasted for a nickel. And the rides are getting painted at Coney. And the moon that rocks down over Manhattan in April is a special kind of moon. And the music that lilts from doorways is a special music. And the girls are golden. There's more, too. It blinks around the translux and demands your attention for ten seconds. Girl stabbed at the Pantages Theater. Police seek early arrest, especially me. Oh, it's you. I was expecting the Mestons. More canasta, Mrs. Sinclair? More people dead. The Mestons were coming to console us. They're good at it, make it enjoyable. I don't suppose that's why you came. No. But you want to come into my house and ask your ugly questions. Uh-huh. Just stand right where you are. Justin, it's that cop I told you about, the one who... Does he have a right to come in? Of course, Elizabeth. Of course. The man has all the rights in the world. Yes, dear. Justin says you may come in. Sit down, Mr. Clover. Take the world off your back. 
Sit down and talk to Elizabeth and me. Cigars there at your fingertip. Anything you need, ask Elizabeth for. Maybe Mrs. Sinclair would like to make you some coffee or a sandwich. Or... Anything that'll take her out of there, huh, Mr. Clover? Don't be embarrassed. You can talk in front of Elizabeth. She knows more about the man Sinclair than I know. Correct, baby doll? Yeah, you want to know about Justin's friendship with Stella, is that it, Mr. Clover? Before the scissors episode, I mean? Well, that's it. I didn't think we'd get around to it so easy, but that's it. You won't mind if I tell him, Justin. Not a bit of it, baby doll. Just hand me a cigar first. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any time, Mrs. Sinclair. This friendship, as you called it? It was you, Mrs. Sinclair. I remember because it surprised me, the name you gave her. You thought it. There was nothing between Stella Croft and my husband, Justin, except the normal relationship of an employer to his employee. Consultation over address designs during working hours, approval, disapproval, the putting into production, the countersigning of the weekly paycheck. Nothing more, Mr. Sinclair? There was more, she'll tell you. There were the times my husband, Justin, took her to fashion shows, to dinners for the buyers at expensive places. There was the time of a manufacturer's convention in Atlantic City. Justin called me every morning, every night. Stella was pretty. Some people thought lovely. She brought us customers, made us richer. That was what was between Stella and my husband. Nothing more. You don't know why she's dead? No, we don't know. But it saddens us, Mr. Clover. Send him home, Justin. I'm tired. I want to sleep. If the Mestons come, tell them I'm sick. They'll understand. More legwork now. The pinching up of the bits and scraps that people leave behind. Get as many as you can and arrange them chronologically, by emotion, by habit, by appetite. Draw a line, one from the other, and peep at a life now nearly dead. For instance, go now to the apartment of Stella Croft. Walk the corridor that once brought Stella home. Turn the knob of her door. The girl in the room was wearing slacks. She watched me close the door. Blew a smoke ring from her cigarette. Watched it die. Then she smiled at me. Hi, Danny. What are you doing here, Jenny? Oh, taking the tour. Seeing how a girl lives when she works in the front office of Sinclair Stylecraft. Gosh, quilted blue satin. How did you get in here? Did you see the superintendent downstairs? Yeah. Did his eyes light up when he saw you? Uh-uh, huh? Jenny, how well did you know Stella Croft? Who gets to know a dame like that if you're another dame? Look, Danny, I'm not the type to be a Pollyanna. My mother told me, Jenny, never be a Pollyanna. Stand on your own two feet. You don't like somebody, don't like them. And that's how I felt about Stella, to a T. Because she had all this, because she was going out with Mr. Sinclair? So I was jealous. But this apartment is something to get jealous about. You're going to try your luck with Sinclair? <laughs> He's already noticed, Danny. The day that I wore that black velveteen with the peasant blouse, he spent practically the whole morning in the shipping department giving me a personal supervise. <laughs> you want me for anything more, Danny? No. Just be around where I can find you, Jenny. Oh, sure, Danny. I really would, Danny. I'd drop all my appointments. The apartment looked like Jenny hadn't touched anything. The place was impeccable, slick, like Stella Croft had been. Lacquered furniture, highly waxed, and full-length mirrors. I walked back into her bedroom, around it, fingering this and that. The small, intimate souvenirs a girl like Stella collects. Then over to a Pullman closet, opened it. Wondered for an instant why a woman needed so many shoes. Wondered... <laughs> wondered why it hurt so much. The brightness of it, the pain, the sharpness slipping so easily into my back. Then gave it up because I couldn't hold on to it. Hmm. And now the finishing touch, Danny. 
the claim to fame of Dr. Sinsky. In medical school, it was always commented upon how Dr. Sinsky finished off his handiwork. It's the bedside manner. I don't need it. Yeah, uh, that's right. You don't need it, Danny. Now hold on to something, Danny. It'll hurt. Yeah, yeah, hold on to something, Danny. To me, it's going to hurt. <laughs> he held on to something. To me, and it still hurt him. What is it with you, Dr. Sinsky? Maybe you need a refresher course in adult medical education. <laughs> Unruffle your feathers, Mother Tentacle. I'm all right. Yeah. Listen to him, Doctor. Last night he got a hole in his back from unsharpened scissors, and this morning he tells me he's all right. Okay, if I go back to my office, Dr. Sinsky. You'll need rest, Danny. I'll bear it in mind. Okay, check me in the morning. You hear, Danny? You hear? Yeah. The debt piles up, doesn't it, Doctor? What debt? What are you talking about? I'll count out the times you've eased the pain. I'll let you know. Uh, get him out of here, Gino. Yeah. Yeah, come on, let's go, Danny. I'll go get permission from the captain to give a sick leave, and then I'll, I'll conjure up a squad car, and we'll surprise the Mrs. Sergeant Artaglia in the middle of a mozzarella, and then we'll solve your, your, our wound together, and then... What made two people die like that, you know? Tommy Hart, Stella Crofty. Danny, Danny, you disappoint me. You are thinking on your sick leave time. What ties it together, Gino? Danny, if I tell you, you promise to let me manage your sickness? Huh? What ties it is Tommy Hart and Estella Croft were once married in that place in Maryland, you know, on that quick marriage plan? I ain't making it up, Danny. Mugovan dug it out of the records. It was a secret between you two? Oh, Danny, don't mean nothing. They got an annul the next day. That unties it. Danny, you're jeopardizing your good health. Danny! Good morning. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Hi, Danny. Hey, look at me. Yeah, look at you. Since when they move you out of the shipping department into the reception desk? Since this a.m. I told you. I got supervised into it. Oh. Tell Mr. Sinclair I want to see him. Sure, Danny. Watch me. See? Is it, Miss Morrow? There is out here at this moment the gentleman of the police department, a Mr. Danny Clover. Show him in, show him in. Very good. To that door, Danny. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Sinclair. I'm a busy man, Mr. Clover, but I always have time to talk to you. Mr. Sinclair, how much of your affairs can you get in order in the next 15 minutes? My business, we never talk in riddles. It's how much, why, when, things a man can answer. What's on your mind? You, Tommy Hart, Stella. They worked for me, Mr. Clover, and they died. I'm going to pay for their funerals, and I'm going to find out if they had families. They'll be taken care of. We have a fund toward that. Tell the people at headquarters it might make an impression. Honestly, honestly, no. I don't know what you're talking about. Let's stop kidding each other, Sinclair. You're a man with tastes, from the lines of women's dresses to a lacquered apartment to a little employee who's now your receptionist, from Stella Croft to Ginny Morrow. Better find out if Ginny had a husband. I still don't follow you. Then I'll tell you. It's called the Badger Game. Listen to me, Mr. Clark. You listen to me. Tommy and Stella weren't married. Did you know that? You didn't know it, huh? I thought. I, I saw the certificate of marriage. The justice of the peace who married them. I, I thought... Marriage and all the next morning. Badger game. Stella invited you to make a play for her. You bit. Tommy walks in, waves a certificate of marriage. You pay him. Money. Invitations to your home. He gets greedier and greedier. So you kill him. I didn't have to. You don't know what it was, Clover. That boy grinning into my face, taking over my house, making me... What is it, Justin? What's the matter? What happened? Make him understand. Make him understand. Mrs. St. Clair, your husband just confessed to killing Tommy Hart. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you kill him? It's all right, Justin. I'm here now. It's all right. You got Tommy out of the way, St. Clair. Why did you kill Stella? Uh, listen. I said it was all right, Justin. And I'll tell you why. Stella knew you killed Tommy. It didn't worry her very much. She just upped the blackmail ante. St. Clair, that's why you killed Stella. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. You did? For what she was doing. Doing to my home, to my husband, to my boy, to my boy's name. Yes, and I stabbed you, too, for what you were doing to us. I killed. I'd kill again. What'll we do about the boy? You didn't think, did you, Justin? You just didn't think when you started it. When you saw that Stella, you didn't think. Please, please. Oh, the boy will be all right. We have money. It's more than you had when you started. He'll be all right, Justin. It's going to be all right. 
In the April night, Broadway echoes with sounds heard only in darkness. The whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. There's a touch on your coat, you turn. There's no one, nothing. Only the trail of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Irene Tedrow was heard as Elizabeth Sinclair, Herb Butterfield as Justin Sinclair, Sylvia Sims as Ginny Morrow, Mary Shipp as Stella Croft, and Sidney Miller as Jones. <laughs> If you're in the mood for mysteries, you can try CBS almost any old evening. And there's a top-notch thriller on hand for you. Tomorrow and every Sunday, it's Charlie Wilde. Monday nights, the top Hollywood stars appear in original thrillers on the Hollywood Star Playhouse. Thursdays, there's a swell night for mystery and thrills on CBS. Suspense, Mr. Keene, and the FBI in Peace and War are heard on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. Risen from not one, but two deathbeds. Oh, Sam, I bet not. You wouldn't take that lying down. Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Well, you did first, Sam. I did not. Oh, you mean you actually Oh, don't pin me down. Anyway, I was present at two dying declarations. Would you believe, Effie, that a man could say something that wasn't true at a time like that? Oh, no. You mean a man would be lying on his deathbed? Oh. Effie, you made a joke. Oh, Sam, now stop it. I don't know what you It's all right, Effie. I forgive you. You can atone by telling me how wonderful you think I am. I think you're... That you may do when I arrive in a trice to dictate my report on the deathbed caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Tell me, mister, how many times a day do you have to comb your hair? Not many, I'll bet, if you groom it right first thing every morning with Wild Root Cream Oil. For this famous hair tonic grooms your hair neatly and naturally and helps it to stay that way throughout the day. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. With Wild Root Cream Oil, you don't have to keep combing your hair every two minutes. (laughs) That is, unless your gal can't resist running her hands through it. Get Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Many 
brave hearts are asleep in the deep. Oh, Sam, you're a sailor. Captain Sam, or is the brig for you? You got your logbook handy, gal? Oh, yes, Captain. So beware. You make it that's awful deep. Be. Oh. Uh, date, June 20th, 1948. Where? Oh, Sam. I have no shame. To uh, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California. Attention, Deputy Woodington from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the uh, deathbed caper. Dear Bill, the uh, dawn came up like thunder out of Chinatown across the bay. In San Francisco, all we could see was fog. But on your side, it must have lifted briefly because somebody named Dan Starbuck managed to find his way to a phone booth, call me, and ask me to meet him at the Third Street Pier in Sausalito. I didn't see him when I first got there. I didn't even see the pier. It was too foggy. But in the glow of the neon lights in front of the Viking Saloon, I saw a man who seemed to be waiting for somebody. He was a big guy with a good face, but plenty of worry on it. Mr. Spade? Yeah, Mr. Starbuck? Dan Starbuck. Come on down to the end of the pier. I'll explain as we go along. We've got to hurry. You act hot. You wanted for something? Well, I'm... not yet. What's the caper? Well, it... My brother's out there on his yacht, the Marguerite. He's dying. When he's dead, they may call it murder. I want to be there with a witness. That's you. In case he has anything to say about it. who did it. Who did? They think I did. Did you? Well, honestly, I don't know. It happened the night before last. I went out there to see him. We've hated each other for years. We've both been drinking, and we drank some more. Then there was a fight. I drew a blank somewhere. Next thing I knew was around midnight. I pulled myself together, went into his cabin. Gordon was lying there with his head all kicked. I realized I was covered with blood, and I was holding something in my hand, big glass paperweight. I dropped it. I got out of there fast and swam ashore. I planned to tell you a different story, but that's it. You want the job or not? You think you'll make a deathbed statement that'll clear you and you want me for a witness? Yeah, that's it. You got a lot of guts. I'm hired. Good. Uh, Halverson? You down there? Halverson! Who's Halverson? Uh, he's a boatman. He'll row us out. Halverson? Hey, Nils? Danny? Yeah. Is that you, Casino? Sure. Can I do you some favor? Uh, I want to go out to the Marguerite. I can't find Halverson anywhere. Well, I guess I can take you. Are you sure? Yeah, you... I'm sure. Oh, uh, Sam Spade, Del Casino. He's the boss of the Marguerite. Glad to meet you. Sam. Any front of Danny's. Hey, listen, Danny, you sure you want to go out there? Any reason why you shouldn't? Well, it's up to him. In his place, I would be on a freighter for China, way out there where the fog is more thicker. No, it's all right, Casino. I know what I'm doing. Well, uh, your friend, you, you excuse me, your name? Spade. You, pardon me, I better ask. The police don't want you for nothing? Not yet, but don't make book on it. Uh, push us clear, Danny. This fog is closing in. But I can still see the lights from the Marguerite. I wish we don't find her. But we did. She was wearing clam diggers, an off-the-shoulder T-shirt, and was leaning against the rail as the dinghy pulled past the police launch and nestled in under the ladder of the yacht. Dell? Dell, is that you? Yes, Mr. Starbuck. Who is that with you? Keep quiet. Dell. Dell, what are they saying ashore about... The... Oh, I, I thought you... You're Mrs. Starbuck? Yes? I'm Sam Spade. I'm from San Francisco. I'm a detective. Your brother-in-law's in the boat. You captured him? He wants to come aboard. He wants to... Why? He's hoping your husband will say something to clear him before he dies. Is there any reason why he shouldn't come aboard? Oh, there's every reason in the world why he shouldn't. The police are in there with my husband right now. Yeah? The doctor says there's a possibility that he may regain consciousness long enough to make a... dying declaration. Mm -hmm. If... If he's face to face with Dan, there's no telling what he'll say. I wish Dan wouldn't. My, my husband is dying. Dan? Yeah. What'd she say? I don't know, but I think you better come aboard. He 
He seemed almost delighted as he swung his weight up out of the dinghy and climbed the ladder. Del Casino, the bosun, followed, wearing a puzzled expression that turned to fear as we entered the cabin. The yellow glare from the lamp swinging overhead was almost blinding to walk into out of the foggy night. The first thing I focused on was the bunk that held the dying man. His head was heavily bandaged, his skin was chalk white, and his lips were beginning to turn blue. The room was tense with waiting. Ranged around him in a semicircle were the supporting players. Two doctors, one family type with a nurse, one police medic without, one sheriff with cigar, one police stenographer, female with pencil and notebook poise, nine-tenths of a widow, and us. At 18 minutes past seven, somebody moved. It was the dying man. The two doctors rushed forward, took his pulse and blood pressure. Miss Scott, adrenaline 3 cc, chlamine 1, saline solution. Oh. All right, Sheriff, he's conscious now, but uh, you'd better hurry. All right, Ah, Mr. Starbuck, you can hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Take that down. Can you hear me? Affirmative answer. Now, Mr. Starbuck, we have to ask these questions. One, what is your name? Please try to answer. What is your name? Gordon M. Star. You got that? What is your name, Gordon M. Starr? That's close enough. Fill it in later. Now, Mr. Starbuck, where do you live? Uh, where do you live? I'm dead. You got that? 1277 Marymount, Pasadena. Hey. Now, Mr. Starbuck, let's try a little harder. Hmm? This is a long one. Have you been injured? And what was the cause of your injury? Uh, yes. Hurts my... You got that? Affirmative. Now, the second part. What was the cause of your injury? Head. Huh? Head on head. Uh, do you believe that you're about to die as a result of your injuries and have you no hope of recovery? I know. No hope. Uh, uh, now, let's get to the point. Who inflicted said injuries? My. Hey, Mr. Starbuck, My. please, you haven't much time, you know. Go away. Doc, is there anything you can do? I'm afraid not. Oh. Oh, this is ghastly. Oh. Can't you leave him alone? Can't you let him die in peace? What are you afraid of, Maggie? Uh. What are you afraid he'll say? All right. All right, tell them, Gordon. It was Dan that struck you, wasn't it? He was jealous. He always hated you for marrying me. It was Dan. Now, 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 Mr. Starbuck, I know how you feel, but we can't allow this sort of thing. Please step aside so we can finish up here. Right, Mr. Starbuck. Uh. Doctor? Uh, very low pulse. I'm not sure. Dan. But... Dan. Is Dan here? Here I am, Gordon. Tell him. Tell him the truth. Do you identify this man, Mr. Starbuck? Yes. He's my brother. Dan. Yeah. You got that? Brother Dan, he's... He's the one. He's lying. Gordon, you know who did it. Why don't you tell the truth? What do you got to lose now? Nothing. Nothing. I'm finished. You, you finished me. Gordon! Uh, Gordon, not yet. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, oh, Doctor, uh, can't you... Can't... Uh, He's dead. Well... <sighs> okay, Doc. In a Starbuck, it is my duty as sheriff of this county to take you into custody on suspicion of murder. And I must tell you that anything you say may be held against you. You'd better come along, too, Spade. Routine questioning, you know. Okay, sure. And I don't think we'll need the handcuffs, will we, son? No, I'll go with you. Yes, indeed, son. It's always smart to come along quietly. Yeah. Look, this is Wait, as far as I'm going. Hey, Dan, come back here. Hey, boy, Use your hand. had one friend. It was the best friend in the world for a man on the land, the fog. The searchlights on the police launch spun frantically as the craft heeled around in a half circle to head him off. Instead of cutting the fog, the beams from the powerful lights bounced back from it and blinded the men behind them. After ten minutes of that, they gave up. The sheriff had a theory. Uh, don't worry. Between the fog and the currents, I doubt if we'll make it. We'll probably recover the body in the morning. And they did. But it wasn't Dan Starbuck's body. It was the bosun, Del Casino. 
and he was found in Richardson Bay adrift in the dinghy from the Marguerite. Somebody had creased his skull with the same type blunt instrument that had been used on Gordon Starbuck. But Dell hadn't lived long enough to make a dying declaration. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to Caper with Two Deathbeds. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The police theory of the Del Casino killing went something like this. Casino had shoved off in the dinghy to join in the search for Dan Starbuck, had rescued him, and been maced for his pains. Also found in the dinghy, but not as yet worked into the police theory, were two items. One, a waterproof wallet containing the seaman's papers of one Nils Halverson. Two, a tattoo mark on the right bicep of the deceased. A small heart with a name in it, Maggie. The brand new widow of the same name was waiting in my office when I got there the following afternoon. Hello. Hello to you, Mrs. Starbuck. What can I do for you? Mr. Spade, I I know very little about the ethics of your profession, and... Well, are are you still working for Danny? If you mean, do I know where he is, the answer's no. Oh. I hoped you'd say that. Why? Because I want you to work for me. Need a new bosun? You needn't have put it quite so crudely. No, I needn't. Since your work is confidential, I'll admit I've... I've done a few things that... Well, it's all too true. My first mistake was marrying Gordon Starbuck when I didn't love him. And I should never have let myself fall in love with Dan. I certainly should have known better than to let Dell fall in love with me. What about Nils Halverson? And me? Well, hardly. No. Nils Halverson was employed by my husband for various odd jobs whenever we put in at Sausalito. Mostly, he'd row the guests out to the ship. He rowed Danny out the night my husband was killed. At least, I think he did. I didn't actually see him. Where's Halverson now? I don't know. He he goes off on drunks for days at a time, but... But, but I have a feeling that someone has paid him to disappear. He, he might have overheard something. Hold on a minute. He... You're going too fast. Are you uh, working up to a confession? Oh, no. It's... It's just that I'm afraid a great injustice may have been done to Danny. After all, Mr. Spade, a man who's dying, I I don't see how he could be altogether in his right mind. Do you? The law says he is if he knows his name and address. A deathbed accusation is the strongest evidence a lawyer can shove at a jury. He can't cross-examine a dead man, and most people have the quaint idea that a man on his deathbed is a lot more truthful than he was when he was hale and hearty. Then you think Gordon may have been lying? Could be, or wool gathering, or picking up some of the lines you were feeding him. Oh, I, I was just afraid he might die before he... You, you see, I thought I might shock him into saying yes or no. He, he, he could have said no, couldn't he? Well, make up your mind. Oh, all I know is it's on my conscience now. If we could find old Halverson and force him to tell what he knows. He's a very strange man. He's devoted to me, if... If the police find him before I do, he, he might refuse to talk out of a mistaken loyalty. To you? Well, I, I meant if he thought I had anything to do with the... 
Well, he's very strange. I told you that. What makes you so sure he's alive? Why wouldn't he be? If I'd been the killer and he'd rode me to and from the scene of my crime, I'd see him secured in Davy Jones' locker. Fish feed, lobster bait, asleep in the deep. Will you work for me? I'll let you know. I didn't have time to get tattooed, but the rest of me was marinated enough. On my head, I was wearing a dirtied-up yachting cap. And the rest of me, I was wearing a pea jacket, dungarees, and sea boots. I was also wearing clamshell number five as I rolled up to the Viking saloon. Well, what did be, mate? Uh, Akavit and Vakta. Uh, have you seen my cousin? Your cousin? Who's your cousin, Prince Valiant? Uh, no, my cousin, Niels Halverson. Niels Halverson. Oh, no. You're Niels' cousin, mm, are you? Yeah. Well, uh, coming from the old country? Yeah, uh, Minnesota. Uh, by you, Minnie. Well, no, he'll be right glad to see you there. Uh, where uh, fair is he? I'll, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say this too loud. Yeah. Bend over there. Yeah. Yeah. He's in trouble, you know. Oh. Yes, I got him holed up down below. Oh. Yeah, come on, come on. Well, by golly, I sure been glad to be going to see my cousin Niels. <laughs> Niels Halverson. Drop the act and get down there. Hey! Okay, Joe, I'll take over from here. Easy, easy. Okay, Danny, me boy. I got his gun. Well, watch him now, watch him. He's full of smorgasbord. Well, Spade, you're the one person I didn't expect to see. But I'm very glad to. Yeah, I wish I hadn't found you. I wanted to find somebody else first. Halverson? Yeah. He's here. Want to see him? That's what I came for. And under here. Watch your head, low bridge. Here we are. Where? A boathouse under the pier. Halverson used to hole in here to sleep off his schnapps. Where's he now? Over here. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, he's going to be a long time sleeping this one off. He'd been missing since that night. Nobody knew he was here till last night. I headed for the saloon when I swam ashore. Joe hit me out here. He could still talk then. What'd he say? I wrote it down here. But it's no help. Let's see it. It's just a jumble of words. Uh, Marguerite. Marguerite. Merry Christmas drink. My beautiful Helga. Row, row your boat. Now throw me back. Row me back. Twenty dollars, good and drunk. Fog rolling in, good and drunk. Gonna be five days, no business. Oh, my head. Paint the boat. Oh, crazy stuff. Twenty dollars. Uh, did you give him twenty bucks to row you I out? I didn't even see him. I swam out. My loving brother wouldn't have let me on board if he'd heard me arriving like a gentleman. Twenty bucks. Did you frisk him? No. I'll have a look. No, I don't... Hey, Wait. Huh. Real soggy, but a 20. I don't care. I'm sticking to my story. I swam out there. I didn't give him that 20. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't. Well, you got to believe me. I didn't even have 20 bucks. That's why I Shut got... Shut up. What's the matter with you? What are you going to do? Come over here, Dan. What? Hey. I don't believe a word of your story, and even if I did, it wouldn't make any difference. Well, what are you... Shut up. You're going to stop talking and listen for a while. I stuffed a gag into his mouth and muscled him over to a piling and handcuffed him to it. He didn't even look surprised. He just stood there staring at me as if he'd lost his last friend in the world. But I wasn't looking at him as much as I was listening to those footsteps in the boards overhead. I waited for them to come back. They did. I walked across the soggy planks to where Nils Halverson lay in the shadows. Nils, I want you to answer these questions again. Now, this time, I'm going to take them down. You get lots of $20 and lots of drink. Now then, I know you don't feel so good. You don't have to talk if you don't feel like it. Just nod your head for yes and shake it for no. Okay, Nils? That counts in a court of law as long as there's a witness. Okay. Now... Your name is Nils Halverson. Your address is 213 Bayview Sausalito. That's correct, is it? Nod your head. Good. Good. That proves you're in your right mind. You know you were injured. Yeah. You know the cause of your injury. Hit on the head and thrown over the side of your boat. What? Huh? Not from... 
Oh, dinghy. Well, it's the same thing. All right. Now, you know you're dying. You have no hope of recovery. That's obvious, but nod your head. That's the boy. Now, uh, Nils, on the night of the 18th, around 10 o'clock, after your usual working hours, you rowed somebody out to the yacht Marguerite in return for which this person gave you a $20 bill. This person is also the person who killed, who, in, who inflicted your fatal injuries. It is. Now, uh, the name of that person, if you can possibly speak even in a whisper, so there can be no mistake. Can you hear me? Just say it close to my ear. Yeah? Yes. Yes, I got it. That's all. Now, I know you don't write, Nils, but make your mark here. Come on, I'll guide your hand. There. Now we're going to take... Nils. Nils. Well, anyway. All right, Maggie. Come on in and join the party. Uh, don't try anything. The light's on you. I'm a better shot than you, and if there's a ruckus, the whole saloon will be down on us. They're all friends of Danny's, too. Stop there. Toss the gun. Okay. What's the matter, Angel? You look kind of scared. No. Just disappointed, that's all. Don't give up so easy, sweetheart. I always wanted to take a trip around the world. We might go on the Marguerite. Together. Yeah. Yeah, sailing into the sunset. Sleeping with our deathbed statements under each other's pillows. Yeah, I see what you mean. I guess it wouldn't work. How much for yours, and what do we do about him? Dan? I'll take care of that. Throw it in with a deal. Okay. But I want it in writing. A little statement to the effect that I can keep under my pillow. Fair enough. Now, all I want from you is a little statement from you to this effect. That you, Marguerite Starbuck, employed Nils Halverson to row you out to the yacht on the night of the 18th, that you there overheard a quarrel between your husband and brother-in-law, and that taking advantage of said brother-in-law's inebriated condition, you sneaked up behind your husband, hit him with a paperweight, and decamped, leaving the murder weapon in Dan's hand. You then started back to shore in the dinghy, and realizing that the only witness who could testify you were aboard that All right, night... all right. All right, I'll sign it. Okay. We'll have plenty of time to put in all the legal decorations later. I'm afraid we won't, baby. You're going to be spending all your available time at the Hatchapi and points west. What are you talking you about? You just made a full confession in front of a witness. You heard it, didn't you, Dan? Every word. Oh, we're fight. Honest. An honest man. Well, I did tell a fib. Now, this is really going to hurt, I'm afraid, Maggie. You see, we didn't actually have any deathbed statement to match yours. No? No. Nils Halverson was a good deal too dead to have made a deathbed statement just now. He's been stiff for 12 hours. Uh, period and a report. Well, Sam, I'll type this right up because then I'm leaving. Wait a minute, Effie. I had to do it that way. Don't you understand? Of course, Sam. I quite understand. But you object, huh? A cruel, ruthless, murdering, though beautiful woman, foiled by a clever ruse, a great acting performance by the greatest private detective of them all. Is that all? You're still leaving? Yes, Sam. My bags are packed. Well, pardon me for having feet. There's a reason, men. In fact, there are five big reasons why more men every day are turning to wild root cream oil for well-groomed hair. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Five big reasons why you, too, should join the millions with handsome, well-groomed hair. Why you should step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and just right for the office or plant. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute, Effie. You can't leave like this. Not without... Oh, all right. I'll talk to you while I'm putting my hat on. Well, can't you at least look at me? After all, you should give me a chance to justify... Sam, apparently you're laboring under an apprehension. Of course I am. Oh, boy, am I glad I picked the last in June and the first in July. What are you talking about? Vacation. Vacation? You just had a vacation a few months back. Well, Sam, that's a year. Well, if you want to take advantage of a legal technicality. Now, Sam, don't say goodbye, man. Well, it, well, it's customary, I suppose. It's 
It's lucky that some of us keep our nose to the grindstone, our ear to the ground, an eye to the future. Huh? Television's just around the corner, you know. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Come here, sweetheart. You look lovely in it. Come here. Have a wonderful time. <laughs> oh, Sam. Oh, Sam. Come here. <gasps> now go on. You missed your train. Uh, where are you going? To Los Sierras. Well, just so you don't go to Canab, Utah. All right, Sam. You know best. Good, good night. Good night, Sierra Sue. Now, who can we get for that part next week? The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to get wild root cream oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get wild root cream oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right. Away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Office of Samuel Spade, Private Investments. I mean, Investigations. Good morning. Uh, evening. Effie? Miss Perrine is on a vacation. Perhaps I may be of assistance, no doubt. I don't know. To whom am I speaking to? I am sorry, I cannot devolve that information to an entire stranger. May I take a message? Look, uh, Miss Whoever you are, I don't want to discommode you, but I... I am sorry, but I will have to ask you in no certain terms to resist from this line you are handing me. I am not the type secretary. Forget it. I'll just call Miss Perrine long distance and dictate my report over the phone. <gasps> oh, my stars and God, how utterly gouge of me, Mr. Spade. Oh, I'm Bernadine, Effie's relief. Uh, I mean yours. I could use some. Oh, shall I send out for some medicine? Yeah. The phone number's on the wall behind the water cooler. Tell them the hundred proof bonded and hang the expense. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bail bond caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Only three days left, gals, and June, the month of weddings, will be over. But don't worry, there are still 187 days left in leap year... Still time to snag the man of your dreams. You know, the one who uses Wild Root Cream Oil on his hair. He and millions of other men use Wild Root Cream Oil daily because Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair so neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Any smart man who wants to look smart always insists on Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Oh, Mr. Spade, you are Mr. Spade, you just gotta be. 
Yes, but why? It was faith. I knew it was going to be like this. I have my qualms, too, Bernadine. Oh, that's good. I I sent the other back. The other what? I called that number, but it was euphonious. They sent whiskey. Is something the matter? Uh, no. No, nothing at all. I'm perfectly qualm. Well, I'm glad. My previous employer was very nervous, which is why I just happened to be tentatively at large when Effie reproached me about being a relief to her. Figures. Uh, Bernadine, now I'm not being fresh. Honestly, I'm not, but do you take shorthand? Yeah, but I don't speak it. What is that you speak? Don't answer. Uh, ready? Rodney. I I mean, Roger. Uh, uh, date. I'll have to ask my mother. Down, Bernadine. Uh, date, June 27, 1948, to Miss Effie Perrine, care of Perry's Lodge, Canab, the Pearl of the West, Utah. What? Oh, uh, wrong letter. I'll get to that later. Uh, date, uh, June 27, 1948, to Leo M. Scarlett, care of Leaf Branch, Root, Knox, and Wood, attorneys at law, 333 Pine Street, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bail bond caper. Dear Leo... I'm sorry things turned out the way they did, Leo, and I'd like you to know how I got into it. If it wasn't for the reward, I don't take rewards. I'm not in love with your wife, no matter what she says, and I wasn't sore at you about anything. I was just sitting in my office, minding my own business when the door opened, and Vivian walked in. She looked every bit as beautiful as she did when she lived under me in Ma Tuttle's boarding house in 41. In fact, I didn't recognize her until she slithered out of her mink. Hello, Sam. Surprised to see me? Uh, yeah, but I'm trying not to show it. What's on your mind? Is that all you've got to say to me, Sam? Well, you're here on business, aren't you? All right, I don't blame you. It all happened pretty sudden, Leo and me. I should have written or phoned you, I suppose, but somehow... Forget it, Vivian. Now, uh, what do you need a detective for? Are you, uh, thinking of divorce already? Oh, please don't, Sam. If it was a mistake, I'm the one who has to live with it. And I made up my mind when I married Leo this time it's for keeps. No matter what. Mm Mm-hmm. What's the what? He's in trouble, Sam. Well, that's nothing new. Well, this time I don't think it's his fault. When Leo went legit, he meant it. What's he say he's doing now? He's a bail bond broker. Judging from your new look, I'd say he's a success. Sam, a man called him on the phone today. I answered. He said his name was Holiday, but I recognized his voice. It was an old friend of Leo's, Charlie Rosenfoy. Charlie, huh? When did he get out? A couple weeks back. He was paroled. I don't know what he said over the phone, but Leo looked scared and sick. I don't wonder. The word around town was that Charlie took the rap for Leo. Well, I don't know anything about that. All I know is Leo's on the level now, and Charlie never will be. He did plenty on his own during that time he served. Well, I won't argue that, but from where I sit, it looks like Leo better start wearing a gun again. He has. That's what I'm so frantic about, Sam. Do you hear any of the conversation from Leo, Sam? He didn't say much. But I did hear him say, All right, ten tonight. I'll meet you there. I wasn't very smart of him. I know, but that's the way he is. It might be only for a payoff. I thought of that, too. But Leo hasn't got that kind of money. He's been dropping a lot at the racetracks lately. And even if he had it, he's not the type to pay blackmail. I don't like it. Why should I stick my neck out? Why did you have to come to me, anyway? Because I trust you, Sam. I know you were jealous of Leo. I was? Sam, if we ever meant anything... If you meant half the things you said to me when we... Stop it. That's blackmail. Oh, I feel so lost and alone. I don't know where to turn. Okay, okay. I'll see what I can do. Oh, Sam. I'll make it up to you somehow. You see if I don't. Sure you will. And tell Leo to stop dropping his money at Tan Ferran. This is going to cost them plenty. <laughs> Vivian had said that your rendezvous with Charlie was scheduled for 10 in the p.m. and that you were too upset to go to work that day, so you'd be at home, 1246 Dunbar. I took a plan in your apartment building from a sleepy lagoon-type cocktail bar across the street called, you guessed it, the Sweet Leilani. Your wife joined me, and after a while, we got around to talking. At least she did. (laughs) I bet you can't guess what I'm thinking about. Huh? Listen, Sam. You remember that night we drove to the half... Half moon... Bay. Oh, you do remember. Oh, we used to do the craziest things. I should have married you, Sam. Please, not while I'm drinking. 
You know what? The trouble with crooks, they have to work day and night. Yeah. Hey, you're not listening. No, but everybody else in the place is. Let's talk about you, Sam. Did I ever tell you how I met Leo? No, and please don't. And then he opened a bucket shop. You know what a bucket shop is? Yeah. It's stock bro- uh, brokerage. Brokerage. Yeah, that's right. Only it's crooked. That was the first business Leo started when he went legit. Mm-hmm. He had to shut it down on account of those securities <laughs> somebody was always stealing out of the safe. Were they insured? Yeah, but they wouldn't renew his policy. So after the second nightclub burned down and he couldn't get any insurance at all, even on his own life. That's why I'm so frantic, Sam. Hey, give me a nickel. I want to play sweet little Annie. Fifty nickels, and two hours later, sweet Leilani broke under the strain, so we had Princess Papuli to leave a night gave out, and we were starting on the Hawaiian war chant when she disappeared through a door marked Wahini's, Hawaiian for powder room, and never came back. Around 9.45, I mumbled something to the bartender about the lady will pay, put on my smoke glasses, and strolled out and across the street. You came out of the building a couple of minutes later. You led me a zigzag course up Merchant Street to Salon, across Salon to Commercial, down Commercial to Drum, and made a lateral pass over Drum back to Dunbar. Your destination, I'd never have guessed it, was the Sweet Leilani. Happily, they were not playing Sweet Leilani. It was very, very quiet. The regular customers had taken a powder, and I didn't blame them. In the new crop at the bar, I counted ten broken noses, at least five broken paroles, assorted knife scars, and four pairs of cauliflower ears, and one maverick. You slid into a booth at the end of the bar, took the gun out of your shoulder holster, and laid it down on the table in front of you. I walked over, turned it around so it was pointing at the jukebox instead of me, and sat down. Some other time, Spade. Some other time I drink with you. I'm waiting for a friend. Why the gun? You selling it to him? Maybe I give it to him. Go on, you drink at the bar. Ah, it's kind of crowded. Looks like uh, Charlie Rosenfoy's old mob. Who are they gunning for? You or Charlie? Why don't you ask them? What are you drinking, Leo? I was with that bottle all day. Got a bad taste. Do me a favor, Spade. There's a bar two doors down the street. Go drink there. There's my friend coming in the door. Any friend of yours is a friend of mine, Leo. Look, Spade. Hello, Leo. What's the matter? You bring a bodyguard to meet your old friend, Charlie? This shamus threw his weight in here. I didn't ask him. I don't need him. Huh. That sounds like the old Leo Scarlatti I used the to The name is Scarlet. Oh, pardon me. I've been on the rock for so long, it's hard to catch up on all the changes. There's been a war, Charlie. Anyone tipped you to it yet? You got a smart bodyguard, Leo. Let's talk. Let's go somewhere else and talk. Uh-uh, I like it here. Okay, we start. How come you tipped the mob we were coming here? You promised you wouldn't. Like the shamas, they got a drink somewhere. All right, say what's in your mind and I'll go. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I think I'll uh, do my drinking at the bar. Both of your guns were on the table. It didn't look as though you were going to use them on one another, and I figured that neither of you was going to do much talking in front of me anyway, so I strolled back to the end of the bar to look at the television. The 10 o'clock news roundup was on, and the ticker tape that was moving across the screen said dot, dot, dot in Atlantic City today, period. I ordered a highball, and then the ticker tape started again. This time it said San Francisco, million-dollar bail bond robbery. One million dollars in negotiable bonds is tonight in the hands of a group of daring hold-up men who commandeered an armored truck at the very portals of the police department in the Hall of Justice. And it said this concludes the 10 o'clock edition of the television news roundup. I had a slight hunch that if the television boys had had their cameras on the big bail bond robbery, that at least some of the characters would have been played by at least some of the bad actors that were foregathered in the sweet Leilani. In fact, what you and Charlie were saying and doing when I walked back to your booth was almost too much to the point. You let me see the bulky portfolio Charlie shoved across the table at you. It looked like a carrying case for bonds, bank messenger type. But it was sealed with wax blobs bearing the imprint of the great seal of the state of California. I was impressed. 
Where'd you get this? You can read about it in the papers, and if I was you, I'd get this out of sight before them papers hit the street. And one thing more. Don't try to clip none of them coupons. And one thing more in addition. Don't open it at all. Sure. Spade? Yeah, Leon? I think I hire you after all. <laughs> I took the job, and you handed me the portfolio. Outside, we flagged the taxi, and you gave the driver an address on Portsmouth Square. Your office, I hate to remind you, was behind one of a bunch of neon-lighted storefronts across from the Hall of Justice. The sign on the door said, Press the button and let freedom ring any hour, day or night. The only bell in sight was a stop-press-type burglar alarm. You unlocked the door, and we went in. Paused in front of a big green safe with a combination lock and started twirling the knob. The tumblers clicked into place. I picked up an inkwell and waited for the safe to open. All right, Spade, give me it. I did, with both hands. With my left, I handed you the portfolio, and with my right, I pitched the inkwell at a well-wired slab of plate glass window. When the burglar alarm went into action, so did you. You dropped everything and were out of the door and out of sight before you could say, let freedom ring. While I was waiting for the cops to arrive, I helped myself to a $500 bearer bond I found lying loose in your safe. I had a feeling I might be needing some bail myself. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective... Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want a well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked... How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the bail bond caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I had hoped, Leo, when I made my spectacular move in your bail bond office and set the bells to ringing, that I'd get the caper off my neck and onto the capable shoulders of the police where it now belonged. Then I told myself I could go home and get some sleep. I had never been that fond of Vivian anyway. I was holding the million-dollar portfolio, complete with its big official seal still unbroken, ready to hand it over with a flourish to the first boy in blue that rushed in. But then I saw something that dashed my hopes. There was a strip of scotch tape across the bottom of it. It wasn't up to me to tamper with important evidence, but I didn't have to. It was only a question of what magazine had been cut up to replace the million dollars in bearer bonds. That question was answered at headquarters 20 minutes later. It turned out to be the last 52 issues of Radio Life, which even Captain Walsh of the robbery detail admitted was no help. Neither was Captain Walsh. Now, Spade, in your statement here, you state... Uh, so and so and so and so and so and so, uh, sweet Leilani. And that Rosenfoy didn't hand portfolio exhibit in question to Leo M. Scarlett, alias Scarlatti, at approximately 10.20 p.m. this day. That's it, Captain. Now, uh, you sure you want to stick with this? You don't want to change any part of the statement? No, I just want to go home and go to bed. I'm afraid you're going to stay with us for a while. Who, me? Um, 
Statement of Jordan Joyce, M.D. Statements of Hilda Sackwriter, R.N. and Mildred DeVilbis, R.N. Day and night nurses, respectfully. Who's sick? Rosenfoy. He's been quarantined in his home in Daly City since his release from Alcatraz four days ago. Chicken pox. Sorry, Sam, I'll have to book you. You sure you don't want to add anything to that statement? <sighs> Only this. Kelsey Walsh... If you continue to do such brilliant police work, you will be waving a stop sign at a school crossing in time for the fall semester. You are a hangnail on the finger of justice. I thought I had been courteous and cooperative, but even so, it was the middle of the afternoon by the time they set my bail. 1500 bucks. That made it life. But I hadn't had time to hang the curtains in my cell when I got even worse news. My bail had been posted by who? Vivian, a banana peel in the steps of progress. She met me outside. Well, aren't you going to thank me? What for? Getting me in jail or getting me out? Getting you out, of course. It was all the money I had in all the world. Leo's money was impounded, you know. But, Sam, when I thought of what you and I once meant to each other, and maybe we still... Yeah, yeah, out. well, uh... You'll get your money back. I'm not really guilty. Oh, I know that. What else do you know? I guess it's safe to talk. Leo phoned me today. Where is he? He wouldn't say. Some pay station. He kept putting in nickels. Sam, you've got to talk to him. You've got to convince him it's best to give himself up. Now you're beginning to make sense, sweetheart. But how can I get to talk to him? I've arranged it. He's to meet us at the Club Leilani. You know, where we had our reunion yesterday. That place on Dunbar? Yeah. Oh, that's great. A crowded saloon less than a block from the police department. Besides, the place has lousy memories for me. By the way, did you ever get out of the ladies' room? If you don't mind, I'd rather talk about something else. Okay, let's talk about how do we bring this big secret meeting off in a crowded cafe. Is Leo coming in a false beard? You really think I'm stupid, don't you? I didn't say so. Well, it so happens that the place is closed on Tuesday. See that sign in the window? Closed Tuesday? Mm-hmm. Now, how do we break in? I was counting on you. You're a detective. Can't you use a glass key or something? Did you say that bail bond you bought for me was all the money you had in the world? That's the truth. Then get ready to forfeit it. It's a risk I've got to take. You've got to take. Sam, please, if we ever meant anything Yeah, to... I know. Half Moon Bay. But sometimes I wish we hadn't been childhood sweethearts. Wait here. I'll case the alley. The alley wasn't much better. There were two windows, washroom type, all glass brick, except the two small ventilators big enough to put your hand through. The only hope was the kitchen skylight. I didn't have any trouble getting up to it, but once I was there, things didn't look so good. The view from the roof was a garage door with two green lights flanking it. Then it struck me where I was and why I was there. The Club Leilani backed directly on the Hall of Justice where the big bail bond robbery had taken place at 5 p.m. the night before. Without further ado, I put my foot through a pane of the skylight, reached in, unlatched it, and dropped. Hurry up, come here, Sam. Up at the front of the building, I could hear Vivian clamoring for admittance. I decided to let her clamor for another minute or two. It isn't a thing I often do, but I walked resolutely into the ladies' powder room. It was very well equipped. It had furniture, a telephone, and more clues than I needed. The magazines were there, the razor blades were there, the scotch tape was there. There was even a scraping of red sealing wax on the steel frame of the window slot. But best of all was what I found in the paper towel dispenser. I lifted it out and moved it next door to the men's washroom. Then I let her in. What kept you so long? You'll spoil everything. I was afraid you'd... Here comes your husband. <gasps> oh. Come on, let me in. What happened, Leo? You're early. Any objections? I just got itchy, that's all. How are you, baby? Don't, Leo. I'm so nervous. Strange. What are we going to do, baby? What's Spade going to do for us? Tell him, Sam. I'll leave you two alone to talk it out. I'll freshen up a little. Haven't had my face on all day. Poor kid. Well, Spade, let's have it. Yeah, she's right, Leo. I can do a lot for you. But you've got to do something for me. Spade, this is level. I never saw those bonds. I know that. Then what are you after? The truth. It's the only thing that can save you, and if you take this rap, I take it too. I'm in clear up to my neck. Okay. Charlie Rosenfoy came around to Vivian and made her this proposition. He was going to pull this bail bond job and plant the goods on me to get even for the rap he thought he'd taken for me. Mm -hmm. Vivian, 
pretended to play along with him, only she got hold of the package long enough to take the bonds out and put the old magazines in instead. Yeah. The idea was the mob would think Charlie had double-crossed them, taken the goods for himself, and delivered a phony packet to their banker, which was supposed to be me. Cute. Only you had to get smart and set off that burglar alarm. Now I'm getting the squeeze on all sides. The mob, the law, Charlie are all gunning for me at once. Don't worry about the mob and the law, and don't worry too much about Charlie. What are you driving at? That'll be him now. Who tipped him I was here? Get back in the corner. It's dark in here. He'll never see you. I'll take care of it. All right. Hello, Charlie. Who? Oh. Come on in. Oh. Good boy, Spade. Get his gun. You're my friend. Sure, I'm your friend. Come here. Yeah, sure, Spade. <laughs> Pleasant dreams, fellas. Now I act. Hey, Charlie. No, Leo. <laughs> Vivian? Sam? Is that you? Yeah. The last of your boyfriends. You mean Leo? Charlie? Yeah. They just knocked each other off. Oh, Sam. I can't see. It's dark. Where are you? Right here in front of the jukebox. You sure? Hope to die. <gasps> Drop it, Vivian. It's empty. Sam, I... Sam! <laughs> Vivian, how could you? After Half Moon Bay. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to knock you boys out, Leo, but uh, better lumps than bullet holes, eh? After she started wrapping up the caper, it wasn't too hard to figure what she was up to, providing you could keep her smoke out of your eyes. She told Charlie how to operate on you and told you how to operate on Charlie. A million dollars for her and two dead gangsters lying on the floor of an empty joint where they'd shot it out. The secret of the missing bonds would have to be written off by the police as having died with either one of whichever of you ever had them. Period. End of something. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. I, I know you're tired, and if you're too brushed, please feel free to elude the whole matter. But... Yes, okay, let's do that. Thank you. Effie said that you were always glad to qualify any little points that she didn't understand. Mm -hmm. She said that, did she? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she also said that quite accidentally that you sometimes leave things out that should be left in. Bernadine, times are very bad. They're cutting salaries everywhere. But where were they during the whole Atherius affair, if you'll pardon the expression? The bonds? In the paper towel dispenser, didn't I say so? Oh, that's what you moved to the men's. Mm -hmm. But how did they get there? In the Walrini's, if you'll pardon the expression. Simple. When the thieves whizzed through the alley after the heist, Vivian had her well-manicured little lunch hook thrust through the window slot to receive them. Oh, that's how the red sailing wax got there. Bernadine, you're spectacular. Now go and type this up. You're making me nervous. You know what they say about people who like mysteries? Once a mystery fan, always a mystery fan. And that goes for hair tonics, too. Once a Wild Root Cream Oil fan, always a Wild Root Cream Oil fan. Just try it and you'll see what I mean. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Mr. Spade. I hope it's not too erroneous. Oh, I'm sure it's quite offensive. Don't you mean inoffensive, Mr. Spade? Have it your way. I don't want to sound imprudent, Mr. Spade, but I must say that your conduct through the whole thing was very brave and outrageous. Don't you mean courageous? <laughs> oh, now I've got you doing it. You're going to be just like Mr. Cummel. Your uh, previous employer, no doubt. Yeah, poor man. You know, he finally became completely erasable. They had to take him away. Mm -hmm. What were his symptoms? 
Well, when he ordered the puppy biscuits, I thought he was just being concentric. But after a while, he wouldn't answer to anything but Rover. I had to sprinkle his flea powder in the morning, you know. And then he had his little tricks. He always wanted to show off, you know, sitting up and rolling over. He could shake hands too. What's so great about that? Any dog can shake hands. Yeah, but can you scratch your ear with your foot? If I、uh, set my mind to it. Now go home, Bernadine, or I'll report you to the SPCA. <laughs> You can't frighten me. Effie told me that your bark is worse than your bite. Good night, Mr. Spade. Effie in far off Canab, come home, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lug Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam, sweetheart, any calls? Only one, Sam. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide.、Mm-hmm. He wants you to drop around so they can get your formal statement. No hurry, not now. He told me what happened, Sam. I'm sorry. Yeah, so am I. I guess he was one of your oldest friends, wasn't he? You don't make any friends in this business, Evie. You can write that in your book now, and I'll give you the rest of it when I get there. You sound tired, Sam. Wouldn't you rather just? What, baby? Well, go home and you know, and just put it off until tomorrow. Or... Yeah, maybe I. No. No, I'll get it off my chest tonight. Stay there, Effie. I'll come on down and dictate my report on the Dick Foley caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. No two ways about it, folks. Hair that's well groomed can make all the difference in the world to a person's overall appearance. That's why so many men, women, boys, and girls are turning to the famous non-alcoholic hair tonic with lanolin, Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. If you haven't tried it before, you'll want to get Wild Root Cream Oil in a new 25 cent get acquainted size. Yes, get Wild Root Cream Oil again and again. The choice of men and women and children too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Here, Sam. Let me. Am I that shaky? Say when. Just to the top of the glass. Now that's enough. You spill it. Yeah. Sam, what you said over the phone about not making any friends in this business? You didn't really mean that, did you? Forget it. <sighs> you can label this. Oh,、uh, file on Dick Foley. Date. 
fill it in. Yes, sir. To uh, Dundee at Homicide, I guess, from uh, Samuel Spade, license number 137596. The facts are all here. If you can dig a formal statement out of it, you're welcome. I'd known Dick Foley ever since I took out my license. We'd worked several big capers together back in my days as a continental lot. He and Mickey Linehan and I. Then he and Mickey opened their own office, Foley and Linehan, private investigations. Five years back, Mickey stopped the slug, and since then the sign on the door read Dick Foley Detective Agency. I'd seen Dick maybe four or five times in the last half a dozen years just to have a drink and chew the fat about the good old days. He never talked about his private life. I assumed he didn't have any. So when I went to his office the day before yesterday in response to his call, I was surprised to find him in a clinch with one of the most beautiful nails I've ever seen. <clears throat> oh. oh. Oh, oh, Sam. Well, well. Uh, shall I uh, come back after lunch? Oh, uh... Uh, Sam, this is Maxine, my wife. Well, you don't deserve it, but I'm happy for you. <laughs> I'll return the compliment, Sam. I've wanted to meet you for years, but Dick wouldn't introduce me. Now you know why. Hmm. Well, uh... You run along, honey. Sam's here on business. All right, Dick. You can bring Sam home to dinner if you like. There's plenty. If he's not too busy, but don't count on that. Well, try anyway, won't you, Sam? I will indeed. Bye now. Draw up a chair, Sam. Hmm? Sit down. Oh. Uh, yeah. uh, what's on your mind, Dick? You remember Claude Spicer, that grifter I sent over for that jewelry store hike back in 43? You never told me you were married, Dick. I'm very happily married. Now, please pay attention. Uh, uh, Claude Spicer, yeah. Yeah, I remember the caper. Wasn't there a dame involved? Well, Spicer had a girlfriend, but the, the cops gave her a good bill of health. Spicer went up for a five-year stretch. They spung him last month. Whatever happened to that dame? Uh, now, look, about Spicer. He gunning for you? You hit it. How scared of him are you? Well, enough to ask you for help, Sam. What's eating him? Just revenge? Sam, I wouldn't tell this to anybody but you. But all the facts of that caper didn't come out at that time. Uh, I uh, saw to that. How come? Well, I couldn't have stayed in business in San Francisco if it had been generally known that my partner was the inside man on a jewelry store heist. Mickey? Yeah, Mickey Linehan. Ah, you and I are both great at choosing partners, Sam. They both deserved what they got. Only one difference. I sent up the killer that plugged my partner. Some people thought the way you gave evidence at Spicer's murder trial wasn't so hot. Well, he was alibied, Sam. In fact, the robbery was his alibi for the murder. I don't know how he managed it. I've been trying for five years to figure it out. Spicer's afraid I might succeed someday. That's why he's out to get me. What's he waiting for? Oh, I don't know. He won't do it simple. He'll have a fancy plan like the other time. He's tricky. Where's he staying? At the Belvedere. Here's his mug. I kept a plan on the building for a couple of days, but he stayed holed up in his room. I think he spotted me. Okay, Dick, I'll give it a buzz. Now, wait a minute, Sam. Yeah? I'm not asking you to do this for love. Standard fee, 25 and whiskey money. Okay? Forget it. This one's on me. In the elevator on my way out, I studied the picture of Claude Spicer on the old police circular Dick had given me. But a picture in the back of my mind kept getting in the way. It was Dick Foley's wife, Maxine. When I hit the street, I still saw her face before me, and it was no picture. Only pretty as. Sam, I waited for you. I've got to talk to you. My pleasure. Shall we uh, confer in an adjacent cafe? Wherever you say. Only I don't want Dick to know. Then you shouldn't have married a detective. Please, Sam. How's this? Uh, black watch. Yeah. Looks dark enough. Oh, that booth in the corner, it's secluded. Why not? Slide in. Oh, no, over here, stupid, not facing the street. Oh, sorry. I'm not much good at this sort of thing. Sam, I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but if he's in really bad trouble, I think I have a right to know. What makes you think he's in trouble? Well, I'm not blind. You can't live with a man and not sense it when something goes wrong. I never thought Dick was the type to show it. Oh, he's, he's tried to hide it from me, and I haven't said anything. I thought if he wanted me to know, he'd tell me. It was a wise thought. Hold on to it. Well, I meant to. But then a terrible possibility crossed my mind. Sam, it isn't me, is it? In what way? Well, you know what I mean. He's been away from home nights so much lately, and he questions me so closely about where I go and who I see and so on, and I... Well, I may as well ask you right out. Did he hire you to check up on me? Then that is it. No. You're not lying to me, Sam. Why should I? 
Dick says you're almost his oldest friend. He's talked so much about you. And he must have told you I don't do that type of work. Why do you keep looking at me? If... Sorry, trying to place you, Maxine. I keep thinking I've seen you someplace before. Oh, it must have been my picture. I was an actress. Yeah. Picture. Yeah, maybe that was it. Why do you say it like that? Like what? Well, as if you were angry with me. Because I just got the caption on the picture. Well, Sam, wait. Come back. Yes, I had. And the caption was from a newspaper circa 1943. And it read, Actress Lovely Cleared in Lanahan Sling. I flashed my tin star at the room clerk at the Belvedere, learned that Claude Spicer was in, and stuck around to make sure the clerk didn't buzz the room to tip him off. Around 4 in the p.m., Spicer went out, very dressed up, umbrella, gloves and all. He walked down Geary to Grant and turned north. A cold San Francisco drizzle started blowing up from the bay. I wished I'd brought my overcoat. A half a block up from California, he entered Grayson's jewelry store. I peeked through the rain streak show window after him. Inside, pawing eagerly through a tray full of diamond clips while a long-suffering clerk eyed her hopelessly from his side of the counter was the actress Lovely. Maxine shot Spicer a quick glance of recognition as he entered, but they didn't speak. He took up a pose of gentlemanly patience, shrugged his eyebrows sympathetically at the clerk, and leaned elegantly on his umbrella while Maxine found fault with every piece of jewelry that was shoved in front of it. The bored expression left his face only once. That was when the clerk opened the vault and brought out some unset stones. Their act may have been fooling the clerk, but it was as plain as the nose on Spice's face, a very plain nose it was, that they were sizing up the joint for a pushover. Maxine left first. He stayed long enough to buy a cigarette lighter and then followed her out. As I took out after him, I stopped to read the sticker on the inside of the glass door. It said, These premises protected by Dick Foley Detective Agency. Maxine was waiting for him at the corner. I grabbed up a Chinese newspaper and used it to listen behind. But I needed to bother. They didn't seem to care. Well, are you happy? Ought to be about a million bucks. Why are you so disagreeable? You ought to be feeling good. Feeling good? Five-year stretch, I come out to find my girl married to the joker that sent me up. You didn't think it was such a bad idea at the time. Well, I do now. Well, after tonight, we'll go east, you and me together, baby. He'll catch up with us wherever we go. Oh, he shouldn't live so long. How do you mean that? Just like it sounds, baby. Bye. Oh, don't leave. I'm going to get some sleep. I'll need a clear head. Claude, I, I don't want to be alone. Oh, not even tonight? I don't want to be alone. <laughs> See you later, honey. Bye-bye. He went straight back to the Belvedere. No stops. Picked up his key at the desk. No messages. Took the elevator to the eighth floor. Let himself into room 809. Hung out the do not disturb sign. Closed and locked the door behind him. I kept a plan on it till around midnight. Then I lifted the do not disturb card from the doorknob and wedged it into the crack of the door. It was a crafty move, and I had just finished doing it craftily when the door opened again in my face. Huh? Who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, uh, nothing, sir. Uh, I, I, I'm making a survey. What? Uh, I'm from the Trotter Pole. Trotter Pole. It's like the Gallup Pole, but we're not in so much of a hurry. Yeah? Just uh, kindly answer this question. As a Democrat, do you believe... Do we, huh? I picked up the Do Not Disturb card and wedged it back into the crack of his door. As any house dick knows, except, of course, Tiny Stover, the night paper at the Belvedere, if anybody opens a door like that, the card will fall out, and somebody will always hang it on the knob. Another thing Tiny doesn't know is never to draw to an inside straight. We played nine different kinds of poker until 5 a.m. when I thought I'd go up and have another look. All was quiet on the eighth floor. From the elevator bank, I could see room 809. The morning paper was shoved under his door, and my do-not-disturb sign was apparently where I had planted it. I tiptoed up to make sure. Huh? Who are you? What do you want? Uh, me? Uh, the paper boy, sir. Your morning paper. You get around. Well, well. Good news in the paper, sir? Interesting, interesting. Jewelry store heist up on Grant Avenue. Oh, yes, sir. Our paper only comes... What? I grabbed the paper from under 805. It was the headline I could have expected if Spicer had left his room without my knowing it. Grayson's Jewelry Store, the shop he and Maxine had cased that afternoon, had been taken for an estimated million bucks in uncut gems. 
But Spice's door hadn't been opened, and there was no other exit. I sat down and thought. And what I thought of was that that sticker on the front door of Grayson's said, These Premises Protected by Dick Foley Detective Agency. When the 6 a.m. Oakland ferry boat felt its way blindly out of the slip, Claude Spicer was aboard, and so was I. Should have been getting lighter, but it wasn't. The fog was thickening over the harbor, and most of the passengers were inside drinking coffee. Spicer didn't go in. He climbed up to the boat deck and stood at the rail under the pilot's house. I planted between two wet paint signs and waited. Not for long. I couldn't make out any features on the man who came up and joined him. They stood face to face, not more than a foot apart, and talked in voices that couldn't get to me through the racket of the foghorns in the harbor. What spoke loud enough for me to hear was a gun. They seemed to fall into each other's arms, then collapsed in a heap on the deck. And when I got to the spot, only the dead one was there. It was Spicer. The other man had disappeared around the corner of the deck house. A ray of light from the pilot's window swept over him, and I saw a gun metal shine in his hand and then spin out over the rail as he threw it. What? Oh, it's you, Sam. I was afraid you'd lost him. What did you do it for, Dick? I had my reason, Sam. Now, trust me, I'll keep you in the clear. How long? As long as I go on playing sucker for you? What do you think I hired you for? Maybe I was supposed to say you killed him in self-defense. Maybe I was supposed to see him making passes at your wife if you needed that. But, Sam, you've got to... I've worked for killers before. I've even worked for thieves. But not for a detective that knocks over a place he's supposed to be protecting. Sam, it's not a... Save it for the cops, Dick. I'm turning you in when we get to Oakland. No, you're not, Sam. Dick, come back here. Let go of me. I'm going over the side. If you try to stop me, you're going with me. He fought away from me, got one foot over the rail, and kicked out at me with the other. It caught me on the point of the chin. I stumbled forward and grabbed out blind. I must have caught him by the belt just as he jumped. I remember something pulling me halfway over the rail and trying to get free of it. I did, but not soon enough. I was in midair, and the black water came rushing up to meet me. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Dick Foley caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I found myself mechanically keeping afloat somehow and trying to get out of my coat. I felt heavy and logged as if I'd swallowed gallons of water. The murk hung low and thick. There was nothing else to be seen anywhere. I swallowed what felt like several more gallons before I got rid of the coat. From out of the misty fog blanket, from every direction, in a dozen different keys, from near and far, a foghorn sounded. I stopped swimming and floated on my back, trying to determine my whereabouts. After a while, I picked out the moaning, evenly spaced blasts of the Alcatraz siren. But they came out of the fog without direction. It seemed to beat down on me from straight above. I was somewhere in San Francisco Bay, and that was all I knew... And I suspected the current was sweeping me out toward the Golden Gate. And a light came up ahead of me suddenly. A 
boat passing a few yards away. I lifted my head and screamed. But the boat siren crying its warning drowned out my shouts. It went on past and the fog closed in behind it. Then I heard a new sound. Seagulls. I swam towards it and it seemed to get lighter. Part of it was the dawn light beginning to cut through the fog blanket. But there was also a strange-looking man standing on the water and waving a green lantern back and forth. I yelled at him to wait for me, and a seagull got off his hat and flew away. When I got closer, I saw that it was not a man, but only a buoy, channel type. I used all the strength I had left to drag myself up on the base of it and let it rock me to sleep. Hey, hey, mate. Uh, Pour some more of the brandy into him, Gus. Yeah, here. Get some of these down. <coughs> Where are we? Hey, it ain't heaven. You can tell that by the smell. Oh, fisherman's wharf. Yeah, take it easy. We got ambulance coming. You going to the hospital? No, no, no. I'll, I'll be okay. Hey, give me a hand. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Hey, you do us a favor, will you? Don't fall down till you get out of sight this time. We're tired of picking you up. I thanked the two kindly old fisher folk for their interest in my welfare, totted up the pier, fell into a taxi, and went home. While I soaked out some of my aches and pains and chills, I did some stewing about the caper so far and stewed up enough anger to carry me through to the finish. I checked the Coast Guard for news of Dick Foley. They told me his body hadn't been recovered yet. I got dressed and went over to his office. The cops hadn't been there. I went through the file cabinet. And what I found under Foley Private had me so interested that I didn't hear Maxine come in until she closed the door. What are you looking for? You, baby. I'm for you. Sam. Come here. Oh, Sam. Mm, nice. Hmm? Uh, oh, you... Now, don't be mad, Maxine. A gun makes a woman bulge in the wrong place. It's not my gun. We'll see. Sam, I... Shut up. Now, starting with the rap Spicer went up for, the same pattern. The way you worked this one tells me how you worked it the first time. You, you get something on a private detective. The first time, five years ago, it was Dick's partner, Mickey Linehan. Yeah. I don't know what Spicer had on him, but I do know he forced Dick to knock over Grayson's jewelry store last night. I won't listen to you. Okay, I'll talk to myself. I'm not saying you killed Mickey Linehan, but Dick did frame an alibi for you, didn't he? Didn't he? Oh, you're hurting me. Good. Try spending a night swimming around in circles in the middle of the harbor sometime. See how you like that. All right, it's true. Dick did help me out of that old jam. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud our love was that important to him. No, Spicer. That same old double cross. Only this time, I'm standing where Dick did five years ago. Dick was set up as a patsy the same way Mickey Linehan was, but he got smart and pulled the trigger first. Stop it. Stop it. Where did that hurt? You fool. I love Dick. Yeah. I loved him. That's something you can't understand. But it happens that way, no matter what people are. You sound as if you really mean that. But you're a little late, aren't you? He's not dead, I'm sure he isn't. If he's not, he's really in trouble. What do you mean by that? I found something here in the files that Dick left, just in case Spicer got to him first. What is it? A confession to Mickey Linehan's murder. That's impossible. Were you there? What are you going to do with it? Turn it over to the police. But if he's still alive... It still counts, unless he shows and revokes it, but I don't think he will. Why? Because I won't back up a self-defense play on the Spicer shooting. But you were Dick's friend. You were his friend. I wouldn't ask him to do it for me. Then what can I do for him? I'll do anything, anything, anything at all. Well, if he stays away, he's as good as dead. If he comes back, you'll get a jury trial. And if there are more men than women in the panel, he'd probably be acquitted on your testimony alone. Do you really think he might have a chance? With a jury, there's always a chance. But where is he? How can I get word to him? Well, if he's not fish food by now, there's one sure way of smoking him out. Something I can do. Nobody else. Oh, please, tell me anything. Sign a confession of your own. Confession? Not Mickey Linehan's murder or anything they might nail you for. Swear that you shot Spicer. What? Well, you can always renege. Make both of you look good, sacrificing for each other. How about it? I... All right. Tell me what to write. I did. She signed it. I had Effie dispatch it to all the papers and news services, and then I brought it down to the hall. Naturally, you didn't believe a word of her confession, Dundee, but when I took you aside and explained my stratagem, you endorsed it heartily and had her booked. 
She pressed my hand and thanked me. The look of resignation on her face was so real it was hard to believe she was faking. When she turned her back to follow the matron down the corridor, I saw why. On the back of her coat, there was a smear of white paint. I remembered the wet, the wet paint signs on the Oakland ferry boat. Dick Foley gave himself up an hour after her confession hit the street. Screamed and yelled at everybody in homicide, trying to convince them that Maxine was innocent and he should take the full rap. But I'm afraid I cleared that when we confronted him with the autopsy surgeon's report. He tried to bluff even then when he read it. Pellet A ended right side between third and fourth ribs, penetrated left lung. Pellet B, pleural membrane, side wound punctured. Well, so what, Sam? All three on the right side, angling up, you see? No! I don't know why you even saw me on that boat. You saw me throw the gun over Oh, and... cut it out, Dick. What I saw was in the dark. But you two men were facing each other directly. If I were going to drop a man fast at close range, face to face like that, I would not put the gun in my left hand, twist it around, straining my wrist in the process, and pull the trigger with my thumb. Unless I were left-handed, double-jointed, and a trickier shot than you are. I'd blast him straight through the middle. All right. All right, yes, it was Maxine. Yeah. Well, that's good. Maybe you can get cured now. Why don't you open up some more? Let me put it down like it was business. All right, sir. Number one. Maxine killed your partner, Mickey Linehan, five years ago. Probable motive to eliminate him and send Spicer up for it. Yeah, yeah, she... She didn't figure on Spicer being smart enough to confess to the robbery, and that alibied him for the murder. Two, you perjured yourself to clear Maxine of the murder. Motive? To prevent the truth about your partner from coming out, and Maxine was motive enough for anything. Cut it out, will you? Sorry. Three, Spicer forced you to team up with him on the jewelry heist. How? Well, he threatened to make a full confession as accessory to Mickey's killing I would have put the whole works on Maxine and leave him in the clear. Yeah. Can't be tried twice for the same crime. Four. You decided to rub out Spicer, whether you could beat the rap or not, and clear the books once and for all. So you pretended to play along with him, told Maxine to do the same, and called me in as umpire. Yeah, yeah. I'm... Sam, I'm sorry. I... Why couldn't you lay off Maxine? Why did you have to... Oh, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> That's about it. Period. End of friendship. Oh. You mean the confession that you tricked her into making turned out to... That's it, Effie. Oh. What'll happen to him? Hmm? What about Dick Foley? Dick? Oh, they got him on a number of things, I suppose. May take some time out of him. But I think he'll be an okay guy again. With her out of the way. With her out of the way. Sam. Uh, go and type it up, will you? It's late. I'm going to get out of here. And now, listen to this. When it comes to hair tonics, the best friend of the family is Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Now, you can get America's leading hair tonic in the new 25-cent Get Acquainted size. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Well, here it is, Sam. I know how you must feel, so I won't... What's your hurry? Well, I thought to... Well, you know how you always feel. Look, sweetheart, Dick Foley was a private dick. So what? You mean you can bring yourself to talk about it? Sure. Go ahead, try me. Well, Sam, it seems terribly complicated... I suppose because Mr. Foley was in the profession and thinks like you do. Up to a point, Effie. What's bothering you? Well, why did he call you in? You, another private detective, and he knew how smart you are and all, and... Yeah. And... I don't know, maybe he thought, well, if I turned up anything, I'd look the other way. Do you think that could ever happen to you, Sam? <laughs> That's a clever phrase you dictated. He called me in as umpire. That's baseball. But if he was so clever, why didn't he win, Sam? His mistake, Evie, was trying a quadruple play which has never been heard of in the history of baseball or crime. All he wanted was to bat Maxine home safe. But it usually figures when three men are out, the side retires. Oh, 
Well, I don't understand baseball, Sam. Yeah, that's all right. Football will be here soon anyway. Oh, but I don't... Good night, Levy. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Renee Garrigang. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's not alcoholic Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, this is Sam, Blackleg Spade, the third most dangerous gambler on the Barbary Coast. Oh, Sam, not horses again. Horses, women, and the gaming tables, Effie, the diversions of the elite. Well, divert yourself with this, Sam. The phone company has sent the pink notice. Uh huh. Pay it no mind, sweetheart. We are healed. We have hit the cashier's cage, annexed the pot, broken the bank, and we're standing on velvet. Sam, are you sober? Uh, definitely velvet. Hmm. Warm, too. Sam, from where are you calling from? You're wrong, Effie. It's a drugstore. Stay where you are. I'll be right down to deal out my report on the hot hundred grand caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. It's smart to buy things the whole family can use, isn't it? That's why I say it's smart to buy Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. To mom, to dad, to the children, Wild Root Cream Oil is really a friend indeed. Non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with lanolin grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. I hope you have a big family-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil in your home. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, uh, September 19, 1948. To uh, robbery detail, San Francisco Police, Attention Sergeant Walsh. Uh, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, uh, dear Joe. Here's the rundown on that hot hundred grand. It started pleasantly enough when my secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, cute little mouse, eased into my private office, closed the door behind her, and leaned back against it with that air of pained resignation, which generally means there's a customer outside that she doesn't approve of, but that I'll see her anyway. It's up to you, Sam. She's very well dressed, and I imagine she can afford you. How do you uh, deduce that? Well, she dropped her purse. I didn't get time to count it all, but there was a $100 bill on top. Well, sure in, Effie. Sam. I... Go ahead, say it. Oh, I don't know, Sam. Sometimes, well, there's just money. No. No, that's one of the reasons I hire you. What's the matter with it? Nothing. That's just it, Sam. 
She's very good-looking, mm-hmm. cultivated, and very kind and considerate. And she seems sincerely troubled. You mean her act is a little too good? I felt that too, Sam. Thanks, Angel. I'll keep that in mind. Tell her to come in. All right, Sam. Mr. Spade will see you, Mrs. Kilcourt. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Spade. My pleasure. Uh, won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm Lorraine Kilcourse, Mr. Spade. It's about my husband, Leonard Kilcourse. Husband? Oh. We've only been married a short time. It was a quiet ceremony at the San Cedro Mission. Mm. Leonard didn't want to subject me to any publicity. The difference in our ages, you know? You mean you want me to keep it a secret? Oh, no. No, except for the newspapers, of course. Naturally, all of Leonard's friends know. Well, he doesn't have many from what I've heard. I've thought it strange, too, that such a prominent man should have such a small circle of acquaintances. I met him only a short time before I married him. He's been very kind and absolutely devoted to me, and I suppose I should feel ashamed of myself for for coming to you. But there are so many things about him that are mysterious that I... Sometimes I... I I can't seem to find my handkerchief. Here. Kleenex. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, take it you're not a San Francisco girl. No. No, I met him at a dude ranch. Well, uh, maybe I can clear up some of your mysteries for free. The reason your husband doesn't have many friends is because they keep dropping dead. I don't understand you. Uh, forget it. He's a big public servant. He's built a lot of sidewalks. The streets of this city are paved with his good intentions. His name is on a thousand manhole covers. If the names of his former business associates land on headstones, it's nothing to me. I got my own racket. Well, what? I think my husband is paying blackmail to someone. Uh Uh-huh. And upon what do you base your suspicions, Mrs. K? It started about a month ago. He began withdrawing large sums from our joint account. First it was 10,000, then then 20,000, and last week, Mm 50,000. And this morning, he closed out the balance of the account. $100,000. Yeah, well, he's got it to spend, Mrs. Kilcoy. Well, I, I won't pretend the money doesn't interest me, but what's behind it, Mr. Spade? Each time he withdraws these cash sums, he, he leaves the house without a word to me. And sometimes doesn't return until dawn. My husband is not fond of nightlife, Mr. Spade. Only a desperate situation could induce him to leave the house after dark. <clears throat> yeah, so I've heard. They say that's how he kept his health as long as he has. All right, uh, you want me to trail him, find out what he does with the money. Just one question. Why'd you pick me for the job? I... I... Why, your reputation... That's local. You say you're new in San Francisco. Well, I I do read the local papers. Your picture was in only two weeks ago. Yeah, well, that caver didn't help my reputation. I like your looks. A nice, honest face. A man I could trust. Well, don't buy that. And I'm sentimental, too. Your picture reminded me of someone who is very dear to me. My brother... Of course, you're nothing like him, really, but but you do look alike. I suppose that sounds like a silly woman's reason for... Yeah. What's your address? Well, I have a little place of my own out on Divisadero. The Balboa Apartments near Normandy Terrace. Mm-hmm. You'd better keep in touch with me there. I don't want Leonard to know. The Kilcourse Mansion is at 1316 Clarendon. 1316. Mm-hmm. He returns from his office around six in the evening. Do you have a car? No. I need one? Well, I don't know where he may go. Now, here are the keys to my car. It's parked in front of the main entrance, a gray Plymouth. He won't recognize the car. He, my, my, it's my brother's. Now, about your fee. A hundred bucks now. If I need more, I'll leave you now. I had an uneasy feeling I would need more. The last detective that tried to follow Leonard Kilcourse had hospital insurance. I don't. But I'm a gambler at heart, so I parked Lorraine's Plymouth across the street from the Kilcourse mansion and waited. At 9 and a p.m., Mr. Kilcourse, much, much too old for her, came out the front door and flagged down a taxi. I made an illegal U-turn and followed. The trail ended across the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. It was a country club-type building on top of a hill overlooking the bay. It did business under the name of Ernie Nogales' Racket Club. The racket had nothing to do with tennis. It came from two sources. 
the moans and groans of the customers losing money at the roulette wheels and crap tables, and the glad hand the management threw at my quarry as I followed him in. Well, Mr. Kilcoy, surprised to see you. Since when you go out after dark? Well, I thought a little nightlife might agree with me, Nogales. Oh, 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 that sounds like you, Mr. Kilcoy. I didn't know you better. I think you was afraid to go out night. <laughs> well, now, I was thinking of buying this place to retire to. Ah. But I figured it'd be cheaper to win it at your roulette table. <laughs> What's your limit here? 10,000. But for you, wide open. The sky. A hot hundred grand for a starter? <laughs> well, any time they catch you with hot money, Mr. Kinko. <laughs> Come over to the cashier. Yeah. I sell you the chips myself. <laughs> I didn't have to bother making myself inconspicuous. Everybody in the joint stopped playing to watch Kilcourse while he shoved his hundred grand roll through the cashier's window and scooped up four stacks of thousand buck chips. Make your bets, please. All right, you. Spin that wheel. Huh? How much you got there? Twenty-five grand. Any objections? Is that okay, Mr. Nogales? Uh, Spin it, Joe. I'm covering through the table personally. Okay, sir. Around and round the little ball goes. Fifteen page, fifteen and the red. Oh. Maybe next time, Mr. Kimco. Why don't you double up, play the red and the black? It's safer. I'll stay with the numbers. Fifty thousand on fifteen. There. Spin it. It's okay, Joe. I'm still covering. Well, it's your money, Mr. Nogales. Number four page. Number four and the red again. Well... Twenty-five grand more on fifteen. Uh, look, Mr. Kilcoris, go on, enjoy yourself, take it off your income tax, but please spend those... Spread them out a little there, those chips, huh? It looks bad for the house. What kind of a joint is this? Can't you cover the bets? Okay, Joe. He asked for it. Okay, sir. <laughs> I didn't wait to see where the little ball went on the last spin of the wheel. I would have made a side bet with any taker that Kilcourse wanted to lose that hundred grand. I would also have made book he knew I was following him. As I left the table and walked out of the club, I braced myself for what usually comes next. There would either be a dead body in the car or somebody would crease my noggin with a sap. But nothing happened. I switched on the headlights and stood in the glare of them for fully a minute, but nobody even shot at me. I flushed the shrubbery. No gunman. Check the ignition wires. No booby traps. Driving back to town, I racked my brain for some way to bring them out into the open. I felt like a man with his life savings all on one number waiting for the wheel to stop spinning, which wasn't far from the truth. Not much of a cliffhanger, but the best we could do this week. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective... Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, On sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the hot hundred grand caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Yeah? Uh, this uh, Mrs. Kilcross's apartment? Yeah. She here? Yeah. Well, uh, 
Can I come in? Yeah. Tommy? Yeah. Who is that, Mr. Spade? Yeah. Oh, this is this is the detective I was telling you about, Tommy. Remember? Yeah. The one who looked so much like you? Yeah. No. Oh, excuse me. This is my brother, Tommy Lane. Yeah. I mean, uh... Tommy, won't you run down to the corner and buy me some cigarettes for about 20 minutes? I have something to talk over with Mr. Spade. Yeah. Nice boy, your brother. Small vocabulary, but big feet. Well, he, he's shy. Now, what did you find out about Mr. K- uh, my husband, Mr. Spade? He uh, dropped a hundred grand in a gambling joint. Ernie Nogales' racket club. You know it? No, but I know Ernie Nogales. I knew him in Reno before I met Leonard. He lost his license there for running a crooked wheel. The way Kilcourse was playing tonight, that wheel didn't have to be crooked. He was trying to lose that hundred grand. But why? Why would he do a thing like that? One of two reasons. Either he's paying off to Nogales or he's paying off to somebody else and Nogales is the go-between. Well, I don't believe it. Ernie is a crooked gambler, but he doesn't touch blackmail. And your husband isn't stupid enough to drop a hundred grand in three turns of a wheel. Anyway, I'm not tangled with him and or the Ernie Nogales mob for a hundred bucks of your money or anybody else's. Here, take it. Well, but... And here are your car keys. No, no, wait, please. You, you can't desert me now. Why not? Well, I haven't told you everything. I'd hoped I wouldn't have to. About your brother? How did you know? The only place you get a green suntan is in a pokey. Besides, the act's kind of stir-crazy. Spent a little time in solitary, didn't he? He won't talk about it. But that's it, Sam. That's why Leonard is paying that blackmail money to Nogales. Uh, you just said Nogales wouldn't touch blackmail. Any other corrections you'd like to make in your copy before we proceed? Yes. Well, I might as well tell you everything. Why not? I knew when I came to you this morning that my husband was paying this money to Nogales. I knew because I asked him to. You and Ernie Nogales are working together? I'm not that rotten. I didn't say you were, but you're a rotten liar. There's that much in your favor. But I'm telling the truth now, Sam. You must believe me. Everything that has happened is my fault. I persuaded Nogales to give my brother a job in his place in Reno. Mm-hmm. They quarreled, and when he got closed down, he, he blamed Tommy. He swore he'd kill him when he got out of prison. That's why I begged my husband to pay him to save Tommy's life. Who did rat on Nogales about that crooked wheel in Reno? I did. That's why I feel responsible. Leonard is so fine, so so generous... But I can't let him go on paying for my mistake. Yeah, like you said, he's going to run out of money. Look at me, Sam. Do I look like the kind of a woman to whom money means everything in the world? No, but you're looking at me, not at Kilcourse. You're laughing at me. Oh, I know what you think. Perhaps I did make a mistake in marrying Leonard, but he was so kind, so considerate, like my father. Everybody reminds you of your relatives. You don't believe my story. Well, since you asked. Well, all right, then. Here's the truth. I'm really Jack the Ripper's granddaughter. My parents were terribly wealthy. I harpooned my mother in her Beverly Hills swimming pool, set fire to my father with a $50,000 negotiable bond, and eloped with John Wilkes Booth. That brings us up to 1865. Shall I go on? Don't stop. It's great. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here and leave me alone. After you've told me all your secrets, I'm not that rotten. (sighs) You won't help me. You never intended to. Why go on? Torturing. Oh, now, stop that. Please, please. I, I believe you. I believe all your stories. Now, uh, what is my next smart move? Sam, the only way to stop Ernie Nogales is to prove that he's running a crooked wheel. And then he'd pay back all that blackmail money, and, and he wouldn't dare lay a hand on Tommy. Well, it's going to be hard to prove and expensive. Oh, but... I'll have to lose a little on that wheel before I can figure the way it's rigged. How much can you invest? Well, I, I have about a thousand dollars of my own. With you? Yes. Here, you take it. Mmm, smells nice. Sam. Yeah? Sam, after all this is over, and after I've put things to right with Leonard, I should have told him before this, but I owed him so much, I... Oh, Sam, I'm so glad it's you. Yeah, me too, Angel. Go now, darling, before I beg you not to. What time does that joint close? Well, well, it runs all night, I think. Good. Let's stay up late and raid the icebox. Around 2 in the a.m., when I low-geared the Plymouth up the long, steep driveway to Ernie Nogales' racket club, backed into the parking space nearest the road with a car headed downhill for a quick getaway just in case, and I went in. 
The joint was still going full blast. I bought 500 bucks worth of chips, swaggered over to the table where Kilcross had dropped his hundred grand and nonchalantly flipped the blue chip onto the red. Appalachia bets, ladies and gentlemen. Make your game. Okay, that's all. Around and round the little ball goes. I didn't look to see where the little ball went. Most of the money was on red, so it was bound to turn up black. A red, please. What? Number 15. Place your bets, please. Make your game, ladies and gentlemen. Around and round it goes. The chips were spread around more the next turn, so I stacked 100 at the bottom of the 1 to 34 column. With a crooked wheel, my 100 made it the best bet to lose. And 19, and the red wins again. Hey! I plunked 500 down on number 5 and raked in 17,500. I left my original bet on the table. When the little ball fell into the pocket, I was 35,000 bucks to the good from my point of view, but not from my clients. I doubled my bet and looked apprehensively around. There were no surly characters edging up behind me. In fact, the only surly character in sight was Ernie Nogales, and he looked happy. That didn't make much sense. When my bankroll got to 105,000, I played a hunch. I threw five grand of it back on the table and lost it. That made a kind of sense. I cashed in the rest of my chips and squeezed the hundred grand U.S. currency into my inside pocket. If anybody aimed for my heart, it was thick enough to stop the slug, which was some comfort. But what I saw when I walked out to the parking lot was no comfort at all. I'd gotten just a glimpse of it through some trees. A sedan backed into a driveway halfway down the hill. It was blacked out except for five glowing cigar ends that showed through the windows. I could think of only one reason for five cigar smokers to be parked in that particular spot at that particular moment. The Plymouth is where I had parked it, pointing straight down the hill. I slammed the door but didn't get in. Then I listened. The car down the hill was getting ready, too. I cracked the door of the Plymouth wide enough to get my arm inside and pressed the starter with the heel of my hand. I switched on the lights, pushed the clutch with my left hand, used my right to shift it into low... And I pulled the hand throttle out all the way and let it go. What's the big idea busting into my office? We're going to have a talk, no, Gallus? Please, don't wave that heater at me. It makes me nervous. I don't like guns. I don't either. That's why I'm here. Put your hands on top of the desk and keep them there. All right. Give me back that roll. I give you clean money for it. It was a gamble, so I lost. Can you blame me? Where'd you get this money? I buy it. Fifty cents on the dollar. I don't ask where it came from, but I read the papers. I figured it was that ship row, that shipyard payroll job a few days back. Like it just fell in my lap. I figured it'd make 50 grand instead of kill course five. I guess that was dirty trick you just out of stir, Tommy, huh? I got news for you, Nogales. I didn't know this money was hot, and I am not Tommy Lane. No? Then what? Private Dick. Tommy's sister hired me to take the fall for him. Look, I uh, got most of the caper. Kilcourse wanted to pay Tommy a hundred grand. You rigged the wheel so Kilcourse would lose it one night, and Tommy would win it back the next night. Now, uh, what was Kilcourse paying him off for? No caper, legitimate. He was sent up for bribing a public official. You mean he was the payoff man for Kilcourse's contracting firm? Sure, legitimate business. And the grand jury went out after Kilcourse. Tommy took the rap, that's all, for a price. Yeah, a hundred grand. Thanks, Nogales, that's all I needed. I was afraid I might be too late. You are, sweetheart. Oh, I have so many things to explain. Where, 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 where can you talk? Right in here. But who's this man? Why, that's your old sweetie from Reno, Ernie Nogales, remember? What's the matter with you two? You oh, crazy? Oh, Sam, I should have told you the truth from the beginning. Check. The Nogales yarn, I can understand. But why did you tell me you were Kilcross's wife? I was desperate. I had to say something. It was the only explanation I could think of for my interest in this case without uh, telling the truth. But you were making a pigeon out of me. I don't know about such things, Sam. All I know is I'm here in time to warn you. You mustn't walk out of here with that money. Listen, they may you... kill you to get it back. They already did. They're combing the wreckage of that car right now looking for my body. <gasps> then Tommy was right. They did mean to kill him. How'd he get the rumble? While he was in prison. From another man that killed Course Framed. He was in for life, so it was safe for him to talk. Hey, you two. Oh. Yeah, Nogales? That car that just drove up. I think that's Mr. Kilcourse. Oh, I... 
There, what's your hurry? Go, let me go. Come on, what's your hurry? Tommy's out there in that cab. I've got to warn him. Or a tip-off kill course. Which is it? No, Sam, you've got to believe me. Sit down. Stop that. You two have fun. I'm getting out of here. Go ahead. Now, uh, listen, sweet Lorraine, you may as well save your breath for those explanations. You're staying right here until the cape is all wrapped up. Here he comes. Have you got a gun, Sam? Yeah. Well, you'd better have it ready. Mm -mm. But Sam... Where's Nogales? I want to see him. Uh, He was called out of town, sir. I'm in charge. Uh, You must have killed Cors? That's right. I want to know why you people have been interfering with my business. It might interest you to know that this building site's on an old Spanish land grant. Title's very shaky. I'll run an eight-lane highway straight through the middle of it and turn the rest of it into a game preserve. (laughs) That's what I do to people who double-cross me. I tried to tell Mr. Nogales that, sir. He wouldn't listen to me. He tipped Tommy off for a split of the hundred grand, but I knew sooner or later we'd have to answer to you, Mr. Kilcors. Oh, what's that? Here's your hundred grand, sir. Count it. Sam. Well, 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 well. What's your name, son? Sam Spade, sir. Well, I'm glad to meet an honest lad. Well, come along. Uh, you too, young lady. We'll all walk out together. Sam, shut what up, are you... What? Uh, Spade, huh? Yes, sir. I'm a private detective, but I'm ambitious. Hmm. Politics? Uh, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> we'll run you for assembly. In the meantime, I believe there's an opening in one of the public services. Garbage disposal. Uh, executive end, of course. Uh, where the devil is that man with my car? Oh, there he is. Now, you drop around to my office in the morning. Thank you, and good night, Mr. Kilcross. Yes. Uh, drive on, Horace. Back to the city. Oh, Sam. How could you? Hmm? All those lies and, and just handing over the money like that. It, it wasn't yours. It wasn't Tommy's either, sweetheart. Get in. Well, Tommy, are you all right? Yeah. Drive us across the bridge, Tommy, will you? Yeah. Tommy. <clears throat> yeah? Tommy, I'm afraid we'll have to do without the money. Yeah? Sam gave it to Mr. Kilcourse. Yeah. Now, now, don't get excited, Tommy. I'm sure Sam had a reason. Didn't you, Sam? Yeah. I mean, that was marked money from a payroll job. Oh, then it won't do him any good. It'll send him up for a good long stretch if the eyewitness story that goes along with it is good enough. And you're just the girl to tell it, sweetheart. Am I uh, right, Tommy? Yeah. Period, end of report. Already? But, Sam... Yeah? What happened? Who were the five men in the car, the ones who shot at that Plymouth in the mistaken belief that you were in it? Their names are of little account, Effie. Suffice it to say that Kilcors pointed his pudgy finger at them in the hopes of keeping the charge of attempted murder out of his indictment. But I was too clever. I identified them. But, Sam, you didn't see anything but their cigars glowing in the darkness. Have you never heard of Sherlock Holmes' monograph on the 49 varieties of tobacco ash, you fool? Oh, but, Sam, Sherlock Holmes is only the segment of someone's imagination. He's a fictional detective. Well? You mean... Oh, Sam, you're tired. Yes, I am. It's affected your mind, winning all that money. Now, you just sit here and rest. All right. Think of the snowy mountaintops and blue skies. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll just go and type this up. Snowy mountaintops. Winter sports yet. And now, listen to this. If you haven't yet tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff, then here's a wonderful way to get acquainted. Buy Wild Root Cream Oil in the new 25-cent size bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And not that it made any difference, but how did you guess that she wasn't Mrs. Kilcoy? Simple. Kilcoy didn't recognize her. Sam, that was after you denounced her. I did no such thing. From the report, Sam, in black and white. Quote, why did you tell me you were Kilcourse's wife? Unquote. At that point, you assumed that she was not Mrs. Leonard Kilcourse. I did not. I merely wondered why she had told me. Well, with all the lies she told, you might have assumed anything she said was totally devoid of truth. And I did, sweetheart. I did. Oh. Oh, well, that's a relief. I was afraid for a while she'd taken you in. What's that got to do with the truth? Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The 
Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorraine Tuttle is Effie. Sadie Thompson appeared as Lorraine Kilcourse. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, when you were a kid, did you like to go sheing? Now, by that, I don't mean chasing the girl next door around the block, but rather the manly art of climbing the nearest snow-capped hill and then returning down said hill on a pair of shees. Of course, you probably know them as skis. Oh, but that's become a peasant term. Now, if you were to use that outmoded expression around the Sun Valley set, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. On the other hand, George Valentine had never heard of sheing, as you will find out in our Let George Do It adventure. It's called Red Spots in the Snow, and you can take it from me. It wasn't borscht. My dear Mr. Valentine, I have never been a violent man, so when I'm threatened I need a professional to, uh, well, frankly, to act as my bodyguard. I don't expect you to follow me around ostentatiously with drawn revolver, but I will expect continuous protection night and day. You will fly to Snow, Snow Valley, Valley Lodge, Lodge, where you will be my guest. Oh, George, did you hear that? Snow Valley. Yes, I heard it, Brooks. Snow Valley is fabulous. The latest, most up-to-date resort in the whole country. I've read the circulars, too. Oh, you? we could have a wonderful time yeah, there. Well, you'd better finish the letter before you start packing. Oh, where you will be my guest. Uh-huh. I don't think you will find your duties too arduous. There's skating, skiing, dancing, and entertainment. Oh, George, it sounds heavenly. Yes, it does. Who's it from? Oh, uh, it's signed, uh, Herbert Judson. Oh. George, do you think it could Only be... Only one Herbert Judson, I guess. Oh, who'd threaten a famous picture director like Herbert Judson? <laughs> Probably not over half the population of Hollywood. Well, he's handsome, he's famous, he's clever. And quite a lady killer. I was reading about his latest heartthrob in one of the gossip columns. Well, then you don't want to take the case. Oh, I didn't say that. If you'd like a vacation... Oh, come to think of it, I'm not invited. The minute Judson sets eyes on you, I'm sure you will be. Oh, thank you. That was a compliment, wasn't it, George? Uh, no comment. Well, write him, we'll be there. I'll telegraph him. Hey, I'm not made of money. Collect. Oh, George, it'll be wonderful. Skating in the moonlight, dancing under soft lights. Yeah, and Herbert Judson in person. All right, go home and pack, Angel, and don't forget... Plenty of woolies. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and Let George Do It. Good of you to take the morning plane, Valentine. And to bring Miss Brooks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Judson. Mm. After lunch, we'll go out and try the she-run. 
She? That's the right way to pronounce S-K-I, George. Ah, oh, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry I wasn't here to welcome you when you arrived. Special events on the she run this morning. Oh, well, that's okay. We spent the time looking at the photograph albums in the lobby. You're on almost every page, Mr. Judson. Oh, yes. The publicity men here, you know. Always snapping off-the-record pictures of well-known people on the she run. Well, if I may be permitted a pun, there was one she in particular who was posing with you and a good many of the pictures. <laughs> Well, all the girls like to have their pictures taken with me. Well, this one was very pretty, in spite of the fact that her dark glasses almost covered her face. Did you ever think of going in for pictures, Miss Brooks? Me? Oh, heavens, no. Oh, really? Extremely photogenic, you know. I can get you uh, a screen test. <clears throat> Incidentally, Mr. Judson... Now, don't worry about your fee, Valentine. It'll be over and above your hotel expenses. Everything's on me. Yeah, well, while we're waiting for lunch, perhaps you'd tell us just how you were threatened. I found this note under the door to my room. Ah. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, words cut out of the newspaper. Better keep your promises if you expect to remain healthy. Is that all? It's enough, isn't it? Oh. What promises does it allude to? I haven't the faintest idea. I was sure a clever man like you would find a lot of clues in this. Well, I'm not a movie detective, Mr. Judson, just a troubleshooter who occasionally gets a good idea. Well, whatever the danger is, I'm sure you can cope with it. Mere fact that you're here is very comforting. Ah, <laughs> here's little Mary with the succulent viands. You know, Pierre used to be chef at the saint -Moritz. You're Mr. Valentine, aren't you? Yes, Mary, this is Mr. Valentine. Well, the desk clerk said that this note was left for you. This might deliver it once, so he sent it in. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, will you excuse me? Why, certainly. I wonder who's sending me here. Uh -huh. Look at this. What is it, George? Just like yours, Mr. Judson. Words cut out of a newspaper. With your advertisement at the top, George. Uh, if this is you, you're wasting your time. A man must pay for his sins, and you can't stop it. Better leave here at once. I won't warn you twice. Well, whoever's sending these threats isn't wasting any time, is he? Say, tell me, have you had any disagreements with anyone here? Why, no. No, nothing of any importance. I had a little argument with Jacques, the she instructor. Maybe you'd better tell me about it. I might find it more important than you think. No, it really isn't anything. Little Mary, the, the waitress here, is quite a she expert. The help, you see, are allowed to use the hill back of the lodge. Jacques and Mary are great friends. Or at least they were until the girl who sings arrived. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going too fast. The girl who sings? Uh, her name is Jill Drew. She sings during cocktail hour. Hasn't anything to do with the argument I had with Jacques. I mentioned her because, uh, well, Jacques is infatuated with her and Mary is crazy about Jacques. Quite a little triangle. Well, this trouble you had with Jacques. Well, Mary's quite pretty, as you may have noticed. I uh, have always been on the lookout for photogenic faces. I asked her how she would like to have a screen test... Jacques didn't seem to like the idea. But now that his interests are elsewhere, I'm sure he doesn't care. I'd like to meet this Jacques. Oh, you'll meet him, yes. We'll go up the mountain right after lunch. Well, Miss Brooks, you manage your she's wonderfully. Well, they don't bother me, but that chairlift frightens me. Now, it's really very simple. You just climb aboard one of the chairs as it swings round. You mean those little chairs hanging like a swing are all you have? Well, surely you've been on a she-lift before. <laughs> they didn't have one on the little slope back of the schoolhouse where I learned. <laughs> well, you won't have any trouble. As soon as you get on, you rest your feet on the footboard, and then you pull the bar down in front of you, and you're locked in. Well, the wire that it swings on, suppose it should break. Now, that wire is good and strong. <laughs> but it goes up so high, and when it stops, you're dangling there. Oh, oh, and this is the girl who couldn't get to Snow Valley fast enough. <laughs> you know, for myself, I've always thought this was a silly sport. Twenty minutes to go up, twenty seconds to come down. Well, I thought I could just play around down here. Well, you don't have to come down the sheet trail if you don't want to. Jacques gives his lessons on that plateau up there at the top. See that space between the trees where the lift goes over the hills? You can watch, Mr. Judson, Angel. Yes, and when you're ready to return to the lodge, you can ride back on the chairlift if you want to. Now, let's see. I'd better take the first chair. Mix, uh, Miss Brooks, you take the next, and Valentine the rear guard. Okay. Well, all right, here goes nothing. I'll show you how it's done. You see how slowly the chairs move? You just jump on and put your shoes on the footrest. Pull down the bar, and there you are. 
See you at the top. Okay, you're next, Angel. I'll help you. On you go. We're awfully high up, George. Yeah, it's a beautiful view, though. I'm afraid to look. I get dizzy. Surely you're not frightened now. We're almost there. And did you ever see a clearer day? Yeah, it is pretty, but those treetops down there look awfully sharp. Oh, don't look down. Look ahead toward that opening between the trees. When we get through there, we'll be only a few feet off the ground. And just beyond, you'll be able to get off. Hey, look back and see how far we've come, Angel. I wish I were an angel. With wings. What's that? Someone in the woods must be hunting. I didn't know they allowed it. They must have hit something, George. Look down there. Red spots in the snow. Hey, that's blood. Hey, good night. Look, Angel. Judson slumped over the bar. He's been shot. Mr. Judson? Someone in the woods there to the left. Hey, Brooksy, look down there. What? Yeah, going down the far side of the hill out of the woods. Someone skiing awfully fast. Yes, and not on the regular ski run. That must be the person who shot Mr. Judson, a blue sweater with a yellow band. Too far off to see what he looks like. Oh, I wish this plane contraption had moved faster. I'll phone down the minute we get to the top and see if we can head him off. Hey, hey, you up there. Help Mr. Judson off. He's been hurt. Yes, sir. What happened? Someone shot him from the woods. All right, I'll get him off the chair. Well, someone will have to help me, too. Just a minute, lady. Where will I get him on the ground? Well, wait now. Don't try to jump off. Don't. There. There you are, ma'am. Oh, Thanks. George, he seems to be hurt badly. Yeah, okay, I'll be there in a second. All right, give me a hand. There, there you are, sir. Okay. All right, let's have a look at him. Now, phone for the police. Tell them to hold anyone wearing a blue sweater with a yellow band around it. Yes, sir. Shall I send for a doctor, too? Too late for that. Mr. Judson is dead. Please, please, folks, keep back. Will you, everyone, keep back? Don't touch him until the police arrive. They'll be here shortly, sir. Did you phone the lodge about the blue sweater with the yellow band? Oh, no, sir. I for, I'm afraid I forgot oh, it. Oh, fine help you are, Buster. You know anyone who has an outfit like that? No, sir. Jacques might know. Well, where is he? Get him. Well, he left a little while ago, just before you arrived. He left? I thought his job was here. Well, he said he had to pick up some supplies in town, and he'd be right back. Hey, Brooksy. Yes, George. Looks as if we have to ski down the hill back there. Are you game? Well, I've never tried a long hill like... Well, whatever you say. All right, come on, then. Now, look, don't let anyone touch the body. No, sir. Hey, you're going the wrong way. The ski run... We're taking the same route the killer took. Come on, Angel, don't break your neck. Oh, George, I'm so glad you care. Well, you bet I care. Oh, George. All right, I'll need you to help me when we get down. Lots of things that have oh, to be... Oh, George. Come on, hold your hat. Here we go. What's it like flying, isn't it, George? Yeah, Pretty fast. George, look out. That snowbank. Huh? Be careful. Oh, hey. Oh. Oh. Hey, Brooksy, help me out of this, will Are you? Are you all right? Yeah, I guess so. Half the snow on the country went down my neck. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. But it was certainly bumpy. Yeah. Man must have been an expert. Yeah, but he slipped up. Nice of him to leave a trail in the snow for us to follow. Yeah, that's right. Well, come on. What are we waiting for? He's way ahead by now. I know, but we can tell the way he went. Duck down. Get behind that snowbank. We've caught up with our friend, the killer. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine. You are invited to Snow Valley Lodge to act as guardian for the well-known Hollywood director, Herbert Judson. Now Judson is dead, shot while riding on the ski lift just in front of you and Claire Brooks. And now that you've followed the suspected killer's trail, you find yourself hiding behind a snowbank trying to avoid being a target. Well, if your name is George Valentine, that's only going to make you more anxious to catch the person who's been doing the shooting. (laughs) 
Okay, Angel, according to my calculations, that's the last shot in his gun. Be careful, George. Okay, I'll take a look. There's no sign of anyone. From here on, he followed the road, and there isn't any more trail. Yes, the road's too cut up by automobile chains. Well, let's get to the hotel. I want to check a few things before the police begin their inquiry. You check the drying room and ask about blue sweaters and yellow stripes. I'll phone Hollywood and get the latest dope on Judson. Any pay dirt, Brooksy? None. The man in the drying room says there are several people who have sweaters like that, but none of them wore them this morning. Was Jacques one of them? No. Jacques always wears black. Did you talk to Hollywood? Yeah, yeah, I did. Signet Studios was very much upset at the news, naturally. Everyone seemed to like Judson. Due back at the studio next week to make a picture. No recent scandals, no big romance since last year. But one of the newspaper boys said that his death would cause a lot of weeping and wailing among aspiring actresses. Popular, huh? Well, he was always promising to get girls into pictures, never making good. Hey, didn't he ask you if you wanted a screen test? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> George, that note he received warned him he'd better keep his promises. Do you suppose one of the girls... I can't imagine why failure to get a screen test is motive enough for murder. But we mustn't pass up anything. Okay, he promised Mary a test. Let's see her. George, do you remember these photo albums we looked at before lunch? Yeah, Sure. Judson and his she's. Well, maybe one of them had a dark sweater with a light stripe. Oh. Brooksy, what would I do without you? Well, I hope you couldn't, George. If I thought... Here they are. Ah. Anything wrong? Yeah. Someone tore out all the pages from the front of this book. Do you suppose it might have been someone who had a dark sweater with a light stripe? I wouldn't be surprised. Come on, let's find Mary. I beg your pardon. I'm looking for a waitress named Mary. Have you, well, uh... you wouldn't find her here now. She's off in the afternoons. Oh, I see. Now, you're Jill Drew, the singer, aren't you? Yes. My name is Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. Hello. How do you do? You, uh, heard about Mr. Judson, I suppose. Yes. Well, I'm asking a few questions before the police arrive. Would you mind telling me if you were one of the girls Mr. Judson promised a screen test to? I hardly knew Mr. Judson. By any chance, do you have a ski outfit? A blue sweater with a yellow stripe? No, I don't ski. I'm engaged to sing and play the piano. Where would I find time to ski? Now, if you don't mind, I have to practice. Yeah, the uh, show must go on, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. I knocked them over to the floor. Sounds like a junk cart. Here, I'll pick them up. They're beautiful bracelets you have, Miss Drew. Rather heavy, aren't they, when you're playing the piano? Oh, I never wear them when I play. But I don't like to leave them in my room. It's marvelous what they can do with costume jewelry these days. My dear young lady, those are real. They're from Elwood's in Beverly Hills. Oh, singing for your supper must be profitable. Oh, I have admirers. I don't doubt it. Now, if you don't mind... Oh, sure. Yes. Sorry to have interrupted your practicing. If you're looking for Mary, you might find her in her room. And where is that? In the annex, back of the main lodge. If she isn't there, she may be skiing on the hill, back of the annex. She's very proficient. Mary, you've been crying. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Poor Mr. Judson. You liked him a lot, didn't you? Well, he was always so kind and generous. Next week, he was going to take me back to Hollywood with him for a picture test. Well, look, Mary, murder is a serious matter. You're in the dining room a lot. Did you ever hear Mr. Judson in an argument with Jacques? What? No, Mr. Valentine. Well, Jacques would never... Mary, there will be an inquest. You'll be asked questions, and you'll get yourself into a lot of trouble if you hide anything. Mr. Judson admitted he and Jacques had an argument about you. Well, he only warned Mr. Judson not to make any promises he couldn't keep. And Mr. Judson was going to give me Jacques the test. Jacques threatened Mr. Judson? Oh, no, Mr. Valentine. It wasn't a threat. Just a friendly warning. Don't you think you'd better tell us all about it? Well, Jacques and I... Well, he used to be kind of attentive until Miss Drew came. I... I wanted to make him jealous, so I told him about Mr. Judson promising me a chance in pictures. And he warned Mr. Judson not to make any promises he couldn't keep. That was all. Where can I find Jacques when he isn't teaching? Well, if he isn't with Miss Drew, he's usually in his cabin. And that is? 
Back at the lodge. Jacques doesn't live in the lodge. He's a cabin of his own. It's number 26. Okay, thanks. I'll see you later. Seem to be at home. Maybe the door's open. We can try. A man who leaves his door open can't have anything to hide. Usually. Well, that's a nice cabin. Fireplace and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Quite cozy. Oh, I'd like to have time to look at all the pictures he has on the walls. Well, go ahead and look. We'll see what else there is. These must be his pupils. Mm. Oh, publicity stills. Well, let's see now. The table. In there. Scrap basket. Hmm. What is it, George? This newspaper. I haven't the slightest doubt that both Judson's message and mine were cut right out of this. George, if he wanted to hide it, why didn't he burn it? I was thinking the same thing, Angel. I'll keep it anyway. Now let's have a look at the pictures. <laughs> well, Jacques seems to have had his picture taken with every well-known star in Hollywood. To Jacques, who helped me stay on my feet, Grant Cooper. To Jacques, the best there is, Norma Lewis. And here he is with Mr. Judson and Jill Drew. In memory of a happy vacation. George, isn't this like one of the pictures from the book? Uh Uh-huh. Only she isn't wearing the dark glasses here. Mm, She was prettier then. She wasn't posing when we saw her. Her sweater has a stripe. Only it's a light sweater with a dark stripe instead of the other way around. Thought she couldn't ski. Doesn't mean you can ski just because you're photographed with them on. George, do you smell something burning? Hmm. Yeah, it smells like cloth. Hey, it is, here in the fireplace. I wonder we couldn't locate the missing suit. Where are you going? Well, to get some water to throw in the fire. Hasn't been in the fire very long. I'll get it out with a poker. There we are. Now, it's a shame to spoil this rug, but... Don't your hands. I'm getting the water. No, I got it, Angel. Just have to stamp on it a bit more. Look out, George. Huh? Oh, good. Well, what do you know? Blue sweater and yellow stripe, all right. I'm glad we found it before it had time to burn completely. Let's see if there's anything in the pocket. Nothing but what's left of this handkerchief. Hey, his initial, too. Well, that sort of settles it, doesn't it, George? Yeah, perhaps. We'll hold it for the sheriff when he arrives. What are you doing in my room? Oh, uh, <clears throat> hello there. I suppose you're Jacques. Didn't think you'd be back so soon. Effortless, did You did not? I ought to turn you over to the police. Well, for the moment, I represent the police. You're lying. Now, listen, Buster. Maybe you don't know that you're the number one suspect for a murder. What's that? (laughs) Good imitation of a man indicating surprise. You think I killed Mr. Judson? Now, look, your ski suit... Oh, that isn't mine. I never had one like that. Your handkerchief was in the pocket. Oh, that isn't mine either. It's... It's none of your business. Now, will you get out of here or must I... Look out, George. Another bit of evidence, huh? All right. Put that gun down, Buster. Drop it, I say. Drop it, Buster. It isn't loaded. What? Ah, Don't you remember? You used up all the bullets shooting at us. Okay, pick it up carefully, Brooksy, yeah. while I hold our friend here. Well, the shots have been fired, George. Yeah, I thought so. Come on, Buster, we're going to find the sheriff. Sorry to disturb you again, Miss Drew, but have the police arrived? I haven't seen them, Mr. Valentine. Come along, Jacques. Jill, uh, I... Mr. Valentine, where are you taking Jacques? We're on our way to the police, Mary. This fool is trying to say that I killed Judson. We found the gun and the ski suit in his room. He tried to burn it. We got there in time. Jacques says the suit is too small for him, and I'm inclined to agree with him. But it wasn't Jacques. He didn't do it. I, I know it. Mary, be quiet. He didn't do it because... Because I did it. Huh? It does look like a girl's sweater, George. What's left of the handkerchief looks like a woman's. Mary, are you trying to protect Jock? No, no, I... She might have done it, George. She knows how to ski, and the sweater could fit her. Okay, motive, Angel. Mr. Judson promised her a test in pictures. He hadn't kept his promise. Well, it's not a very good motive for shooting a man, as I remarked before. Would you say so, Miss Drew? Please, can't you discuss this somewhere else? I have oh, to... Oh, yeah, rehearse. sure, I know, I know. You have to rehearse. We'll only be a minute. And you might be interested in this. Do you think failure to give a girl a screen test is good and sufficient reason to... Mr. Judson made fun of me because Jacques had fallen in love with Miss Drew. Please, leave me out of this. You say you shot him, Mary, huh? Yes. 
And then came down the other side of the mountain and reached the hotel in time to go to work. That's it, George. And then planted the suit and the newspaper and Jock's gun back in his room. She tried to burn the suit. Jock's cabin was the only one with a fireplace, and it was only natural that she should return the gun. But she happens to love Jock, is even willing to confess to a crime she didn't commit to save his life. Why would she leave the stuff in his room for the police to find? Well, maybe she was jealous and then changed her mind when she saw he was suspected. Girls in love often do strange things. Oh, yeah, they certainly do. Well, it's an interesting theory, Brooksy. Only if you remember, when we started up the ski lift, Mary was still at the bottom. We just left her in the dining room. She couldn't possibly have reached the top before we did. Yeah, you're a sweet kid, Mary, trying to save the man you love. But it isn't a good idea to get mixed up with the law. Then you think it really was, Jack? Oh, no. No, I agree with you that it was a woman, all right. A woman's sweater, a woman's handkerchief. And do you remember the initial on the handkerchief? Yes. J for Jock. Why not J for Jill? Don't go away, Miss Drew. Oh, this is ridiculous. Is it? We saw your photograph in a blue sweater and a yellow band. You destroyed the pictures in the album, but you forgot the one in Jacques' room. But she had on a light sweater with a dark band. The strange peculiarities of photography, Angel. Unless you're using panchromatic film, blue comes out light and yellow comes out dark. And I think when I check with Elwoods and Beverly Hills about those bangles, we'll find that Judson bought them. Yeah, I think we'll find out that they were presents from him before he got tired of her and started sheing elsewhere. All right. All right, I did it. I didn't mean to kill him. I just wanted to frighten him. But he deserved to die. He was a pig. He was always promising women the world and giving them nothing. He even promised to marry me. Then he met this little nobody and treated me like the dirt under his feet. I tried to make him jealous by pretending I cared for Jacques. Uh huh. Brooksy, I'll turn this little lady over to the sheriff, phone the jeweler in Beverly Hills, and then I'll meet you back in the lobby. <laughs> Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Well, I was right, Angel. Judson bought those presents and braces for Jill. But, George, did she tear the pictures out of the book so we wouldn't know she could ski? That's right. I don't think she meant to implicate Jacques, but his cabin was the only one near hers that had a fireplace. So when she went there to return his gun, she thought of burning the sweater, which she knew we'd seen from the chairlift. Well, how did you know Jacques didn't do it? Well, he didn't know the gun didn't have any bullets in it, for one thing. And now Mary and Jacques can live happily ever after. <laughs> can anyone really live happily ever after? Oh, George, you're so cynical. If you don't look out, some girl will take a shot at you for a warning. Not from a ski lift, Angel. The only girl who'd take a shot at me doesn't like dangling from the sky. You have just heard Red Spots in the Snow, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Davis Kent wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you'll again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Well, greetings as usual, friend. Now, before we get down to cases, I want to ask you a question. What, in your opinion, is the dirtiest trick man can play on his fellow man? Now, don't say stealing candy from a baby, because that'll send you right back to the bush leagues. No, I'll tell you what I'll do. I promise you that if you'll listen to our Let George Do It adventure, 
you'll get some of the nastiest ideas on how to loss up your neighbor that you've ever heard of. Is that a deal? Okay, suppose I let George Valentine take it from here. Dear Mr. Valentine, first letter I ever read in 17 years since the last time I filed a gold claim in Nogales. Name's Tioga Tom, only honest man left in the West. If you ever heard of the castle I live in out by the desert, then you know what these railroad tickets are for. To come see me. But you don't know anything else, understand? Trouble you fellas, you jump on conclusions. Think nobody else is smart but you. If you think I need help, then you're crazier than the people in Cactus Junction. And I ain't spit in their direction since WPA. But I do need a mite of assistance regarding the arrest of a culprit. I'm a man everybody tries to pester, on account of how rich they think I struck it. But me, I like my privacy and I aim to maintain it. P.S. The culprit I make reference to is the one who stole or made disappear or killed my dog. Only botheration is, it was my C&I dog. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Like a chicken leg, dearie, I brought a whole fryer along with some hard-boiled eggs. You know how trains are. Oops! Excuse me while I just get my valise on the rack here. It's all right. I'll move my coat, only this Yes, is... you came all the way through from the city, huh, dearie? Claire Brooks, it says on the baggage thing. Oh, my, that's a nice name. I had a boarder named Brooks once, but he died with his kidneys, poor darling. How you like our town, Cactus Junction? It ain't much, uh, look, is it? Please, excuse me, but really, this seat is... Dead. There we are. I guess there's no room for my hat, though. Have to jab it in across the aisle. Mind me to keep my eye on it. You never know. So now let's eat. Well, I'm awfully sorry, madam, but I'm trying Go to tell on, you. Go on, dearie. There's plenty of chicken for both of us. Oh, but I had the most awful time wringing its neck. Oh, you should have seen me. I chased him all around the oh, yard. Oh, no. I, I said, will you please not sit down here? The seat is taken. Oh, George. George. Yeah, here I am, Angel. Well, if I'd known you was that tight. Oh, that's all right, lady. Sit still, sit still. But, George. Going out for a smoke. Have a nice time, Brooksy. Oh, George! Isn't he sweet after all? Now, my name's Carmichael, dearie, and let me tell you about this Good. chicken. Good! Let it go, Jake. Well, here we go, Mr. Valentine. Last stop before Emory Switch. Emory Switch. That's where we get off, huh, conductor, for Tom's? Yep. Two, three mile walk, I guess, up the hill. But there's a moon tonight. Rode around the back way, but of course it's his father. Uh huh. Kind of a lonely spot for a blind man, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, desert rat with money. <laughs> Probably never let a doctor touch him in his life. Seen him out there once just a couple of weeks ago. He was fumbling along, hanging on to his dog. And... Doesn't like people, huh? No, there's an old Oriental been with him for years, if that's what you mean. Ho Sing, cook and bottle washer. Which increases, Tom, is. A whole fortune might have paid in his castle, they say. <laughs> eh, I can't feel too sorry for him. Tioga Tom, last honest man in the West. <laughs> says him. Well, you'll be the first fist up there for a long time, I guess. Maybe you can get your hands on some of that gold. Underway now. Hey, save me another. Hey, wait, wait for me. Hey, stop the Oh, conductor, there seems to be a guy out here. Hey, 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 well, come on, let's give him a hand. Drinking too. Can't even run straight, you see. Help me, fellas, will you please? Here, let me reach him. Now, now, here, I can reach him. Oh, gee, thanks. Oh, 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 easy there. Oh, Couldn't oh, even oh, hang onto my hand. Oh, Don't know why we bother. He's liable to fall. Get out of the way, friend. I'll get him. Here we go, boys. Here we are. Oh, gee. Oh, thanks. So, sorry to be in trouble, was in the bar, and everybody was so nice, they couldn't get away. Okay, okay, Frank, you made it all right. Oh, yeah. Wait a uh, minute, here's your uh, hat over here. My name's, uh, Loosefoot. Want a drink? 
What? Uh, Loosefoot. Uh, it's a name. Somebody just give it to me, I guess. I don't remember. Uh, come on, come on. Have Wait a, a minute, scepter, it's your ticket, huh? too. Want hey, look, it fell off your head. Take it. Here, give me that. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, sure, nice of you, hey, pal. Emery uh, Switch, it's Yeah. Uh, didn't it? Oh, oh, sure, sure. I, I'm a necktie salesman. Got a few samples for the switchman who works there. That's all. Well, thanks again, and, and, and you too. I, uh, where'd the other guy go? Back in the car, I guess. Oh, well, uh, thank him for giving me a hand, will you? I mean, thanks. I sure appreciate Yeah, sure. Uh, Only didn't you notice, Liz Brain? What that other guy tried to give you was a shove. I didn't shove him, Mr. Valentine. I just didn't help him much. I didn't want him on the train. What of it? Well, Mr. Flannery, I don't know. I'm just curious. Perfect right. Perfect. His name's Loosefoot. You know him? Who doesn't? I've done business in Cactus Junction. Lawyer. Coming this time from the city, though. As far as Emery Switch, huh? You too, maybe, huh? And why not? Now, Loosefoot's the kind of a person who's always in the way. Son of an old partner of Tioga Tom's, or claims to be. Always claiming to have a claim on him. Oh. And why are you going? What's your claim, Mr. Flannery? Never ask a lawyer a direct question, young man. <laughs> Spoken like an ambulance, Jason. Or presume on a man's guilt before it happens. Now, I haven't really seen Tom since before he lost his eyesight. Many's the time I've handled his legal affairs. Oh, wait and... a minute. What do you mean, guilt before it happens? What happens? What's going on tonight? You and Loosefoot. That makes three of us headed for the same place to visit a guy nobody ever visits. And all on the same night. Why? Oh, you too, eh? <laughs> well, well. What's your angle? You need counsel say so. You don't leave me alone. Why should I say why? <laughs> I tell you this, though. There's four, not three. Huh? His common-law wife for six months back in 1917. Or she says she was, but that's her claim. Not a bad one. You mean Tioga Tom's... That big overdeveloped appetite out there in the coach. Notice her eating fried chicken. A woman, Mr. Valentine, who'd wring your neck for a favor, but charged to tell you the time. The widow Carmichael. My land, yes. That's where I live in Cactus Junction. Just to be near the poor dear. Thirty-three years I've waited. The one true love of my life. All right, so you're going to see him too, but would you... Four of us? Four of us? My, I think it's just friendly. That's what I think. Only even with my shoes on, it counts to five to me. Ain't that so, Cousin Henry? Ah, who's cousin? Well, I guess it does, widow. Oh, George, he's some sort of a cousin of Tioga Tom's. Uh, mother's side, it was. Never very close, but... Blood's always thicker than water. That's the way I was raised. If you can't miss Brooks, here it's six of us, ain't it? Tioga, now he never liked crowds. Family trade. I told them we were going up to do a magazine story on him. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But the rest of you, Mrs. Carmichael, will you please... I don't hold no secrets. I'm sure you don't. I ain't afraid to speak up. Remember, blood's thicker than strangers, too, widow. And to whom is bereavement a secret? What? what? Oh, but he'll be well again. I know he will. I brought along my nursing things. It's my opportunity as well as my duty. It's the telegrams, Mr. Valentine. We all got them. Even that loose foot up in the bar car. Where Tom's nearest. Bless his adorable old soul. Now, 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 widow. The telegrams? But I don't know Down why... Down this she... evening, miss. From uh, Po Singh, that heathen up the castle. Here, yeah, read for yourself. Oh, Thanks. Boss, very bad. Fall down, very bad. Come quick, please. Sign Po Sing. Boss, very bad. A blind man, and he's already had some kind of a fall. Emory switch. Ten minutes stop, Emory switch. Come on, Brooksy, I gotta get to a phone. Trap? What trap? What is it? Quiet, Agent. Oh, some kind of trap. I know, Savvy. All it's saying, me mix up. Oh, for up. the love of... 
Look, Po Sing, I told you this is Mr. Valentine. I'm on my way out, but I want to find out what happened since Tom wrote me. Now, if you need a doctor or no, something... No, 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 no. Boss, he say doctor just for horses and descending he bills. Boss dying, that's all. What? Come quick, that's all. Boss is dying. <laughs> dying? Come on, Brooksy. Let's get our stuff off the train and get up there. I don't know what's going on. But, George, day before yesterday, a blind man's dog was stolen or killed, and then he has an accident. I know, right? I know. A rugged character who probably kept moving around, dog or no dog. Sure, somebody's up to something. This bunch of people. Haven't you realized what they are? Yeah, they all got telegrams. You know what I mean. They're the only people in the world, apparently, who have any sort of claim against Tioga Tom. They're nothing but vultures. Well, I'll go you one better, Angel. Say ghouls. Because you want to bet a guy like Tom has never made out a will? So if he did die, they'd all want to be handy to stake out those claims, start grabbing for his gold. Yeah, they go, George. All walking out together. Yeah. About three miles up the hill, somebody said. Only suppose you and I just walk fast and beat him, huh? Let's get to Tom first. All right. Loose foot in the widow. Look, there's certainly a pair. Cousin Henry, he's as slow as they are. Characters, I tell you. But there's one who's not so slow. Hey, he's not with him. Who, Mr. Flannery? Yeah. Still in the compartment. Let's drag him along with us. I want to ask him about what he did with that seeing-eyed dog. Ask him? George, what makes you oh, think I'm just he's... guessing. I'll tell you later, Angel. Hey, Flannery, let's go. We're... George. Mr. Flannery's dead. Yeah. Heard it. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine, Tioga Tom the legendary man in the castle overlooking the desert. He thought he didn't need help, but that was yesterday when all that worried him was the disappearance of his seeing-eye dog. Once his protection was gone, something happened to Tom, an accident, and his only friend, Po Sing, says that he is dying, says, come quick. The vultures, the only relatives or ones with claims against Tom, they're gathering too. But if your name is George Valentine, you can't hurry to the castle quite as quickly as you'd like. Because one of the vultures is dead. Yes, Mr. Flannery has been murdered. Holy brother of Macintosh, what are we going to All do? All right, take it easy, Conductor. Take Some it easy. Some sort of a sharp weapon, George. Yeah, a little tiny wound in his throat. Yeah, but I got a train to worry about, and them people all scattered now. I better get on the telegraph. George, you said you had a hunch Mr. Flannery was the one who did something to the dog. Why? Oh, any of these people could have got at that dog. You know, Angel, it happened yesterday. It's only 15, 20 miles from Cactus Junction out to the castle. So they could have gone back and forth. Well, what's on your mind? But Mr. Flannery told you he'd come all the way from the city, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Neat, sharp little guy, man with efficiency. How about that, did he? Well, I, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I'm so rattled that I, I can't tell. There's I, mud, well, clay on the bottom of his shoes and the instep, see it? I noticed when he crossed his leg and carefully creased his trousers. Mr. Valentine, wait till the sheriff... If he'd been in the city the day before, how'd mud get there? I'm the kind of guy who'd have a shine before breakfast. Say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I got the stubs here, I... Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. Flannery, compartment. But you're right. He just got on at Cactus Junction, just like the others. Uh-huh. So then maybe I'm wrong about the dog. Oh, George, now you're confusing me even worse. Well, why was he murdered? Who murdered him? Maybe somebody else did something, and he was up here snooping around and saw it. Quite an operator, you know that. That'd be his style. See something and just keep quiet. Hey, Al, you see him? No. Oh. See a little woman, a little wobbly guy, and a stiff-jointed slowpoke? I know, sure, I know. No, I didn't see him. I couldn't catch up. Already left the road, I guess. Took the trail up the hill. Oh, brother. This road run around the back side of the castle. Sure, about five miles up there. There's a place you Okay, can... stay and help the conductor, will you? Let me have your truck. Yeah. Well, he's got to get us off on the side. And then all right, all right. You guys worry about the train and the body. Come on, Brooksy. The ghouls are on foot. We can beat them. Yeah, sure, Only well, get that sheriff here fast. One murder's enough for tonight. Particularly if the second one should be me.
fits the description. Yeah. This door, I guess. Oh. Don't see anybody inside there. At least we're ahead of the others. Yeah. Uphill, it'll take him another half hour. Only George, the murderer, if he's one of them, wouldn't stay with the others. Wouldn't he run away? Oh, maybe whatever this is all about isn't finished yet. Here we are, Angel. I guess we walk right in. Oh, it's a kitchen. A living room in here, apparently. Yeah. Hello? Anybody here? Hey, Tom, where are you? The place is so empty, but it's clean. That must be his room. It's the only one that... Yeah, maybe he's asleep. But... George. Hey, a man dying, but his bed's empty. He's gone. Yeah, yeah, he's gone. Huh, what? Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Valentine, hello. Hello, miss. You're posing, but where's your... Tom, gone. <laughs> he is gone. Now, look, friend, what is this? A man who takes a bad fall and is dying doesn't just disappear like that? Oh, Mr. Tom, say, Mr. Tom, gone, now, excuse me, hey, please. wait a minute. Where are you going? I got a cleaver knife. A what? Me, a cleaver. You sorry? Mr. Tom say you must stay. Oh, he does, huh? The boss. Old Honest Tom says we should stay, huh? Suppose we don't. You're going to use that thing? More better, I think you stay. Oh, sure. Okay. No, stay outside. I don't worry. Brother Valentine the sucker, Valentine George, the sucker. George, there's a fence guy. down here the front way, too. It's supposed to be a gate half a mile from the house. Yeah, and this was a path when we started out on it. Where the deuce did we lose it? Valentine the pathfinder, the boy's Oh, scar. George, you don't know yet. Hey, look out now. Easy there. Ooh. We seem to be down in a gully. What? Yeah. The trail must be up there, George. A little bridge right up over us. Come on. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't what I was looking at. Sawdust. Hmm? Yeah, sort of scattered. All around here, too. Farther under the bridge. Seems to be just a little footbridge. Pretty far up there, though, isn't it? Yeah, sort of has been here for a day or two. Wet. Fell here, and there's some on top of the cross piece, too. Yeah, I see it. Somebody said trap. Something up there has been freshly sawed, Angel. And anybody coming up the trail from the front gate would have to go across that bridge, wouldn't they? And it's so dark, they couldn't yeah, see. Yeah, come on. Get up there before somebody tries to walk across it. Hey. Look out! Where are you going? What? Bump into a man just sitting peaceful like that. Hey, there. Woman's voice, wasn't it? Well, yes, couldn't you see it? Tom, Ty, oh, get Tom, wouldn't you know? You wouldn't know anything. Who is it, Valentine? Yeah, I'm standing right here in front of you. You're sitting on a rock waiting for something to happen? Detectives all are stinking. Trouble with you, fella. But sitting nice and healthy, yeah, the poor guy who had the bad tumble. Only honest man left in the West. And he gets his hired boy to send out telegrams saying he's dying. <laughs> had a tumble. Broke ten ribs back in 1922. Never told a lie in my life. So that's the way you stretch it. Poor dying Tom. Been dying since the day I was born. So have you. So now you're sitting here waiting to hear wood break, huh? Bo Singh brings you out where you can, waiting to hear people tumble through that little trap you set up there. Pester me, every one of them. I told you that... I'm afraid we don't believe anything you told us. Told you I like my privacy. I ain't to maintain it. Bunch of vultures, all pestering me, looking for my gold. So you hire me. See an eye dog disappeared. Don't you think somebody's up to something? You jump on conclusions. Say, I had that bridge sword. But one of them did it. Like one of them did a murder, I suppose. Ain't interested in murder. Gonna die myself sometime. That's enough to worry about. Just trying to slow up the process, that's all. I steal my dog and then saw my bridge. Who do you think uses that bridge? I do. Even without my dog, I can find my way around this place, but I found him out. Yes, sir. Tom isn't going to go down with it. Huh? Go on, one chosen. Hold your tongue. Ain't you got ears? George, yes, somebody's coming. I'm going to get up on that bridge before... No, this way. Hey! Hey, where am I? Who is that over there? Where's the trail? I can't see. <laughs> my loving vultures. Tell everybody their friends of mine can't even find their way around. Hello, Henry. Your voice, ain't it? Tom. <laughs> Fitter and a fiddle. What in the name of... Never mind. Where's the rest of them? Loosefoot and the lady. Oh, coming, I guess. We move kind of separate. Only that telegram, Tom. What kind of a stunt... Yeah. Let me take your arm. Help me no. out. Quiet, buddy. Hello, Henry Loosefoot. 
Mrs. Carmichael. Another county he heard from. Could hear that one across three counties. Yeah, there she is, over on the other side. She's headed for the bridge. Come on. But, Hurry Tom, up and can't... get her. I'll be all right. George, we can't get up there in time. We're on the wrong side. She's coming this way. Mrs. Carmichael, stop. Who's that? Where are you? Stay where you are. Don't come across that bridge. What did you say? Oh, the bridge. Yes, I see it. All right. Uh, stop. Don't walk on it. Oh, it's you, dearie. I'm coming. Stop, George, I said. She... Stop, will you? Well, I can't stop till I get there, can Oh, I? Lord, she'll fall. Oh. Stop. My heavens, what's all the fuss? Oh, we... Out of the we way, got... Angel. Let me see something. What's the matter with him? Oh, dearie, what a climb. And the wind blowing my hat off all the time. What are you trying to see, George? The gird is sawed half through, all right. But a board's been freshly nailed across to support it. George, but I But who don't... could have nailed the board across? Tom and Poe Singh are the only ones up here. So Tom was telling the truth. Someone else sawed it, then Tom had it fixed. Wait a minute. Mrs. Carmichael, where's your hat been? What? Yeah. When Flannery was murdered, little tiny wound. He was stabbed with something sharp. Well, how in blazes should I know where the pin is? George, she pinned her hat to the seat opposite us, the seat across the aisle. I remember it. Did I? Couldn't find it when I left the train. And the only person who would have noticed it or thought of using it was the one who sat down there. Cousin Henry. Yes, Cousin Henry. And George, he's down there with Tom. Wait a minute. What about Loosefoot? Where's he? Ran on ahead, I guess. He was the fastest. And the trail's easy mount. So we haven't seen him because he's probably already crossed this bridge. Probably clear up at the house by now. But George Thomas down there with sure, Henry. Sure, sure, with Henry. Don't you see, Angel? Tom wanted to know who killed his dog and sawed the bridge. That was the reason for the phony telegrams, this whole shindig. It was to get all the vultures up here and see which one of them wouldn't walk across the bridge. Henry. And five minutes ago, Tom discovered who was guilty. Well, uh, hurry up. Yeah, 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 but quietly. Because now it's all backwards. Now the question is what Tom intends to do to Henry. There. There they are. And they're not moving toward the house, not moving at all. Tom's got a gun, George. He's hanging onto Henry's arm. Even a blind man could shoot somebody as long as he yeah, had a... Yeah, come on, around this way. Oh, uh... Well, come back, did you? Get down here, Mr. Valentine. This crazy... Shut up, dog killer. You'll get your chance to grovel. He's a murderer, too, you say, huh? Don't answer, Angel. Around the rock here. Yeah, that's right. Now, come on. He's crazy. You're both crazy. Everybody comes pissed me. Well, it's going to stop once for all. Sure, he killed Flannery. Flannery's another fish, snooping around the same day he was. Let go of me. Let go of me. Get your hand oh, off my... Oh, no, you don't. You move. The gun goes off. Okay, Tom, I'm here now, right beside you. You can hand me that gun. Uh-huh. Hey, George, you let go. He just let go. Oh, you, you... Look out. I'll get him. Give me that gun, I said. Where are you? Where is no, he? Oh, no, you don't. Detectives... Knocking my gun The sheriff out, will get him. Don't worry. I just got an idea. It might be good to save you from dying for a while, Tom. <laughs> Man's dying from the day he's born. Oh, sure. Honest Tom. Rugged independent. I know I hate that guy, but shooting him while escaping might not go down so well with a jury. Well, uh, just shooting wild. Uh, I couldn't actually... Well, would have been just blind luck if I hit him, I mean. Oh, sure, sure, Tom. Be careful what you say. Don't want to tell a lie. Only honest man left in the West. Yep, that's me. Don't want to admit you might be a dead shot. Don't want to say right out to your blind. Even though that's how you suckered these people into coming after you. <laughs> but, George, he said... <laughs> Ain't a lie if a man always talks like he had to hear people to recognize him, is it? Ain't a lie to stumble around the few times you've seen, is it? Buster, you take the cake. <laughs> honest as the day is short... Sure, we all jumped at conclusions, all right. Because I guess there's no law against a man with good eyesight owning a seeing-eye dog. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Don't like it. People, don't like them. Well, you can leave for the castle pretty soon, Tom. Taking down your cousin Henry's confession now. Worthless bunch of vultures. Won't be pestered anymore. Sure, sure, Tom. You've got your privacy. You know, we did stop you from doing the one thing that really would have been wrong. Do I appreciate it? Obligations ain't for me, young lady. 
Well, the reason people pester you is because of your gold. And I thought maybe you'd tell us what... <laughs> tell you a secret. Sure, I got barbed wire and fences, but I never actually said I have gold, did I? What? Oh, for the love... Oh, George, come on, let's get out of here. Jump on conclusions, like everybody else. Oh, that awful man. George, I want to go out someplace and go dancing and forget about it. Okay, spend my gold. Well, at least I know you haven't got any. <laughs> I'll tell you something that'll worry you for years. You notice, Tom didn't say he didn't have any either. You have just heard Nothing But the Truth, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. You know something? I'd love to be a detective. You meet so many interesting monsters. Take the fellow who's about to get in touch with George Valentine. He's a big game hunter with a cargo of hungry wildcats, boa constrictors, and other charming playmates. Now, what this old codger wants with our George, I don't know. But I do know this. Our Let George Do It adventure is called The Hand and the Coconut. And just in case you don't care for jungle stories, you should pay attention anyway. Because you'll learn a dandy new way to keep Junior's mitt out of the cookie jar. My dear Mr. Valentine, this is a letter about monkeys. My name is Derek Stang. The same Derek Stang whose exploits in the jungle you no doubt read as a boy. Yes, I'm still as alive as an old battleground of scars and fevers can be alive. And today I'm writing my letter on the deck of a sweltering ship, a South African freighter tied up at the port in your town. <laughs> There's a little capuchin monkey trying to untie my shoelaces at the present moment. <laughs> Monkeys are strange animals. They're greedy like human beings. I have trapped them many times by the simple expedient of placing a shiny, desirable object inside a hollowed-out coconut to which there is only a single small opening, an opening just big enough for a monkey's hand. Of course, the monkey reaches in to grasp the object. Inside the coconut, he grasps it, his hand makes a fist, but then, Mr. Valentine, he can't pull his hand out. The fist is too big. His greed is greater than his fear of the approaching hunter. Oh, Mr. Valentine, will you please come to visit me this evening? I need your help to complete the capture of the monkey. A monkey whose hand is already trapped. A monkey by the name of Lars Mickelson. listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Oh, 
You didn't think I could stay away, did you, Mr. Stang? Hey, here we are, through here. Uh, I'm supposed to be in bed, you know. But I was afraid you couldn't find your way from the pier. And so few people pay any attention to an old man. I've heard of you too, Mr. Stang. Only somehow I always imagined you were... Taller? Uh, uh, taller, yes, yes. With more hair in my beard. <laughs> Perched to stride an elephant, perhaps. <laughs> uh, isn't it wonderful? The romance there is in those old National Geographic pictures. Yeah, the greatest hunter in the world. Why, well, I remember when you... Oh, but I still am. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed, there's no one who can approach me. My exploits will never Wait be... Wait a minute. That uh, red sign back there, what did it mean? Quarantine, Miss Brooks. Ah. Animal quarantine. Ten days I've been stewing here because of some ridiculous nonsense... Uh, careful there. Oh, yes. Gangplank runs straight into the ship, into the hole. I'm all right. Uh, but quarantine for what? It's a plot against me. That's what it is. Uh, no lights on. The captain disappears. Oh, yes, yes, he's ashore. He's having fun. Uh, I, I have matches. Uh, here. The ladder to the... Oh! Uh, what in the... Steady, steady. It's all right. It's a panther. Very rare specimen. Taught a couple of native boys to shreds when he got him. But he's in a cage now, aren't you, old boy? <laughs> yes, they're all in cages. Animals. A ship full of wild here, animals. Here, look here, see? It's a constrictor. 33 feet. Takes quite a crate to pack them in, doesn't it? Yeah. See, through the little bars. And over here, the poison. Yeah, oh, well, thanks. I'm, I'm not much interested in snakes. No, 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 of course not. Too easy, much too easy. All of them are, you know. Sixty years old I am, living from pill to pill, fever to fever. Well, I guess you're still a great Red sound. tape to be finally caught myself in red tape. Oh, you mean this quarantine? Yes, not one of my animals is sick, mind you, not one. Zoos all over the country waiting for delivery. But the day we dock, what happens? An officious young veterinary aboard for the usual government inspection, and he and the captain get together. Well, look, Mr. Stang, this uh, veterinary or the captain is one of their names, Lars Mickelson? Is that what you meant when you wrote No, 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 no. Mr. Bowling, that's the vet, Mr. Bowling. Your captain's name is Teague. You've had trouble with him before. Lars Mickelson. Shh! Is... Now, Baba, how many times have I told... Asleep. sleep, a sleep, stupid like men, big booming feet on the floor. You come booming like elephants. All right, all right. Uh, my wife, Mr. Valentine, she... Ah, the men. Ah, uh, this is... Oh, oh, no, 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 no. My wife is asleep, she means, in there. Baba, these are friends of mine. We're just going to my stateroom. Well, go, go. Do not just talk about it. She's asleep. Be quiet. Uh, of course, of course. All right, all right. Man, elephants in the moon. Here, here. here we are. What in heaven's name was that old thing in earrings? Uh, Baba, uh, old-fashioned notion of my wife's, the personal servant, the devoted slave. Mm. I found her in Cairo 25 years ago. Claims she could talk to animals. She looked just the same then, but she gets more and more obnoxious every year. Did your wife make this last trip with you, Mr. Stein? Oh, yes, yes. Has to be somebody to tie my muffler, spoon out my medicine, yammer at the old man. Mr. Stang, wait a minute, look. What do you want me for? To be a witness. The hand in the coconut, Lars Mickelson. But who is The Lars? captain left the ship in charge of this man, an ugly, conniving rogue, the second mate... Lars Mickelson. But well, what did he do? What do you want me to be a witness to? Mr. Valentine, he stole my field glasses. He... he what? Especially made ones they were, too. Finest ice lenses. There were several things stolen during the voyage, but I was sick. I didn't notice. First a hunting knife, then other little things. Now, you're to see that he has them. That's all. I'll testify to their loss. I I'm seeing my lawyer in the morning. Um... What makes you think Mickelson took these? The things? hand in the coconut, I told you. The field glasses I placed where he could take them. He, he won't let go. No one else could have taken them. He, he's up in his cabin now. He... Oh. You think this is trivial. I'm being vindictive. But, Mr. Valentine, people can't get away with things with me. I, I won't let them. Now, you'll find out for me, won't you? You'll come back first thing in the morning, this quarantine, my fevers, those nagging women, you understand, don't you? It's the last straw when 
somebody thinks I'm so ineffectual I can be stolen from without... All right, Mr. Stang, all right, yeah, sure. See you in the morning. The boyhood hero. How the mighty have fallen. Oh, George, I feel sorry sure, for sure, him. Sure, 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 sure. What are you going to do? He's going to see his lawyer in the morning and prefer charges against... What can against we do, him? Angel? I don't like a thief either. A hand in the coconut. <laughs> Poor, worn-out, suspicious old guy. Well, at least we can do is find out if he's right. Sure, sure, those are good field glasses. What of it? Uh, well, we were on the ship here, Mr. Mickelson. I just wondered what the skyline of the city would look like from... Well, I saw you with them around your neck and... The name is Lor's sister. Second mates don't rate that mist of stuff on a tub like this. No, oh, you've been cleaning them in my cabin there. You want to go out on deck? Oh, wait a second. Zeiss lenses, huh? Oh, nothing but the best. Who are you? What are you doing aboard? Oh, we're uh, just visiting Mr. Stang. Oh, nasty old coot, isn't he? What's the matter, buddy? Whose glasses are these? Mine, of course. What are you talking about? They're a gift, that's all. Look, what in the name of... Oh, excuse me. Mr. Mickelson, have you seen my... Well, how handy. Those are what I came for. Uh, these? Yes, of course, my glasses. I wanted to take a look at them. Wait a minute, Lorna, baby. You you said you... Beg your pardon? (laughs) I don't know who you are, but if this fresh sailor's a friend of yours... Baby, I, I don't, don't... Mr. Mickelson, I want these field glasses. I loaned them to you, remember? Are you so stupid? Here you are, lady, here you are. Thank you. <laughs> you're not stupid at all. But then, maybe you're not a sailor. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, here's one for you, Angel. Tempest in a teapot. So much fuss over a pair of field glasses. His, hers, hers. They're hers. on this ship, tourist. Now get off, what both of you. What are you so mad about? Who is she, friend? Passenger. Lorna Stang. Mrs. Stang. Mrs. Stang? Huh? But she was supposed to be asleep. Look, both of you, th- there's the gangway off the forward deck through here. Now, come on, be good, will you? I- I'm busy trying to get ready so we can unload when this crazy wait quarantine... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why can't we go through here? Huh? No, no, you can't get off. she that. came. Here, this is the door she came out of, isn't it? The same one you came from when we huh, came in here? No, 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 get away from there. Says you, handsome. I don't know why you should be so upset, Mr. Mickelson. There's nothing through that door except... except apparently your stateroom. I don't know what goes on on that ship, Mr. Valentine. I'm just a veterinarian. Strange bunch of people being cooped up together for a long time. Mr. Bowling, I tried to get hold of the captain. The captain went ashore the day they landed. Known him for years. Nice guy. Besides, that second mate, Mickelson, offered to stay aboard and keep an eye on things. That's not surprising. Huh? Oh, well, yeah, I, I know what you mean. They're about the same age, I guess. I mean, Mrs. Stang. Yeah, we know what you mean. I'd like to help the old guy, too. He's one of my heroes. I guess if his wife is giving things away to her sailor friend, your evidence might at least help him get a divorce from her. She's no good, I can tell you that. Stang says there's something funny about the quarantine. There is. When the ship docked, we got an anonymous note from one of the crew. Said a couple of the animals had been suspiciously sick during the voyage. Going to take the quarantine off tomorrow. Let them all in. False alarm. Hmm. Anonymous letter from one of the crew. Made sense at the time. It doesn't know. Will you clear that up? Well, George, after all, if Mrs. Stang is the kind of woman who'd pull a wool over her husband's eyes in one way, Not she'd exactly certain... what I meant either, Miss Brooks. Oh, yes, yeah, she might have written the note. To finagle a couple of more weeks with a sailor? That's not likely. It's Derek Stang who's sick, Mr. Valentine. We know that. He we... keeps alive from medicine to medicine. Old fevers, something tropical. Medicine in blue wrappers? Huh? Yes, yes, as a matter of fact. Tablets of some kind. Uh, something pretty strong, I should imagine. Oh, uh, but his wife... His wife is also his nurse, Miss Brooks. He depends on her. Aside from his money, she's all he's got. Well, then, Mr. Valentine, uh, why did you say blue? Hmm? I, uh... 
Oh, oh, because I noticed a stack of blue papers in Lars Mickelson's cabin. George. The greatest hunter in the world. Suppose he's the one walking into a trap. Yeah. Suppose it's his hand in the coconut. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now, back to George Valentine The Hand in the Coconut. You meet one of your childhood heroes, the greatest hunter in the world, Derek Stang. You find that he is still the greatest hunter when it comes to animals. But his observation of human beings is a little less acute. He thought you would trap Lars Mickelson for stealing a pair of field glasses. Instead, you have trapped him for stealing Mr. Stang's wife. Or is it the other way around? If your name is George Valentine, you have begun to suspect that the person who is really in danger of being trapped is the hunter himself. I don't know what I can do in this situation, Mr. Valentine, dragging me down to the waterfront. I know, Doctor, I know. I'm sorry we had to get you out of bed. Oh, look at that fog. (laughs) Stang must have his own position, you know. I can't interfere. Mr. Stang's stateroom is right here. Don't see his wife's watchdog around any place, do you, Angel? Come on, let's slip into his cabin. We'll wake him up. George, he's not here. He's gone. Well, (laughs) you dragged me out to look at a man you think might be sick or... Hey, you see? He's so sick he's out walking around deck someplace at 6 a.m. or going someplace else. Well, I'm a doctor, Mr. Valentine. Do you expect me to take serious the minute, idea that... Here, look at these. Hmm? Yeah. Blue papers. In the wastebasket. George, the same as those powders, those tablets were... Ready. Yeah, only look how many of them. Yes, the accumulation of days, judging from the other trash. Hmm, strong. Well, I grant you the old man is taking strong medicine, but... Men who are poisoned generally die in bed. Uh-huh. And if a man had been living on this stuff, he could build up quite a resistance. In fact, Mr. Valentine, while it might hurt you or me, he couldn't be poisoned with it. It was a stang. George, here she is. Hey, what's the matter? What happened? Hey, lady, snap out of it. Snap out of it. Uh, I'm all right. I... Lorna, Lorna, what is it? Uh... What are you doing to her? What's the big idea? Oh, take it easy, Buster. Take it easy. It wasn't me. She's just staring at something down there in the fog. Baba. Baba, she screamed. I heard her, but I can't Mr. see. Stang, where are you? Mr. Stang, look out! Look out! In the water. In the water. He fell in the water. George, I can't see him. There's his cane, but it's so far from the wharf. Not there. He's not here. He's gone down. I, I-, I could see him go down. The current's so fast, I can't do anything. Hey, there's the police over there. Get a boat for him. Mickelson, step on it. The current's so fast. All right, all right. Do what you can. He just fall. I could see him fall. Now, listen, fall. old lady, would you there tell There was us? something the matter with him. He walked like the blind. I, I call out. I shout. I-, I tried to grab him in time, but he falls. The policeman over there on the deck saw the splash, too, Valentine. Looks like Stang's been swept out. All right, all right. Only Mrs. Stang. Leave me alone. My baby, I could not grab in time. Don't touch me, Baba. Oh, my baby. Baba, come here, will you? Now, look, he fell here, huh? Over this rail? Yes, I think. It was in the fog. I, okay, I couldn't. Okay, now listen, I don't believe you. And I don't mean just the rail. I mean the scuppers, wide and deep, see? If a man fell, he'd only land against the rail. Men. He fall, I say. I saw him fall. They're not doing much good, Valentine. Mickelson. The police couldn't get out in time, neither could I. He, he didn't come up. He's gone. He, he's gone, you understand me? Yeah, I understand. It's as phony as a lead nickel. They're lying. Of course they're lying. But there's nobody aboard the ship except the three of them, was there? Riley, suppose that old Harridan gave the poor guy a shot. Of shove. course she did. What else? You already saw how Baba was covering for Mrs. Stang, didn't you? The good, faithful old Duena helping out in all kinds of cute ways. No real witnesses. You'll never get a conviction. I'll get a confession, my friend. 
You were with the other two, so they couldn't have shoved him. Uh, all right, Mrs. Stang, let's go inside and... Mrs. Stang. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Leave her alone. Still staring at nothing, eh? But uh, you ought to stop shaking, Mrs. Stang. I'm all right. Oh, sure, sure. You're fine, fine. Just a little upset because you're going to get all of Stang's money at the expense of your stooge, poor, faithful old Baba who'll be locked up for murder. She told you he fell. She told you, didn't she? She told you... Well, go on, go on. Oh, doctor, uh, what's the matter? Medical convention, Lieutenant. That other man over there with the bag colleague of mine, Dr. Morrison, just got here. Says a woman called him from the ship almost an hour ago, before we came aboard, Valentine. No. Had to hurry all the way across town. Woman identified herself as Lorna Stang. No, no. Said she'd just gone into her husband's stateroom to give him his regular medicine, only he wouldn't wake up for it. She was afraid he was dead. <gasps> oh, So it was just his party that went overboard. Don't you understand, Riley? We'll get a confession. The three of them are in it. Now, wait a minute. Hold it. Doctor, what else in that wastebasket? Oh, uh, same wrappers, same medicine. So they poisoned him. What difference does it make? Will you ever prove it? I don't have no, to. No, no. Even if you had his body, you wouldn't either. Tablets are gone from the mate's cabin where I saw him, aren't they? Huh? What's that got hey, to do with it? Hey, doctor, tell me. Derek Stang lived on this stuff. What would happen if it were taken away? Well, it's hard to tell. Die sooner or later, probably. Uh-huh. Well, suppose Lorna Stang had left those tablets with the mate. Suppose they were substituting something harmless for the strong stuff in the blue papers. Suppose that was the idea. Even an autopsy couldn't prove that absence of medicine had killed a man. Hey! Hey, where are you going? Where do you think, Riley? To catch a monkey. Mr. Stang told me you talk to animals. Is that right, Papa? Why not? They can say more than men. I already told you we know the whole story, didn't I? That your beloved mistress confessed the whole thing, all of it? And so? And so now tell me he fell overboard. I threw him overboard. He was dead. I see him dead in this stateroom. Oh, great. Helpful Nellie, huh? No wonder Mrs. Stang wouldn't let you touch her. No wonder it was she who screamed when she saw you out there on deck. <laughs> you kind of interfered with their little plan, didn't you? I know nothing of plans. You know enough that when you saw the body, you figured it was murder and thought you'd better be helpful and get rid of the evidence. She is my mistress. For her, I would do anything. But she, you say she confessed. I lied. You, Shuckle, you... Take it easy, lady. Look out now, look out. Yeah, be careful. Don't get your friends excited. Besides, you're not really mad. You told it too easy, so don't pretend. There should be cages. Oh, I'm not afraid of these things. All behind bars, aren't they? All trapped. The monkeys, panther. Yeah, even the snakes. I talk to animals, too, you know, Baba. Ah, you fool. No, 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 I'm not. You are the good and faithful servant who spoiled Lorna Stang's plan for a perfect murder. So perfect, so neat, it must have been put right in front of her. Like bait in front of an animal, like a shiny object in a coconut to trap the greedy monkeys. Look out. They move the cages. Sometimes there are accidents. Cut it out, old woman. I'm not afraid. But everybody else seems to be. Stevedores, policemen. They don't come any closer than they have to, do they? You're only too glad to get rid of this slice of the jungle. Now, let's see. All consigned for shipment to Derek Stang's animal farm. You talk like the wind. Ah, men. Old woman, so faithful to Lorna Stang... I guess she believed it. You put up a pretty good act. But then she's young. You can't have been with her very long. And the great hunter told me he found you in Cairo 25 years ago. <laughs> Faithful to whom, Baba? Now, let's see. Who's everybody most afraid of? Hmm, snakes, I guess. Boa can... Look out! Don't touch a cage! The great hunter. Greatest in the world. Hello, Mr. Stang. Stand very still, Mr. Valentine. Oh, yeah. Now I get it. 
The snake was the dead man, thrown overboard. Yeah, even when I was a kid, I knew how good you were. Don't know why I thought you were slipping. There is a snake in the next cage under my hand, a live one, poisonous. You will stand here quietly until I am loaded off the ship with my animals. No, you're not a hero anymore, just a guy who baits coconuts. Waits until the monkeys bite. Think they've killed you, and then mess things up by having Baba throw something overboard with a splash. Then she reluctantly admits it. It was you. You would have made a good pupil, Mr. Hunter. I, I doubt it. You picked me for a sucker, didn't you? Because you arranged this phony quarantine that kept the monkeys aboard, where you'd all be cooped up together, where you could push Lorna and Lars into what they did. Sure, you arranged it, it all. It won't do you any good to move, Mr. Valentine. I lift this catch and the snake is released. He's faster than I was than hired as a witness, wasn't I? Yes, a witness, Mr. Valentine, to a murder without a body. Oh, yeah, that's better, isn't it? It'll be second degree. They'd be put in prison, locked up, put in cages. Yes, yes. I never kill animals, you know. So you baited the trap. In cages, Mr. Valentine, they'll still be here. Perhaps you too, the biggest game in the world, men. And I'm the only hunter in the world who ever tried... Hold it, Stang, hold it. Now you listen to me. I'm just an amateur, see? Mr. Valentine, there's no more time. It's up to the but snake... When I go hunting, now you listen to me. I'm stupid when I go hunting. Because I carry a gun. <laughs> Yeah, you see? Now your snake's dead. So you stand still, Buster. I could probably get a game permit for you. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Stang didn't do anything. That's the awful part. He made the other people do things that were wrong, so there's nothing the police can hold him for. Angel, Derek Stang was really successful. You know that, don't you? Hmm? Yeah, he kept trying to get bigger and bigger game all his life. And then he tried to trap human beings into a spot where they'd be caged. Yes, but he... Until he finally trapped himself, don't you understand? Now, one look at that guy, and what do you think any court would decide? Well, don't worry. He'll be in a cage, all right. A padded one. Oh, George... Let's forget this nightmare. Take me someplace for a nice, cozy supper. Hmm. Okay, the Tropic Inn. Is it nice? Oh, yeah, Angel. Uh, they serve a delicious kind of drink there. In a coconut shell. Oh, George. You have just heard The Hand in the Coconut, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey will star as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. I think this story with its goblins and its witches and stuff should kind of scare them your hair. Hey, yo. Hey, bro. You want some gas, mister? Better drive closer to the... Hey, take a joint Broomville. What? Yeah, this Broomville. The way you're headed, though, is Timber Corner. But... Hey, look, look out! Oh, 
Holy smoke, mister, where'd you take your going? It's because you drive a fancy sedan from the city. Uh, <laughs> I know, I heard your car. Heard it drive up. I'm coming. Oh, shoes now, where to, where to put those? Uh, all right, all right, just a minute. Wonder who it could be. Yeah, I bet I'm going to be surprised. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got a little surprise for you, too. Don't go away, just take a minute. Yeah, big sedan. Whose car is that, for God's sake? Oh, God. Mervyn Brewster, huh? B-R-E-W-S. But why? Why? Everyone loved my husband. They did. From the city it was, Lieutenant was no Riley. Big... big black sedan. It didn't catch the license, oh, but I it did. was the same car they saw drive away from the house here. Didn't they, Fred? They loved Mervyn. Everyone did. Uh, uh, Dora, yes, wait sir. a second. Chilla, tell him. Take hold of yourself, Dora. The lieutenant has but to... But, Mac, work. I just came home, and there he was, lying there, dead by the door. I'd been out visiting. I wanted him to go with me. It's such a beautiful night. Mrs. But when I Brewster, came home... please, we've got to work fast. Several people spotted the strange car, and Fred, <laughs> Fred, in the service station, couldn't you see what the man looked like? Well, a, a, a dark hat, Lieutenant. An overcoat pulled up, sort of a... He's sort of a fish-colored face. I remember that. Little skinny shrimp, I'd guess, and... Uh... Oh, and then he had a funny eye, sort of pushed out of place. Scarred, I guess. What? But Merv didn't know anyone Well, like we'll that. radio the highway patrol. They're uh, setting up roadblocks. There's never been anyone like that in Broomville. That's right, Lieutenant. People love Merv. He was the nicest man in the world. Yes. Uh, Why would anyone like that from the city just come out and shoot now, him? Now, Mrs. Brewster, Here, Lieutenant, please. Lieutenant, I'll take care of it. Yeah, oh, thanks, you... sister. The... Huh? Miss Brooks. What in the name of heaven are you... Do- come on, Mrs. Brewster, we'll go. Wait a minute, what are you doing here? Well, I came with George, naturally. But what? Who sent for him? Come on, come on, what's going on here tonight? Who sent for Valentine? You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Everybody loved him, Mr. Valentine. That's why I called you so quick. I didn't know the city police would be called in, too. Okay, Fred, so you phoned me. Well, uh, you see, Dora come home and, and found Merv. Went to the nearest neighbor, first place down the other road from Timber Corner. Only that's old Fonville. He wouldn't help his dying mother. So she called McKenzie. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get these people straight. Uh, McKenzie, he's in there in the other room. You saw him. Merv Brewster's assistant down at the factory. Whisk broom, Merv called him. <laughs> Gosh, Merv always had a funny the word. What? Or... what? Well, what's this factory you're talking about? Brewster's brooms. Haven't you heard of them? Sweep the skies, sweep the world. <laughs> Yeah, that's Merv. Well, it's his factory, and this is his town. Gosh, he built the whole thing... You mean thing... the chubby man and the suspenders in there who's dead, Merv Brewster? You mean he owned a factory? Well, sort of one. But it don't make him no rich man. He, he never cared about profit, just for the good of the town. See, practically everyone here works in the... Okay, fa- okay, I understand. Brewster's brooms. But you didn't work for him. You own a service station, so where do you fit? Well, but Merv's my cousin, don't you understand? Gosh, I'm the only relative he had. Always a joke for everybody. And you should have seen how the kids loved him. And then an hour ago comes a big sedan from the city and this stranger... You didn't know anyone in the city, Fred. Huh? Uh, this is McKenzie. You saw him. Hello, in... Mr. Valentine. I suppose it's confusing when you... Yeah, first... sure, of course it is. Every murder is. Until it's solved. Uh, Merv was a genius in his own way, you know. He even drew his own labels. Witch riding on a broom is the trademark. Made up his own slogans, rebuilt a barn for a factory all by himself. Uh, sort of a rustic one-man band. Okay, of... okay, I get the idea. Now, that's the real mystery, isn't it? The town Santa Claus gets murdered. A man you say everybody loved. Do you blame us for being surprised? Being shocked? Yelling for help? 
There's no one in Broomville with a fish-colored face and a bad eye who drives a big black sedan. It looked like one of them armor-proof jobs you see in the movies. Mr. McKenzie, your boss or your partner, whatever it was, he must have done business in the city. Maybe he had enemies no, there. No, no, he didn't. Murph was born in Broomville, Mr. Valentine. Born and raised. Married 27 years. He didn't no children himself, but 20 times a godfather. Now, look, look, somewhere there's got to be somebody who didn't no, like I this guy. No, I tell you, there isn't. That's why you're here. To solve a riddle, it's impossible. Uh huh. Impossible. But it happened. Valentine, forget the sedan. Just think about Brewster. He sat here. Room was dark. Doorbell must have rung. Walked to the door. Well, of course, Lieutenant. Just a minute, I said. A little alcove by the door, see? Did Brewster go straight to the door? Did he flip on the porch lights like a friendly guy in a small town would do? He was shot from the porch through the alcove window. That I know. He was peering out to see who was ringing the bell. <laughs> now tell me Merv Brewster wasn't afraid. Now tell me he didn't expect a strange collar and a big sedan. And the person saw him through the glass and shot him. Shell casings, two of them, and they checked with the slugs. Found them right on the grass, right next to the window box here. Hmm. What kind of a gun? A Luger, my friend. A special type of a special shell. A very popular gun in the city, in the dirtier parts of the city. And gang killing. Exactly. But we already know it has all the earmarks of, of a rub out, Miss Brooks. Yeah, a killer and a rub out. Ronnie, if the killer stood here on the wet grass by the door, there's probably... Now be... you're getting it. Now you see him. Oh, we'll chase the sedan from the city, sure. But right here in Broomville, we've got something. No. Because where the killer stood, there are no tracks. Hey, wait a minute. But oh, yeah. There were. Yeah, sure, sure. But some of these local lovable people have very carefully trampled all over them with a pair of rubber boots. You see, somebody's been killed that everybody likes. Then we find that he really sneaked to the door like a rat in a trap to peer out. Look, we don't know what kind of motives people really have underneath all that. Okay, Riley, go ahead. Make like a detective. Huh? Me, I'm going to follow the footprints. The footprints of the rubber boots that spoil the killer's tracks. Here, George. They turn in here. Yeah. Yeah, across the road. Broomville, so innocent, so shocked. A sedan from the city, and to them it's like a man from Mars. <laughs> you can't kid me what's going on right okay, here. Okay, here we are, White House. Tracks turn up the drive. You see it? Yeah, come on. Hey, wait a second. Yeah? Yeah, number three, Cedar Road. Hmm? Mailbox Everett says... W. Farnville. Wow. Farnville, huh? First place down the other road from Timber Corner. What's the matter with... Oh, well, somebody said that, that's all. The house is dark. Yeah. The neighbor, Mrs. Brewster, came to for help. Only he wouldn't help his dying mother. What in the devil was... Oh, it's a bell. Oh. Like a homemade burglar alarm. Yeah, it's a tripwire. Here it is. Well, that does it. Oh, these rubes. They don't expect trouble. Oh, no, no. Imagine running a tripwire across your lawn. Riley. Huh? Straight up the driveway. See it? In the shadow by the garage, something moved. Yeah. Well, here's where we get our answer to what's going on in this night. Here we are! Hey. There's a barrel full of bird shot for the first one of you that moves. That's not from the garage. Someplace overhead, George. Back there. I saw you. Oh, yes, I saw you. And grown up, every one of you. Well, you ought to be ashamed. Hey, now look, friend. What do you no mean? No lights. You think I'm asleep. Well, I've seen every one of your little games around here tonight. You'll get old fondle, you say. <laughs> kind of forget a man might keep a watch out of his attic window. Well, it's private property you're tramping on. Trespass, malicious... Hey, intent. slow down, slow down, Buster. If this were any place but Boonville, I'd have every one of you arrested. You'd what? Climb down from that attic. And get down here fast, my friend. Because you're under arrest. <laughs> So, Mervyn Brewster was murdered. Huh. That's too bad. But I don't know anything about it. Is that so, Mr. Fonville? I've hardly met the man. You what? But everybody in town... I'm to... not from this town, lady, though sometimes I wish I were. Far from it. 
Brewster's brooms. Huh, that's all you hear. What a funny thing Mr. Brewster said. Well, I've had enough of it. I retired here for my health and let... For your tell health? You. And a lawyer, too, huh? From the city, no doubt. And your doctor says, uh, surround your house with burglar alarms and uh, sit up nights with a shotgun across... Hold it, Riley. Room. You're barking up the wrong tree. Huh? He didn't trample around in rubber boots. George, can you still... Yeah, keep... yeah, still by the garage, Angel. There's somebody else here, all right, Riley. Well, no, 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 wait a minute. I'll do this. I don't want you embarrassing yourself anymore, barking at all the wrong things at the wrong Valentine, time. What Saying you... the small town must be up to something mysterious tonight. Broomville, where the trademark is a witch on a broomstick. George, right uh -huh. here. Know who it is, Riley? Wearing great big boots and sneaking around? Oh, I know, we've still got a crime to solve. Only tonight it's going to be a lot tougher than you ever figured. Well, well, who is it? Who is it? Just Take it easy now. It's only a little short guy carrying his head under his arm. Huh? But the head is a pumpkin. And the rubber boots are his father's. What? <laughs> it's all right, Sonny. Come on out. The man here comes from the big city. He just forgot the date, that's all. Trick. Trick. Trick or treat, sir. Yeah, Riley. It's Halloween. Are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine, a sedan from the city. Before the car disappeared into the dark again, its driver had murdered Broomville's leading citizen, Marvin Brewster, the man that everybody loves. Well, naturally, the highway patrol is out frantically searching for the big black sedan. But if your name is George Valentine, your problem is right here. Your problem is why. Why would anyone even think of killing a jovial man like Brewster? And needless to say, Lieutenant Riley is not so jovial when he is reminded that tonight, whatever clues there are, may only be the work of goblins or witches. That tonight is Halloween. All right, Mrs. Brewster, so none of it makes sense. Well, this part does, Riley. Donuts. What? Oh, yes, those. I fried them myself just this afternoon. Donuts. Now, look. There was cider, too, on the little table, see? Poor Mervyn always liked to have something ready for the kids. It was sort of his day, you know, Halloween. We built this factory out of a witch's broom. He was so full of fun himself, you know. He wouldn't let anyone interfere, the police or anyone on Halloween. No, no, sure. Big, a big joker. Only Valentine, Look, I... Look, the donuts mean this, Riley. He wasn't sneaking to the door when he was shot into the alcove to peer out. He was just reaching for some donuts to give to the kids. That's what he must have thought the doorbell was, a trick-or-treat. So he wasn't scared. He didn't expect a stranger from the city tonight. Oh, brother, the man that nobody hated. So maybe it's true that... Uh... What? No, no, everybody loved him. That's what I told you. Until I heard about the telegram, eh? I, I still don't ah, believe... What's this what telegram? telegram? Well, didn't Mac, Mr. McKenzie tell you? He's the one who took the message from Priscilla. Maybe he told the local police. Priscilla, but... what are you talking about, Mrs. Brewster? Well, she's down at the telegraph office. It's really a part of the post office, and that's part of the general store. Priscilla's a lovely uh, person. What uh, telegram? A carbon or something that came through. The telegram somebody in Broomville sent today to somebody in the city. Somebody who came out here in a sedan. <laughs> Who, um, who sent this? In a little place like this, you must but have a record. But they just write them out and leave the money. I'm so busy at the other window, you hey, Riley, see. listen. It says, uh, you don't something... Anyway, don't get paid until he's gone. <sighs> paid until he's gone. Dead. Dead. There, you see what I mean? The guy in the sedan was a killer from the city. 
And somebody right here in Broomville hired him. Oh, yeah? Well, that's not the way I figure, Riley. Come on, I'll show you. Okay, here we are, Timber Corner. Now, give me your flashlight. What in the world? Riley, what's the Brewster's address? Huh? The house on Cedar Lane beyond the corner. That's what I phoned my crew and wrote in the report. Sure, sure, but you've never been here before. You came out with a native cop, he wouldn't notice. But look at the street sign, you idiot. Take a look at that. Now, wait a minute, get out of the way. Huh? Right here, Miss Brooks, cutting out paper for dogs. You check at the newspapers, Brooksy? George, it's true he's a lawyer from the city, sort of a big-time ambulance chief. Uh-huh. Now, well, Riley, I said there was another way even the telegram could work. It didn't have to be sent by somebody from town, did it? Huh? Gangland stuff. Somebody might have spotted the victim and wired the killer how to find him. Hey. Hey, I'm beginning to get yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And this street sign is loose, all right. Don't you remember Fonville's mailbox? It said Cedar Lane. George, the street sign... Sure, sure, it turns... Now, which street is which? First house beyond the corner. The oldest Halloween trick in the book. Changing street signs. So maybe Merv Brewster didn't have any enemies. Just a big, loud, lovable guy who was so crazy about Halloween that by some kid's prank, he died for it. Funville. He was the one they meant to kill. Come on! Too late. He's dead. That was the same gun. Same empty shells. Mm, it all must have been the same. Came to answer the door. Yeah, and... That's right. Two shots. George, he was the kind of a man some gang might want to get. Retired criminal lawyer who didn't pick his clients too well. Yeah, that's it, all right. The killer is sent out to get Von Bill only tangles up with a Halloween prank and picks the wrong house. Kills the wrong man. Then finds his mistake and comes back. Riley, this couldn't have happened very long ago. Ah, uh, no, no, I know. So, let's go. We'll, uh... Oh, hello. It's Fred, the guy who got me into this. Yeah, the guy who found the car. The sedan. You, sedan? you what? Yeah. Killer ditched it down the woods. Engine's still warm. Come on. It's all over but the shouting. We found it. Not surprising you ditched it, sir. We got a half hundred patrol cars out in the highways, roadblocks set up at every crossing. It's the same sedan. I'm sure of that. I'm positive. Not going to be easy to trace, neither. There's no registration. The driver will be easy to find. Little fish faced guy with his eye all scarred up. How many men have you got, officer? Oh, plenty, and everybody in Broomville will be only too glad to hey, help. Wait a minute. Us Don't in... touch that. What? Uh, there won't be any fingerprints, Valentine. We know he was wearing a hat, an overcoat, and probably gloves. Yeah. Well, I was looking for something else. But I can't find Oh, now, don't you start playing detective. We'll get him. This is Broomville. And we're going to sweep the woods for a killer. All right, all right. But remember, it's still Halloween. Men, stand out there, more. Move slower. Keep the flashlights on the ground. I hope they find him. I hope they find him. Yeah. Mind if I take a look at something inside your house, Mrs. Brewster? Oh, no. Miss Brooks is already in here someplace, I think. Oh, hello. Remember me? Oh, yeah, Mr. McKenzie. Mm -hmm. I thought you were out on the manhunt. I thought Dora might need me. They're coming closer, you know. Yeah, looks like he's hiding right around Timber Corner here someplace. Right close. And the closer they get, the more wrong I am. Wrong? What do you mean? Oh, something Lieutenant Riley said earlier. And he was right. When you investigate a case this fast, you don't know what kind of motives people really have underneath. Motives? Everyone around here knows that old Fonville was mixed up in all sorts of things. Back in the city, that is. Halloween. Gosh, if Merv hadn't always been so considerate, telling the cops to lay off and everything, then the kids never would even thought of twisting that road sign. George, what's happening? What? Oh, excuse me. It's all right, Angel. What'd you find? Well, I looked for it. I've been upstairs. She's what? It's all right, but I didn't find it. And it wasn't around the car any place. Some place in between, I guess, huh? Hey! How you doing out there? Hey, the tent! You can't kick me out? George, he's leaving. No, no, Brooks, it's all right. Fred's a tall guy. Let him go. It's a false alarm anyway. They haven't found the killer yet. They won't. 
Mr. Valentine, will you please tell me what in the name of Blue Blazer? Yes, you... yes, I'll tell you, Mr. McKenzie. Now, suppose somebody wanted to kill Mervyn Brewster. Oh, I, I don't know why yet. But, but... everybody loved my George, husband. Upstairs. Suppose there's... that person set up the phony telegram. Suppose that person dug up a big sedan from the city. That part would be easy. Why, I'll and uh, most important, suppose that person took advantage of Halloween by twisting the road sign. On purpose. George. Sure, Brooksy, what would everybody say? Kids. An unfortunate accident corroborated by the Halloween road sign and the telegram. Oh, yeah, sure, everybody knows Fonville has enemies. And forever after, the police would be combing the city for some mythical gangster killer. Mythical? Where people saw him, Fred saw him, of all Mr. McKenzie, food. what do you think I was looking for at the deserted car Miss Brooks looking for here? I, I haven't the slightest it's idea. It's a Halloween, Buster, remember? Well, what's been the greatest boost to Halloween since the Headless Horseman? The rubber mask. The skin mask. The rubber horror mask. You've seen him. And think back, Mackenzie. Fish-colored face, a funny eye, sort of pushed out of place, all scarred. Oh, no, it, it couldn't possibly have been anyone. Those guys me. outside are getting closer and closer, lady. And I'm getting more and more sure all the time. It was somebody from Broomville, changing his voice and wearing a mask and an overcoat. It was somebody in this room. Uh, Mr. Valentine, I, uh, I think you're forgetting Fonville. He was murdered, too, you know. The killer made a mistake and then killed Fonville. Yes, but Mr. Fonville told us he'd been watching from his attic. He'd, he'd seen every one of the little games around here tonight and the pranks. Exactly, and... Angel. And he could have, from that attic, very easily seen who changed that road sign. Mr. Fonville? As I remember, there's only one person who's been over to talk to Fonville since Brewster's death. Who might have guessed him and told that the old coot had been watching from his attic, who would have known that he had to be killed, too. I'm afraid You, Mrs. I... Brewster, when you went for help. No, what are you trying to... It was to... dark. If a stranger from the city came out and did get mixed up by road signs, how would he know it was your husband or even a man behind that darkened glass in the alcove? How would a stranger standing at the door think to look in that window and see him? Stop it! But if you heard Stop him it. trapping around, you'd know what he was doing, you and nobody else. If he stepped aside to get a surprise for the kids, some donuts, maybe, you'd know where to look for him, wait for his shadow to fire at... Because you were the one who put him in the alcove with a cider. Put your hands up, all of you. Oh. Yeah, sure. He loved Halloween. The Brewster broom, it's built around Halloween. You know, even the trademark. Oh, he was such a funny man, my husband. Everybody loved him. Except you, huh, lady? All right, now, come on, come on. Give me that gun. Give me the Luger. There's a lot of policemen getting closer all the time, and you can't you get away with it. stay where you are. I'm going. I can go past those policemen. They know me. I'm just a meek little housewife. There's Fred coming on the lawn. There's a side porch to this house. I can see you from there. I have my own car. If you move, I'll kill Cora, you. Please. No, no, no. Don't move. Let her go. But it's Halloween. The police won't pay any attention to it. George, what happened? Some what? kids piled trash cans on the porch. Brooksy, it's Halloween. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. <laughs> so I was right. You see, Valentine, we don't know how people really feel underneath. There she is, married for 27 years to a perfectly nice guy. Oh, just and... a minute, Lieutenant. It must have worked both ways. Eh? Uh? Well, when I was upstairs, George, I started to tell you. In Mervyn Brewster's study, he drew his own labels, remember? The witch riding on the broom? Yeah, that's right. It's on every broom. It was a big sketch. The original, I guess, in the drawer. Oh, he must have been a lovely man to live with. What, what do you mean? Well, you can't see it on the little ones. But guess whose face he drew on that witch? And then probably laughed about it, thought it was funny. Hey, yeah, that's right. Dora did look a little like a witch. Santa Claus to everybody but her. Kind to everybody but her. Well, it worked both ways, all right. She's hated him. For... Halloween. <laughs> she used it to kill him. It trapped her. Well, Brooksy, somewhere the witches and goblins are laughing real loud. They had a big night. <laughs>
You have just heard The Sedan from the City, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Portions of the following program are transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond. Private Detective. Roberts. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. They show? Not yet. Fisher is covering the service entrance. We'll go in. Hunk the horn if you spot anything. Right. We'll get out here, Otis. Get the car out of sight. Like old times, Rick. Yeah, but I don't miss them. Somebody always gets shot up. Here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Sir, candid snapshot of yourself strolling down the great white way. Look, thanks, Bud. Uh, but just I... sending this card with your name and address. Look, friend, thank you. Uh, Mr. I... Diamond, please. You don't know me, but I know you. You used to be a cop. I done time. That's how I know, see? Okay, okay. I heard you was a private cop now. I came to your office to see you, but I was too early. Now, look, what, what is this? Please, please, you gotta take this card. I think I'm being tailed. Little men with the nasty old sledgehammers? I'll call you later. Take the card. I told you. Take that... the card. Here, take it. Phone you later. Diamond Detective Agency. Mary had a little lamb. She hit it with a stick. She could have gotten 20 years. Instead, she came to Rick. Oh, are you really that good? Well, uh, I got the inside on who knocked off Cock Robin. Well, good for you. Hi, Helen. Hi. Did you just get in? Mm, yeah. Kind of late, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Are late on a case? A half a case. Alone? Uh, the funniest thing happened to me on the way to the office. Alone? No, I was leading patrol number three of the Brownies. I mean last night. Were you alone? Don't you want to hear what happened to me on the way to the office? I want to hear what happened to you last night. Oh, now relax, honey. I was with Walt. Honest? Honest. We played poker. If you don't believe me, stop it at the fifth precinct. Walt's hired a voodoo witch doctor to shrink his head back to normal. Well, all right. Now what happened to you on the way to the office? Oh. Well, the darndest thing. Some little guy comes out of the crowd and snaps my picture. Snaps your picture? Yeah, you know, one of those sidewalk photographers. Then he creeps up to me and gives me a card like he was passing a pound of radium and tells me to hang on to it until he calls. Said he was being tail. Well, who was he? Who knows? He knew me all right. Well, what's on the card? Oh, uh, nothing much. Got it right here. Just a place for your name and address. Were well, you supposed to send it in and get your picture back? That's right. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Well, there's something stuck in the middle of the card. Hmm. Didn't see it before. Well, Rick, hurry up. Find out what it is. Oh. Hey. Well, stop with the mystery. What is it? Oh, it's a... It's a negative. Small negative. Oh, we couldn't have developed your picture that quickly. No, it's uh, too small to make out what it is. Hold it up to the light. Honey, I am. Just looks like a... Oh, a bunch of people on a street. Oh, why don't you have a print made of it? I got a better idea. 
Why don't you hang up the little old phone and give my friend, the frightened photographer, a chance to call? I'll call you later. Brute. That's later, dear. Bye. <laughs> That's the way it started. I hung up the phone, turned around in my chair, and held the negative up to the light again. Couldn't see a thing that made it unusual. The more I tried to figure it out, the less sense it made. My better judgment started chuckling, but somewhere down in the middle of my stomach, a little alarm started ringing. I had that lousy feeling again, and no matter how hard I tried to talk myself out of it, I knew something was wrong. That little alarm kept sounding off, and believe me, I felt pretty foolish when I realized it was a phone. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? Oh, been taking any more pictures? How'd you know it was me? Scientific police methods. Hunch, and I recognize your voice. Find the negative in the card? Yeah, what does it mean? Don't want to talk over the phone. Come to 222 Bleecker Street, apartment H. You want me to bring the negative? No, 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 hide it. If they stop you, you don't want to have it on you. If who stops me? They'll kill you, sure, if they find it on you. <laughs> Well, one thing was certain. The little photographer sure knew how to get me interested. I started out of the office when I remembered he'd said to hide the negative. So, loving a good melodrama, and being the type who sits home Sundays to listen to Sam Spade, I found a piece of adhesive tape, put the negative back in the card, pulled out a desk drawer, and stuck the negative on the bottom of the drawer. Then I closed the drawer and headed for Bleecker Street, apartment H. I waited a few seconds and then gave it another try. Yeah? I'm looking for the guy who lives here. Oh, you are, huh? Yeah, short little guy, takes pictures. He does, huh? Well, your name's Einstein, isn't it? Nah. Look, I just want to see the little guy who lives here. Louie! Hey, I found some knishes in the icebox. Oh, that's swell. And somebody out here wants to see George. Some liverwaste, too, huh? Somebody wants to see George. Oh. Well, maybe it's a guy he called. Hiya. You want to see George, huh? I want to see the guy who called me. If his name's George Swell. Oh, shall I let him in? Yeah. Come in. Thanks, Toto. Uh, his name's Tony. You called me Einstein before. Funny. Uh, George is in the other room, right over there. Thanks. I seen you before. Goody. Used to be a cop. Yeah? Private eye now. Hey, what the... That's George... See the one you want? Name's Diamond, ain't it? Look, Dreamy. Is he sleeping one off? No, he's dead. Who killed him? I did. I helped. Okay, you helped. Uh -uh, I wouldn't, Chalmers. Yeah, I got a rod in my pocket. Had it on you all the time. (laughs) Pretty good, huh? He sees a lot of movies. Uh, I'll just take your gun, Chalmers. Be careful with the holster. I knitted it myself. Funny. Are you hungry, Shamus? Not a bit. You, Tony? Oh, I'm starved. Put him to sleep while we have lunch, huh? Sighting me. Hey, now, wh- Louie. Huh? Let's heat them knishes. I like them that way. Yeah. I hope they're potato. While the Rover boys loaded up on liverwurst and knishes, I slept it off. The one with the pug nose and the steel wool complexion called Tony had tapped me right behind the ear with his gun, and it took me a pint of blood and 15 minutes to find my way back. When I finally rolled myself into a sitting position, I lifted my sore skull and looked up at my two lovely playmates. Hey, Tony. Uh-huh. You got liver waste on your chin. Oh, thank you, Louie. Oh, how you feel, Shamus? Like a lark. <laughs> he is funny, you know. Uh, we want the negative, Shamus. I don't know what you're talking about. While you were snapping, we taught to join a party that ain't here. It ain't? Nah. So we figure, seeing as how George called you, maybe you know something about it. How'd you know George called me? Oh, we heard him just as he was hanging up. He went for a gun, so we knocked him off. Where's the negative? I don't know. Maybe he's got it on him, Louie. Fine out, huh? Hold well, still, Shamus. <clears throat> Here's his wallet, catch. No, nothing else. Mm, nothing much in the wallet. Hey, here's a bunch of cards. Diamond Detective Agency. Hey, get a load of the fancy printing. Yeah, 
Fancy. And maybe he's got it in his office. How about a Shamus? Look, you two broken down comics. Anything in my office, the termites have got dibs on. And I still don't know about a negative. Uh, Louis, shall we go over there? Yeah, we gotta find it. What about the Shamus? How long did you put him to sleep before? Fifteen minutes. Mm-hmm. And yeah, fifteen minutes, about twenty minutes to get to his office. Half an hour in a case of joint. Two. This time, make it an hour, huh? Hey. Right. Sure that's good for an hour? Oh, sure. But if you're worried, I'll give him another ten minutes just to be safe. <laughs> You know, it's little things like that that can get off the monotonous. And if you're not conditioned, sometimes you end up with a few loose bolts. Tony was a man of his word, all right. An hour and ten minutes later, I was stumbling around the room trying to comb the cobwebs out of my eyes. This also can be somewhat of a problem, especially when your eyes have come loose and rolled back in your head someplace. Well, I leaned over, shook my head a couple of times, got the eyes rolling around until I felt them drop into place, then I found my way to the phone. Sergeant Otis. Well, don't worry about it. They'll find a cure someday. Oh, no. What do you want, Diamond? Your other head. I'm going bowling. Someday, Shamus, I'm... Someday, going... Sergeant, you're going to find your true niche. And Ringling Brothers will have to find you a mate. Now, put the lieutenant on the phone. Do. Oh, now, what do you want? How's your head? Don't you shout at me. Well, it's your own fault. Who in the world drinks old-fashioned stingers? I do, and I'm sorry. How do you feel? Eh, yeah, Numb. Take some orange juice, Tabasco, and three raw eggs. Walt, please. It's great. Makes you sick as a dog. Look, Walt, if my head is the wrong size, it's because it was beaten that way. Oh, no. Have you gotten kicked around again? I got so many walls, I look like an advertisement for puff rice. What happened this time? Get over to 222 Bleecker Street, apartment H. Why? Because I got a little old corpse for you. Oh, not today. Not today. Please. Take some orange juice, Tabasco, and three raw eggs. Oh. Uh, weak mind, weak stomach. What's the police force coming to? Hello, bright eyes. Oh, can't you lower your voice a little? Well, go on in, Otis. Oh, oh sure, sure. Pelican feet needs an engraved invitation. Well, shut the door. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, you... <laughs> oh, what did I do? Relax, Walt, relax. You don't look so bad. I think I like you with a purple face. You said there was a corpse here. Where is it? And save the gags. A dead man is in here, laughing boy. You don't have to be nasty. Coroner should be here any minute. Huh? there's the victim. Who is he? Otis, take a look. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant, yeah, Lieutenant. His name's George Phipps. I went through some of his things while I was waiting for you. Here's his wallet. George Phipps? Uh, let me get a better look. Know him? Get out of the way, Otis. But you said... Yeah, I, I know him. Ex-con. Got sent up just about the time you went on the force. He remembered me. What do you do? Drop circulars on Sing Sing? <laughs> Otis. It wasn't that funny. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. What? Uh, no, Lieutenant. Otis. Or what, Lieutenant? Shut up. The rest of the boys from Homicide finally arrived, along with the coroner, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened up to that point. George Phipps had been shot in the back, and the boys found the slug on the other side of the room in the wall, so Walt asked for a complete report as soon as possible. Then we climbed into the squad car and went back to Walt's office. Now, what about that negative? You think it's still in your office? I don't know. I'll go over later and check I think you can identify the two gun ups who worked you over? Drag out the files. Well, if these two guys knew George Phipps, maybe they did time with him. Could be. One's name was Tony, huh? Well, Tony Payton did time at Sing Sing, and he sounds like your description. This looked like your boy. Let's see. Well, you little dickens, you. You win the butterscotch cake. I'm right. You certainly are. This guy is a sure cure for insomnia. Okay, let's see what we can find out about the other one. Here's the report, Lieutenant. George Phipps was shot with a thirty-eight. Hey, Tony Payton put me to sleep with the end of a thirty-eight. He did, huh? Would you mind finishing the report, Sergeant? Not at all. Uh, been dead about two hours. 
Tip started working for the Speedy Photo Laboratory four days ago. Has about four photographers working for them. Yeah, you know the kind. Take your picture on the street and give you a card. Yes, I know the kind. Sir. What's the address of this photo lab, Boris? Uh, down 36th Street. Walt, I'm going over to my office, see if the negative's still there. Well, you've got to identify the other mug that works you over. Oh, I don't know his name or anything else. Take an hour. Well, I'm going along. I want to see this negative. Then let's go. You want me to drive? I can make it, Sergeant. Oh, shame on you, Walt. Well, you know he just wants to turn on the siren. <laughs> Place is sure a mess. They really did a job in your office. Uh, negative there? No. Didn't think it would be. Swell. Now what have we got? Well, I don't know about you, but I've got an idea. You go on back to the station. I'll check with you. Where do you think you're going? To the speedy photo lab. It's not quite six. Maybe I can get there before the close. And what do you think you're going to find there? The negative's gone. Sure it is, but it was developed there. You think maybe there's a print? No, well, that picture was probably taken of somebody on the street. They don't print up those things unless somebody sends in the card. Somebody must have, so there's got to be a print. Phipps only worked for them for four days, so the picture had to be taken in that time. Yeah? Let me talk to Lieutenant Diamond. Sure, but who's there to show you how? It's for you, Walt. Oh, yeah? Nobody ever says hello. What? Oh, nothing. I mean, yeah, yeah, I got something. Uh, We just got a report on a stiff in the river. Thought you'd want to go check. Oh, sure. In the river, huh? Yeah. Anything else? No, that's all. Well, good. I'll just go rent a little old rowboat and sail merrily up and down until I find the crowd. What's the address, your hornhead? Oh, uh, 682 River Street. Thank you, Sergeant. What's the matter, Walt? Uh, I gotta go check on a homicide. Come on. It's on the way to the photo lab. I'll drop you off. We climbed in the squad car and cut across town. In front of a small white building on 36th Street, Walt let me out and headed for the river. I went into the speedy photo lab and flashed the badge just long enough for the guy in charge to think I was a legit officer. Then I went through the list of people who had been mailed pictures in the last four days. The speedy photo lab must have been heading for a quick collapse because there were only seven names. I wrote down the addresses and started to check. The first four were strikeouts. But the fifth was good for all the bases. Yes, what can I do for you? Mr. Andrew Troop? Yes? Did you receive a picture from the speedy photo lab? Why, yes. What's this all about? May I see it? Well, I don't know. Uh, here's the badge. A policeman? Now, now, don't get excited. Everything's all right. Well, I can't help but get excited. A real live policeman. How wonderful. Oh, dandy. You see, I'm an amateur criminologist. I'll send you a magnifying glass. Now, may I see the picture? I'll get it right away. A real policeman. I may break out in a rash. He got the picture all right, along with his correspondence course from the Find a Clue Detective School. And while he explained his advanced theories on police procedure, I took a good look at the snapshot. He was, of course, the reason for the picture. He was walking along toward the camera, puffed up like a park pigeon with his eye on some popcorn. But there in the background were my two sweet skull crushers, Tony Payton and his friend. But nothing seemed wrong. They were simply walking out of a building, one on either side of a short, stocky man with a large briefcase. Is that picture a clue of some sort? Well, I don't know. Uh, Do you mind if I take it with me? I'll see that you get it back. Not at all, not at all. I thought you policemen worked in pairs. Well, we, uh, we usually do, but my partner got sore and gave me back my class ring so we're not speaking. Goodbye and thank you. I got it, Walt. I don't care what it is, I'll trade you. Otis for whatever you got. Here's the picture. Oh, this is swell. Well, now what's the matter? Two homicides in one afternoon, that's what's the matter. Hey, uh, who was the guy in the river? Worked for a brokerage firm. Disappeared four days ago with $200,000 in negotiable securities. Let's see that picture. Mm, all right. Now, here's the guy who the picture was taken of. Type who works in the pillow factory. Well, there's Tony Payton in the background. Mm-hmm. The gorilla next to him is his partner. I know him. That's Louis Russo. Three times Lou. What do you see? Holy, I... No wonder. No wonder what? That guy, that guy between Tony and Louis. The one in the middle, the one with the briefcase? Yeah, yeah, that's the one we just fished out of the river. Oh, 
Oh, then they accidentally got their pictures taken just before they killed the man with the security. Sure, Peyton evidently saw Phipps take the picture, remembered him from Sing Sing, couldn't go after him until they took care of the guy with the security. Sounds good. Phipps developed the picture and saw what he had, got scared and came to me for help. That must have been... Oh, what do you want? We located Tony Peyton. Where? Over in a broken down hotel on 25th Street. Come on. Fisher and Robert showed the clerk Peyton's picture. And the clerk said he was registered there under another name with another guy. Fisher and Robert staked out? Uh, yeah, across the street. Huh? Get the car and step on it. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, the siren. <laughs> Robert's parked up ahead. Pull up by him, Otis. Right. Roberts. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. They show? Not yet. Fisher is covering the service entrance. We'll go in. Hunk the horn once if you spot anything. Right. We'll get out here, Otis. Get the car out of sight. Yeah. Like old times, Rick. Yeah, but I don't miss them. Somebody always gets shot at. Get going, Otis. Okay. Ready, Walt? Yeah. Let's go. Clerk. Well, that's right. There's not going to be any shooting, is there? Not if we can help it. How late are you usually on? Uh, till midnight. Is there a room around here, a closet or something we can wait in? Oh, um, nothing close to the lobby. Look, if there's going to be any shooting... What about the elevator? Well, what about it? Can we turn the light off and wait in there? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Good idea. That part of the lobby's dark. Wouldn't see us until they were on top of us. Well, they just live on the second floor. What if they use the stairs? They won't get that far. Come on, Walt. Oh, what do you want me to do? What you do every night. Oh, sometimes I play the radio. Okay, if I play the radio. All right, but keep it low. I sure hope there isn't going to be any shooting. There's a light switch. That's not it. Oh, where the... Okay. Is there a stool over there? Hey, that's too loud. Hey, lady. Hey. Miguel? Turn it down. Uh What are you doing? Getting that stool. That's it. Sure, jumping. Uh, yeah. Two eleven. What's the matter? Something wrong? No, no. This stump would make me jumpy too. He's heading for the stairs. When he gets past us. No. Hold it, Tony. All right. Don't move an inch. Not a shamus. Ah, uh, thirty-eight. Uh, look, what is this? That's a bright remark. Where's your partner? You think I better make a guess? <clears throat> I'll make it a good one. Rick, not in front of taxpayers. I'm not a cop, and this guy gave me my lumps earlier. Now, where's your partner, Tony? Someone coming in. That's Louie. Cop is Louie, bitch! Watch Tony Walt. I'll go after Louie. Get the wall. He's coming your way, Roberts. Stop, Louis. Stop. Okay. Uh, Get me to a hospital, will you? All right, all right. Sorry about the horn, but he slipped past. Get him an ambulance. I'm going back in with Walt. Sure. My shooting. Okay, Rick? Yeah. All right, let's go, Tony. Gee, I didn't think there was going to be any shooting. Well, you never know, do you? Rick. Hmm? I'm getting 
getting a little tired of you getting your face all bruised up. You're getting a little tired. Well, you know what I mean. I worry. You worry and I ache. I'll trade you. If I could, I would. You little doll. I know you, but honey. I know. As long as we're going to give away your worry and my sore face, let's give them to someone who deserves them, hmm? Otis. Oh, he's got enough trouble of his own. Yeah. Have you ever seen those feet? There's not a shoe store in town that carries a size. Rick. It's true. He can only get one pair a year. Why only one pair? Takes four months just to lay the keel. <laughs> oh, there it is. I might as well answer it. Louis Pool Hall. <laughs> what? Louis Pool Hall, snooker billiards and straight pool. Now you stop that, Helen. Helen? Look, I don't know what you want, Mac, but the name's Gay Now, don't give me that. When you picked up the phone, I heard a piano. Well, of course you heard a piano. What do you think this is? A crummy joint or something? We got high class entertainment. Anybody that runs eight straight billiards gets a free beer and a song. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, Gertrude, would you mind telling me who does the singing? You mean you ain't heard? We got the world's greatest lyric baritone, Clyde Cat. He's crazy. <laughs> oh, no, for Pete. No, 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 Clyde. Wait a sec. I'll get him to warble a number. Hey, Clyde. Oh. Yeah, Gordy. Flex your tonsils. Sure. The bird with feathers of blue is waiting for you back in your own backyard. You'll see your castle in Spain through your window pane back in your own backyard. Oh, you can go to the east, go to the west, but someday you'll come weary at heart back where you started from. You'll find your happiness lies right under your eyes, back in your own backyard. There, you see what I mean? Now, look, I want to speak to Rick. Don't know him, don't know him. Maybe he waits in the bowling alley. But... Oh, you'll have to excuse me, Mac. My brother what runs the joint is real skinny, and some jerk just chalked up his head and is using him for a cue. <laughs> now, you wait a oh, minute. Oh, I can't, Mac. I can't. He's liable to get a concussion. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you want me to talk to him? Well, do you really want to know? Yeah. Because I wanted you to hear exactly what you're beginning to talk like. I talk like that? Close. Oh, now, come on. I mean it, Rick. You associate with so many the guys that talk out of the corner of their mouth that you're beginning to pick it up. Oh, well, honey, if you're going to get square on me... Now, do you see what I mean? Honey, if you're going to get square on me... Well, all right, all right. You want a little proper diction, huh? Well, it certainly wouldn't hurt. <coughs> Darling. <laughs> oh, yes. Come closer. Oh, how nice. Oh, not that close, darling. You're fogging my glasses. Sorry. Nothing. Better? Much. Shall we? Love it. Oh, Ronnie. Oh, Cynthia. <sighs> hey, it works. I gotta remember this. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Byron Kane, Gene Bates, Tony Barrett, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Today's show was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Here's an important time change reminder for Richard Diamond fans. This is the last Richard Diamond broadcast in this time period. Beginning April 5th, you will hear Dick Powell as Richard Diamond at a new time on Wednesdays. Check your local newspapers for the exact time, and be sure to tune for Richard Diamond on Wednesdays, beginning April 5th. 
Next Sunday at this time over most of these same stations, NBC will present Voices and Events, the exciting chronicle of today's happenings throughout the world. Tune here next Sunday for Voices and Events, and be sure to hear the next thrill-packed adventure in the life of Richard Diamond one week from Wednesday over most of these same NBC stations. Next, hear James Melton and Harvest of Stars on NBC. Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. There it is. I've got it. I've got it. Let me see. Here you are. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. My friend, you have just made us independently wealthy. Many men have died in the past because of this. And unless we're extremely cautious, you and I will be added to the already long list of its victims. Come, hurry. Here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, where the blue of my eyes meets the gold in your wallet. Oh, that's pretty terrible. Hmm, you may be right. You admit it. Yes, I've seen your wallet. Oh, Rick. <laughs> Hello, Helen, baby. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, just finished cleaning out my desk. Oh, find anything interesting? Mm-hmm. Sam Spade. Guess he hadn't paid his rent. Oh, you're impossible. So, Sam. Well, I'm not going to try to keep up with this. Am I going to see you tonight? Oh, sure, sure, darling. I... Oh, uh, wait a minute, honey. Hmm? Company just walked in. Oh. Something I can do for you, my friend? Are you Richard Diamond? That's right. Client, Rick? No, I don't know, honey. I'll call you back. Please, Mr. Diamond. I haven't got much time. Okay, what's on your mind? This package. Here, take it. And keep it for me until... Hey. Hey, what's wrong? Hide it. I'm being followed. Hide it. Now, oh, take it easy. Oh, what's the matter? Hey, fella, come on. Now, what's... Oh, swell. Precinct Police Station, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's Ponder, and I think I've been doped. Now put the lieutenant on the line. Oh. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, Rick. Oh, no, it's only 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Nobody gets killed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You better check up on your statistics. There's a guy in my office who makes a liar out of him. What? Yeah, lying right here in front of my desk. He's dead? Well, if he isn't, he's got a lazy heart. Maybe he just fainted. Maybe he's suffering from some kind of a shock. Maybe he's got some terrible disease and he'll give it to you. Walt, if this guy isn't dead, he's sure going to have a hard time explaining the bullet hole in his back. Don't touch anything. Can't even scratch my head? Oh, you know what I mean. Now, all I did was lock the door. Now, get over here. Knock three times and say, Ricky loves Walter, and I'll open up. Uh, what did you lock the door for? Well, because this guy came in and gave me a... Gave you a what? Wait a minute, Walt. Come on, what are you mumbling about? Will you shut up? Someone's trying to get in the door. I'll see you when you get here, Walt. I have one of those locks that any skeleton key would fit, and that was exactly what my visitor was using. He opened the door. I moved back against the wall as the door swung in. My visitor was a young, well-dressed man, about five feet eight or nine, red hair, nose full of freckles, and on top of the nose, a pair of black rim glasses. There was a big bulge under his coat that he started reaching for just as I rolled his arm around behind him. Oh, you're backing me off! No, no, not yet. I still got a little way to go. No! Just making you more comfortable. 
Now, now, I'll take this big gun. It must weigh you down. <laughs> you can't do this to Oh, me. sure I can. See, I just pushed a little. No, no. Just locking the door again. Now, sit down in that chair. <laughs> My arm. Well, I'll be happy you still got it. Now, what are you doing patty-footing it around here, using a pass key to get into my office? I got the wrong office. Look, Sonny, you see that over there? Oh, what is it? It's a guy, and it's very dead. Uh, I'll send some flowers. Make it enough for a duet. Someone else gonna die? Someone else is gonna get pretty close to it if I don't get the answers I want. Well, I'll see what I can find out. Ooh. That's to see how fast you can talk. I don't have to talk to you. I don't have to talk to nobody. I want a bet? <laughs> going to be sorry for that. You're mixed up. Let me straighten you out. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, then let's have it. What were you doing busting in here? What do you know about the dead guy? I don't know nothing about him. What gave you the idea you could break into my office? I found out the door was locked. I didn't want to wait around in the hall. You got a permit to carry this gun? Well, of course I have. Let's see it. I haven't got it with me. Oh, well, then we'd better start at the beginning. Did you rotten... Come on, Ricky loves Walter. Now open this door, I'll have all his ticket in. Who's that? That's the law, Buster. Now you stay put while I let the big fat policeman in. Come on, come on, Diamond. Should I open it? Oh, not with your head. Well, greetings. Uh, come on in, Walt. I got somebody. Hey, what the... Oh, I had somebody. Some guy jumped through Diamond's window. It's eight floors up. Yeah, but there's a roof only one floor below. Look off the glass. There he is down there. Hey, you, you, come back here. He ducked behind that sign. Oh, let's get off of my back. Oh, yeah. oh, well, he's gone. That's that. What did he do? Busted into the office. Hey, is that dead guy over there? What does that look like, a bear rug? Oh, Think the guy who jumped out of your window has something to do with the dead man? I don't know. He had this gun on him. Well, why didn't you take a shot at him? Because if you'll notice, I've been holding it by the barrel. I wanted you to have the nice little old fingerprints. Oh. Yeah, oh. Why didn't you take a shot at him? Why didn't I? Yellow Town, why didn't you? You shut up. Well, Walt, I don't know what he was, who he was, or what he'd done. Why should I take a shot at him? Uh, Lieutenant. Otis, I told you to shut up. Now, let's take a look at the dead man. Looks like he's been shot in the back. Yeah. You said he came in to give you something, Ray. That's right. This package right here. And what's in it? I don't have a look yet. Left in today's newspaper. Well, what in the... Hey, some kind of doll or something. Looks like it's carved out of ivory. Funny looking thing. Look at all those arms. Must be oriented. You know what it is? No more than you do. The guy just came well, in and... It sounds like the wagon, Lieutenant. Yeah, when the coroner gets here, Rick, we'll go down to the office and see if we can get any identification on the guy who jumped out of your window. Okay. Here's a wallet off the dead guy. Well, let me see. Yeah, 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 Lieutenant. Hmm. Social security card. Name's William Logan. Hey, here's something. Guy's a merchant sailor. Here's his card. We'll check these things. Look, Walt, Walt you, you've got to wait around for the coroner's report. I've got a date with Helen later, so I'll go over to my place and get cleaned up. Then I'll meet you at the station, huh? Okay. Hey, where are you going with that statue? Well, the dead man, William Logan, gave it to me to keep. That's evidence. But it's also something from a client. Client? He give you a fee? No, but he wanted me to have this thing, and looks like he died trying to get it to me. So he's a client until I find out what this is all about. Ain't he noble? Noble, schmoble. That thing is still evidence. I'll take good care of it. Now, Diamond, you come back here. Walt... What do I always say when I leave you like this? What? What do I always say? Why, uh, bye. Bye. I left Walt and headed for my flat on East 51st. I wasn't about to try and figure the whole thing out because it was still an early case. And sometimes cases like that can stretch out into two or three murders before things begin to fit together. That's the way you got to figure. One guy dead could lead to another, so you walk on eggs for a while and make sure it's not going to be you. I got to my flat and went in. Smoked a few cigarettes. Looked at the carved ivory figure that William Logan had given me. It looked like a woman sitting cross-legged with all of her six arms outstretched. I gave it a good going over, but couldn't find anything unusual. So I put it on the piano and went in and started to shave. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, what is it? Okay, okay. When people don't answer, it makes me wonder. I 
across the living room, remember the ivory figure on the piano. So just to be safe, I lifted the top of the piano and put the statue down inside. Then I moved over to the door. Mr. Diamond? That's right. I'd like to talk with you. I have a business proposition. Is there any money involved? Quite a good deal. Well, you've just made an appointment. Come in, Mr. Uh... Titus. Leopold Titus, Esquire. He came in all right. He had the duck to do it. He must have been a good seven feet tall, and even with his heavy overcoat, he couldn't have weighed over 140. He reminded me of a king-sized case of malnutrition. He took in the whole apartment with one fast look and slid into a chair, rested his elbows, locked his hands, and put them under his pointed chin. It appears you've been shaving. I've interrupted. Oh, no, no. Split personality. Never touch this side. Mr. Diamond, I haven't much time. Good, good. Now, you uh, said something about money. Hmm. I can see that this is a subject which meets with your approval. Well, it sets off an emotional reaction, shall we say. I can't stand goosebumps for more than a couple of minutes, so let's get to it, huh? Yes, indeed, indeed. Mm. Mr. Diamond, I am prepared to pay $10,000 for Kali. Oh, well, that's dandy, but I'm not a booking agent. What kind of an act does Kali do? 10000 Mr. Diamond. Look, to me, Kali is the name of a dog. Kali! Oh, okay, so he got mixed up with the French poodle. 10000 and that's my top price. You know, of course, you're running me right into a nervous breakdown... I get the shakes when someone changes five bucks. Mr. Diamond, I want Kali. I will have Kali, whether I pay you the 10000 or not. Look, Mr. Titus, really, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I certainly hoped you'd be more sensible than this. I know that William Logan came to see you this afternoon. Oh? And I know for a fact that he had Kali with him. Well, did he have it when he left my office? I couldn't see. Mr. Logan was under a sheet. Now, either the police have Kali or you do. I'd like very much to know. Uh, maybe I can help you if you'll tell me exactly what this Kali is. I made an offer of $10,000, Mr. Diamond. That's a great deal of money, but it does not entitle you to play 20 questions. Okay. Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Titus, I'd like to finish shaving. As I explained, Mr. Diamond, I don't have much time. Well, then, good afternoon, Mr. Titus. No, I'm afraid not. Charles! Yes, Mr. Titus. Well, well, well. I thought maybe you'd cut your throat when you jumped out of my window. I hear you got rather ambitious with Charles, Mr. Diamond. We turned such a pretty color when you slap him around. I told you you'd be sorry for that. Yes, and indeed you will, Mr. Diamond. Unless you tell me where I can find Kali. You can go to the devil. I'm afraid the trip would be unpleasant and premature. However, I'm sure your passage might be taken care of. <laughs> Show him your new gun, Charles. Of course. Now you sit down, Diamond. Where is Kali, Mr. Diamond? And you know very well what I'm talking about. The small hand-carved ivory statue. Sorry, Titus. Yes, and so am I. I deplore the sight of blood. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Titus. Just turn your back. Yes, Charles. Excellent suggestion. Do you have a wireless, Diamond? No, but I got a lovely bunch of coconuts. Oh, very funny. All right, where's your wireless? Hey, never mind, Charles. Mr. Diamond has a piano. Yeah, I can manage to raise or lower the volume as the groans dictate. I can make a lot of noise. My old piano teacher assured me I could do the same. Yeah. Now, go ahead, Charles. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh, you... Where is Kali, Diamond? Oh, nuts. Again, Mr. Titus? Again, Charles. Are you using your fist, Charles? Oh, yes. Well, use the barrel of your gun. We haven't much time. All right. Oh, now, wait a minute. You... Oh, oh. Oh, it's not a very good piano, Mr. Diamond. Mm. That's an old kazoo over in the drawer. Kali Diamond, I want the statue. Well, for $10,000, don't you think I'd give it to you? No. Oh, really, Mr. Diamond, this piano is in a deplorable condition. So's Diamond, Mr. Titus. He looks terrible. Shame, but unavoidable. Keep working on him, Charles, until he decides to confide in us. Where's the statue, Diamond? Now? Okay. Oh. NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah. 
Young man. Mm. Young man. Mm. Oh. Oh, who says so? That is good. You can hear me? Oh, I can hear who? Try and sit up. Oh. You look quite uncomfortable. Yeah, you can make book on it. There, that's better. Mm. Now take your time. I want your answers to be correct. Well, he got me into a sitting position, and when things finally stopped jumping around, I got a good look at him. Titus wasn't around. Neither was Charles, his little butcher. The room was dark except for a single light in the corner. The man standing before me was short, dressed in a tailored blue suit, his dark face standing out against a white turban on his head. He didn't smile or blink his eyes. I am Ahmed Benif. Oh, thanks. I'd introduce myself, but I've been pushed around so much I could be anybody. Mr. Titus and his man Charles can be very persuasive. Well, a gallon of blood and a few broken arms, anyone can do it. Where did they go? Uh, I got tired and took a nap. Did you give them Kali? Oh, no. Now, look, it is I... It's a very simple question. I know that a man came to your office with the statue. So does half of New York. I have been following Titus because I know the statue was stolen from him and that he would do anything to get it back. He led me to your office, then he led me here. If he has the statue, he has undoubtedly returned to his flat where he is preparing to leave for a place of safety. Well, I don't know whether he's got the statue or not. That is unfortunate. I have no more time to question you. I shall have to assume that Mr. Titus has the statue and kill you. He was like a cat. Before I could push myself to a standing position, he was around and back, and I felt something drop over my head and draw tight around my windpipe. Oh, I'm sorry, but I must know. If you will not tell me, I shall have to strangle you. Simon! Come on, Ricky loves Walter. Now open this door. Oh. We shall meet again, Mr. Diamond. Come on, Rick. I know you're in there. You were supposed to be down the station an hour ago. Oh, oh shut up. I don't want to break it down, but I will. Yeah, but I will, but I will. Okay, keep your badge on. <coughs> Come on, step on it. <coughs> ah. Well, Blue Eyes. Where's Diamond? No. Yeah. What in the world? Believe me, Walt, I don't know. You look off. Yeah, I feel like I've been playing in a wind tunnel with blocks of cement. What happened? Look, before I go into it, hmm, tell me what you found out. We better take care of you first. Yeah, I don't have to wait. Things keep going on like they have been. It's only a matter of time until someone else gets killed. Now, what did you find out? Well, you know that gun you gave me? Yeah, the one I got from Charles. Is that his name? Yeah, what about the gun? It was the one that killed the guy in your office. That's why you've got to get down to the station and try to identify this guy from the gallery. By the time I do that, he'll be out of the country. How do you know that? Ahmed Benif told me. Who the devil is Ahmed Benif? Guy with a turban. Tried to strangle me. Now, don't you start that. I'm not starting anything. He beat it out the back. If you hadn't knocked on that door, I'd have been strangled to death. He the guy who beat you up like this? No. Charles did. Because Mr. Leopold Titus Esquire told him to. Leopold Titus Esquire? What are you trying to do? That's right. He was looking for Collie in the first... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Collie? That's a dog. No, 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 Walt. It isn't. It's an ivory statue. I... Oh, my gosh. Oh, what? Wait a minute. He's lost his mind. What are you doing in that piano? I'm looking for the statue. I put it in here. Please, Rick, slow down. Yeah, gone. Well, Titus has got it. He was playing the piano. Please, Rick, please. Walt... What did you find out about the dead man? William Logan? Yeah, what did you find out? He was a merchant seaman. Landed yesterday on the Queen of India out of Calcutta. Uh Huh? Thanks, Walt. Where do you think you're going? Check with the steamship company. I stumbled out of my place looking like an ad for ground sirloin and grabbed a cab. On the way to the India steamship lines, I tried putting two and two together. The little statue, Kali, was the reason for the whole thing. One man was dead because of it, and everybody who was connected with the case was perfectly willing to kill anyone else at any time. Mr. Leopold Titus wanted it, so did one Ahmed Beneath. Titus and his boy Charles evidently tailed William Logan, merchant seaman, to my office, and somewhere along the line, Charles shot him. Ahmed Beneath was tailing the whole bunch. Two and two, 
Well, maybe, but I still needed some answers. A cab pulled up in front of the East India Steamship offices, and I went in. A nice little girl with a nice little uh, <clears throat> personality showed me the passenger list of the India Queen, and sure enough, Mr. Leopold Titus and a Mr. Charles Freely, first class. I thanked the girl, told her I'd send her a picture when my face got back to normal, and I headed for the docks in the customs office. I needed an address on Titus, and I knew that he must have signed a manifest at customs. He had. And five minutes later, I was back in my cab headed for the residence of Mr. Leopold Titus Esquire, Kew Gardens, Long Island. It was a big, sprawling house, and by the time I got there, my watch was leaning on seven o'clock. I paid the cabbie with my last 20 bucks and started toward the only light burning. The light was coming from a downstairs room with tall French doors, so I went over the balcony and moved up for a better look. I got the look and went in fast. Titus! Uh, Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you're a bit late. The place was a wreck. Titus was half sitting, half lying against the couch. There was blood all over him. Charles Freely was stretched out on the floor near the towering bookcases. He was looking up, staring, but not seeing a thing. Around his throat was a long, white length of cloth. <laughs> Greed, Mr. Diamond. The price for greed comes extremely high, as you can well see. I'm at Beneath. Oh, you've met. Yes, I'm at Beneath. Quite as proficient with a gun as well as a strangling cord. I'll call an ambulance. No, no, Mr. Diamond. I'm having a twinge of conscience, so hear me out. You must find Beneath and stop him. Does he have Kali? Yes, he has Mother Kali. Mother Kali? As she is known by her followers. Tugs. Mr. Diamond, have you ever heard of Tugs? No, I haven't. What are they? A cult long since believed extinct in India. An army of assassins banded together under the guidance of Mother Kali. Assassins? Yes, Mr. Diamond. Trained in the art of strangling. Oh, yeah. oh yes, I read something about that in a history book. It was a long time ago. Correct. They were suppressed by the British in... 1830. You're trying to tell me they've started all over again? Absolutely. What about that little statue? Belongs to the man who has reorganized the tugs. Symbol of his leadership. Passed down through generations from one leader to the next. And to a collector worth a fortune. And you're a collector? A businessman. But I know a great many collectors who would pay a sizable fortune to get a hold of that statue. And Ahmed Badif is one of those tugs. Indeed he is. Where did you get the statue? Charles stole it for me from Ahmed Benif. What about William Logan, the merchant seaman? Uh, board ship from Calcutta. Logan discovered its value and stole it from us. Indeed, Ahmed Benif is a tug. The statue is his... Passed down by his father and his father before him. I'll call the law. Mr. Diamond, please see that Charles is buried next to me. A mixed up boy, but a good friend. Sure. Now, uh, operator, Put give me... Put down the phone, Mr. Diamond. Put it down. Well, beneath, this isn't very smart, is it? On the contrary, Mr. Diamond, it is very smart. I have the statue... And now you are the only man who could tell the authorities that once again the thugs are rising all over India. How did you know I'd be here? I did not know. As I was leaving, I saw your cab pull up. I listened to everything Mr. Titus had to say. I was surprised. I thought surely he would be dead by now. And now you kill me. Most assuredly. Ahmed couldn't see it because as he came closer to me, his back was to Titus, and Titus was pulling himself painfully across the room, trying to get to the dead body of Charles Freely. I didn't know what he was up to, but I, I had to give him time to make it. I deplore the use of a gun, but in some cases... You'd I'd rather th strangle your victim. That is my religion, Mr. Diamond. Unfortunately, in some cases, I must take other steps. Well, you've sure taken some pretty big ones. I assure you, it has been most necessary. All because of a little statue? All because of what that little statue represents. 
I rule the thugs, Mr. Diamond, and Kali is a symbol of my leadership. As you have seen, I would do anything to retain its possession and keep faith with my people. So now, again, my time is short. Uh. <laughs> Indeed, it was short, wasn't it, Mr. Diamond? Indeed. I'm certainly happy that Charles had his new gun. Thanks, Titus. A pleasure. And now, quickly, two favors, Mr. Diamond. What are they? First, take this statue of Kali and destroy it. I must have your word. You've got it. Good. The second, I... I wish your honest opinion. I'll try. Once you directed me to the devil, and I said that it was a... Premature crossing? Yes. I I fear that perhaps now it is not your honest opinion, Mr. Diamond. Do, do you think he could really stand the competition? <laughs> Titus. Titus. Well, it'll... Sure, it'd be a good race anyway. How do you feel, Rick? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Pretty good, I guess. Want to tell me about it? No, I, um, I don't think so, honey. You just get confused with an old argument about right and wrong. Well, I wish you weren't so unhappy. Unhappy? Oh, honey, you said a bad word. I'm just mad about my bruises. Oh, I think the colors are lovely. Mm, well, so do I. I've just got to be careful about wearing plaid. Oh, Rick. Mm, pretty bad, huh? Yeah. Why don't you just sing something? All right, dear, I'd love to. Bye-bye, baby. Remember you're my baby. When you oh, give no, me... No, no, no. Did you hear that? I certainly did. He's back. That's the grouch in the next building, isn't it? <laughs> yes, he's been out of town for a rest. Oh, my God. What's his name? Mr. Lumpkin. Oh. Uh, good evening, Mr. Lumpkin. <laughs> oh, antisocial, huh? You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my... Good evening, Mr. Lumpkin. All right. Good evening. Well, now, that's better. Now, what would you like to hear? <laughs> the sound of you cutting your throat. You're fighting me. Oh, I'd love to with a machine gun. Tepper, tepper, tepper. Control yourself. I may ask questions later. Oh. Good evening, Mr. Lumpkin. You stay out of this. Good evening, Miss Asher. <laughs> My, you're looking well. Oh, oh, thank you. So are you. If he leans out any further, he'll be hanging by his heels. Now, you just stay right there, Mr. Lumpkin. We've got a lovely surprise for you. Yes? Yes. Now, sing something nice, Rick. Love it, love it. Bye-bye, baby. Remember you're my baby. When they give you the eye Although I know that you care Won't you write and declare That though on the loose You are still on the square I'll be gloomy But send that rainbow to me Then my shadows will fly Though you'll be gone for a while I know that I'll still be smiling with my baby by and by, with my baby by and by. Well, how do you take it? How is that, Mr. Lumpkin? Oh, Miss Asher, it's impossible for me to express my feelings at this moment, especially when a lady is present. <laughs> He didn't like it. Well, what do you expect from a clarinet player? Come on, let's case the icebox. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Gypsy Rose Lee visits Duffy's Tavern tomorrow on NBC.
National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Everything will be right there. It's okay, okay. Just let me get a robe on. Coming, coming. Yes. Yes. Yes, there's nothing like stepping out of a nice warm shower into a nice hot murder. The only thing in sight was the body of a man lying on his face. I didn't have to get any closer to see that he was very dead. Then I heard someone running down the front steps and out of the street, so still being the kind of guy who's always interested in seeing what a killer looks like, I went down the stairs and out into the street. I landed on the sidewalk just as the sedan pulled away from the curb and dove into a hole in the traffic. I only had time to see that there were two people in it. Didn't even get a chance at the license. Well, a white terry cloth robe can be a little conspicuous at 11 o'clock in the morning on East 51st Street, right off Madison... So I shuffled back up the stairs, put in a call for Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct, homicide. But it seems as if I was a little late. A neighbor on the way to the... uh, Well, a neighbor on the way down the hall had stumbled on the dead one in front of my doorway. Now, generally, a body in front of my door would be left alone to sober up. But this one seemed to be bleeding, so just as a precaution, the neighbor had called the police. All I could do was just stand around and wait for them. Know it, Otis? Wouldn't you know it? Finally got to be right in his own building. Yeah, Lieutenant, and she said it was right in front of his own door. That's around this corner. Uh, what'd you say the name of the woman was who turned in the alarm? Uh, Myrtle Tibbles, the apartment next to his. That's right, Otis, and she's a big snoop. Huh? I heard that. What's that? Myrtle Tibbles. Now listen, Rick. If you've got any questions, officer. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you. Oh, no... shut up. Otis, go question her. Me? Yes, you. Go ahead. I Lady, I know everything you're going to say. And a lot more. Oh, then come in, Captain. Hey, did you hear that, Lieutenant? Get in there, Sergeant. And question the big snoo- uh, lady. Uh, yes, sir. Snoo, eh? Well, Rick. Well, Rick. What kind of a bit is that? I suppose you're going to tell me you had nothing to do with this killing. Walt, I was in taking a shower when this gentleman decided to get himself shot in front of my door. I was singing, too. Would you like to hear what I was... No, thank... Hey, wait a minute. If you were in taking a shower, how did you know he was getting himself shot? He rang the doorbell first. Oh, sure. He wanted to let you know there was going to be a murder. Listen, blubbermouth, I was taking a shower. I stopped taking a shower. The doorbell rang. I went to the door. I opened the door. Dead man. I ran down into the street after the killers. What about the shots? I didn't hear any. Must have used a silencer. Well, you say you ran after the killers. Was there more than one? Two. I don't know who pulled the real old trigger, but I chased two people down into the street. Did you recognize them? No, they didn't leave any calling cards. Ah, descriptions. Man and woman. Now, that's helpful. License number? Too fast. Got lost in traffic. In other words, all you noticed about them was a little less than nothing. Mm. I'm surprised you didn't forget and leave your head hanging in the shower. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, now, by George, Lieutenant, that was a real dandy, that was. (laughs) Cut it out, Rick. Come on, let's take a look at the corpse. Well, have you forgotten? You just sent it in to question Myrtle Tibbles. Not Otis, I mean this one. You better be specific. I've known a lot of coroners to get pretty confused when Otis was covering a homicide. Mm, some kind of a messenger. Yeah, band on his cap says Speed Messenger Service. Here's his receipt book. Only one entry, Richard Diamond, Apartment E, 53 East 51st Street. Nothing else. Would you want any more? I'm honored. Now, what the devil could he have been delivering? The reason he got shot, probably. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah Myrtle. Uh, oh, oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, Go uh, ahead and ask him, Otis. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, young love. Uh, Myrtle, uh, uh, Miss Tibbles wants to know if it's all right if I stay for lunch. Why, I think that would be real nice, Sergeant. How long do you think it will take? Uh, how long, Myrtle? Uh, not long. Well, that's fine. But before you sit down and start feeding that fat face of yours, what would you suggest we do about this body in the hall? Well, I'll tell you, Lieutenant. Otis. Uh, uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Get out here. Uh, coming, Lieutenant. Uh, thanks anyway, Myrtle. Uh, well, 
Where to, Lieutenant? Oh. Well, how, how about the speed messenger service? Right. Just as soon as the coroner and the boys get here and take over. Uh, you want to come along, Rick? Well, sure, sure. The dead man was trying to deliver something to me. I'd like to know what was important enough to get him shot. Sure, let's get going. Uh, Diamond, don't you think you ought to change that robe? Uh, Walt. Yeah, I know, but what are you going to do? Oh, gee, I only made a suggestion. You don't have to get sore. Oh, we're not, Sergeant. He can wear the robe for all I care. I only... Well, thank you, Sergeant. I don't give a darn if he looks silly. Otis. Just because I make a suggestion... Sergeant. Yeah? Will you do me a favor? Well, sure, Lieutenant. Shut up! <laughs> So, while Walt tore Otis to pieces, I did a quick change. And when the coroner arrived, we climbed aboard the squad car and headed for the main office of Speed Messenger Service. While Walt was getting the address from headquarters and the car radio, Otis sneaked on the siren. So, in less than ten minutes, we pulled up in front of the building at 31st and West End Avenue and barged in. You on duty here, miss? Yeah. Trouble? What makes you think there's trouble? When a cop car pulls up in front and you two jump in here like a couple of bill collectors, it figures. Trouble, see? Ah, a woman's intuition. <laughs> wonderful, simply wonderful. Tell me, dear, did your service send a messenger over to 53 East 51st Street, Apartment E? About an hour ago. Why? What was he supposed to deliver? I don't know. I don't remember that good, see? Oh, well, try. I don't get this. What's wrong anyway? Well, dearie, your messenger ain't anymore. Yeah, shot to death. <gasps> What? Mm, now try to remember what it was. Oh, that... Mr. Cartwright! Hey, hey, Mr. Cartwright! Well, let her get Cartwright, Walt. Maybe he can tell us something. Yes, now what in the oh, world? Mr. Cartwright, Johnny, he's dead. He's... Yes. Those are police officers, see? They said he was shot to death. No, no, just be calm. Let me get this straight. But I told you, see, it's Johnny. All right, all right. Now go in the back. Get a drink of water or something. Yes, sir, but I just can't believe it. It's... I am Mr. Cartwright, gentlemen. Well, that's nice. Are you in charge here? I am the manager. Now, what is this about one of our messengers being dead? That's right. Do you have any idea what he was delivering to 53 East 51st this morning? Well, I... Uh, why, no, but it, it should be in our record book. You'll have to forgive Miss Ogilvy. She gets very emotional. Hmm, does she? Well, let's see the record book. Oh, it's right here. Uh, here you are. Now, let's see... Uh, uh... There, it was the first delivery this morning, as you can see. Fifty-three... We'd uh, like to know just what he was delivering. Oh, well, I really couldn't say. I, I don't even remember what the item looked like. Well, who sent it? Uh, uh, yes, yes, that I can help you with. Uh, here it is. Uh, last name Clark, first name Paddy. Uh, in other words, a man named Paddy Clark. No. Yes, uh, odd first name, isn't it? Mean anything to you, Rick? Oh, something is a little vague. Name seems familiar, that's all. How about you? I don't get a thing from it. Any return address? Uh, no, uh, just his name with instructions to deliver it to a Mr. Diamond at this address. Well, uh, don't you remember whether it was a package or a crate of bananas? Oh, dear, we what? get so many things in here to be sent out. Uh, Lieutenant. Yes, Otis, what do you want? Uh, 201 over on East 48. Thought you might like to know. You better take off, Walt. 201's your department. Fine, fine. Two homicides in one morning. I'll finish checking here and go over to my office. You can get in touch with me there. Okay. Come on, Otis. Let's go. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah. You can use the siren. My, you officers certainly are busy, aren't you? Yes, we officers sure are. Now, uh, how'd you like to trot out that girl again? Maybe she's calmed down a bit. Oh, certainly. Uh, certainly. Feel any better, Miss Ogilvy? Oh, yes, sir. Much better. Uh, this gentleman would like to ask you a few more questions. Oh, the good-looking one? Oh, sure. Uh, if you're through with me, officer, I have some... Uh, you go, go right ahead. Go on. We'll get along all right. Alone. Only beautiful. Honest, dearie, I, I can't help you a bit. I don't know nothing. Oh, sure you do. Weren't you here when this Patty Clark came in? Well, honest, I, I don't remember, but... Gee, you got the most... But uh, you do remember what the messenger was supposed to deliver, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, what was in it, I don't. It was just a thick envelope. Why, could... Listen, honey, I'd Anything like Anything unusual about the envelope? I wish I could remember for you, but I really can't. We deliver so many things every day, but let's talk about something else. Gee. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, after all, there was no reason in the world why she should remember one particular envelope, so... Making like a good cop for Walt's sake, I scribbled down her name and address. Then headed for my office at the corner of 51st and Broadway. I stopped in the lobby for my morning supply of cigarettes and was about to step in the elevator when a big fat hunch... That's right, hunch. 
grabbed me by the arm and turned me back into the direction of the tobacco shop. That's the place I've been stopping at every morning for the last six years. And it was run by a little guy with a twitch in his right eye. A little twitch and a last name, Clark. And a first name, Patty. Uh, Back for something else, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, yeah, Max. Uh, Where's Patty? Oh, he called up the other day and says he was going out of town for a couple of days or so. Oh, is that it? I missed him the last couple of mornings. Well, you know, he got three stands to look after. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Say, tell me, where's Patty live? You want to see him? Mm-hmm. Got a little business deal I want to talk over with him. Oh, sure. You know Patty. Anything to make a buck. Here. Yes. Yes, his address. Uh, read it. Oh, fine, yeah. He got a phone? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Skylar 49970. There. Thanks, Max. One of these days, I may even buy a cigar from you. <laughs> Funny how things like that can happen sometimes... The name of Paddy Clark had seemed familiar, but I couldn't place it. Only because I'd been doing business with him every day for six years and didn't think to look that close. I grabbed the elevator, went upstairs to my office, and put in a call to Mr. Clark. Yeah? Uh, Paddy? Who wants him? Oh, no. Rick. Hello, Walter. What's new? You know perfectly well what's new. What do you think I'm doing over here? Well, now, let me guess. Rural homicide? You know that's why I come over here in the... Now, wait a minute. Yes, Lieutenant? How did you get this phone number? Patty Clark dead? The deadest. Now, how'd you get the number? I, uh, looked in the book. It's not in the book. It's a hall phone listed under the apartment name. I asked my Ouija board? Pow. Okay, okay, Groucho. Patty Clark owns a cigar store in my building. Well, why under the sun didn't you tell me that in the first place? You said you didn't know him. I said the name was vaguely familiar. All right. How was Patty killed? Shot coroner's on his way. Look, I'm not far from your office. I'll be over as soon as he gets here. Mm. I'll have a candle in the window. Bye. Mm-hmm. The happy people. Mm-hmm. Something wrong? Oh, no, 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 no. Come in. Just filling my lighter. Okay, Agnes is alone. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Well... And in came Agnes. And this was the type of girl easily recognized. About five feet five with more curves than the World Series. And the one thing that really set her apart from the rest, a great big 38, complete with silencer. Her boyfriend took out a cute little 45 and leaned against the door while Aggie swayed over to my desk like a mull cobra. All right, Diamond. Let's have the envelope. Honey, honey, could you point that thing the other way? My skin is beginning to crawl out of my shirt. I want the envelope, Diamond. And if you refuse to give it to me, I really wouldn't mind killing you. You know, I, I think I'd like to give it to you if I, if I knew what you were talking about. I hope we're not going to have to play games, Diamond. Well, uh, something like post office might not be so bad. I, I... Drill him, Maggie, and we'll search the place. He's got to have it somewhere. I'll handle this. I want the white envelope Patty Clark sent you this morning. And I thought you two got it after you killed the messenger boy. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. Seems to me I chased you into the street. Saw you climb into a car and take off. The guy in the white robe. So if you two knocked off the messenger boy, you must know I don't have the envelope. Too bad, but I didn't didn't even get to the door until after you'd shot him. We didn't shoot the messenger. What was in the envelope? You know what was in it. Go on, Aggie. Show him we ain't kidding. Oh, shut up. We didn't shoot the messenger, Diamond. But we are going to get the envelope. Where is it? Hey. A siren's pulling up out in front. Uh, why didn't you search the messenger? You had a gun. You didn't have to worry about me if I showed at the door. Well, we got an envelope off him, all right. Empty. Hey, what are you doing, Paul? Taking a look out in the street. Hey. Police. Prowl car. Two guys coming in this building. Some of your friends, Diamond. You say the envelope was empty? What if they are some of his friends? What if they found Patty? I told you to shut up. Why'd you kill Patty? You knew he'd already sent the envelope. Knock him off, Agnes. Quiet. Hey, somebody getting out of the elevator. You keep your face shut, Diamond. Paul, get over behind the door. What are you going to do? Diamond, you stay right there at the desk. Say one wrong thing and you and a couple of more get dead. My, my. Hello, Rick. I got over here just... Good night, see. Lieutenant. Good night. Good night. Oh, what you mean is good afternoon. Ooh. Believe me, Walt, I meant good night. <laughs> NBC.
NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yes, dear sweet little Agnes had slipped out from behind the door and let Walt have it right behind the ear. He went down like a 16-pound shot in an elevator shaft. Then Aggie and her playmates started backing off. They opened the door and Aggie Darlin pointed the business end of the silencer about halfway up my hand-painted tie. Whether or not she would have shot is anybody's guess. But along about that time, a very dear old friend stepped up behind her. Drop it, lady. The other cop. You can drop yours too, Sonny. Oh, Otis, bless your little pointed head. You fool. Why didn't you look first? Well, I, I forgot. Forgot? Okay, over against the wall. Keep your hands up high. Hey, how's the lieutenant? Oh, uh, oh, he'll come around. Walt. Mm-hmm. Oh, Walty. Mm-hmm. Which one let him have it? Agnes. The dame? The other one's named Paul. Come on, Walt. Oh. Come on, Walt. It's spring again. You know, birds and bees and all that sort of rot. Ah, that's a good boy. Now, now, try and sit up. Oh, my head. What happened? What happened? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Walt, you've been crowned queen of the 5th precinct. Who did it? No, no, no. Don't look at Otis. He's been reading his Tom Swift, Rived in the Nick. Look, there. Huh? Them? Them. And Otis saved the day. What did he do? Wander in without his collar and scare them to death? Agnes, uh, he, uh, she's the one with the sweater. Agnes crowned you. Look, uh, where did these two figure, huh? Oh, there the pair ran out of the building after the messenger was killed. Put the cuffs on the motors. Yes, sir. Okay, you put out your right and you put out your left. And I'll be in Sing Sing before you. And I'll be in... Th- to get him. Now bring him over here. Go on, lady. Okay, keep your hands to yourself. Here's the artillery, Lieutenant. 38 Special with a silencer this 45 auto. Mm, silencer, that's enough to book him in itself. All right. You kill the messenger? No. How about Patty Clark? We don't know who you mean. They know. That's your story. Well, we'll take him down and book him. Happy now, Rick? No. I want to know who has the envelope and what's in it. Envelope? Yeah. The girl at the messenger service finally remembered. Come on, let's take these two down to headquarters. <laughs> Still not talking. Did you find anything in the files? Well, both have records. Guy's Paul Barrows, Agnes is his wife. One conviction apiece, May 1938, suspicion of passing counterfeit money. Uh-huh. Convicted, did time, parole. Oh, you got a fresh address on them? They've been living in Flatbush. Otis went over with some of the boys to check. Good. And here's some fancy news. Just yesterday, the FBI started watching all of Patty's cigar stores as possible fences for phony money. Yeah? Well, then it ties. Come on, I want to take a look at Patty Clark's room. Beside a couple of bags he'd packed for the trip. Oh? Four slugs in the chest, no struggle. Anybody in the building hear the shots? No, and the 38 your little girlfriend had wore a silencer, remember? Hmm. When did the coroner say Patty was shot? About six this morning. What's that? Oh, a little address book. Patty must have used the speed messenger service more than once. Look, see here? Here's the address and phone number. Oh. Now, Walt, let's go over and take a look at Agnes and Paul Barra's place in Flatbush. See what Otis has found out. Oh, oh, hi, Lieutenant. Hello, Detective. Well, thanks, Otis. You drop your watch? Turn up anything? Uh, No, nothing much. What do you mean by nothing much? Well, nothing. That's what I was afraid of. Hey, is there an address book around here anywhere? Over by the phone. Why? Just getting my jollies, Otis. Love to look at new numbers. Now, see if Speed Messenger Service is listed. Yeah? Hmm. Yeah, right here on the back page. Well, Yeah? Patty was killed at six this morning, huh? Right. Six this morning. You know, I wonder when he gave the Messenger Service that envelope. You know, the one addressed to me? Well, the place wouldn't have been open at six this morning, so it must have been sometime yesterday. That's right. And back in his room, his bags were all packed. Well, I think he wanted to make sure he'd be out of town before I got that envelope. I'm way ahead of you. Hello, Henderson? Levinson. Plan any plane or train reservations for Patty Clark? Well, if you didn't, I'll show you where I keep that bottle of lighter yes. fluid in my office. Uh, does that include me too, right. Diamond? There's only one bottle, Otis. Rick, Patty had tickets for a plane to California and then a boat to the Philippines. Well, I'll lay you even money that Agnes and that Paul character didn't knock off the messenger or Patty Clark. What? 
Hmm? All they wanted was that envelope. Envelope, envelope. That's why they came after me, and Patty didn't have it. No? Then who has? Otis, stop sneaking up. Now, Rick, what about the counterfeiting angle? Otis, uh, Otis, go over and check on the speed messenger service. Hmm. See if anybody could have pilfered that envelope and put another in its place or something. And be sure to call me. Why don't we do that? On account of her going back to the precinct and talk to Agnes Barrows. Waiting outside. Good. And here's something you like. Ballistic says the 38 your Aggie was carrying is not the gun that killed Paddy Clark or the messenger. Swell. Okay, show them in. Hello, Aggie, darling. I'm sorry I didn't shoot a hole in your head. <laughs> Isn't she a doll? What do you want out of us? We ain't got nothing to say. Oh, uh, we'll see, we'll see. Now, we know that Paddy Clark was fencing counterfeit money for you two. Now, ain't that peachy. Mm-hmm. I, uh, Walt, get the phone. Yeah. Hello? Uh, Lieutenant, I'm down at the speed messenger service. Well, congratulations, Otis. We thought you'd get lost. Walt, let me talk to him. Sure. Otis? Yeah? Mr. Cartwright there where I can talk to him? He's right here. He isn't? Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, he's right here. Well, if Cartwright isn't there, put the girl on. Cartwright is here. He's standing right next to me. She isn't? She? No, he. Cartwright say he. Can't you get anything straight? They've skipped? Huh? Whole place cleaned out? No, there's plenty of people... Oh, now, wait a minute. Hold the phone a second. They've skipped, Walt. I'll pull out a general. Skipped? Why, those dirty... Oh, shut up. Didn't you hear? Didn't you hear what he said? They skipped. How do you know? You gonna take his word? Anderson, put out a general on Cartwright and his girlfriend. That dirty, no good, double crossing Cartwright. Look, kiddies, that guy's framed you two from the very first. Why don't you talk? The state will make it easier for you. Agnes? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Sure, tell him. We've been getting the run around ever since he got Hello? us in this deal. Hello? Okay. Okay. Hey. Hold it, Otis. But, uh, I said hold it. Go on, Agnes. Well, I. I don't know whether Cartwright killed him or not, but. But Paul and me sure didn't. What about that envelope the Patty Clark sent to me? What was in it? Counterfeit dough. Some of the stuff we made with Cartwright. Why send it to me? Oh, because Patty got sore at Cartwright and wanted to blow the racket wide open. He was crazy to send it through the speed messenger service. Sure he was. Yeah, I think I get it now. When Cartwright found it out, he killed the messenger and had you two there just to make it look like you'd done it. Sure, the lousy. Uh, Otis. Hey, listen, how long can a guy hold Otis, for? Otis, Otis, Otis. You want to be a hero? Huh? How close is Cartwright standing to you at this minute? Uh, you... he's about a foot away. Well, just reach out oh. and slap the cuffs on him. Really? Yeah, and something else, Otis. What? You may use the siren all the way home. <laughs> It's nice to have you here with your face in one piece. Yeah. Lucky, ain't I? <laughs> That's pretty. Why don't you sing it? Well, I... Oh, no. Mm, let me get it. It's got to be Walt. Yeah? Rick, I just wanted to let you know that Cartwright was behind the whole setup. Printed the stuff right down the basement of the speed messenger service. Rick? Uh, Harold Abernocker speaking. Owner of the largest hog ranch outside of Little Rock. You don't say. Sure, Dad. What's the matter? You need an ear horn or something? Rick, so help me if you don't stop this. My uh, name's Harold, bud. Harold. That's that. That's my name. Now, you just hang on and let you mash your molars with a missus. I don't want to mash my molars with a missus. I want to talk She talks to you. louder than I do. Used to call the hogs herself, you know. Lula Bell? Lula Bell. Howdy. <laughs> Having trouble with your hearing, huh? Now, Helen, listen. Calling me, Harold? No, no, friend. My name's Lulu Bell. Maybe you got the same trouble like my Uncle Zeke. Used to stick a plug of tobacco in his ear overnight and always forgot it. Oh, my God. Yeah, we thought he's plumb deep till I started calling the hogs and it shook the tobacco loose. Now, you just relax and I'll unplug you. Oh, this is ridiculous. Work for Uncle Zeke. Hold on to your teeth. Sweep! Pee, pee, pee. <laughs> Find any loose tobacco? <laughs> he hung up. <laughs> Give me the phone, here. Good old Walt. I'll drive him out of his mind. Fifth Precinct, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt? Oh, no. Now, you listen to well, me. Don't get loud with me, Grouchy. I just called up to find out what happened on the case. Huh? Now, look, I just told well, you... If you don't want to tell me, okay, be a sorehead. I'm not going through that apple knocker routine again. What are you talking about? Lula Bell called Otis all the way in from a stake out in Flatbush. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't want to keep me in on the know, just forget it. Gosh. What's the matter now? Maybe, maybe I did have the wrong number. What a bunch of...
bunch of idiots. Okay, so you had the wrong number. What about the case? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it, it seems that Cartwright yeah, was really the one behind the whole setup. Killed Patty Clark, Sam Farrell's We've got to stay with the happy people. Have your fun, live in the land of joy. Stay with the happy people. Face the sun, life is a Christmas toy. Down through the endless ages, tears have been contagious. And take it from me, that misery is looking around for company. So stay, stay, stay with the happy people. Don't wrinkle your brow, it's strictly out of style. Just stay with the people who love to wear a smile. Helen, is the boss still talking? Wait a minute, Arthur. really had blood in his hands. He's been cleaning yeah, up that he's still talking. for years. Well, I might as well sing another chorus. We've got to stay with the happy people. Have your fun, live in the land of joy. Stay with the happy people. Face the sun, life is a Christmas toy. Down through the endless ages, tears have been contagious. And take it from me, that misery is looking around for company. So stay, stay, stay with the happy people. Don't wrinkle your brow, it's strictly out of style. Just stay, stay, stay with people who love, love, love to wear a smile. We arrived at, Otis says there must have been more than 100,000 in phony bills. We got the plates and everything. You don't say. Yeah, that just about ties it up. Well, Walt, I'm sure glad to have heard all that. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, someone wants to say hello to you. Oh, yeah? just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle, Wilms Herbert, Lucille Meredith, Michael Ann Barrett, Carlton Young, and Frank Gerstle. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards, and the entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. There's more thrill-packed listening for you throughout the week when NBC presents other great adventure mystery dramas. Nightbeat and Dangerous Assignment are two action-filled shows you'll want to make a steady date with every Monday night over most of these NBC stations. Yes, on Monday, travel the nightbeat of the Chicago Star with newsman Randy Stone. There's poignant adventure as Randy searches the city at night for an unusual and intriguing story. Also on Monday, join Brian Donlevy in Dangerous Assignment. As Steve Mitchell, soldier of fortune, Don Levy journeys to the corners of the earth in search of adventure, fortune, and fair play. Yes, now on Monday, hear two great adventure mystery programs, Night Beat and Dangerous Assignment, on NBC. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time, when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Green Gill Theater stars Ginger Rogers tomorrow night on NBC. Now we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'd been eyeing the guy sitting in the back booth for quite a while. Everybody in the cafe tambourine was having a good time but him. He was American, maybe 30, black hair, combed straight back. I thought I'd go back and say hello. He looked like a nice guy until I got close. Then I saw something in his eyes I didn't like. Fear. Hey, what do you want? What's the matter, buddy? Drinking alone, not good for you. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Oh, sure you do, but aren't you hitting the bottle kind of hard? Who are you? I own this place. 
Oh. Oh, then you're Rocky Jordan. That's right. You're, you're an American. Right on two counts. Oh, that's why I came here, Mr. Jordan. This is really an American place, like Chicago or New York. I'm safe here. Safe from what? My name is Lint, Mr. Jordan. I... Hey, maybe you better walk out and get some air. No. He... He's waiting out there. He was following me. I know I saw him. He, he's going to kill me. Kill you? Don't let him kill me, Mr. Jordan. Nobody's going to kill you, Lint. Let's go to the front door and take a look. No. Come on. I'm out ahead of you. Lint acted like a nut that might cause trouble. I took him by the arm and led him up to the front door of the tambourine. Outside, there was nothing but a cabbie and two girls walking up and down. Then suddenly, Lint pulled away from me. Across the street! It's him! I told you! Lint tore back into the tambourine, running for the rear. I headed across the street and into 24 hours I'd never forget. <laughs> On a narrow street not far off Cairo's native quarter stands a Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Trail of the Assassin. He was American. His name was Lint. He was hitting the bottle a little too hard, and he was using my tambourine for a hiding place. The usual formula for trouble. He swore somebody was waiting just across the street to kill him. I got Lint to the door to have a look, but he tore himself away and ran back into the cafe. So I scouted the street alone. All I found was shadows cast by the streetlight. I checked the cabbie parked at the corner. Yes, sir. There was a man waiting a few minutes ago in the shadows. An American? I would not know. He wore a black coat as though he was cold. He kept coughing into a handkerchief. Yes. That was all the cabbie could give me. So I went back into the tambourine. Chris, my bartender, said Lynn had gone out the back way through my office. I don't like wild men running around my place, so I went after him. I just opened the office door when I saw Lynn stumbling toward me from the open alley door. He suddenly fell into my arms, pushing me back into the cafe. Then he slid to the floor, face down. That's when I saw the orange handle of an assassin's knife, pinned between his shoulder blades like a flower. I had Chris lock the doors, then phone police headquarters. Ten minutes later, who should show up but Sergeant Greco? As I see, stabbed in the back. Murder, of course. That's good deduction, Greco. Now, where's Captain Sabaya? Captain Sabaya is in Alexandria. I am in command during in his absence. You mean in charge? The man was killed here in the cafe tambourine? No, out in the back alley. He stumbled in here after. Very well. Where were you, Mr. Jordan, when the man was murdered? Sergeant, I saw it all. I saw it all. There was a fight. This man... Mr. Jordan? That him, he was throwing the man out. The man broke away running. They went to the alley. The poor dead man... Fought his way back toward the light. Thank you, my friend, for this information. I saw it all. I will testify for the usual fee. <laughs> Look, Greco, are you going to take the word of a... For the moment, you may consider yourself in my official custody, Mr. Jordan. You better get it straight. Back in my office. As you wish. Now, there is only one question unanswered. Huh? Only one? Your motive. Why did you kill this man, Lint? You tell me. I advise you to cooperate, Mr. Jordan. Admit, this man was an old enemy of yours from America. You recognized the orange-handled dagger, didn't you, Greco? Of course. It is a type used by the tribe of Singori. That's right. Tribe of Singori, professional assassins. There have been too many murders in Cairo, but those who would wish us to believe the tribe of Singori were the murderers. You will have to do better than that, Mr. Jordan. Why should I want to kill Lint? I've never seen the guy before tonight. Your Americans have a tendency toward violence. Okay. You win, Greco. I killed him. Excellent. Now, we are progressing. You're making a fool of yourself. What? If I was going to kill a man, would I do it right outside my cafe with everybody here? In a rage, yes. And pull him back into the light? Well, uh... would I use a knife? Maybe a forty-five, but no knife, Greco. Uh... Well, go on. Take me now to headquarters. 
You look real good when Captain Sabaya gets back. As Captain Sabaya has done in the past, I hereby release you on your own recognizance. But I assure you, Mr. Jordan, I shall not rest until I have uncovered evidence to bring you to justice. Oh, what a brain. Also, your cafe tambourine will be declared off-limits and closed until this affair is settled to my official satisfaction. That is all, Mr. Jordan. Greco went out and took the names of the witnesses. I told Chris to go on home. In 20 minutes, the cafe was empty. I locked the front door and turned off the overhead lights. There was a spilled drink on the piano. I picked up the glass and set it straight. Sat down. It would be in the papers tomorrow with my picture. All about Lynch's murder in the cafe. It's bad for business. Business? <laughs> there wouldn't be any until Greco pulled down his official stickers. Lynn had been an American. Funny I hadn't thought about home for a long time. Yeah, it had been a real long time. Oh, Lynch. Who was he? Who killed him and why? With Greco putting the pressure on, I knew I'd better find out before everything crashed in on me. Greco would work like a bulldog until he'd hoped something up that would look like evidence. The next morning, I went to Mustafa Bay's shop down on the bazaar. In Cairo, 1950, he was one of the last true artisans making knives. Hempered blades, daggers, cutlasses. Mustafa Bay made them all. He was an old man. He knew everything that had happened in Cairo in the last 60 years. If anyone would, I figured he'd have the answer to the orange-handled dagger. I, Fendi, you wish to buy a blade of truth. Sorry, Mustafa. Oh, Jordan, sir. An old man who has burned his eyes over the forge until even the stars are lost to him. He's sorry that he did not rise to make welcome an old and trusted friend. Oh, thanks, Mustafa. I'll just sit here on the rug beside you. What brings Jordan Bay to the shop of an old man who finds himself as worthless as the moon to men that will not look up? Oh, you're not worthless. For 69 years, Effendi, I have made the finest blades. And my father before me, and his father before him, the same. Now, the pistol. Ah. Well, everything changes, Mustafa. Everything but ashes. Do not hasten to that far place where yours are destined to be found. Hey, look, uh, maybe you can help me. I am a friend. The orange-handled daggers of the tribe of Singori. What do you know about them? The Singori are assassins. Oh, I know that. Ah, yes, they were excellent customers. But the Tsingori were driven into hiding many years ago. Are they still active? It is said the camel may live from its hump. But there comes a time when the camel must drink. You're saying maybe the Tsingori are getting back into harness. You are concerned about the man who was killed with the orange Tsingori dagger at your cafe last night. You knew about that? Even so. If the Singori did it, it doesn't make sense that they leave their calling card. Mustafa is vain of his knives. See, my mark on this one. All artists are proud of their labor, and they mark it with their sign. So the Singori always leave the sign of their work, the orange dagger. Unless... Go on, Mustafa. Unless someone kills and wishes to point to the innocent. Oh, meaning maybe somebody did the killing with a Singori dagger to make it look like the tribe of assassins. All things are possible. Thanks, Mustafa. You've been a big help. Now, the first thing I had to do now was to get a lead on who wanted Lint knocked off. I made a few telephone calls and found Lint's hotel, the Du Nord. I grabbed a cab and was there in ten minutes. Fifty piastres talked the room clerk at the Du Nord out of key 416, the one to Lint's room. I went upstairs. Lint's room was a mess. 
Looked like Greco had been there and taken a close look around. But maybe Greco had overlooked something. He had. Just as I was snapping open Lint's suitcase, a big job with hotel, airline, and steamship stickers from all over the world posted on it, I felt a sudden movement across the room. I started to turn, but it was too late. I felt a rocket sink through my skull, and the rug went black, deep black, for a long, long time. Are you all right now? When the rug began to lighten up, I found I was looking at the ceiling. Isn't that the frame by the ceiling was the face of a woman. Red hair hanging down, almost touching my face. Can you hear me? Green eyes, cool it's against a creamy sure. tan. She was young. There, now, isn't this better? I'm supposed to say, where am I? You're in room 416 at the Hotel du Nord. I don't get around much anymore. Ooh. Here, let me help you up. Oh, thanks. I, uh, I heard a noise in here, and then a man ran out and left the door open. I, I saw that you were hurt. Well, thanks for coming to the rescue, lady. I, um... Was coming to this room anyway. Uh, did you know the man named Lint? I was his wife. His wife? Well, I, I, I just heard about his death a little while ago. The newspapers. I, I don't know what to do. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Your husband was killed in my cafe. Then you're Rocky Jordan. Yes, your picture was in the paper. Didn't you wonder where your husband was last night? He. He stayed out before. Hmm. Did you get a good look at the guy that ran out of this room? Well, it happened so fast. You must remember something. Well, he he was wearing a top coat, a, a slouch hat. I, I couldn't see his face except... Wait. Yes, he was coughing. Top coat, coughing into a handkerchief. You've never seen him before? I don't know. You're not sure, then? We were on a sightseeing tour last week into the native quarter. I... I couldn't say for sure, but we went into a little place. I think I saw him there. What was the name of the place? It was a cafe. Well, do you remember the name? Yes. It was the cafe of the Singori. I told the redhead to sit tight until she heard from me. Then I raced for the elevator. Down in the lobby, I ran into none other than Sergeant Greco. Well, Mr. Jordan. I hope you are not attempting to flee Cairo. I don't go to hotels to catch planes, Greco. Just a reminder. Amut, commandeer the elevator. One moment, Greco. Oh, Sam, oh, am I glad you're back. Oh, Captain Sabaya, you have returned from Alexandria. As you can see. I was told you had followed Jordan to this hotel, Greco. Following me for information, Greco? Jordan, I have just heard of your part in this unfortunate affair. Just an innocent bystander, Sam. Yes, yes, of course. You make it most difficult, Jordan. Things are tough all over. Why are you in this hotel? I heard it has a good rumble band. He came here to enter the room of the murdered man. Have you been upstairs, Jordan? Yeah, I took a look around. You see, Captain Sabile? But Greco here made such a mess of the room, there wasn't much left to see. You are wrong as usual, Mr. Jordan. I made notes concerning the location of all articles, but touched nothing. Awaiting the return of Captain Sabile. You better go take another look. Things have changed since you were up there. Sam and Greco started for the elevators. I went to the hotel desk to ask a question, but I got the wrong answer from the clerk. There must be some mistake. Mr. Lint registered as a bachelor. There was no woman in his room. So, Lint wasn't married. The red-headed girl had lied. She was likely the one that had turned Lint's room upside down, looking for something. And she was likely the one that had tapped me on the head, too. She'd been in the room when I opened the door, hadn't had a chance to leave. She didn't want to get caught there, so she'd sat me. But why had she stayed? She could have run away while I was knocked out. Then it hit me. She'd worked real hard to plant the idea of the coughing man in the black slouch hat, like the one the cabbie had seen across from my tambourine the night before. She'd also mentioned the Cafe of the Singori. Now, there was only one place to go now, deep into the native quarter, to the Cafe of the Singori. Could be a front for the headquarters of the assassin tribe. I passed the beggar at the entrance of the cafe of the Singori. He looked like a beggar, but I had a hunch he was a lookout. The cafe was dark and almost empty. 
I felt the stare of hidden eyes. A native girl was dancing in a small, cleared space. I sat at a table and waited. I didn't have to wait long. Rocky Jordan honors the house of Singori. That puts you one card ahead. You know me, but I don't know you. You the head man around here? I am Haki, a simple waiter, Effendi. Sure, real simple. It is my profession. I have heard many things of you, Mr. Jordan. I hope they are all true. Believe half you see, nothing you hear. Estimable. It is a saying from a book of wisdom. No, a saying from 7th Avenue. Hakim considers it an honor to serve the wise Rocky Jordan. Oh, not so wise. I didn't come here for refreshments, Hakim. Oh? I can see you're real surprised. <laughs> Perhaps Jordan Bay was cared for uh, company at his table. A man was killed in Micah Fay last night, Huckim. How unfortunate. Yeah, he thought so. Name was Lint. Ever heard of him? Englishman? USA. We do not get tourist trade so deep in the native quarter. <laughs> they become fearful before they have penetrated to the Singori. Maybe you know a red-headed woman, about 25, creamy, tan... Green eyes. Ah, that is beyond Hakim's hope of heaven. You had a customer here, maybe a week ago, an American, middle aged, wears a black slouch hat, coughs a lot. Maybe he bought a little uh, service. I do not recall such a man, Effendi. But surely Rocky Jordan knows the day of the tribe of Singori being hired as assassin is in the past. What kind of a knife are you carrying, Hakim? Inside your robe. No, Effendi. Uh, let's take a look. Huh? Yeah, just like I thought. It's necessary for Hakim to protect himself in this low place of employment. Eight-inch dagger. But you will notice, Effendi, the handle. Yeah, it's not orange. As I have said, the day of the assassin, alas, is over. All of you, it is all right. Sure, Hakim, sure. Effendi, listen. I must be careful here. Such a man as you have described has been seen in the quarter. It is said he is a man of great evil. Where can I find this man of great evil? It is said he lives at the Hotel of the Armenian Davos, near the Fountain of Musa. But Hakim does not know if this be true. Hakim would know the truth if it came dressed like the Sphinx. But Hakim knows where the man of evil lives, for sure. Here, Hakim. Oh, Mutashaki, that thing. Give part of that to the dancing girl, will you? She's the only thing in here you can depend on. I had an idea if I was ever going to get my cafe open again, I'd better see the man of evil. I got to the Armenian's hotel by the fountain of Musa about sundown, spread enough foxies on the fly specked front desk to get a straight answer, and walked up to room 237. The room of a man who had registered as Rufus Glanders. So, you are Rocky Jordan. Come in, Mr. Jordan. I've been expecting you. <laughs> You're uh, Rufus Glanders? I am called that. Another American? Uh, San Franciscan. Well, just why are you expecting me, Glanders? Lint was killed in your cafe last night. Well, you get right to the point. I've only been in Cairo a short time, Mr. Jordan. Mm -hmm. But already I've heard much of you. Your tenacity. <laughs> hey, you're a sick man. And a relatively poor one. <laughs> I didn't come here to talk money. Money can be very important. You see, Mr. Jordan, I have used up my monetary reserve in traveling about the world. Yes, I uh, noticed your suitcase down at the foot of the bed. So? People that tour the world usually pick up a lot of stickers for their luggage. <laughs> that reflects middle-class taste. Oh, I don't know. Folks get quite a kick out of it. But your suitcase has just one sticker on it. I know. A view of the Golden Gate Bridge. A sticker from a hotel in San Francisco. The only city in the world. Why should I bother with the rest? So, you're from San Francisco, huh? Yes. Yeah. Ah, there's nothing like that view from Golden Gate Park on top Telegraph Hill in Frisco. Golden Gate Park is nowhere near Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, you're from San Francisco, all right. But that still doesn't explain why you're expecting me. I've heard much of you. And since Lint was killed at your place last night, and since the killer has not been apprehended, I thought you might contact me. <laughs> why should that follow? My reasoning for traveling all over the world on the little money that remained to me was to catch up with Lint. And kill him. Maybe Captain Sabaya down at police headquarters would like to hear your story. Police got an idea I did Lint in. That's absurd. Last night, the cabbie outside my cafe spotted you waiting there to kill Lint. Yeah. I was there. At the end of a 6,000-mile search, I found him. I thought I could kill him. But I couldn't. You nailed him out back. No. If I had been able to kill Lint, I would have entered your cafe and accomplished it in the open. You see, Mr. Jordan... My life means nothing to me now. I have only a little time left. And Lint took everything that mattered to me when he left San Francisco. My money. My wife. Your wife has red hair. Beautiful red hair. I don't know about your story now, Glanders. But from where I stand, it looks like your wife's trying to put the finger on you. But you seen her? She practically led me to you. Oh, uh, Mr. Jordan. Stop stalling, Glanders. We're taking a trip to headquarters. Ah, Mr. Jordan, get back. Come on, Glanders. I shot behind the window. Sorry. I whirled toward the window that opened onto a fire escape. I dive for the floor. A knife. Coming through a knife. Getting down the fire escape. He won't stick around. Be careful, Mr. Jordan. Oh, yeah, I see him now. Running down the street. Who is it? Well, you're lucky to be asking. That knife was for you, Glanders. Went into the sofa right up to the orange handle. But who threw it? Who was he? A guy named Hakim. A guy who's got a lot of answers. Answers? But it's too late to follow. No, we don't have to. I know just where you and I are going to find him. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns with the ending to tonight's story. What is the war news today? Whatever it is, you want to help, don't you? Well, you can do something very important. You can contribute a pint of your blood every three months through Red Cross. Again, Red Cross is the official agency to collect blood for the armed forces when and wherever needed. That need is now. We must build up a blood reserve. And we must continue to take care of the day-by-day -day needs of our community. If you are a normally healthy person between the ages of 21 and 60... Will you call your local Red Cross and make an appointment for a blood donation? Call your local Red Cross. We return you now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. I headed out of the hotel room with Rufus Glanders in tow. Outside, we caught a cab and directed the driver deep into the native quarter to the Café of the Singori. The native watcher was still at the door as we went inside. This time I didn't take a table, but barreled on through into the back. That's where I surprised Hakim in a small cube-like room. Ah? Oh, you... You are on us again, Jordan, sir. Breathing kind of heavy, aren't you, Hakim? It's been a most exceptional evening for business, Jordan, sir. Hell, bet. Uh, you know my friend here. I have never set eyes on this rascal before. As he says, Effendi, we have not met. Now you forget fast. <laughs> Who hired you to put a dagger into Lent's back, Hakim? <laughs> Very funny joke. Was it the woman with red hair? I do not understand. Be careful, Jordan. You... I hope you know what you're doing. It was the red-headed woman, wasn't it, Hakim? She paid you to kill Lint. She also paid you to put me on the trail of Glanders here. So I'd go to him and be caught there when you slipped a dagger into him, too. I was to be the fall guy. What manner of lie is this? She knew the police were already suspicious of me. And that'd be the payoff. Rocky Jordan. Caught alone in a room with another dead American. <laughs> Your funny story makes me laugh. Eh, maybe this will make you laugh, Hakim. I think the woman's here in this cafe right now. No. 
She is not. I'm so sure I'm going to call Captain Sabaya and have him search the place. No, you cannot do that. He'll make her talk. You know what she'll say, Hakim? She'll say, I paid Hakim the assassin 100 pounds to knife Lint and another 100 to kill Glanders. No! No lies! Careful, Gordon. He's dangerous. Hakim the assassin. No, she will not tell me! Hakim took off like he knew where he was going. And he did. Before I could move, I heard a noise in the hallway and a woman stumbled into the room. It was the redhead. And she was wearing an orange corsage pinned over her heart. The orange handle of a Singori dagger. Just then, Captain Sam Sabaya came in with about ten men. One of them had Hakim by the neck. Oh, let me go, go, let me go. Hey, you got the right man, Sam. The woman is dead. Yes, she's dead. How'd you get here? My son had always followed you to trouble, Jordan. Well, she was asking for it, Sam. She was hiding out here. I'd spotted her in Lint's hotel room, and she had the idea that Flanders here was after her to kill her. Flanders? Who is he? I was her husband. She hired Hakim. No! no, To no. kill Lint and Flanders. When I got mixed up in it, it looked like a good idea to make me the fall guy. I will have to have more information. Well, this is a good time for you to talk, Flanders. Well, <coughs> When Lint left San Francisco, he took nearly all my money, ruined my business. He took my wife with him, too. I followed them all over the world. I was going to kill them. But when I caught up with them here in Cairo, I found I couldn't kill. I also learned that Lint had thrown her out without a dime. Reason enough for a woman to hire an assassin to kill him, Sam. She probably got the lead of the Singori in a sightseeing tour. Well, you were lucky, Glanders. You were next on her list. She was going to make sure you didn't catch up with her. Lucky? I suppose. I put the pressure on Hakim here, and he killed his client so she wouldn't be able to testify against No, him. Jordan, no. That's when you walked in, sir. Jordan, is it possible that you will ever leave the matter of justice to those in authority? Oh, hold it, Sam. Greco was out to get me. Greg? Oh, yes, yes. Now, I shall discuss this with him. Then I can open up the tambourine? At once, if you so desire. But I didn't so desire. I headed back to the cafe with Rufus Glanders, but I just didn't feel like opening up. It was kind of late, and we sat down at the bar, and I mixed a couple of drinks. Uh, delicious drink, Jordan. Thanks, Glanders. May I propose a toast to the United States? And to those of us who can never return. Why can't you go home? The matter of Lynch's theft? He juggled books in the firm, making me appear to be a criminal. It was a personal matter. One which I do not care to explain. So you can't go back? No. I can't go back. That's tough. You know San Francisco? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a cafe there once. Looking down on the Embarcadero, night, with the soft lights of the ships floating up to you through the fog. Cable cars, fishermen's war. Post Street. Forest Park. Forest Park? But that's in St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Jordan, written tonight by Gilbert Thomas, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jay Novello as Sam Sabaya, and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music composed and played by Richard Arant. John Jacobs speaking, Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Starring George Raft, we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'm Rocky Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. 
It's been said out this way. Love strikes the speech dumb. The ear's deaf. The eye's blind. Yeah, I've seen it happen. It's what you might call really losing your head over a dame. The Café Tambourine. Crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, cheats. Forgotten men down on their luck. The lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's transcribed Rocky Jordan story, Valley of the Dead. Remember me? Chris, the barkeep at the tambourine. Also the general dispenser of information. Yeah. Yeah, Rocky Jordan and me have been buddies for years. And usually things go kind of smooth between us. Not always, though. I'm thinking of that Valley of the Dead deal when the blow-up between us sounded like the echo of an A-bomb. And, well, listen. It was one of those quiet evenings around the cafe when it began... The crowd had thinned out, and a sad-faced legionnaire sat at the bar, staring into his half-empty glass of wine. A few locals were scattered around, lapping up some arak, and in the back booth, one of the more handsome young guides around Cairo was whispering into the ear of a sweet-faced tourist, and she was giggling. Then Rocky came in. Call me one, Chris. Uh, anything wrong? Call me one. Yeah. Oh, sure thing, right? You, um, been for a walk? Yeah, I've been for a walk. Well, was wondering. Hey, yeah. Uh, Rock, you drink? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Things have been kind of slow tonight. I was thinking maybe we could close up early. Julie's coming by. You two getting sort of serious? <laughs> yeah, I... Uh-uh. A couple of cops just come in heading this way. Good evening, Jordan Bay. Oh, hello, boys. We are looking for someone. A man wearing a dark suit. We thought perhaps he might have come in here a few moments ago. Mm, haven't seen him. Sorry. No, no, nobody come in the last few minutes except... What's happened, boys? There was a shooting at a small hotel several blocks from here. Oh, shooting, huh? Anybody get hurt? We are certain the man in the dark suit was wounded. We picked up his trail. Lost him near here in the native quarter. Oh, that's too bad. Yes. Thank you, Jordan Bay. Come along, Amit. I'm going back to the office. Close up whenever you want. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I watched Rocky as he walked to his office. He opened the door, took just one step inside, and then fell flat on his face. I got over there on the double, locked the office door, and hauled Rocky to the couch. And that's when I saw it. The blood trickling down his hand. I put in a fast call to a doc who would keep his mouth shut, and while he was patching up the rock shoulder, I went out and closed up the cafe. A half hour later, when I got back to the office, the doc was gone, and Rocky was all business. Chris, you know a gent named Brizak? Brizak? Bri... Bri... No, no. How about a guy named Fabian? Risto Fabian. Well, do you? Uh, no. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. For a minute there, I thought maybe I'd heard the name someplace before. I guess not. Here. Take a look at this. Check, huh? Yeah, 20,000 pounds. Boy, that's... Hey, Rocky, this check is... It's made out to you. I thought you didn't know Fabian. Well, I don't. Then why would he write you a check for 20,000? Look, I don't know. Honest, Rock. Say, does this have anything to do with what happened back at the hotel? Yeah, but we don't have time for all that now. You got to get out of here. Lay low for a few days. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't argue. Here's 50 pounds. Get moving. Not until you tell Look, me what... You said you didn't know Brezak. You don't know Fabian. All right, I'll take your word for it. Now you take mine. Beat it. Now listen, Rocky. And don't take your fiat. You'll be spotted too easily. Uh, it's probably Julie. She must have come around the alley. I'll get it. Hello, Rocky. Come on in, Julie. Sorry I'm late, Chris. Oh, hello, baby. 
Well, what's the matter, Doc? Oh, ask him. You two boys been having a quarrel? Out of the blue, just like that. Get out of town, he tells me. What? Well, Rocky, what is this? Well, if you want your boyfriend to stay alive, you better tell him to do as I say. Where's the Fiat, Julie? Well, parked out front. Leave it there. Here, take the keys to my car. Get Chris up to Dave Amunia's place. I'm going to walk down the police headquarters and have a talk with Sam Sabaya. Oh, Mr. Jordan. What's on your mind? I'd like to have a little chat with you. Sorry, I have an appointment. My name is Fabian. Mr. Fabian. Fabian? That changes things. I thought it would. Get in. Okay. I've been sightseeing here before, so don't knock yourself out. Mr. Jordan, why did you go to that hotel tonight? Brizak's invitation was extended only to your bartender. I know, but Chris wasn't around when Brizak's messenger showed up. So I was asked to pass along the invitation. Which you did not do. That's right. Knowing Brizak as I do, I couldn't uh, resist going myself. The fact that the messenger mentioned 20,000 pounds, that had something to do with it, too? You think I'm trying to cut in? That is exactly what I think. Suit yourself. Fabian, what is this all about? All I got from Brizak was double talk. And a bullet in the shoulder. He resented the fact that I took the check from him. I shall only have to write another one. Really, Mr. Jordan, it is a simple business deal. I wish to pay Chris for information which he has acquired. I'm not convinced. If you ask me, that check was just a come on to get Chris and Brizak together so that killer of yours could do his work quietly. Mr. Jordan, if you are as concerned over Chris's welfare as you seem to be, you will do as I say. For the police would like to know more of a certain death which occurred here in Cairo a month ago. A man named Griswold was murdered. A geologist. I read about it. The killer got away in a small car, a yellow Fiat. That wasn't in the papers. Neither was this. Brzezak arrived a few moments after the killing. He heard someone running out the back door, saw the yellow Fiat race away into the night. Brzezak fired after the car, succeeded in breaking one of the tail lights. That's quite a story, Fabian. It happened. You can ask your friend Chris. But I doubt if he would admit that he was the one who murdered Griswold. Oh, we seem to have driven right back to your cafe. You can let me off here. But I thought you had an appointment. I've changed my mind. Yes, I can appreciate your dilemma. Oh, there is the yellow fiat. I suggest you examine the tail light closely. Good night, Mr. Jordan. Jordan. What? Oh, uh, it's you, Sam. Admiring the little yellow car? What are you doing here? Waiting for you. What happened at the hotel tonight? What hotel? Jordan, when my men spoke to you in the cafe earlier this evening, they were not fooled. However, they thought it wise to confer with me before taking any steps. I don't know what you're talking about, Sam. Brezak, the shooting in the hotel room. What were you doing there, Jordan? And what is your connection with this man, Fabian? Fabian? Yes, Fabian. You never heard of him, eh? You stepped out of his car a few moments ago. Well, what have you to tell me, Jordan? Sam, I'm kind of confused. I can't tell you anything. Jordan, already there has been violence. I cannot allow... I can't tell you anything now, and nothing's going to make me, Sam. You'll have to give me some time. Jordan, tell me. Are you protecting someone? Or yourself? A little of each, maybe. Don't press me, Sam. I won't give. Very well, Jordan. I shall bide my time. But if there is any further violence, I shall hold you personally responsible. Sure. Now, tell me something, Sam. Who is this Fabian guy? Risto Fabian. Bachelor, age 52, found of horses and American women. Citizen of Greece. Permanent residence, Athens. You seem to know a lot about him. He is not an unimportant man, Jordan. Have you ever heard of the Valley of the Dead? Sounds familiar. A great stretch of land in a country to the east, owned by Mr. Fabian, and now on lease to the Egyptian government. On lease? Oil? Oil. Thanks, Sam. I think you've given me something to go on. 
Jordan, after all, I am only a government clerk. And this is all I know about the matter. Griswold was hired by the government to do a survey on the Valley of the Dead to determine if the land had further oil potential. According to his report, it did not. So the government has decided not to renew the lease, which expires in a few months. And Griswold expired too, after he made the survey. Why? Do not ask me. I have lived long enough to know the value of minding my own business. The wells are played out and the lease is dropped. Fabian is left with a lot of worthless land and no income. Yes. What's missing, Allie? You don't go gunning for a guy who's supposed to have some information if what he's got isn't worth anything. What? Gunning? Allie, how can I get my hands on a copy of Griswold's report? Griswold's house, perhaps, if there is anything left of his belongings. Or perhaps the girl who worked for him, uh, Miss Ware, Julie Ware. Julie? You know her. Yeah. Thanks, Allie. Night. Good night. Rocky, look out! Look out! Rocky! You are listening to tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, starring Mr. George Rapp. Dr. Christian's unique success with his patients is due as much to his keen understanding of people as to medicine. Every Wednesday evening on CBS, Gene Hirschholt stars as kindly Dr. Christian of River's End, bringing you stories full of warm understanding. Listen for Dr. Christian for another drama of real life, your next program over most of these same CBS stations. Now we take you back to Cairo in tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Valley of the Dead. The shots from the moving car tore some big holes in the front of Ali's house, but none of them caught the rock. He'd spotted the car, dove for cover. Well, he picked himself up knowing full well it had been Fabian and Brizak. And ten minutes later, he walked into a low-slung apartment building, not far from the tambourine. First thing he caught was the low wail of a sax. He listened for a minute, and it took him back. But then it stopped, and he walked down to room 212 and knocked. He tried again, and a door came open. But it was the one at the next apartment. And standing framed in the archway was a redhead with a neckline that looked like it was diving for pearls. Hello. Hello. Looking for Julie? Yeah. Friend of hers? In a way. Want to come in and wait? She might be back soon. Well, thanks. Maybe I will. Mona Clark, USA. You're an American, too, aren't you? Uh Uh-huh. Rocky Jordan. (laughs) Shake. It's not that I don't like far-off places. You just want to see something familiar once in a while. Yeah, I know the feeling. I've got a pot of coffee fixed. Want some? You got enough. Plenty. I'll get right away. Where are you from, Rocky? I mean, in the beginning. St. Louis. Good town. New Orleans myself. Been there? Well, lots of times. (laughs) Do they still serve coffee and donuts in the French market? They did when I left. Gee, I miss it. Well, home next month. Never no more to roam. Until next time. Here. You and Julie pretty good friends? Pretty good. I'm trying to find out about a fellow named Griswold. Griswold? Definitely a meatball. One of those guys who live on a steady diet of vitamins. Always with the play. Yeah, I get the picture. Julie worked for him, you know. He's been up here a couple of times. Julie's boyfriend caught up with him here once. And knocked him down the stairs. Tall, sandy hat fellow named Chris. Now, that's the one. I thought he'd kill Griswold. He was so sore. Of course, Griswold never bothered me. He knew I'd wrap him with my sacks. Sacks? Was that you playing just now? Uh-huh. 
First sax, Billy Baxter's all-girl orchestra, world tour. Give a listen. Life? Mm, very good. How about this? Oh, now tell me something. What kind of work was Julie doing for Griswold? He did an oil survey on a place called uh, the Valley of the Dead or something. She typed up all the reports for him. I see. Julie uses Chris Yella Fiat quite a bit, doesn't she? Uh huh. Why? Just wondering. Thanks, Mona. Leaving? I. I'd like to finish that song for you sometime. Don't worry, baby. You'll get a chance to. Chris. Hi. What are you doing back at the cafe? You're supposed to be up at Dave Amunia's place. I'm not going any place until you tell me what you found out. All right. As near as I can make out, it goes like this. Risto Fabian thinks you killed Griswold. For information about the Valley of the Dead. Oh, Rocky, you don't believe that, do you? No, but Fabian does, and that's why Breeze acts gunning for you. Chris, where's Julie? Well, staying with a friend at the island house in Bullock. Is she in trouble, too? More than she knows. What do you mean? Chris, how did the taillight get broken on your Fiat? What's that got to do with it? Answer me. Well, I did... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, Julie had the car that day. She said some kids broke it throwing stones. Sure. Chris, I'm going to tell you something you're not going to like. But I wouldn't say it unless I thought it was true. Well, go ahead. I'm listening. I think Julie's the one who killed Griswold. Rocky. It's lousy, I know. But it all fits. She typed Griswold's report on the Valley of the Dead. She's in the know. She drove your car that night. Not you. Don't you see you're playing a fall guy for a double-crossing, two-timing... Rocky, I'm... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit you. Forget it. But that doesn't change what I think. I'm going over to Bullock's seat, Julie. No, you're not. You go wandering around, you'll pick up a bullet. I'm going, Rock. You're not going to stop me. I guess I'll have to. <laughs> Cairo Police, Captain Sabaya. Sam, Rocky. Yes, George. I just caught my bartender, Chris, dipping into the safe. I want him locked up. Hello, Julie. Oh, Rocky. Can I come in? Well, I... Packing? Yes, vacation. I thought I'd go up to Karnak for a few days. Kind of sudden, isn't it? What's that big envelope in your suitcase? Oh, nothing. Just something I'm going to mail. Oh, let me see. Rocky! Oh, addressed to Julie Ware. American Express. Athens, Greece. Oh, I thought you said you were going to Karnak. Well, I... Fabian lives in Athens, doesn't he? What's inside of this, Julie? Leave it alone. You have no right to open it. Yeah, I know I haven't. Well... Griswold's report on the Valley of the Dead. This report any different from the one the government got? No. Give that to me. Take it easy. The other report said there was no oil in the Valley of the Dead. This one says there is. Give it to me. This is the correct one, isn't it? This is why you killed Griswold. Uh, Rocky. Yeah. Don't be angry with me. You don't understand how big this is. I don't. All right. Let's work it out. Griswold did the survey on the land, found oil, and prepared this report. He was about to send it in, and I got smart, Rocky. I stopped him. What good would it do him to have the government pick up the options on Fabian's land? But if Griswold made a deal with Fabian to turn in a false report... The government would drop the option. Fabian would get his land back. Yes. Oil's worth a lot these days to a lot of different people and countries. Price is high. Fabian could make a fortune. So Griswold went for your idea. Yes. Fabian went for the idea, too. 
because he'd already been approached by a representative of a foreign power. But that's when Griswold began to act like an idiot. He said he'd settle for 20,000 pounds. <laughs> 20,000 pounds. That's less than $50,000. Fabian stood to make millions. So you and Griswold talked it over, and he ended up with a letter opening his back. You all saw for the right report. Then you contact Fabian yourself and make a new deal. Yes, Rocky. And it can still be done. You and me, we can hit Fabian hard. A partnership and a billion-dollar business. Where's Chris? In a nice, safe place. Why don't you get him out where it's not so safe? Fabian thinks he's the one who killed Griswold and knows about the oil. It'll be over in a minute. Fabian will go back to Athens satisfied. And then what? The day before the option comes due, you and I take a trip to Athens to see Fabian. We'll have partnership papers all drawn up. Fabian will have to sign them. It'll be too late for anything else. What do you say, Rocky? Lady, you're a louse. Rocky, what are you doing? Phoning the police. Oh, no, you're not. Put down that poker. Oh, your shoulder hurts, doesn't it? Oh. So long, stupid. What? Do not let my gun startle you, my dear. Uh, Fabian. Hey, may I come in? I have been following you, Mr. Jordan, for at length I have devised a method for bringing Chris, uh, shall I say, into the range of Brizak's gun. Chris is out of reach, Fabian. He is in jail. I know. You will telephone Captain Sabaya and tell him you made a mistake. Tell him to release Chris. So Brizak can be picked off coming out of the station? Yes. He's standing across the street from police headquarters now, waiting. Let him wait. Mr. Jordan, you will take the phone and do as I say. Sure, I'll take it. There. But... You pulled it out of the wall. That's right, and you can't find much use for it now. Mr. Jordan. Go on, pull the trigger. That'll get you nothing. Mr. Fabian. Yes, my dear? I know how to get Chris out of jail. If it would be any help to you. And why should you want to help me? Because I'm afraid you'll be angry with me. Through no fault of my own. All this and no music? Why should I be angry with you, my dear? Because I have this. Look, I believe this is something you want. Well, Griswold's original report on the value of the dead. Where did you get this? Chris gave it to me to hold for him. She's lying, Fabian. Silent. My dear, have you read this document? Oh, good heavens, no. It's full of such technical language I wouldn't understand it for a minute. Fabian, you're not going to go for this, are you? Chris doesn't know anything about this report. He didn't kill Griswold. She did. Oh, how can you say that, Mr. Jordan? Oh, he's lying, Mr. Fabian, to protect his friend. Yes, my dear, I understand. Tell me, how would you get Chris out of jail? Well, Chris and I have been quite friendly. It would be a simple matter for me to bail him out. Uh, excellent. My car is downstairs. Mr. Jordan, you will drive. I shall sit by you with my gun in your side. Come, let's get started. <laughs> Slow down, Jordan. This is as close to the police headquarters as I want to be. Stop there by the alleyway. Razak is just... Yeah, I see him. Razak! Razak! Yes, Mr. Fabian? This charming young lady here will go into the police station after our men. They will come out together, but she is not to be harmed. I understand, Mr. Fabian. She will not be harmed. Mr. Fabian, I think it might be better if I came out of the police station a few moments before Chris. So Mr. Brezak doesn't shoot me by mistake. An excellent precaution, my dear. Everything is clear, then? Yes, quite clear. Brezak. I know. She is to die also. Correct. Now take up your position across the street. Uh, we will time it to pick you up as soon as you have fired. Well, as you can see, a lot was going on while I cooled off in the Cairo jail. The first thing I knew about anything was when Julie suddenly showed up and bailed me out. Then, while I was picking up my wallet and things at the desk, she waltzed out the front door ahead of me. Well, that struck me kind of odd. I moved after, out the front door, and started down the steps. 
And that's when all Hades broke loose. A black convertible up the street took off with a sudden jerk. First jump in the ground! It was Rocky's voice, and I didn't ask any questions. Slugs him across the street, sail over my head, and then I saw Rocky behind the wheel of the car, and the joker beside him almost went through the windshield as Rocky grabbed the back of his neck and shoved him. With his other hand, he yanked the wheel of the car, headed right to the spot where the gunman stood frozen in his tracks. Chris, grab Julie. Don't let her get away. Well, by then, I didn't need anybody to draw me a picture. I caught up with Julie halfway up the block and hauled her back. Captain Zabaya and a flock of cops had piled out of headquarters and taken over. And when Rocky got through talking, they had it all. A little later, Rocky, Sabai, and me were heading along the street on the way to the tambourine. I uh, guess I did it up good this time, huh, Rock? Oh, forget it, Chris. No, no, I don't want to forget it. I played the prize, though. Um, I'm sorry. I apologize. Well, it's nothing to apologize over, Chris. It's one of those things that happened. You're all in it right, Chris. It happened. Why? Nobody knows. But nonetheless, it does. So many men, one time or another, are attracted by women of evil. You trying to tell us something, Sam? Well, as a matter of fact, Jordan, when I was a younger man, there was a dancer from Algiers who... Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you too, huh? Yeah, thanks, Captain. I'll uh, turn off here, Rock, and go on home. See you at opening time as usual? Sure. See you then. He will be all right, Jordan. Do not concern yourself over him. Sure, Sam. He'll be all right. <sighs> Observe, Jordan. A new day. The city of Cairo awakes. Yeah, and the tourists will be pouring out on the streets before long. And already the vendor is striving to attract them to his shop. Ah, Jordan. Listen. The call of the East. What? What is that? <laughs> that, Sam, is the call of the West. Excuse me, Sam. I'll see you around. Our star, Mr. George Raff, returns in just a moment. The flood victims of Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Illinois are depending on you. Those whose lives have been jeopardized, whose homes have been destroyed, urgently need your assistance. The President of the United States has asked the American public to contribute at least $5 million through the local chapters of your American Red Cross for the relief of these citizens. So it's up to you. Give generously through your local Red Cross chapter. Help the flood victims. They need you. Now, here again is the star of our show, Mr. George Raft. Thank you. Well, Julie was quite a doll. Tall, big brown eyes, honey-colored hair. As far as Chris was concerned, she was out of this world. The law being what it is, she soon will be. Well, see you next week at the Tambourine. Until then, Saida... Rocky Jordan stars Mr. George Raft with Anthony Barrett as Chris and Jay Novello as Sam Zabaya. Also heard in tonight's cast were Donald Morrison, Gene Bates, Ted Osborne, and Gloria Blondell. Our original music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Production and direction by Cliff Howell. Rocky Jordan is written by Larry Roman and Adrian John Doe. Bob Lamont speaking. This transcribed program came to you over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue.
Kellogg speaking. Oh, uh, first off, today being Thursday and things being the way they are, I want to thank my Aunt Beulah for sending me those pork chops from Barlow, Kentucky. She doesn't know it, but she's made me the most sought-after man in town. Oh, well, next week, spinach. Anyway, to get back to business, I didn't know that my old friend, Judge Robert March, was having a cocktail party the afternoon I dropped by his place to say hello. But as I walked into the patio, (laughs) I was Richard the Glad Rogue. My old friend, the judge, introduced me to an amber-eyed blonde who answered to the name of Pamela Leeds. And I smartly opened the conversation by saying, Hello. Oh, Judge March, do you mean to tell me that this is the famous Richard Rowe, the investigator? <laughs> I know it's disappointing, Pamela, dear, but nevertheless, <laughs> that's the rogue. Oh, really? You're not really disappointed, are you, Miss Leeds? You're just amazed that a man who has done so many brilliant things could be so young and uh, handsome. Of course. Well, I can see that you don't need me, Richard. I think I'll go and circulate among my other guests. I'm sure that the two of you will never miss me. See you later, Judge. Thanks. You can believe almost anything he says, Pamela, unless it's about himself or you. (laughs) Thanks for the tip, Judge. Oh, uh, would you like to take a walk around the garden? There's a bench under a weeping willow tree over there by the wall that always makes me feel very poetic. Oh, I hate to miss that, really, but I was just leaving. I have to leave, really. Oh, you do? Oh. Well, uh, how are you going to leave? You have a car here? No. No, the judge was going to send me home in his car. Well, that's silly. Oh, yes, especially when I'm going out that way, right past your house, as a matter of fact. I'll drive you home. (laughs) Were you really going out my way? Of course. Well, then... I'll go with you. Oh, that's swell. Oh, uh, incidentally, where do you live? Well, Pamela, this has been a kind of a short date. I I hope I get a rain check on that bench under the tree. <laughs> I have a lot of fascinating statements I'd like to make to you. Oh, we'll see each other again, won't we, Richard? Mm, how about tomorrow night? It's Sunday, you know. <laughs> Great night, Sundays. Mm-hmm. The moon will be full. There's dining and dancing at the Macombo. And... Oh, Pamela. Dr. Stevens. Uh, what's the matter? Is Father... Pamela, we've been trying to reach you. Yes? You better come with me, Pamela. Your father is dead. <laughs> Well, that's how it all began. We'll continue in just a moment. But now, here's Jim Doyle. I'd like to make a suggestion to the ladies. I'll bet you've often felt like singing the blues after you've shampooed your hair. The shampoo blues is a well-known theme. I've just washed my hair and can't do a thing with it. Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is just the thing to dispel those blues. For when you use Fitch's saponified shampoo, your hair is so lustrous and easy to manage... You'll be singing praises rather than the blues. It's made from pure vegetable and mild coconut oils, so it never leaves your hair dry and difficult to manage. It makes oceans of lather, too, that cleanses completely. Fitch's saponified shampoo also contains a special patented rinsing agent. Even when you rinse with hard water, this rinsing agent ensures that no soapy film is left on your hair. It leaves your hair shimmering with natural highlights. You can use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo as often as you like, with absolutely no fear of the shampoo blues. Ask for it at your drug or toilet goods counter. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I'm fairly familiar with death in most of its forms. And maybe familiarity with a man with a scythe breeds contempt. But I felt awfully sorry for Pamela Leeds when her father, Ansel Leeds, died. I was more than ordinarily interested when my friend Judge Robert March called me the evening after Leeds' death and asked me to come to his office. Uh, Richard, 
I am the executor of Anson Leeds' estate, and I think there's something strange about his will. Eh? Yeah? Uh, this is, of course, uh, confidential. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he left the great bulk of his estate to a nephew, his sister's child, Peter Moore, with only a $50,000 legacy for Pamela, and the rest of the estate going to the servants and various charities. Oh, only 50000 to Pamela, huh? You think that's a little strange? I've been Anson Leeds' attorney, and I think his closest friend for 30 years. Rogue, I know how fond he was of Pamela, but... Uh-huh. Uh, 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 Pamela was not his daughter, you know. Uh, she was adopted by Anson just before his wife died 20 years ago. Oh, legal adoption, huh? Uh, yes, and I'm in a position to know that uh, Anson couldn't have loved Pamela any more if she had been his own daughter. Uh, as a matter of fact... I drew up a will for him about uh, six years ago in which he left almost all of his money to Pamela with other small legacies to relatives and servants and charities. Was the old gentle little flighty in his last years? No, sound as a dollar. Extremely bright right up to the last. And, Rogue, uh, there was no change in the way he felt about Pamela. I know that. But I cannot understand this new will. When was it made? What's the date on it? Uh, Just a year ago this month. Uh, here it is. Mm. Oh, I see. Uh, typed. Is this signature genuine? Oh, of course. There can be no doubt of that. I know that fancy Spencerian signature as well as I know my own. I realize, Rogue, that I'm giving you a problem here that is based on nothing more than a personal hunch. But I would never be at ease about administering the estate if I didn't have the will thoroughly checked. Uh-huh. Well, let's see. This, uh, this will mentions only... Peter Moore, that's the nephew. Mm-hmm. Pamela Leeds. Uh, Kate Schumann, 5,000. Oh, uh, Anson's nurse. Uh, been with him for, oh, six or seven years. A fine woman. And Fred Kraft? Uh, Anson's gardener. Uh, been with him, oh, 15 years, I guess. They, uh, the nurse and the gardener, uh, witnessed the will, as you'll notice. I want to retain you to investigate that will for me, Rogue. Oh. Well, Judge, uh, ordinarily I hold my clients up for a fee. But for you, Judge, uh, oh, I guess I could toss you a couple of packing tickets. Richard, this is very important to me. Will you handle it for me? Well, of course, Judge. Now, first, uh, looks like my first move is to go out to the Leeds estate and talk with the witnesses. See under what circumstances this document was written and signed. I'll see you later, Judge. <laughs> How do you do? I wonder if I could see Kate Schumann. I'm Kate Schumann. Oh, I'm Richard Rogue. The uh, investigator? Uh, yes. What do you want to see me about? Well, Miss Schumann, I... Oh, uh, could we go someplace where we could talk privately? Of course. My quarters are upstairs. Richard Rogue. Oh, hello, Pamela. What in the world are you doing here? Well, I just came by to uh, talk with Miss Schumann. Well, I didn't know you knew her. He doesn't. No, we uh, just met. I'll see you later, Pam. All right. Stop by the library on your way out, will you? Oh, sure. Right in here, Mr. Rogue. Thank you. Now, Mr. Rogue. I uh, came to talk with you about the will which you witnessed for Anson Leeds about a year ago. Oh, oh, cigarette? No, thank you. I don't smoke, but I don't mind if you do. Thank you. Uh, tell me, Miss Schumann, uh, who typed the will? I'll tell you the whole story. Mr. Leeds called me in one morning and asked me to do some typing for him. I often type letters and business things for him. Yes? I got my portable typewriter, and before he started dictating, he made me promise that I'd never mention the fact that he'd made a new will until after he'd passed on. Then he dictated the will to me. I see. Did he seem in good mental health at the time? He was perfectly normal. I was a little surprised at his terms. I mean, the way he left the money. And he could tell that I was. He just told me that he had good and sufficient reasons for doing it the way he did. And asked me to witness his signature. Uh Uh-huh. Then he asked me to get the gardener, Fred Kraft, to come in and witness it. I did. He, uh, he signed the will in the presence of both you and Fred Kraft? Yes. Hmm. Do you know Peter Moore? 
I've seen him here a few times on visits. I don't know him. Will he be here for the funeral? Yes, he's on his way here now. On his way here? He lives in another town? He lives in Garden City, Iowa, with his mother. She was Mr. Leeds' older sister. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Schumann. Who uh, asked you to investigate the will, Mr. Rogue? I can't tell you that, except that it was an interested party. Well, everything happened just the way I said it did. I'm sorry to see Miss Pamela left with so little money. I'm very fond of her. Well, it certainly looks like everything was according to Hoyle. Thanks for talking so frankly with me, Miss Schumann. You've been a great help. I'll just check with Fred Kraft and you can forget the whole thing. I didn't expect to see you out here today, Mr. Rowe. Well, I didn't expect to be here, Pamela. Judge Marsh asked me to drop by and do him a little favor, that's all. Uh... Oh, excuse me. It must be Peter. Certainly. Hello, Peter. Hello, Pamela. I guess there isn't much I can say, is there, Pamela? I know, Peter. Where's your mother? Didn't she come with you? No, you know, Mother. She was very upset. She just couldn't make it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is my cousin, Peter Moore, Mr. Rogue. Hello. How do you do? Mm, I think I'd better run along, Pamela. I want to talk to your gardener. Name's Kraft, isn't it? Uh, Fred Kraft. He'll be in his cottage. It's out and back. It's a little white cottage. He's probably asleep by now. Mr. Kraft? Mr. Kraft? Mr. Kraft? Oh, good Lord. Hello, Evan. Richard Rogue. No kidding. Cook up some more business for me, Rogie? Oh, well, you know me, Evan. The Anson Leeds estate this time. The Leeds gardener was just chopped to death with a hand axe while he was asleep. Better get your boys and get out here. Hello? Judge Marge, Richard Rogue. Yes? Now, uh, Judge... Get that will to a handwriting expert. I think it's a phony. Oh, well, uh, well have you any evidence that... Now, did... now, now, Judge, this isn't the court. This time, I've got a hunch, that's all. One of the witnesses, the gardener, has just been chopped to death. Now, get an expert on that will and tell him we'll call him for a report on the signature tonight. And you'd better come out here. One of the things I like about you, Rogie, the corpses you find are always so dead. Oh, I see what you mean, Irvin. Say, from the looks of this room, the late Fred Kraft put up quite a row, didn't he, huh? Uh-huh. But not enough of a row to get out of that couch he was lying on when he got that first blow with the axe. Let's shake the joint down, shall we? Uh-huh. Why was he killed? Well, all I have is a theory. I don't want anybody in the house to know that. Uh, he was one of the witnesses on a will made by Anson Leeds. The uh, will is in question. Mm, I get it. You think he might have been put out of the way to keep him from testifying as to the validity of the will, eh? That's my theory. Oh. And there's something that might back it up a little. What? Look. There on the floor. Yeah? Stub of a plane ticket. Hmm. From Garden City, Iowa. You sound like Garden City means something to you. Come on, no tricks, Rogie. What's with Garden City? That's the town where Leeds was born and raised. That's the town Peter Moore just arrived from. Oh, I got here as soon as I could, Rogue. Oh, good heavens. Hello, Judge. Kind of a mess, isn't it? Oh, uh, Judge, are you having that well checked? Yes, I have Carl Friend, the handwriting expert, working on it. Oh, uh, what did you know about Fred Kraft, Judge? Oh, he was an old family retainer in the best sense of the word, Lieutenant. He and Anson Leeds were more friends than they were employer and employee. How come Anson only left him $5,000 then? I I don't know. Fred was a thrifty man. He had quite a nest egg saved from his salary and from investments he had made on tips from Anson. His estate will be worth, oh, I should say conservatively, $60,000. Hmm. 
Who gets it now that he's dead? Well, Pamela Leeds. You know, she's been like a daughter to old Fred. I happen to know that she's the sole beneficiary in his will because I drew it up for the old man. Yeah, this case has more angles than a six-pointed star. Yeah, yeah. Here's a cute one I just picked up, Rogue. Look. Hmm. A lady's wristwatch. Where'd you find it? On the floor, right over there. It's got a broken link, like it might have been torn off of somebody's arm. Ah. Well, whose is it? Uh, it's engraved on the back to Pamela from Dad. Pamela? Oh, uh, come on. Let's get in the house, Irvin. You'll want to question everybody, won't you? Yeah. I've got the boys holding Miss Leeds, Peter Moore, and the nurse Schumann in the library. Oh, while you're talking to them, the judge and I are going to be busy upstairs. <laughs> I don't understand, Rogue. Uh, just what is it we're looking for in Kate Schumann's room? I don't know. I don't know. But she's mixed up in this thing someplace. Uh, take a look in the bathroom, will you, Judge? If you see anything the least bit out of line, call me. Okay, Rogue. Oh, look. Look. Ah. Here's pay dirt. Yes? Kate Schumann's diploma from nursing school. Hmm. See where it was issued? School of Nursing, City Hospital, Garden City, Iowa. Yeah, the town keeps popping up, doesn't it, huh? Yes. Oh, look, uh, I want you to witness this, Judge. Here are two cigarette stubs. Lipstick on the tips. Fresh. No, no, don't touch them. Just leave them right where they are. All right, but, but Rogue, you said yourself that the nurse couldn't have killed Kraft. She was in the house at the time that he was murdered. Yeah, I know, I know. But I've got an idea that's beginning to make sense. You got a pencil? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Now, let me use it here. I want to copy this phone number from Kate Schumann's scratch pad. BL6791. Room 323. You know, Rogue, we have no now, right. Now, to... look, Judge. This is beginning to weigh on your conscience. You better get downstairs with Urban. He's a warrior, too. I've got a lot of work to do and a long distance phone call to make. You go downstairs and tell Urban I'll be down as soon as I have convicting evidence on a murderer. I'm going to have to impress on you that I mean business. There's been a murder committed. Now, one of you knows something about it. And we I... don't, Lieutenant Urban. I tell you, we were all here in the house when Fred was killed. I wish you'd go away and leave us alone. What was your wristwatch doing lying in a pool of blood near the body of the murdered man, Miss Leeds? Why was a link torn wide open on the band? I don't know. It was on my dressing table this morning. I know it was. Yes? Well, three witnesses saw it lying at the scene of the crime. Look, Lieutenant, why don't you let the poor girl alone? I was with her when Fred Kraft was killed. So was I. We were all right here in this room. That's very interesting. All of you established your alibis for a very important time. Were you all working together? Now, one of you start talking. How about you, Peter Moore? How do you account for the fact that the stub of a plane ticket from Garden City, Iowa, was found at the scene of the crime? Plane ticket? I came out on a train. Yeah? When were you in Fred Kraft's cottage? I haven't been out there in four years. You may have to prove that statement more in court. This is outrageous. You can't keep us here pounding questions at us, making accusations. There's been a murder committed. It's my business to find out who did it. I'm going to find out. Judge, go get Rogue. Tell him I want him down here right now. All right, Lieutenant. Peter, please. Don't let him question me anymore. Look, Lieutenant. It must be perfectly obvious that no one of us could have had anything to do with the murder. It was probably some transient. I suggest, Lieutenant, that you use some Lieutenant other means. Like... Yes, yes, what's the matter? The upstairs looks like a cyclone hit it. And Richard Rogue is gone. Yes, I was gone. And I'll tell you more about it in just a moment. First, here's Jim Doyle, who wants to tell you some facts about shaving. Yes, men, it's a fact. Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream does give as smooth and comfortable a shave as you could hope for. Plenty of research and testing have gone into the making of this fine cream, and now it combines the qualities you want. Smoothness of texture, a clean, tangy odor, and a skin conditioning ingredient for sensitive skins. Fitch's No Brush softens up the toughest beards, so your razor will glide easily, giving you a close, clean shave without scraping or irritation. It leaves your face feeling smooth and cool, 
leaves your disposition calm and cool, too. For Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream is designed for sensitive skins. For men who prefer a lather cream, it's Fitch's Brush Cream. Gives lots of creamy lather that stays moist all during the shave, giving a smooth, comfortable shave. Rinses off easily, too. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Creams come in economical 25 and 50 cent sizes. Ask for either type, but for solid comfort shaves, be sure it's Fitch. Spelled F I T C H. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. The more I looked around the upstairs room in the mansion of Anson Leeds, the more I suspected that what started out to be the investigation of a validity of a will had turned into the investigation of not one murder, but two. I made a long-distance call. Then I called a doctor friend of mine who admitted that a clever murderess could disguise the effect of morphine poisoning. Then I checked the telephone number I found on Kate Schumann's scratch pad found that it was the number of the Hotel Splendid. I went there. In the lobby, I was stopped by my friend Todd Reeves, the bellboy. Hello, Mr. Rogue. What are you doing? Oh, uh, take a ride with me in the elevator, will you, Todd? I'm calling on a guest of yours in room 323. Yeah? What's the matter? They in trouble? Now, just don't ask any questions. You want to make 20 bucks? Oh, sure. Who do you want killed? Just take a ride with me and do me a favor. Give me your passkey, Todd. Oh, that's what the 20 bucks was for. You want me to get fired? Oh, I'll back you up if you get in trouble. Yeah, then I'll really get me the boot. You want me to stick around? No, I don't. I think the less you know about this case, the better off you're going to be. Who is it? Uh, shove off, Todd. I'm, I'm going in. Who is it? Hello. Stay right where you are, please. What do you want? I want to talk with you about a murder. Oh, Oh, this is a typical rogue trick. Telling us to wait here and disappearing. If I ever get... I'll get it. Hello. Hello, Urban. Hello, rogue. Where the devil... Look, Anson Leeds was murdered. Don't say a word to the people you're holding there. One of them is the killer. Right. The will is a forgery, and I have the proof. Hold everybody until I can get there for the payoff. Be about ten minutes. All right, Urban. I'll take the party from here. Okay, Rogue. And this had better be good. It will be. And this concerns all of you. In the first place, I've talked to Carl Friend, the handwriting expert. That will, leaving everything to Peter, is a forgery. There are five copies of the will, and the signature on each of the copies is identical. It's impossible for anybody, even a man in the best of health, to write his name exactly the same way five times. That's not true. I tell you Shut up. The signatures were made by placing a sheet of carbon paper under one authentic signature of Anson Leeds and tracing it through to the fake wills with a sharp pencil, then inking the signature in over the tracing. Don't bother denying it, Kate. Carl Friend photographed the signature under a powerful light with an enlarging camera. The particles of graphite under the ink sparkle like diamonds. Ah, that will was a fake. And Fred Kraft was killed to keep him from telling the fact that he was not present when Anson Leeds signed it. I didn't kill Fred Kraft. No, but you killed Anson Leeds with morphine poisoning. She murdered my dad? He was murdered? Yes, Pamela. I just came from the mortuary. There are obvious syringe punctures in his arm. But Dr. Stevens... Yes, I know, Judge. He signed a death certificate for heart failure. But I found this vial of morphine tablets in your room, Kate, and this... This bottle of belladonna hidden in your desk. You kill Leeds with morphine and then drop belladonna in his eyes to dilate the pupils. Oh, that was very clever. Because the only outward sign of morphine poisoning is the fact that the pupils of the eyes contract to pinpoint size. I killed him. But I'll never go to jail for it. Grab her, Jeff. Grab her. Get the syringe away from her. Kate. I was too late, Rogue. Yeah, yeah, she was too fast for us with that shot of poison. Kate. Kate. Uh, Kate! Too late. 
She's dead, Rogie. I, I don't understand. Why did she do it, Mr. Rogue? Oh, for game, for game. You were an innocent part of the plot to kill Anson Leeds, Peter. Peter? Oh, no. Stop being so mysterious, Rogue. If you know who killed Fred Kraft, say so. Was it Kate? No, 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 it wasn't. The murderer of Fred Kraft is in jail. I put her there a few minutes ago. She was a good friend of Kate's, who was resentful of you, Pamela, and ambitious for her son to be a wealthy man. Peter, she needs you, kid. Better get down to the jail and see your mother. She loved you so much that two people died so you could inherit a million dollars. Well, that was the end of that case. Peter Moore's mother was tremendously jealous when old Anson Leeds adopted a little girl, Pamela, and made her the heir to his fortune. And after her school day's friend, Kate Schumann, was installed as the old man's trusted nurse, they plotted his murder without Peter's knowledge. Mrs. Moore was in Kate's bedroom when I was questioning Kate. And when she learned that the will was being investigated and that I was going to talk with Fred or Kraft about it, she killed him. She made a complete confession and was executed for the crime. I felt sorry for Peter. Ah, he's a nice kid. Pamela felt sorry for him, too. She felt so sorry for him, she's going to marry him. So he'll get the Leeds fortune anyway. Ah, you know, that hardly seems fair. Getting a girl like Pamela and all that money, too. You know, I... Uh, I could have gone for that Pamela. Lovely girl. Oh, lovely girl. Ah, but after all, I need another girl like Frankenstein needed another monster... In exactly the same way. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. But don't forget, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about an alibi that is blown up by gunfire. There are some lovely people in it. We call it the murder habit. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station... When you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. <laughs> 